Mike Farron presents Fantasy. Out of the slime of creation he crawled a wavering path through fetid jungle until his footsteps echoed through his own self-made canyons whereupon he dared to face eternity and call himself man. Look within yourself, O mind of man. Of what worth are your fleeting impressions? What philosophy dares decide between the real and the unreal, the true and the false, without thought to the strange happenings in the universe? A caution to your puny wisdom, O oh mind of man. Do you dare to say that this is truth and that is fantasy? <laughs> Quite obviously, it's time for the sponsor's opening commercial message. So, in the absence of said sponsor, we will use this space to tell you about fantasy. Our message is short. As you consider this program, bear two points in mind. One, fantasy has the same high listener appeal as that enjoyed by the current cycle of murder mysteries without the objectionable qualities of the murder mystery. Two, fantasy offers a source of radio material virtually untapped since Orson Welles skyrocketed to fame with his men from Mars. But don't misunderstand. Fantasy is not a series dependent on the space void. For fantasy can happen in your own backyard. And now, as you listen to our story, we ask that you decide for yourself. Is it truth or is it fantasy? Listen to Entity from the Void. Darling. Father, you old sweet. Did you come to have a glass of punch with me? I did indeed. Why aren't you dancing, dear? I did earlier. Oh, I'd love to dance, but Fred... Oh, he's drunk again. He's been very drunk oh, for two look, hours. Look, darling, again, I ask. Why don't you divorce, Fred? After all, there can't be much left. There's nothing left. But marriage meant so much to me, Father. It was a new life, a useful life. Children, a home to me. Oh, my child, you can marry again. Perhaps. But you see, Father, there's no one else. <laughs> Think I'll hang on to my frayed threads a while. Very well, my dear. Well, I'll run along. I'm playing cards with Carl. Bye, darling. <laughs> Be careful, Plunger. Nada. Hello. Oh. You love to dance. Will you dance with me? <laughs> I don't think we've met. Does that matter so much? We might still enjoy dancing together. Yes, we might. Very well. Do you hear a strange sound? I hear intriguing music. Shall we go to the dance floor? Why hasn't someone introduced us earlier? I was not here. Oh, then you came late. No, I was near you. I've been near you often. You have? <laughs> I don't understand. I swam in the surf with you yesterday. Yesterday? <laughs> now I know you're having fun with me. I swam alone. Yes, out to the old breakwater. I was there when you tore your swimming clothes on the rusty nail. You saw that? How terrible of you. I was mortified even though I was alone. But you couldn't have been there. I would have seen you. It's no fault of yours. I did not let you see me. Who are you? What is your name? Is a name of any importance? Isn't it pleasant just to be together? Dancing? <laughs> talking? Oh, 
strangely persuasive you are. Yes, I admit it. I find it pleasant. Now I am happy. Now I feel that I can say more to you. Let's step out on the terrace. Now I want you to tell me who... Where did he go? How strange. Seems almost as though he... He disappeared. Well, here you are, darling. Oh, Fred. Oh, Fred. Yes, dear. Your husband. Is there anything wrong with that? Please, Fred. Please, Fred. Please, Fred. I've been looking all over for you. I want to dance. Everybody dancing. I want to dance, too. Fred, please. Fred, you're hurting my arm. Oh, now, don't start crying again. I want to talk to you. I'll talk to you when you're sober. I'm going to walk on the beach. You were too busy with your fears, dear. I saw you come out here to the beach, so I followed. Tell me about it. Oh, nothing, Father, really. Fred, he... he just tried to kiss me. And after all, he is my husband. My dear, I know that your loyalty is badly misplaced. You're chained to a besotted fool, and I'll not stand by any longer. But there must be something we can do for him. Perhaps a good punch in the jaw, which I would like to administer personally. Now you're giving away to your feelings, Father. If we could get him away from liquor Wait. for a while. My southern queen is sailing for Rio in three days, carrying steel plates for me. The ship has accommodation for two dozen passengers. It's quite comfortable. Carries a doctor and an excellent chef. But no bar. Oh, Father, you darling, I... I'd like to try it. If I could keep Fred sober for two weeks, it it might just be enough to bring him back to reason. Well, I'll, I'll arrange it in the morning. Now, how about drying your eyes and coming back to the party? In a moment. Father. Father, did you see the man I danced with just after you left me? Uh, why, no, dear. I went to play bridge. Oh, I'm sorry. I wanted at least to know his name. Well, what did he look like? Describe him. I can probably name him. Well, well, he was tall, with wonderful shoulders and, and crisp brown hair with, with just a little bit of a wave in it. And the bluest eyes I've ever seen. And, and, and there was a cleft in his chin. And... Oh, darling, how many fillings in his teeth. <laughs> you certainly looked this young man over. Oh, Father, I didn't really. I, I don't recognize this paragon. I'm sorry, dear. Well, it doesn't really matter. But at least I... I would have liked to know his name. He was strange. Strange. I had an odd feeling of... of godliness. After three days, this cruise begins to look a little better. Martini? Fred, where did you get the liquor? I had it in my steamer trunk. Excellent martinis. You sure you're careful one, darling? Really, no. Martinis are a boon to mankind. I should like to soliloquize or write a poem to them. Unfortunately, I can never think of words that rhyme. However, if I do not have the pen, I do have the soul of a poet. Don't you think I have the soul of a poet, Nada? Really, now? Please, Fred. I'd rather you didn't put your arm around me now. My dear child, may I point out that drunk or sober, I'm still your husband. And you're doing an excellent job of bringing that to an end. Really? Is my little chickadee planning to fly her nest? I don't think I would. And why not? Because I'll simply take it upon myself to make your life as miserable as a life could be from then on. How hateful you can be. <laughs> Darling, you've no idea. You're quite sure you don't want a martini? No? 
Well, then I'll drink it myself. Nectar of the gods, solace of the lonely, companion of the dilettante. Fred, Fred, I'm going to take a walk on deck. Don't you want to come with me? Of course I don't want to come with you. In the first place, it's blowing some weather. And in the second place, all I want of this miserable tub is a view of Rio Harbor as soon as possible. Then I shall take a plane home. I'm sorry we came. I had hope that... Oh, well, I'm sure the whole cruise was an idea of that stupid parent of yours. Please, we'll have nothing to say about my father. And why not? He's a dull businessman. And I suspect an interfering busybody. I notice you don't hesitate to spend his money. <laughs> oh, why should I? He has plenty of it. You don't think the only attractive thing about you was your beauty, do you, darling? Fred! Fred, stop it! Stop it at once! Please try to retain some of the manners of a gentleman. Gentleman? Why, I'm the perfect gentleman. All the society columns say that. Now, you'll notice the cut of my suit. Because <laughs> it's bought with your father's money, the ass. That's enough! Leaving so soon, my dear? I'm... I'm going on deck. Oh, it's very foolish of you. You might be blown over the rail and get very drowned. That might be just what I want, Fred. Fred! Please, Fred. Slap me, will you? I'll show you. I'll take you down a peg or two. Please, do not be afraid. Only trust me. Who are you? Where did you come from? What manner of strange creature are you to, to come out of the sky? Nada, look at me. Look into my eyes. There you will see that you have nothing to fear. You, you were frightening. But, but now I... Yes. Now you are happy, as you were when we danced. That is, as it should be. Nada. Tell me. I understand, but believe me, I mean for you only the greatest of good. I am not of your world, Nada. I am an entity out of the void. Now, let us return to Entity from the Void. What is truth? And what is fantasy? A lonely girl, a fog-bound ship in mid-ocean, and the mind-shattering appearance of a godlike creature, is this fantasy? Or the strange, strange story which he had for lovely Nada, was this perhaps truth? My world was called Kor. Thur? And from a world called Kor? This is so hard to understand. Patience, my dear, and you will understand. Kor was a planet in the fifth galaxy beyond this. My world has been destroyed for a thousand years. 
yet the light from it still shines upon your earth, for the distance is so great that 2,000 light years are required to bring its glow this far. This, these things you tell me, they're, they're staggering. My, my mind, it's, it's in a whirl. But you believe me? Yes. Oddly, I do believe you. My people, though much like the people of your earth, far surpassed you in intellect. And yet, our science, our culture, our developments of all kinds were of no use when the end came. The end of a tired, worn-out planet. I alone survived, for I alone was given the power. This is frightening. And it's unbelievable. Nada, it is frightening and unbelievable only because your mind is bound by the conventions of an unbelieving world. Let me show you my story. Please do. Tell me your story. Show you my story, Nada. Hold my hands. So. Now clear your mind of all thought. Clear it. I will help you. I cannot. One's mind continues to function... The thought processes go on. Clear your mind. Refuse your mind the privilege of thinking. I help you now. Think only as I tell you. See now a great hall. A hall of science. A hall wherein are gathered the greatest minds in the whole universe. See them, handsome men. Some young, some grey-bearded. Thinking. Thinking. Wish. Somebody might do something about this. Scar, now. Scar, he'll know. Men of Cora! Yes, sir. I beg your indulgence for having kept you waiting. <coughs> Will someone report any further progress? Raga, you are in charge of ministry. I have little to report, Gar. Ah, yes. A pitiful shell, this planet of ours. No longer capable of producing even the simplest needs of science. We have gone a step further in the disintegration and reassembly of matter. It would be simple to transport every person on core to another planet in a matter of seconds. But first, we must have a station and a power plant on the newly selected world. And that is impossible? Quite impossible, Gar. Then my solution is the only one, though it presages death to Kor and the people of Kor. My friends, it is inevitable that we die, for I tell you this, that already has the breakup of our planetary mass begun. Within twelve nods, our world will have disintegrated, and all upon it will be dead. Oh, no, it's Wait! Not. Wait. We must not let die... What we have accomplished, we must preserve our sciences, our arts, our cultural advantages. I, I can send one man to another world. I am ready to teach one man the secret of the free entity. One man, to one man can I give the ability to free himself from his mortal body. And as a free will, a free entity, he can roam the universe with a thought. And settle where he will. Men of Core, if we are to send abroad our science, then I say that Gar himself is the one to go. Yes, yes, yes. Hold, yes. hold! The severance of the free will from the body will bring about shock of tremendous proportions. We need a young, strong man whose intellect is as well developed as his body. I call upon the young man, Thur. I am here, Gar. Then step forward. There. There is grave danger for you in this transmigration. You have the courage? I am ready. Then join hands with me and clear your mind of all thoughts. I will give you the power by impression the more quickly to accomplish the freeing of your entity. When your mind is cleared, tell me. Begin. Oh, <laughs> 
I do not believe so. Wait. The. The. I am safe, God. Describe for us your surroundings, your emotions. Where are you? I am in this room. Yet I am gone from our world. I am in the void. I have the feeling of being everywhere. I move a billion miles with a thought. I have no emotion. Only a feeling of tremendous power. It is a success. The transmigration of the will from the prison of a body to free entity. What is that sound? It is the crashing of disintegration. Our world is breaking up. I hear you, God. Go, go quickly. Lest in the coming cataclysm you will be drawn from your free entity to the husk of your body and consumed with us. Quickly. You have your mission. Go. I go, God. Courage, men of God. And thus it has been, my Nada. For a thousand years, I have searched for a world to give the science and culture of Kor. Fantastic and wonderful story. And I have no doubt now, third of your wonderful powers. Then you will give these great powers, these sciences and this culture of Kor to our world, to the earth. No, my Nada. No? You said I said I searched for a world. I examined the planet you call Venus and which we call Mech. The great monsters which people this place, the horrid things still crawling in the steaming slime. They have millions of years ahead of them before they'll reach even a remote stage of intelligence. And the hairy creatures who scuttle about on six ugly legs and the great ball you have named Jupiter are intelligent enough, but the arts and sciences of core are best suited to a race of our physical proportions. But then... This world of mine, why do you not give these things to us? No, my Nada. On this earth, I have found only greed and selfishness and destruction. Man is pitted against man in hatred and lust. Where my power is given to him, man on this earth would destroy himself and his world. I understand. Then you must go on searching... No. No, in finding you, my search is completed. I have a plan. Far out in space, beyond this galaxy, I have come upon a perfect world. It is verdant and beautiful. You would call it paradise. No harmful being exists upon it. From the tiniest creature to the largest, each one is gentle and kindly. My new world wants only man. You have more to say, sir. In your Christian belief, one man and one woman gave life to this earth? Yes, that is our common belief. Then why cannot one man and one woman give life to my new world? My Nada, only you have measured up to the standards I have set. In your nobility of thought, your gentleness, your loyalty, your goodness, and your beauty... Come with me. How amazing and beautiful. A new race. A new beginning for mankind. Oh, uh, how glorious. My Nod. With all the great powers at my command, I find that none is great enough to conquer the gentlest of all emotions. I find myself completely and utterly in love with you. I know. And I love you, sir. My darling. Oh. Oh, we, we mustn't. Oh, I demand it. Oh, sir, please. My Nada, what is wrong? Sir, I am already given to a man. I cannot even think of... The weakling that dissipates? Well, you hate him, I know this. Forget him. I cannot. Since childhood, marriage has been sacred to me. I cannot break a vow. 
in sickness and in death for better or worse. Note. Without you, my power is worthless to me. Sir, sir, if you love me, perhaps you could find among your great powers a way to strengthen my husband against his weaknesses. And of course, I could do so with a thought. Then, then will you, for me, my dear one, there can be nothing else. Very well, my Nada. Let me bring him to mine. A moment. So, Nada, your husband is no longer a problem. Come, let us go to your cabin. Oh, he, he's sleeping. Let me wake him. Fred. Fred. Your husband is not sleeping, my Nada. He's dead. Dead? Fred? Oh, no, no. I am sorry, my dear. But, but why did he die? I have no answer to that. It is strange. I feel little emotion. I feel no sorrow. Only pity. Pity for the pathetic wastrel whose unhappy life I shared. But I... I do feel some emotion. There... There it is hateful of me, but... I cannot conquer it. I feel a sense of... of elation. Perhaps my nada at the thought that there is no longer a barrier between us. I think... Yes, my darling. There is no longer a barrier between us. You will go with me. I will go with you to the end of the universe. There is grave danger, nada, for you. First, we must bring about the freedom of your entity. We must unshackle your will from your body. In that there is danger. I am ready. Join hands with me. So, now, clear your mind of all thought. I will help you. Look into my mind. Try. Try hard. I will try. Soon your mind will clear of all thought. Only the thought to tell me when to begin the transmigration. My begin. What a terrible thing. That girl's father is the owner of this ship. She she and her husband here are socially prominent. Doctor, what killed them? Captain, this man died of acute alcoholism. I saw him at dinner in the salon. And already the signs were there. But Mrs. Westgate and this stranger, whoever he is, what killed them? You're the ship's doctor. You must find out. I have no idea. There are no marks of violence. And see their faces. Captain, they are, they are supremely happy in death. <sighs> One of these love pacts. This will be a terrible scandal. Somehow I don't believe it was a suicide pact. Captain, they have been dead less than half an hour. We know that. And yet these two bodies are cold. Strangely cold. Why, it is comparable only to... to what is called absolute cold. The cold of the space void. Yes, man is life's enigma. Whether he lives in town or farm, in cottage or penthouse, or locked in the narrow confines of a bottle, or locked in the narrow confines... Locked in the narrow confines of a bottle? 
Yes, it's hard to believe that anyone could live in a bottle. Our fantasy next week will be The Bottle Party, adapted for radio from a story by John Collier. Fantasy is produced in Hollywood by Frank Farron. Tonight's fantasy was written and directed by Hobart Donovan. Special music for fantasy was written and arranged by John Duffy and Ken Cameron. The theremin was played by Dr. S.J. Hoffman. This is Ken Nile speaking. <laughs> This is an audition transcription. A bishop. And the gargoyle. Thanks, boys. Uh, take care of yourself, Daddy. As a live and walk my beat, the gargoyle. <laughs> How's your digestion, Ryan? I see you just got your free ride uptown at the taxpayer's expense. Ah, yes, yeah, so I did. The little I ask of life, glory be to God. Oh, and uh, how's his nibs, the bishop? Ah, in the pink, Danny, in the pink. I just came out for a game of pool and to pick up the papers. Ah, nothing but misery in those things. Yeah. Well, now that we've observed the obscenities, as they say in Emily Post, what were you doing talking to the young lady over there? Young? Yes. <laughs> You're losing your ideals, Ryan. Just a school teacher I found on the stoop. And what's her name? Jennifer. Jennifer Butts. Oh, my, my. I thought for a moment she might be a young Colleen in need of a protector. Yeah, she's in need of something. I came by here and she was wringing her hands, walking up and down. So I ups to her and I says, Excuse me, lady, what's needling you? Yes. And she begins to cry on me, so I lambs. Then I thinks about the bishop. And I goes back and I toss my headpiece and I says, Listen, doll... You look like out of town to me. What's the matter? Your husband give you the chill? Uh, you've got a touch of blarney in you, gargoyle, you have. Sure. So she looks at me and she says, Young man, I am Jennifer Botts. My cousin is mayor of Maple Rest in Illinois. If you get fresh, I will turn you over to the police. And why not? Uh, now listen, Ryan. Don't try to make a chest out of that stomach. I got enough trouble. What do I do with the dame? And why should I answer that? She's got trouble, some kind of trouble. Do I have to call the sergeant? Do I have to call the traveler's aid, and do I have to listen to you? Okay, okay. I suppose I better take her up to see the bishop. No, no, that's a splendid thought. If she stays on my beat, I have to worry tonight, and here it is Sunday. And I have enough worries about this day. Uh, my Mary graduated. Yes, late but successful. And there's a doings at my house, and I want to get home. Okay, okay. I see my duty, and I do it. And I turn me back, and I hope your parole is permanent. Thanks, copper. You bring tears to my eyes. Gee, Bishop, where did you get the midget joke box? <laughs> my little music box has been with me for 20 years. It has relieved my boredom and the silent watches of my missionary work all around the world. Well, my jewel of great price, my laborer worthy of his hire, sit down. Yeah, Bishop. What's wrong? Gargoyle, you are really worthy of your name. Why? You're so obvious. Okay, I'm a sucker. Make me know it. A gargoyle is an architectural whimsy, a stony decoration in a profane manner to relieve the austerity of a saintly structure. But obviously obvious. Yeah. You know how I got that name? The sob sister at my last trial. He sits on the stand like a gargoyle, she says. Well, how was the pool game? Okay. How was Ryan? Okay. How did you know? He goes on duty about this time. Well, what have you got to tell me? Well... To make the thing simple, I brought a lady home. Uh -huh. You have my permission to make yourself a Jamaica Rum Collins double strength. These malted milks are going to your head. I'm leveling, Bishop. She's out there. Oh, I see. My, my. I never thought I'd live to see this. Well, bring her in. Hey, Jennifer. It's okay. Come on in. Hmm. So this is your young lady. I'm not any young man's. Young lady, sir. I beg your pardon. I am Bishop Morris. I am Jennifer Botts. Lovely name. Thank you. Had a Jennifer Woods as my assistant out in the Congo 15 years ago. Oh, dear me, dear me. 
That was during my active life as a bishop. I'm retired now. I see you're already acquainted with my friend, the gargoyle. The gargoyle? That's a strange name. He's a strange young man. He's been very kind. Oh, I'm afraid, Bishop, that I'm presuming and... Not at all. Oh, please, please don't be kind. I've really made a terrible fool of myself, and I can't... Well, I I don't know where to turn, especially back at Maple Rest. I told them to go to... Well, well, I burnt my bridge behind me. Rightly so. Without being trite, I hope, I can say that Maple Rest's loss is New York's gain. Oh, they were kind, but I always had dreams. I... Well, you see, I was a star in our college musical comedies, and I thought I'd go on the stage. But I had to work, and then years went by, so many of them. But I saved my money, and when my father died last spring, I knew that I'd, I'd just have to come here and get the grease paint out of my system. Here's tea, boys. Oh. Here you are, Jennifer. Don't mind my finger for a spoon. It's got calluses and don't burn easy. Thank you. Well, so much for the dreams, Jennifer. What happened? I met a man. I went to the Capitol Theater by myself, and then I went to that Penny Arcade, you know? Oh, yeah, the place that's got the turtles with the autographed backs. Yes. I wandered around, and I tried the shooting gallery. There was a very nice man with a cane that showed me how to shoot. He wasn't fresh or anything. Well, we talked, and he said he was a producer. Okay, Bishop. She went home with a baby doll. Oh, please, I... Well, he was with other people, and I don't know, somehow he asked me if I cared to go with them. We went to a nightclub, and the other people left. Oh, it was wonderful. He danced so beautifully, and he was such a gentleman. I told him about myself. I told him all about my ambition, and he was very sympathetic. Yeah, yeah, sure. Then he asked you up to see his printing press. Oh, no, no, nothing so melodramatic as that, I'm afraid. He, he was quite helpful. He said that, naturally, the going would be tough, and I agreed. Then he said that he'd be able to do something for me if I had $200. Ah, I see. Please continue. Well, I gave him $200, and he was to arrange a part for me in his show. It was almost time for me to go back to my hotel when a man came in. What kind of a man? A man with large yellow eyes. Yellow eyes? Yes. He didn't say anything. He came near us, and he looked at Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson got up, and they went into the back of the club. Uh -huh. Well, I waited and waited, but he didn't come back. I went back to my hotel, and, and then... Yes? What happened? Then I... I found that the billfold I'd given Mr. Simpson had all my money. I thought that I'd left $700 at the hotel, but... But it was all in the fold. Everything I have is gone. Oh, dear, dear. I, I couldn't stay at the hotel. And I, I can't go back to Maple Rest. <laughs> I, I can't do anything. Nah, nah, nah. I'm so sorry. If you need money to go oh, back, please, I... please, I... I'm terribly sorry I bothered you, but I, I don't want any money. Ah, oh, Bishop, listen, it's ABC. Let's fix up the little woman. She don't want to go back to no stick. She's big time. Oh, dear, dear. All right, Gargoyle. We'll do what we can, Jennifer. Uh, do you remember the name of this nightclub where you last saw Mr. Simpson? Yes, it was... It had a white door. It was called the 89 Club. Oh, I think I know that dump, Bishop. Over on West 48. Very good. Well, Miss Jennifer, we're not all the same breed of cats here in the city. Perhaps we can right a wrong without having a drop of that uh, printer's ink spilled to betray your embarrassment. Oh, you, you think you really can, Bishop? Oh, I, I'd be so eternally grateful. We'll do our best, my dear. The gargoyle and I need a stroll anyway. Now, you stay here, make yourself at home, rest your mind. We'll be back within the hour. Thank you, Bishop. I'll wait. Oh, I'll... I'll wait like a church mouse with a troubled conscience. Bishop. Oh, who is it? Please. Please! You sure, Rocky? You sure this is the Dane that was with him? Yeah, sure, Snap. I was in the back, looking right at her. I'm good on faces. Okay, Rocky. Don't smother her. She's got enough of that stuff to hold her. Now, let's get out of here. Okay. 
How? Where did you leave the car? In the alley. You carry her, Rocky. I'll go ahead. We'll take the stairs. It'll be safer. Whose dump do you think this is? I don't know. That ain't important. Right now, we've got to get this gal out of circulation. You think she talked? What could she say? About you, I mean, Snap. That's why we're here. Come on. And put down that ashtray. How many times I got to tell you we ain't collecting souvenirs? Is this the place, Gargoyle? Yeah, that's the joint. The Club 89 seems closed. Yeah, it closed down early, Bishop. I guess their customer went home. Well, that doesn't help us. Oh, there's apartments above. Yes, that would be the entrance to the left. Yeah, what's that mean? We might find our Mr. Simpson living here. This seems to be a neighborhood which might be favored by his colorful presence. It's a walk-up, Bishop. The door is locked. Regs, Ben, Hyman, Redding, Simpson, Chalmers E. Simpson. Well, very simple. Press the button. Nothing happens. Maybe he's out running for office on Jennifer's dope. Bring two or three others, Gargoyle. I believe that's the usual technique for gaining admittance to these places. Some tenant is sure to press the door release. If I didn't know you was a bishop, I'd get the idea you got a head in the world ringing doorbells. Now, third floor. And hurry before the others come out to see why their guests haven't arrived. Three B Simpson. Chalmers E. Simpson. Press the buzzer. No soap, Bishop. He ain't responding. Try the door. Hey, that was easy. It's a comfy little joint. Anybody home? See if you can find a light switch. Okay. Uh, nothing here. Let's try the bedroom. Hey, look at the pictures, Bishop. Cuddles to Simpsy from Vera. Oh, ain't that awful? Doggo. Yeah? Come here, quickly. No, no, don't go in. There. There, on the floor. Gee, Bishop. Somebody got to him. Yes, as nice a job of the 45 as I ever saw. Hey, wait a minute. There's a picture of Simpsy on the desk. Let me take a look. Now, let me get a peep at the victim. Yeah, it's him, Bishop. Chalmers E. Simpson. And very dead, too. Come on, Gargoyle. This is no place for a retired bishop. It ain't no daisy chain for a retired lug, either. What are we going to tell Jennifer? Well, Miss Botts will have to accept a less violent version. I'll arrange for her financial reimbursement, and we'll let her believe that it, it, uh, we found it at the 89 Club, eh? Well, that's a nice thought, Bishop. No use getting her hopped up. Hello. You, you smell anything? Yeah. It smells sick. That's chloroform. Miss Botts! Jennifer Botts! Don't tell me. Jennifer! Jennifer Botts! No use, Gargo. I'm afraid she's gone. Gone? Where could she go? Hey, look, there's her hat. Now, don't tell me a gal like Jennifer will buy a hat like that and then go off and leave it. It ain't in the cards. No, Bishop. it isn't, Gargo. Oh, dear, dear, I expected to spend this hot summer night in some portion of air-conditioned peace. Now your pixie-like impulses have involved me in a grade A number one mystery. Where is Miss Jennifer Botts? If she left of her own accord, where did she go? If somebody forced her to leave... Who was it? And why? Eh, uh, maybe it ain't too late for sitting down with the morning papers. Maybe she's hiding. Maybe she's behind that curtain. Hmm? See? It ain't like the other curtain. It bulges a little. Yes, yes. Wait a minute, Bishop. Now, Jennifer, don't play jokes. Come out of there. Get back. You get back. You put up your hands. Both of you. I mean it. Well, look at this. Mickey Mouse with a cannon. You get back or I'll, I'll let you have it. Who are you and what are you doing in my apartment? Your apartment? I want my ruby. The ruby you murdered Simpson to get. Now you hand it over. Oh, my dear man, stop waving that gun in my face. What was that about killing Simpson? I saw you. I followed you upstairs. I saw Simpson. He was dead. You did it. You got the ruby. Now you give it back to now, me. Now, listen, Half Pint. We ain't got no time for jokes. Where's Jennifer Butts? 
Jennifer who? I don't know what you're talking about. You give me my ruby or I'll fire. No, no, no. Wait. Hold on to yourself. You don't look like a man who would kill anyone. Take it easy. If you saw us kill Simpson, how did you get back here so fast? I went down the back way. I waited until you came out and I followed you. When you were opening your door, I, I went around to the service entrance. It was open and I got in all right. Now you give me that ruby. I suppose you put down that gun and let's talk this over, huh? We didn't kill Simpson. We went to his house and found him on the floor, well, dead. Then who did it? Who's got my ruby? I've got to get it back. It's everything to me. Look out. There at the window. Oh, nice work, Gargoyle, but couldn't you have found a less expensive vase to hit him with? Sorry, Bishop. I was in a hurry. Oh, my head, my head. Mm, it's too bad, Mr. Uh... Pincus. Joseph Pincus. Joseph Pincus, not the curator of the Charles Museum. Yes, oh, yes. For goodness sake, Mr. Pincus, what brought you to arms and intended violence on a hot night like this? The Charles Ruby. Why, it's beyond price and it's gone. Well, how did it go, Mr. Pincus? Oh, I was a fool. Simpson was my friend. I liked his charming manners. He was a fascinating conversationalist. I knew him for years. Oh, I knew he was a ruthless person, but I never thought that he'd steal the ruby. Did he steal it? Yes. I made the mistake of bringing it home from the vault. I wanted to brag a little. I showed it to him. We had wine and conversation. I was very drowsy when he left. and I never missed the ruby until today, and then I tried to find him, and now he's dead. I see. Why do you suppose he stole the ruby? He wasn't a criminal, was he? No. I guess he wanted it for a woman. He was irresponsible that way. Yes, yes, we know. You see, we are missing something, too. A very nice lady by the name of Jennifer Botts. Mr. Simpson got away with her money, and uh, we went over tonight to try and get it back. Yes, sir, of course. But my ruby, where is it? Perhaps the murderers of Mr. Simpson could answer that. Yeah, but where do we start? Well, let's start with the young lady of Mr. Simpson's affections. We'll forget Miss Jennifer for the moment. For I have a hunch that those two crimes are linked together. Miss Jennifer was with Mr. Simpson tonight. A man came in, a man with yellow eyes. They went out together. Mr. Simpson did not return. The question is, did he murder Simpson because of the ruby or for less valuable reasons? Uh, speaking of dames, remember that picture in Simpson's room? Yes, yes. Uh, what was the name? Vera. Cuddles to Simpson from Vera. Vera? Oh, he said something about a girl uh, in a chorus. What chorus? Some chorus, you know. Let me see. Could it have been the dot, the jot? The spot? Yes, I think so. Huh? Well, then let's away to this den of pleasure which knows no curfew and begin with the lady known as Vera. The weasel here, Bishop. What oh. do we do with him? Oh, yes, yes. A good point, Gargoyle. Uh, get some cord. Okay, Bishop. And some cheese? Don't be facetious. Mr. Pincus is a very learned man for all his appearance. Okay. Mr. Pincus, I'm really very sorry that I must take certain measures with you. I'm afraid you couldn't help but only hinder our actions. So uh, we will uh, truss you up a bit and, and leave you to your meditations while I reflect sadly on a book that seems never to be written called The Bishop Goes to Bed. Come on, Gargoyle. Well, that's all the Vera's we got, Governor. Ain't three in one course enough? Too many. But uh, one Vera isn't here. That's right. She's off tonight. Uh, either of these two look like the picture of Simpson's Vera? Now you can't tell. They fixed those pictures up, Bishop. Well, thank you, Dorman. Here. Here's something for your trouble. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, uh, uh, wait a minute. Yes? I heard you asking about Vera. I only got a minute. I got to go on to the jungle number. Who are you? I'm a friend of Vera's. Uh... You ain't a cop, are you? No. Nah. No, nah, you don't look like it. Are you friends of Vera's? Yes, in a way. Uh, say, I uh, read about Simpson. Somebody knocked him off tonight. Yes, that's right. I told her she ought to watch her step. Snap Martin's been doing a burn about Simpson for weeks. Now I'm worried about her. Snap Martin, huh? Well, who is he? Don't you know him? He's a racket guy. Oh, yeah, I heard of him. Bad medicine. Well, he's been carrying a torch for Vera for months. She should have watched her step. Well, where is she tonight? I don't know. He's got a place up at Greenwich. Where in Greenwich? Stony Road, near the water. Oh, a country gentleman, huh? She's been up there. Say, maybe she's there now. You think something might have happened to her? Yeah, now that Simpson's knocked off, maybe the... Well, uh, I said enough. I I, I gotta go now. Uh, goodbye. Goodbye. Taxi, mister. Uh, head or tails, Gargoyle? Tails, if it's Greenwich. Tails it is. Oh, you wouldn't fool me, would you? Let me see that coin. Uh, I thought so. 
tails on both sides. Sure, Bishop. It's an open and shut case. Okay, taxi. Stony Road, Greenwich. The palatial mansion of Mr. Snap Martin. And easy on the bumps, Mac. The bishop is a heavy sitter. There's your dough. Okay, so long. Hmm. Pleasant place. Not the formidable hangout of desperate characters I expected to find. All right, that's movie stuff, Bishop. The boys are taking it big these days. Shall I lean on the button? Yes, a frontal attack is as good as any. Shall I unlimber the artillery? No. No, let's move with caution. Okay, we'll case the joint first. What you guys want? Ah, the butler himself. Wise guy, huh? There's nobody home. Scram. We want to see Snap Martin. Yeah? What for? About the murder of Chalmers Simpson. Oh, you do, do you? Well, come right in. We have an open house. Now, reach. Reach, Mug. Okay, okay. Don't shove that thing into my stomach. I get the idea. Come in here. Come on. Keep him up. Get over there. That way. Keep going. In there. Well, who are these guys? Visitors, Snap. Little guests. What do they want? They came all the way up to talk to you about a murder. Something about the murder of a guy called Simpson. Yeah? Go over them. Okay. Uh, this guy had one. Give it here. Are you Snap Martin? Yeah. I'm Bishop Morris. And that's the gargoyle. Yeah. Now, this is very interesting. Oh, that's a magnificent camellia there in the vase. I like it. I'm very fond of camellias. They don't have no smell. No. They couldn't stand the competition. Sit down. What do you want here? Well, first and most important, we want Jennifer Botts. Never heard of her. She was the woman you kidnapped out of my apartment tonight. Yeah? Yeah. How do you figure? Because you were the man with the yellow eyes. The man she saw come into the 89 Club last night and go off with her escort, Simpson. That was I was afraid of. You was right, boss. Yeah. It was nice of you guys to come up and tell me. What are you going to do with her? You just told me. She recognized my big yellow eyes, so we planned a boat ride. And you can go along, too. I see. Well, since that is settled, uh, couldn't we see her? Sure. Get the family together, Rocky. Yeah. Tell Vera to come down, too. We can't leave anybody behind. How is Vera, anyhow? What's it to you, Mug? How do you know Vera? Her picture was in Simpson's room. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just a passing fancy. Vera is very temperamental. Yeah, so temperamental she probably didn't tell you about the Charles Ruby which Simpson gave her. Huh? Say that again. And say it slow. The Ruby. The Charles Ruby. Yeah, yeah, I know about the rock. Where did she get it? Mr. Simpson gave it to her before he met Miss Bartz. Yeah? How did he get it? He stole it from his friend, Mr. Pincus, the curator of the museum. Mr. Simpson, Mr. Pincus, this is getting so it sounds like Mr. Martin ain't so well informed. Bishop. Oh, hello, my dear. Oh, dear me, I'm so glad you came. These men came after you left and smothered me. And here I am. Are you all right, Miss Jennifer? Yes, I, I guess I am. I'm kind of nervous. Ah, that's silly. There's nothing to worry about. Yeah, everything's going to be fine. Hello, darling. Oh, we... Oh, are we having a party? Yeah. We're having a party just for you. Who are they? Why, I've seen that girl before. It's Vera. Yes. She was at... With Mr. Simpson's party when I met him at the shooting gallery. The shooting gallery? This is very interesting. Isn't it? Yeah. Oh, baby, there's something I want to ask you. What's the matter, Snap? Something wrong? Yeah. Where's the ruby? What ruby? The ruby Simpson gave you. He didn't give me anything. What are you talking about? Rocky? Yeah? Go up and look through baby's junk. Okay. That gorilla ain't going to pour through my things. Sit down. Sit still. My goodness, I'm so excited. When I'm excited, I know my nose is shiny. Where's my pocketbook? Uh, oh, here. Oh, no, uh, that's not your pocketbook. This is your pocketbook. <laughs> Can't you see? Oh, but this is your... Oh, no, you're right. <laughs> when I get excited, I always take the wrong pocketbook. Yeah. Thank you so much. Come on, come on, cut out the little girl talk. Well, just a minute, Mr. Martin. Now, all we want is Jennifer Butts. Oh, I'll make a deal with you. Let her go, and we'll forget all about the whole incident. Sure, we will. 
We'll all take a nice little boat right and forget nothing, it. Nothing, ain't nothing like a ruby up there in baby's room. Of course not, sugar. You know me better than that. <laughs> what was Simpson to me? I thought I had that figured. What I didn't know about the ruby... Come on, hand it over. Hey, stop it, will you? Stop looking at me. I ain't got it. Hand over the pocket, but... Sure, there's nothing in it. Give it here. Nothing but junk. Oh, baby, I'm sorry. You're sorry? <laughs> Gee, what a fool I was to get mixed up with a cheap, suspicious rat like you. Now, listen, baby, listen to me. I'll make it up, but not right now. What's that? Get out there, Rocky. Gee, Bishop, look, it's Pinkus. Little tag along himself. More visitors. That's fine. Get away from that window, Lug. Sure, sure, don't get excited. Bishop, look, that little person at the window. <laughs> there, there, you didn't think I'd find you, did you, now? Now, where's my ruby? Why, you little twerp, I'm going to let you have it right now. My goodness, I did it. I shot Come you. on, Miss Jennifer. This is our chance to get out. Ah, scram, Pinky. There's another gorilla out there. I want, I won't go a step until I get my ruby. No, sir. Brother, you're a hero, but I ain't got time to argue. Come on, Gargo. Drag fingers along. We're headed for the boat. Hey, where's that dang with my pocketbook? Listen, you mugs, you don't get away without me. Oh, yes, we do. Get in there. <laughs> Here we go, Pinky. Pinky, back for our boat ride. <laughs> Dawn is beautiful out here. Yeah, it's pretty all right. Feel better now, Miss Jennifer? Yes, thank you. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry, Miss Botts, Jennifer. I meant to shoot that gangster person. Oh, that's quite all right, Mr. Pincus. I don't blame you. And when I saw you stand at the window there, I I was so thrilled I couldn't move. Were you, Miss Jennifer? Uh-huh. Oh, my goodness, if I hadn't failed. Why, Mr. Pincus, why did you fail? I think you're a hero. No, no, I'm ruined. The ruby is gone, my career, everything... I guess they'll send me to jail. Nah, they'll take it out of your salary, a million at a time. Well, perhaps they won't hold you responsible, Mr. Pinker. Oh, yes, yes, they will. There's no excuse, no. <gasps> oh, my goodness. Well, what's the matter, Miss Jennifer? Oh, I feel excited again. Where's my pocketbook? I want a pot of my nose. On your oh. lap, lady, on your lap. Oh, yes. Oh, now, let me see. Where's my pot of... Oh. Oh, dear me. I I do believe it is. Is, is this your ruby, Mr. Pinkus? Huh? Yes. Where did it come from? From Miss Vera. Oh, now I know why she gave me her pocketbook instead of mine. Goodness, she really loves that awful person, Snap. And she didn't want him to know she had the ruby. Wasn't that sweet? That was just dandy. Miss Jennifer, oh, my dear Miss Jennifer. Miss Jennifer, do you still want to have your fling at the stage? Oh, my, no. Uh, I've had all the drama I want for a lifetime. (laughs) Then perhaps Mr. Pincus has a, a solution. Good man, Pincus. Well, turn up the engine, gargoyle, and wipe that dreamy look off your face. Okay, Bishop. You know, the next time I pick up wandering school teachers, I'll get me a good night's sleep first. <laughs> school teachers are dynamite to me ever since I got kicked out of the second grade. <laughs> Bishop and the Gargoyle by Francis Wilson will be heard in another thrilling adventure next Sunday night at the same time. Our cast this evening included Richard Gordon as the Bishop and Kenneth Lynch as the Gargoyle, Walter Kinsella as Ryan, Elizabeth Morgan as Jennifer Botts, Charles Jordan as Snap, Johnny Gibson as Rocky, Arthur Allen as Pincus, Jean Ellen as Mary and Eleanor Audley as Vera. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine... Invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. You know, the lives of Holmes and Watson were not always filled with action. They spent many a quiet evening at home in Baker Street, discussing the problems of the world over a glass of port. You know, it seems that no wine is more expressive of friendship and hospitality 
than port. And I'm sure there's no port wine more enjoyable than Petri California port. Try a good glass of Petri port after dinner some evening, or any time you get together with your friends. You'll love the rich, ruby red color of that Petri port. You'll love its smoothness and full body. It's remarkable and wonderful flavor. A flavor that comes straight from the heart of luscious, hand-picked grapes. Serve that Petri port alone or serve it together with cake or cookies or with fruit. Yes, and serve it proudly. You can because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now I'm sure our old friend Dr. Watson's expecting us. Let's tap on his study door. Come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Come over here by the fire. I was just having a cup of coffee. Would you care to join me? Thanks, that'd be nice. Uh, it'll prevent you falling asleep during my story tonight. <laughs> There's no chance of that, Doctor. From the hints you gave us last week, it sounded like quite a story. It began in a circus in Paris, you told us? Yes, my boy, the circus. A colorful world of sawdust and spangles. A world, Mr. Bartell, that I may tell you confidentially, always held an irresistible fascination for me when I was a youngster. Me too, Doctor. In fact, when I was eight years old, I fell desperately in love with a, with a lady bareback rider. A stunning creature who wore pink silk tights with gold sequins on them. Unfortunately, my mother caught me writing her proposal of marriage... And I'm afraid that, uh, well, that's another story, and one that you probably wouldn't find very interesting. <laughs> I'm sure I would, Doctor, but I think it would be safer to stick to your Sherlock Holmes yes, story. Yes, you're probably right, my boy. Well, it was a winter in the 1890s, and Holmes and I were in Paris. On our second day there, Holmes suggested we attend that night's performance of the Cirque Royale. Needless to remark, I was delighted, Mr. Bartell. And shortly after nine o'clock that night... I found myself seated beside Holmes in a box near the ringside. It was an incredibly vivid scene, even for that city of color and light. The gay costumes of the women and the gaudy trappings of the ringmasters and clowns looked like a giant kaleidoscope under the blazing glare of the arc lamps. As we sat there, a brass band nearby blared forth some popular music of the day, and yet he didn't appear to be enjoying himself. And so I leaned across and touched his arm. Hmm. What is it, Watson? Well, you're very quiet, Holmes. Aren't you having a good time? A good time, oh, I suppose. Well, chap, I was just wondering where Mr. Edwards is. Mr. Edwards? Who, who's he? An extremely distinguished client who was to meet us in this box at nine o'clock. Oh, client. So oh, this little excursion was on business. After all, yes, I might have known it. No worry, old fellow. In your case, I think you'll be able to combine quite a little pleasure with the business. Well, can't you be a little more explicit, Holmes? Shh, shh. Here comes the ringmaster. La grande vedette du cirque, Mademoiselle Giselle Girondet, équestrienne incomparable. Giselle Girondet, yes, I've heard of her. She's a bareback rider, isn't she? Huh? Honest and France, old fellow. She also has quite a reputation as a femme fatale. Three duels have been fought over her. A young English officer in the Grenadier Guards committed suicide last year because of her. And a famous French banker is at present languishing in prison because her extravagances drove him to appropriate funds that did not belong to him. Yes, Watson, she's an extremely colorful personality. You know, Holmes, it's a funny thing. When I was eight years old, I fell violently in love with a lady bareback rider. She wore pink suit tights with golden sequins on them, but uh, unfortunately... Yes, she is, old fellow. Yes, she is. Look at the way she's jumping from the back of one horse to the other. Sheer poetry of motion. The lady appeals to Watson. By George, yes, indeed she does. In fact, Holmes, I don't mind telling you that if I weren't a married man and a yeah, poor you'd man... Yeah, you'd like to court the lady, eh? Uh, yes, I, I should Excellent, indeed. Excellent, fellow, excellent. That's the very reason for our attendance at the well, What in heaven's name are you talking about, Holmes? Ah, there you are. Good evening, Mr. Edwards. Holmes, my dear fellow, how are you? 
I haven't seen you since, uh, since that little affair at Windsor Castle when Mother... Uh, excuse me, sir. I am Mr. Mycroft and this is my friend, Sir William Nigel. William Nigel? Of course, of course. And I am Mr. Edwards. We must uh, respect each other's incognitos, eh? How do you do, Sir William? Oh. Uh... Well, I'm extremely honored to meet you, Your, your Royal, uh, 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 Mr. Edwards. How'd you like Giselle? Isn't she a stunning creature? Yes, indeed she is, sir. The four of us to have supper together after the performance tonight, I understand, Mr. Edwards. Well, unfortunately, I can't be there, Mycroft. There's some stupid affair at the embassy which I have to attend. We must postpone the dinner until tomorrow night. Oh, very well, sir. Uh, come over to my hotel a little early and we can discuss the whole business. Personally, I think a lot of fuss is being made about nothing. Now, if you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I must go back and see Giselle for a moment and tell her that I can't keep our appointment for tonight. I'll see you tomorrow, Mycroft. Good night, Sir William. Good night. Good night, uh, good sir. night sir. And maintenant, for votre plaisir, les frères Salini, les jongleurs internationales. Holmes, what's all this mystery? That wasn't Mr. Edwards, it was the Prince of... Shh, Watson, please. Discretion, old fellow. Mr. Edwards, as you know, is extremely democratic. Too much so, possibly, when one considers his position and responsibilities. He's become quite seriously involved with Mademoiselle Giselle, the lady bareback rider who has just left the ring. Oh, so that's it. The Foreign Office, quite naturally, I suppose, is deeply concerned over the matter. And I've been entrusted with the delicate mission of protecting Mr. Edwards. Oh, does Giselle Gironde know that his true identity, do you suppose? That's the first thing that we have to find out. It's possible that she is simply captivated by having a rich Englishman at her feet. If on other hand, uh, she knows who Mr. Edwards is, then we may be in for a great deal of trouble. Yes, but how are you going to find that out? By tempting her with a richer Englishman. And one with a title. That, my dear fellow, is why you are Sir William Nigel. You mean that... Uh, your I... job, old what? fellow, is to do your utmost to steal Giselle Gironde from Mr. Edwards. But, uh, well, I, I don't even know the girl. We shall remedy that defect in a few minutes. As soon as the performance is over, my dear chap, I shall take you to her dressing room and arrange an introduction. I must say, Holmes, the backstage life at a circus is even more colorful than in the ring. What makes you say that, old fellow? Well, I just saw Pinhead having tea with a, a bearded lady while a sword swallower was standing behind him practicing his act. Oh, hello. See that man standing talking to the girl in tights? Yeah, attractive, isn't he? Uh, the gentleman is Inspector Bernay of the French police, an old friend and a distant relative of mine. Bernay! How are you? Ah, well, <laughs> mon cher ami, comment ça no, no, va? No, 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 Bernay, please. On this occasion, my name is Mycroft, if you don't mind, and this is my friend, Sir William Nigel. How do you do, Inspector? Enchanté, Sir William. Uh, permit me to introduce Mademoiselle Yvette Marat. How you do? How do you do, Mademoiselle? How do you do? Uh, uh, what brings you behind the scenes at the circus, may I ask, Monsieur Mycroft? Uh, my friend, Sir William, is most anxious to make the acquaintance of Mademoiselle Gironde. But of course, every man wishes to meet Giselle Gironde. Why not ask Bernay? He will present you to her. Ha! In another way. Oh, now, Yvette, chérie, do not begin that all over again. You are in love with her. You have always been in love with her. I, I, I wish you were dead. Sometimes I... Sometimes I think I could kill her myself. <laughs> On my soul, Inspector, she's a fiery little thing, isn't she? Ah, ça c'est vrai, ça, Sir William. <laughs> Many times I've told her that Giselle Gironde would never waste her time with a simple police inspector. Uh, uh, she prefers a wealthy foreigner. But Yvette ne comprend pas. She does not understand and she does not believe. Mademoiselle Nara was dressed in tights, Berne. And what does she do in the circus? Uh, she walks the tightrope. Oh, She's yes, a queen of the high wire. Mm -hmm. A charming and a talented girl, but a most, most, most jealous one. Uh, Berne, my distinguished friend, Sir William Nigel, is most anxious to meet Giselle Gironde. Uh, will you introduce him? I should prefer not to appear on the matter at this stage. Oh, Miss Certainement. I, I will take you to her dressing room. Uh, please come with me, Sir William. Yeah, right. I'll, I'll see you later, Holmes. I'll be waiting for you, old chap. Good luck. Hey, uh, you're a lucky man, Sir William. Giselle has quite a penchant for the Englishmen. And when they are rich and have a title, I am sure she finds them irresistible. <laughs> you really think so? Oh, but of course. Ah, quel dommage that I'm only a poor policeman. Ah, uh, here we are. Entrez. Giselle, mon chou, permit me to present to you Sir William Nigel. 
He's a great admirer of yours. Yes, indeed, madam. Ah, Sir William Nigel. Come and sit here beside me, Sir William. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, shall leave you. Au revoir. Uh, sit closer. There. That is much more cozy, no? Oh, it's very nice of you to see me, Mademoiselle Gironde. Oh, don't <laughs> be so formal, my Englishman. You may call me Giselle, and I shall call you... Let me see, I shall call you Sir William... Na Willie! I shall call you Willie! You do not mind? <laughs> mind? I think it's very delightful. Quite delightful, my dear. I was hoping perhaps that you'd care to have a little, little supper with me tonight, Giselle. <laughs> Uh, so what about some, some oysters, a cold pheasant, and a bottle or two of Pomery and Green 072? Think it tastes rather well, don't you think? Oh, really? <laughs> I can see you are perfect. Oh, host. I don't know about One that. One more. I get my clock. Uh, well, you, you know, it, it, it's a funny thing. What is a funny thing, Willie? When I was eight years old, I fell violently in love with a, a lady bareback rider of a circus. History seems to be repeating its... Here. I feel Pierre. Do you no longer knock when you come to my door? Who is this man? My name is Nigel, Sir William Nigel, my good man. And who may you be? I am Alfio Alfieri. I am Alfio Alfieri. And what is he? Huh. A trainer of wild animals. An ambusier. What tongue? You must not speak to Alfio in that way. You belong to me. Send this stupid Englishman away. You found it impudent? Grossier. Belong to you. She said belong to no one. Do I have to take my whip uh, to put you? Put down that way. Put it down, you scoundrel. <laughs> That's the time it will be your face, Carl. You me. infernal blackguard. Raising your hand against a woman. Shocking. Bravo. Monsieur Willie has knocked him down. Uh, he certainly deserved it. Oui. And you in turn deserve something, Willie. Oh, what was that? Come close, Willie. And I give it to you. A little kiss. Oh, kiss? <laughs> Thanks awfully. <laughs> So strong, so resolute, so brave. Oh, it was nothing, my dear Giselle. Nothing at all here. More champagne, Gus. More champagne. Oh, really? Giselle? Oui, Monsieur Edwards? I have a box for the opera tomorrow night. I was hoping that perhaps... Oh, I'm sorry, monsieur, but my time is occupied. I am showing the delights of Montmartre to mon cher Willy. Mademoiselle est mieux le collier de perles à cinq rangs ou celui à trois rangs? He says, which do I prefer? The five-string color pearls or the three-string color pearls? What does my Willie think? So that you can't hang too many pearls on a pretty neck like yours. I'll take the five-string collar, my good fellow. You're doing splendidly, Watson, splendidly. Yes, but Holmes, I felt such a blasted fool handing that jeweler fellow a check. Signed by Sir William Nigel. Are you quite sure that it'll oh, be on Oh, don't worry, old fellow. Remember who our client is. Money is the least important concern in this matter. On with the masquerade, old fellow. On with the masquerade. More champagne, Gasson. Willie, you are such a headstrong boy. <laughs> More champagne. Citadel, you dear little thing. Oh, <laughs> Good evening, Bernay. Has Mademoiselle Gironde come into the evening performance yet? Yes, Monsieur Holmes. I escorted her to her dressing room an half an hour ago. Uh, Monsieur Edwards is in there with her now. At last, it seems, she has used for a poor policeman. Last night, she found a threatening letter on her makeup table. Since then, she has been most grateful for my company. A threatening letter, eh? Any idea who might have sent it? Oh, yes, of course. I'm afraid I have, Monsieur Holmes. Uh, I told her to pay no attention. Uh, by the perfume of the note paper, I recognized the sender. A jealous tightrope walker called Yvette Marat. Oh. <laughs> poor Yvette. She would make a very inferior criminal, I'm afraid. 
Still, Giselle asked me to stay outside her dressing room till the performance starts. Uh, uh, you wish to see her? Uh, yes. Oh, good evening, Mr. Edwards. Evening, Mycroft. Evening, Inspector Werner. Uh, come on, sir, I wish you Look here, Mycroft. I think this little game's gone far enough. Giselle has just refused another invitation of mine. Now, I know who Sir William Nigel is, and I swear I'll tell her. Uh, don't you think, sir, that the lady is hardly worth bothering about? Surely this whole incident with Sir William proves that she's a scheming little adventuress. A fictitious title and an apparently bottomless purse have shown her up in her true colors. <laughs> I could have told you the same thing without such an experiment, my friend. Well, I suppose you're right, Mycroft. I've been a fool. An idiot who lets a pretty ankle turn his head. A conceited dope. <laughs> Let us just say, monsieur, that you have been a man. Uh, good evening, sir. Oh, good hello, evening. Good evening. Uh, just going back to see Giselle for a moment, I brought us these flowers for her. Oh, I'll be back in a jiffy. Uh, just a minute, Watson. I, uh, I hate to dampen your ardor, old chap, but uh, the masquerade is ended. Ended? What, what do you mean it's It is no ended. longer necessary for you to impersonate Sir William Nigel or to pay court to Giselle. Oh, really? Oh, 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 really? Really? Well, that's a, that's a great relief, sir. Great relief. I've hated the whole business. Oh, yes, yes, I'm sure you have. Uh, we um, appreciate the sacrifices that you've made, don't we, Sir Edward? Yes, yes, indeed. Well, I must go back and see her once more, though. We had a rendezvous for tonight, and I must cancel it. A gentleman thing to do, you know. Um, I, I won't be a minute. <laughs> Never have I seen a man more downcast. Obviously, with him, my dear Holmes, business was a pleasure. Alfieri, where are you going? That Englishman. I just saw him go into Giselle's room. To whom are you referring? That the man that called himself Sir William Nigel. Oh, yes. Two days ago, he strike me. I have to settle with him. No man may strike Alfieri. Do not cause any more trouble, Alfieri. From what I've been told, you thoroughly deserved what happened uh, to you. Here he come now. You English, you... Alfieri challenge you to a duel. Holmes! Holmes! What's no chap? What is it? You're as white as a ghost. It's... It's Giselle. What's wrong with her? She's dead. She's lying there in her dressing room. Strangled. Strangled. And only half an hour ago I spoke with her myself. Since then I've been standing in this corridor, guarding your door at your own request. Only two men have entered Giselle's dressing room since then. You, Monsieur Edwards, and you, Sir William Nigel. What are you suggesting, Vernet? I am suggesting nothing. I am stating that these two gentlemen... I want to arrest for suspicion of murder. Dr. Watson's unusual story will continue in just a few seconds. Time I'd like to take to remind you that one wine that seems to be the outstanding favorite among the ladies is Petri California Muscatel. That's probably because, like a beautiful woman, Petri Muscatel is subtle and intriguing. Petri Muscatel is the color of burnished gold. And its flavor, well, it's the flavor of big, plump Muscat grapes. Picked by hand, carefully and tenderly, and they're just full of wonderful, delicious juice. If you want to show that you really know the wine that women prefer, serve Petri Muscatel. Serve it after dinner or later in the evening. It's wonderful. And why shouldn't it be? It's a Petri wine. Well, Dr. Watson, so you and the mysterious uh, Mr. Edwards got yourselves arrested on suspicion of murder, huh? Yes, Mr. Bartell. Holmes did everything in his power to persuade Inspector Vernet to release us, but it was useless. And so, while Mr. Edwards and myself were languishing in detention cells, the local Sûreté, Holmes, and the French inspector were examining the dressing room of the dead woman. I'm, in sh I'm sure, Inspector Vernet, that... Uh... Being as keen a detective as you are, you must suspect the true identity of Mr. Edwards. Of course, Mr. Holmes. But that is the danger of incognitos. If he chooses to assume the identity of play Mr. Edwards, then he must run the risks of play Mr. Edwards. And you are convinced that either he or my friend strangled Mademoiselle Gironde? It is obvious. Then I'll have to prove to you that they didn't. Let me examine the body again. No. If she had been strangled by either of my friends, why would her body be lying here under the window? It's as far away from the door by which they left this room as possible. That proves nothing. No, but it's odd. Giselle was a strong girl. Uh, there might easily have been a struggle. Uh, perhaps she tried to get away through the window. And yet there are no marks of violence on her throat. Just this piece of very fine cord that did its deadly work so cleanly. Mm -hmm. Cut with a knife. Uh, please do not remove the cord, Monsieur Holmes. The body has not yet been photographed. Jeremy Vernet, you're making it very hard for me, aren't you? Uh, you notice, of course, that the window is open. Yes, but we have examined the snow outside. 
There were no footprints within three yards of the window. The murderer must have entered by the door that I was watching. Yes, it would be hard, even for a professional acrobat to jump in. An acrobat? Bernie, your young friend, Mademoiselle Yvette Marat, is a tightrope walker. Yvette, but... Yes, yeah, she's certainly had a motive. She'd even sent a threatening letter. I heard her express hatred and jealousy for this dead woman. It's conceivable that she could enter a room by a window without leaving footprints in the snow. Where was she at the time of the murder? I do not know. I was waiting for her in the corridor. And I suggest that we investigate her alibi at once. And after that, Inspector, I must pay a visit to the Surte. I don't want my friends to think that I've deserted them. Excuse me, sir. Yes, Holmes. I'm afraid it looks rather black. As I was telling you, Yvette Marat, the tightrope walker was able to establish a completely satisfactory alibi. Vernet still suspects you or Dr. Watson. Well, that's ridiculous. May I ask you a very straightforward question, sir? Of course. I can well understand that if you had gone into the dressing room and found the woman already murdered, you might easily be tempted to conceal the fact, to avoid a scandal involving your person. Will you swear to me, sir, on your true identity, that Giselle was alive when you left her? She was, Holmes. I swear it. Thank you, sir. That's all I wanted to know. I'm glad to see you. You know, I've been thinking. All this depends on Vernet's evidence. But supposing he was the murderer. He told us that Giselle had turned him down, you know. I thought of that, but Mr. Edwards swears that Giselle was alive when he left the room. And yet that means that Mr. Edwards... Oh, no, 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 no. It's unthinkable. Holmes, you're not suggesting... Holmes, if I thought that that were possible, I'd confess to the murder myself. My life wouldn't matter if... If it had saved us cattle like that, great Scott, it it would shatter the empire. Dear old Watson, you will not sacrifice yourself. You're as valuable a British institution as the lion himself. No, my dear fellow. We shall never sacrifice you, not while my mind is still capable of... My mind? That's it. Thank you, Watson. You've given me the answer. Holmes, what are you burbing about Be patient, old fellow. In half an hour, you'll be out of this cell and the real murderer will be in it. Questions, questions. Why must Alfieri answer so many questions? Because he will not yet tell the truth. You murdered Giselle Gironde. How many times I have to tell you I did not kill her? Why should I want to arm her? Because you were jealous. Because she humiliated and tormented you. But I was not in her dressing room. I've already proved that fact. Am I a magician that I can kill somebody without entering a room? Alfieri, I know how you killed Giselle Gironde without its necessitating your entering this room. And you're a very smart man. Please, to tell me. I don't need to tell you. With the aid of Bernay, I'll show you. Open the window, Alfieri. Uh, What game is this? Very well, then. I'll open the window myself. Put your head out. Come on. So. Uh. Who do you see? Inspector Vernet, standing three yards away, where you stood, and he's got your long training whip. No, no! Don't move! Stand there, the inspector hasn't your skill with a whip, but he wants to try a little experiment. No, leave him alone! All right, Vernet, I'm holding him! Well, Mr. Edwards, I I mean, well, sir, this is a a pleasant change from a prison cell, isn't it? It certainly is. (laughs) Holmes, I can't tell you how grateful I am. I still don't quite understand how you did it. Watson, in uh, rather a roundabout way, was responsible for giving me the clue. Oh, how was that, Holmes? Well, on more than one occasion, old chap, I've had cause to deploy a rather florid style of writing. Tonight, I was very thankful for it. Uh, When I began to speak of the capabilities of my mind... Uh, Suddenly I remembered a phrase of yours in which you referred to uh, its whip-like rapidity and accuracy. That, of course, made me think of Alfieri, the animal trainer. Exactly how did he kill the poor girl? Uh, Well, sir, he stood outside the window, uh, far enough away to leave no incriminating footprints. Called to Giselle, probably persuaded her to lean out, then snapped the whip around her neck, pulling it tight and strangling her. And then I suppose he cut the cord and let the body fall back into the room. Precisely, old fellow. We found a whipstock among his tackle, a whipstock from which the lash had been cut. The stub of lash left matched the cord around the dead girl's throat. Amazing business. 
And I don't mind telling you, fellas, I'm very thankful to be through with it. Yes, so am I, sir. In fact, I wouldn't be at all surprised if this whole incident cures me of my love of circuses. Oh, I didn't know you had a predilection in that direction, Watson. Oh, oh, oh yes, sir. Yes, you don't mind my saying so. Uh, uh, when he was eight years old, he fell in love with a lady bareback rider. <laughs> didn't you, Watson? <laughs> Indeed. What happened? Well, sir, I, I don't remember her name, but she wore pink silk tights with the golden sequins on them. And I wrote her a rather hot-headed letter. Unfortunately, my mother... Well, Doctor, that was one of the most unusual stories you've ever told. And, and I might say you played a very prominent part in that case yourself. Oh, I suppose I did it. That, Mr. Bartell, Giselle was a beautiful girl. Beautiful. Boy, I sure love that nickname she gave you. Wheelie. Yes, I thought it was rather nice myself. Well, that is, uh, I, I, I mean... I... <laughs> Don't get embarrassed over a nickname, Doctor. You should hear the nickname I had. When I went to school, all the girls called me Bottles. Bottles? Oh, oh I see, from Bartell. Bartell? Bottle. <laughs> Some nickname, like a prophecy. What do you mean? Well, they called me Bottles, and now that's what I like to talk about most. Bottles. Bottles of Petri wine. Oh, I should have known. <laughs> and I'd like to talk about Petri wine because, as far as I'm concerned, it's the swellest wine that ever poured from a bottle. That's because the Petri family really knows how to make good wine. Well, they ought to. They've been making good wine ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And since the Petri family has always personally owned and operated their business, they've been able to keep that fine art of winemaking right in the family, handing it on down from father to son, from father to son, from generation to generation. So it's no wonder whenever you want a good wine, you want a Petri wine, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you going to tell us about next well, week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you of a strange adventure that Holmes and I had in the swampy Fenlands of Norfolk. Concerns a gypsy encampment, a child that vanished, and a horrible death in the murky depths of a fearsome quagmire. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Three Students. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. Wheat checks, rice checks, and good hot Ralston present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Visions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Harry, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol. In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy are being held in a cave on Pluto by two criminals who plan to dispose of them. Now the Commander and Happy have managed to get to a space phone in the cave. All the meters check, Happy. There's nothing wrong with the space phone after all. That's great. We can have a whole squadron of space patrol ships out here in a few minutes. This is an emergency call from Commander Corey to Pluto City Space Patrol Unit. Send ships to Sector G-18. Look for my ship, Terra-5, grounded near a steep bluff. Professor Walker, Cadet Happy, and myself are being held by... Look out, Commander! Take the warning! Use the radon quickly! I want to get Corey permanently! We'll return in just a moment with today's space patrol adventure... The Prisoners of Pluto. (laughs) 
Hiya, gang. This is Captain Zeke Tufel speaking. I'm just having myself a stroll down the street before I turn in for the night. Uh-oh, what's that light blinking in the window of that house across the street? Say, I'm going to investigate. That light's a signal, and it's a space patrol code system. It says, be sure to tell the boys and girls how to get a space patrol pocket projectoscope. Hey, that's a real projectoscope that boy's signaling with. Gang, I'm going to get him to tell you all about his projectoscope because you can have one, too. I thought that'd bring you running, Captain Tufeld. Come on in. Boy, am I glad I sent for this projectoscope. It's really something. Tell the gang all about it, Space Patroller. Well, kids, it's not only a keen signal light. You can use it as a film projector in a dark room. Watch me flash pictures with it on the wall, Captain. There. See that picture? That's a picture from a Space Patrol adventure called Mighty Meteor. And it comes with your projectoscope on a strip of film with three other swell stories called Space Pirates, Men from Mars, and Robot Invasion. And Buzz Corey and Cadet Happy are in them, too. And gang, on this one film, there are 24 different pictures. The projectoscope's a real flashlight, too. A flashlight in the shape of Buzz Corey's rocket ship. And it's a winner for looks. A neat six inches long, made of smooth, tough plastic, with four big tail fins and a one-inch radar antenna. Just think, a signal light, flashlight, film projector, and model rocket, all in one. Gang, to get an official Space Patrol projectoscope, complete with bulb, battery, and film, do this. Buy a box of rice checks or wheat checks, the cereals with a wonderful magic space picture on the inside. And then with your name and address, send 35 cents in coin and a rice checks or wheat checks box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. Don't forget your 35 cents. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. <laughs> And now, today's Space Patrol adventure, The Prisoner of Pluto. Commander Corey and Cadet Happy have been in Pluto City awaiting the arrival of Professor Malcolm Walker, who is from another city on this outer planet. Deeply concerned over the professor's failure to arrive, Buzz has ordered patrol ships to search the dark, constantly frozen surface of Pluto. Several hours later, Buzz and Happy join in the search, scanning rocky crags and valleys of frozen air with infrared probe rays from their ship Terra 5. Finally, Buzz sees the wreckage of a small lab ship at the base of a long slope. Now, in their spacesuits, Buzz and Happy are climbing the slope in order to investigate the wreckage. The ship doesn't look too badly damaged, Commander. Even a tiny hole in the hull would be serious damage here on Pluto, Happy. Unless Professor Walker managed to get into a spacesuit, the intense cold and lack of air would finish him in a few seconds. There doesn't seem to be any sign of life, sir. I don't see any lights in the ship. Let's get the hatch open. Focus your atomic light over here, Happy. Yes, Commander. I'll go in first, Happy. Be ready to open that first aid kit. If the professor's still alive, we'll have to work fast. It's ready, sir. Secure the outer hatch. Hatch secured, sir. Well, he's not in the control section. Want me to check the aft compartment, sir? All right. He may have sealed himself in after the crash. Hey, wait. What's this on the control panel? That looks like a note, Commander. Hold your light on it. Ship crash. Due to instrument failure, space phone equipment damaged by crash. I am not hurt. Two hours after crash, I thought I saw a flash of light due west. Since rescue at this position is unlikely, I have gone to investigate source of light. I shall appreciate finder of this note relaying this information to Commander Corey of the Space Patrol, who is now in Pluto City. I am carrying a projector scope and an atomo light. Professor Malcolm Walker. Professor Walker should have stayed with the ship. Yeah, it's good to know he wasn't hurt. I wonder what caused that flash of light he saw. There's nothing out here in this part of Pluto, unless another search ship has landed here. I'd be the light was probably a reflection in the frozen air that covers the ground, a reflection from a ship far above this planet. Well, if Professor Walker took an atomic light with him, it shouldn't be too hard to find. Let's get back to our ship, Happy. We can head due west, low altitude, and see if we can locate him. Right, sir. First, just to prevent any further wild chases all over Pluto, I'll add to this note the event he returns here. I'll ask him to remain... Just a minute. There he is on the sled, just like I told you on the space phone. Found him unconscious, almost tripped over him in the dark. All right. Let's lift him out of this airlock. Uh, say, didn't you chop any more frozen air, Orman? Oh, that first little will hold us until we find out who this guy is. Just set him down here. 
Well, anyway, he isn't with the Space Patrol. His yeah, suit says United Planets Research Foundation. Mm. What kind of a research would he be doing out here? His eyes are open now, Hagel. Open his face, please. We'll find out who he is. Wait, Roman. Chances are he's just lost. If we didn't arouse his suspicion, we can keep him here until our supply ship arrives next week without any trouble. But then what? Then we will turn him over to the boys. They can get rid of him out in space. Okay. All right. Open the face piece, and I'll do the talking. Just take it easy, my friend. We'll have you out of that space suit in a moment. Thank you. My heating unit went out. I guess I'm lucky you found me. <laughs> you certainly are. Uh, how do you happen to be on this part of Pluto? My lab ship crashed a mile or two from here. Mm -hmm. I'm Professor Malcolm Walker with the United Planets Research Foundation. Mr. Um... Uh, Hagel. I'm a geologist. I see. I wonder if you would let me use your space phone to contact a friend of mine in Pluto City. He's probably worried about me. Well, as a matter of fact, we're having a little trouble with our space phone transmitter. As soon as my partner can repair it, we'll be glad to let you send a message. Thank you. Of course, it may take several days. Several days? Yes, yes, you see... We don't have much spare equipment here, but our regular supply and relief ship should be here in about a week. You will be able to go back with them. Well, it's rather inconvenient. And look. But what am I complaining about? Here I am, recently saved from certain death, and I'm fretting about spending a few days in a warm cave with congenial companions. <laughs> I understand exactly how you feel. Oh, by the way, was my projector scope signal light on when you found me? Uh, signal light? Uh, no, just the regular Atomo light. And it was turned on. Oh, good. And there may be a chance that a search ship will see the other light. I remember dropping it just before I collapsed. I'm afraid I was so numb with cold that I don't remember exactly. You had a signal light? Yes. As I said... I but... see. Uh, Professor, if you'll come with me, I'll get you something to eat. I'm sure you must be quite hungry after the ordeal you had. If you just go into the next room and make yourself comfortable... Uh, right through the door. I'll be right in. Thank you, Mr. Hagel. I'm most grateful. Oh, you're entirely welcome. Oh, uh, Roman, could I speak to you for a moment? Yeah, Hagel, what is it? Well, I'm afraid you'll have to go out again and get some more air, after all. Go out there again? Yes, please. Well, the old fool has dropped the signal light. You will have to find it before a search ship spots it. Now get going. A oh, signal light, that's all we need. Yeah, hurry. Uh, I'll prepare a snack for our guest. There's not a sign of anybody down there, sir. Keep your eye on the viewscope, Happy. The professor couldn't have gone much farther than this on foot. He'll circle back and cover the area again. He may not have headed due west after all, sir. Couldn't the infrared beam have picked him up by now? Unless he's fallen into a crevice. Yeah. yeah then that would account for our not seeing the lights he said he was carrying. It doesn't look too good. We better send him for more search ships. Space upon Pluto City, Happy, but still keep an eye on the viewscope. Yes, sir. Get it, Happy, aboard Terra 5, calling Pluto City Space Patrol. Get it, Happy. Now, hold on a minute, Happy. Check your transmitter setting. Yes, sir. Seems all right to me. Oh, oh, I forgot about the new double scrambler circuit. You were on two frequencies, Pluto City and Terra Headquarters. Yeah, I'll have to watch that. Terra would probably wonder why we were bothering them with a the Pluto search problem. The double scrambler is a good security measure, Hap. You can send the same message in two different codes, and no outsider listening in can tell if the same message is being sent. Now, well, I've got it set for Pluto City alone now, Commander. Fine, Hap. Smoke and rockets. There's a projector scope light, Commander, down there on the ground. That must be Professor Walker's life. Happy, hold that call until we can land and do some investigating. All right, Commander. Why doesn't he turn it back on? He must have seen our ship lights. Well, got a rough check on the location. Couldn't be difficult to find it now. Well, that didn't take you long. Any luck, Roman? There's a professor. He's in the next room meeting. I found the light. It's oh. fallen into a narrow fissure on the rocks. Was it down? Yeah. It's pointing downward. I doubt if it could have been seen from his ship. Certainly had a close call at that. What do you mean? Well, just as I was picking up the light, I caught a glimpse of a spaceship's light over to the north. Quickly shut off the light. Are you certain they didn't see the light? I'm almost certain. They'd have had to be looking right at it. Anyway, they wouldn't see anything out there now, even with their brightest atomic search beams on. You're right. They never see the airlock opening unless they landed and stood right in front of it. That was a delicious supper, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Oh, you're quite welcome, Professor. Uh, now, if you'll come with me, I'll show you. Well, 
You won't give us any trouble for a few hours. You sleep? Yeah. Dropped off the moment he laid down. Look, Hagel, why can't we get the supply ship here quicker? We can space phone him tonight. That would be pretty stupid, Rorman. With search ships flying around this area, in a week they'll have given out the search. Then it will be safe for the supply ship to land. Oh, I'm sick of hiding out in this cave. We've been here ten months. Surely the space patrol isn't still looking for us after all that time. Well, I'd rather be here than in some space patrol detention center undergoing suspended animation. Yeah, I'd like to know how this differs from suspended animation. Listen, you hear that? Sounded like somebody in the airlock. Hagel. Look. Sorry if we startled you. I'm Commander Corey of the Space Patrol. <laughs> yes, Commander. We were startled. You see, we weren't expecting company. We're looking for Professor Walker. Professor Walker? Why, there is no one here but my partner and myself. Professor Walker's lab ship crashed near here. Yeah, we found a note that it was headed in this general direction. Oh, and he probably went right on past our airlock. <laughs> we often miss it ourselves. I don't imagine he's very far away. You're sure you haven't seen him? Oh, no. no we haven't seen anyone. Have we, uh, uh Mr. Evans? No. no. No, of course not. Well, in case you hear anything about him, would you please notify the United Planets Research Foundation? The United Planets Research Foundation? I see. If you forget the name, you'll find it engraved on this projector scope you have here on the table. Projector scope? This one, Mr. Hagel. Hagel? I didn't believe I told you my name. You didn't. You looked familiar to me when I first came in. I just recalled where I'd seen your picture. And where was that, Commander? We have a method of remembering faces we see in the Space Patrol wanted files. I don't believe I understand. Well, it's very simple, but I'm not going to explain it now. If Professor Walker isn't here and you haven't seen him, how do you happen to have his projector scope? Roman, get them. Commander! Here we are, Cadet. Nice work, Roman. When I saw the commander edging toward the projector scope. I couldn't grab it in time. Oh, it's probably just as well. Corey and the cadet have forced our hands. Now we'll have to play it safe. Plug them up. We'll get rid of them and the professor, too. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Hi, gang. This is Captain Dick Tufel speaking from the Interplanetary School Stadium on Terra. I just saw a swell baseball game here. Listen to that crowd cheer the winners. Yes, it sure is fun when you're a winner. And here's something like that. But remember, to be a winner, you have to get supercharged. And here's the way to take care of that. Eat a good breakfast with rice checks or wheat checks, the bite-sized super cereals that help to supercharge you. Delicious! And there's plenty of <coughs> zing in that rice checks flavor. And man, oh man, rice checks biscuits are toasted and toasted to make them crisper and crisper. And wheat checks. Ah, there's a flavor you'd fly to the moon for. Now, gang, remember, it's fun to be a winner and hear this. So move right up and be a winner. Move right up to the breakfast table or the breakfast that supercharges you. A power breakfast with the super cereals, rice checks or wheat checks. The cereals with Buzz Corey or Cadet Happy on the outside. And the wonderful magic space picture on the inside. <laughs> And now back to today's Space Patrol adventure, The Prisoner of Pluto. Buzz Corey and Cadet Happy have been led to a secret cave on the dark, frozen planet Jupiter by a projectoscope signal lamp dropped by Professor Walker when he collapsed in his spacesuit near the cave airlock. Confronted by the commander, the two criminals, Hegel and Rorman, first denied they had seen the professor. But when Buzz discovered the professor's telltale projectoscope, the two fugitives rendered Buzz and Happy helpless with a paralyzer ray gun. Now, still under the effect of the paralyzer rays, Buzz and Happy have been carried to a cave room next to the one in which Professor Walker lies sleeping. Okay, come on, let's get going. Paralyzer's ray out to hold them for another half hour. That'll be plenty of time. Did you hear that, Happy? Yes, Commander. Try moving your arms and legs. I've already tried, sir. The paralyzer ray seems to have worn off. Good. The spacesuits protect us from the full effect. Let's try to locate a space phone and alert Pluto City. How about the space phones in our spacesuits? Remember, we're inside a cave. A long distance from Pluto City, the signal won't carry. Oh, that's right, sir. Well, well Hagel does have a space phone in here. We'll search the cave first and find Professor Walker. Then we'll see what we can do about a space phone. Professor? Professor Walker? Well, wake up, Professor. Uh, fine. What's going on? 
Who are you? I'm Commander Corey of the Space Patrol. Hmm? Of course, sir. Commander, am I still in the cave? Yes, Professor, you are. Yeah, that's a relief. I'm afraid I owe Mr. Hegel and Mr. Rohrman an apology. You do? Yes, sir. For a brief moment a while ago, I, I suspected them of trying to keep my presence here a secret. <laughs> isn't that ridiculous? I suppose it was due to my fatigue and fear after cracking up. Now listen, Professor, there isn't much time. Your suspicions were correct. Hegel and Warman are criminals. What? The Space Patrol has been searching for them for months. You happened to stumble on their hideout. And you captured them? Not yet, but we will. We'll need your help. Where's the Space Patrol? Space Patrol? They told me it was out of commission. Well, I'll bet they've got a space phone around here somewhere. And in good working order, too. But we'll check. Professor, better get your space suit on. Be ready to move out of here in a hurry. I certainly will, Commander. If you're unhappy, we'll try to locate Hager. Good day, stuff down here. We can store it away later. Okay, Hagel. <coughs> Say, this is a real hole. We got quite a load of supplies out of that ship, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, we sure did. Now, let's get the three of them and put them on Corey's ship. Uh, have your ray gun handy. We may have to give them another blast. All right. <laughs> Are you sure you can make the ship crack up look like an accident? Oh, just leave it to me. We'll take Corey and the cadet to the ship first. Then come back for the professor. Wait. Well, uh, I hear voices in the space of phone here. Be quiet. I'm going to open the door. All of you Emergency from Commander Corey to Pluto City Space Patrol. Send a patrol unit to Sector G18. Look for my ship, Terra 5, grounded near Steep Bluff. Professor Walker, could then happen myself for being held captive? Roman, first them with the ray gun, quickly! Uh, that takes care of them. Switch off the space patrol. We got to get them to the ship in a hurry now. Space Patrol, Pluto City, calling Commander Corey. Message received. Hegel, I heard you. Hmm? We have established a fix on your location in Sector G-18. Rescue ships will be dispatched immediately. Space Patrol Unit Pluto City out. Confound it! Hey, what are we going to do now? We can't wreck for his ship. Those rescue ships would eventually locate the cave. We contact Jackson and Trask. Maybe they can get here before the Space Patrol arrives. We can do better than that. We can get away from here in Corey's ship. Yeah, but who's going to pilot it? Where will we go? You don't know Astrogation, neither do I. Oh, I can't get it spaceborne. After we're off Pluto, we'll wait till Corey and the cadet come out of the Reagan effect. Then we'll force them to take over and take us to Mars. Yeah, but what about the professor? Well, if we take Corey, we'll have to take Walker, too. He'll be a good protection for us in case we're intercepted before Corey revives. All right. Let's get him into Corey's ship. It won't take long for the patrol ships to get here. We'd better be gone. Happy? Happy, are you awake? Yeah, I mean, yes, sir. Hey, where are we? Aboard Terra Prime. Commander, you got us off Pluto. Well, the last thing I remember we were, was having Hegel and Roman surprise us when we were using the space phone. How did you manage to get us away? I'm afraid I didn't. Hegel and his partner put all three of us aboard our ship. Oh, yeah. Commander. Uh, yes, Professor? I uh, don't suppose you know where they're taking us? No, I don't. You? To Mars. They were talking after they used the ray gun on you and the cadet. To Mars? Why would they risk discovery by blasting off in my ship? Well, you see, the Pluto City Space Patrol unit replied that they had established a fix on the cave and were going to send rescue ships immediately. What? I don't see how that's possible. Hegel and Rohrman got us before we established contact with Pluto City. Besides, they couldn't have plotted a fix that fast. It was my voice they heard. Your voice, Professor? Yes, sir. I saw them watching you, and I, I knew they'd never let you complete the call, so I used the transmitter in my spacesuit to make them think you'd succeeded. Perhaps it wasn't such a good idea. I'm not so sure. At any rate, it was very quick thinking, Professor. But it didn't have the effect I hoped it would. I thought perhaps if they thought their position was hopeless, Hegel would surrender without harming us. Well, at least it got us off Pluto, Professor. Yeah, but we're still their prisoners. Well, we've still got a chance. So I hear somebody in the next compartment. Oh, you come out of it, eh? Come on, Commander. You and the cadet have work to do. And if we refuse? Roman and I can easily find a way to change your mind. All we want you to do is to plot an astrogation vector that'll take us to Mars. Can't you do it? I wouldn't be asking you if I could. There's a lot about this ship that I don't understand. And listen, Corey, don't try any tricks. I'll know Mars when we're close enough to see it. And don't forget, whatever happens to this ship happens to you, too. All right, Hegel. Okay, up to the control compartment, then. Professor, you'll stay here.
All right, Hagel, there you are. We're on automatic control now. You ought to reach Mars at about 2300 universal star time. And you swear the director you said keeps us off the regular space lane? I said it did, didn't I? I'm going to watch the view scope, Corey. And if another ship appears following us, you'll regret it. Well, can we help it if, if somebody sees us accidentally? It'll be up to both of you to avoid that accident. Yeah. Now look, Corey. I want my men to meet us on the Martian plane and pick us up there. Turn on that space phone so that I can contact them. And no fix on this either. I don't know how this thing works, but I do know when the scrambler circle is set to the right combination. And which one is that? Scrambler code 31567. Now set it. All right. That's it. Now cut on the transmitter. This is Hagel calling Jet Trask at Saturn City. Hagel calling Jet Trask at Saturn City. I hope he and Jackson are near the receiver. Hagel, spaceborne out of Pluto, calling Jet Trask at Saturn City. Maybe Corey's trying something. Fun. Space phone's on, don't worry. Hagel to Trask. Trask here. Go ahead, boss. Uh, Trask, listen carefully. I got a job for you. How did you get off Pluto? I thought Just you were... listen. I want you to take a ship and meet me on the Martian plane, Sector 5G. We'll be there at about 2300 Universal Star Time. Got it. I'll be there. I'll be aboard Commander Corey's space battle cruiser, the Terra 5. What? Hey, listen, are you making a deal with Corey? Don't be a fool, Trask. If I were double-crossing you, would I use Corey's ship? I've got Corey and his cadet and Professor Walker here at the Ray Gun Point. Okay, Hagel. I'll pick you up at Sector 5G, Martian plane at 2300 hours, Universal Star Time. All right, Trask. Hagel out. Cut it out, Corey. Roman. Take Corey and the cadet back to the compartment. Won't bring them out again when it's time to land on Mars. Nice landing, Corey. And now this is where we say goodbye. Yeah, we'll miss you. You won't miss a thing from now on. Yeah, this is it. For all three of you. Uh, let's finish them before press land so we won't waste any time getting away from them. There's just one thing I want to do first, Hagel. Yeah? What is it? This! My uh I'm happy while they're off balance. Well, I guess that takes care of our friends, sir. Get their weapons, Happy. Foreman, why didn't you watch Corey? How did I know he was going to jolt the ship with a rocket blast? Anyway, maybe Taz can help us. That's right, Corey. Alert, you gave the ship. We'll tip him off that something's wrong. He'll get us out of this. I think you'll find that Trask is having troubles of his own. Have a look in the view scope. Space patrol ships. That's right. Where did they come from? You told them where to find us, Hagel. I did? Yes. When you were talking to Trask on one scramble frequency, the same message was being sent out on the regular space patrol emergency frequency. Pappy, take them back out and lock them up. And ask the professor if he cares to join us. Right, sir. All right. Come on, you two. Be our guests for a change. <laughs> An action preview of next week's exciting space patrol adventure in just a moment. And now, gang, here's Cadet Happy to tell you how you can have fun ten different ways with that swell new Space Patrol projectoscope shaped like a rocket ship. Number one, show pictures on the wall with it. Two, use it as a flashlight. Three, give signals with it at night. Four, hide secret messages inside of it. Five, play Space Patrol with it. Six, light it in a dark room. Looks like a rocket flying at night. Seven, wire it on your bike for a new and different kind of ornament. Eight, Keep it to dress up your room. Stand straight up on its tail fins. Nine. Keep it by your bed at night. Comes in mighty handy. And ten. Take the bulb and battery out and use it as a roomy pocket case for marbles, jacks, money. Yes, sir, gang. The projectoscope is lots of fun. And it comes to you complete with bulb, battery, and film for showing pictures on the wall. To get a projectoscope, do this. Buy a box of rice checks or wheat checks. Then, with your name and address, send 35 cents in coin and a rice checks or wheat checks box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in the USA and may be withdrawn at any time. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy are investigating a space factory revolving in an orbit around the planet Venus. Suddenly, they find themselves locked in a freight-handling chamber room, floating in the middle of the room. Trowbridge has cut the artificial gravity field. We're completely weightless. Well, how are we going to get down to the floor? Where... Oh, my head. Smoke and rockets come out of We fell up. 
up to the ceiling. There's the floor down there below us. Drawbridge reversed the gravity field. The pull in this room is toward the ceiling. Well, now how are we going to get down to the floor? We'll get down to it all right. The hard way, I'm afraid. Drawbridge will reverse the gravity field from floor to ceiling till he breaks every bone in our bodies. Be sure to listen next Saturday for the exciting story, The Venus Space Factory, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! Special bulletin for boys and girls in Springfield, Illinois, Terre Haute, Indiana, and Washington, D.C. Buzz Corey's own space battle cruiser, the Ralston Rocket, will be in your area next week. Don't miss it, the Ralston Rocket! Boys and girls, this is your commander speaking. Help science help you. Give every nickel and dime you can to the American Cancer Society. Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Ken Mayer, Norman Jolly, Bela Kovach, and Stephen Robertson. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol. And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol program on your local ABC TV station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. Space Patrol came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Hey, Tom. Tom Crabtree. Yes, Lucy. Sit up and pay attention. Listen to what the man's saying. Ladies and gentlemen, at home with the Crabtrees, starring Verna Felton and Joe Kern. <laughs> Be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. But in the case of the Crabtree home... How humble can you get? <laughs> Let's take a look at it. We go up Main Street to Elm, cross the railroad tracks, and four blocks after the sidewalk stops, there it sits. The fence needs painting, the house needs painting, even the paint needs painting. <laughs> but to the crab trees, it's home sweet home, where happiness reigns supreme and never is heard a discouraging word. Well, almost never. Take this morning, for instance... Tom woke up with a big smile on his face, hummed a little tune, and went into the kitchen for breakfast. Lucinda, as usual, was already there. Oh, morning, Lucy. Morning, Tom. How about pouring me some of that coffee, huh? Oh, that's it. Now the sugar. About three teaspoons should do it. That's fine. A little cream now. Thanks. Say, looks a little hot, Lucy. Will you blow it for me? No, listen here, Tom Crabtree. No. I don't mind a pour in it and a sugar in it and a cream in it. But jumping, gee, hoss of hat, I draw the line at blowing it cold for you. Oh, why, Lucy? Why, Lucy, nothing. They no effort for you to blow your coffee. Uh. All you got to do is... Breathe out and see that it's aimed right. Yeah. <laughs> For land's sake, Lucy, you seem a little touchy. I ain't seen you so upset since you got out of the wrong side of the bed last week and fell through the hole in the floor. <laughs> now, just as soon as I have a little sip of this coffee, I'll... <coughs> <coughs> What'd you do to that coffee? Stronger than a hog collar's Adam's apple. <laughs> well, I didn't expect it to be too tasty. Considering I made it out of the water I cooked the cabbage in last night. <laughs> out of what you cooked the cabbage in? Yeah. Lucy, you feeling all right? Sure ain't like you to go and make coffee out of cabbage squeezins. I know. And it ain't like the water company to go and shut off people's water. But they done it to us. They shut off our water? You heard me. Now, how could they have done a thing like that? Well, I don't know. Twisted a valve, I guess. <laughs> I tell you, Tom Crabtree, it's a terrible state of affairs when a man can't pay his water bill. Mm. So help me, things have oh, gone too far. Oh, now, Lucy, it's relax. A, 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 we don't a, a, have to worry about that old water company. I've been planning to dig a well. 
<laughs> For ten years, you've been planning to dig a well. Mm-hmm. Like you've been planning to fix the kitchen door so the hens can't get in the house. <laughs> well, what's wrong with hens in the house? Nothing. Except for me, every morning it's Easter. <laughs> Eggs all over the place. I don't know whether to sweep with a broom or a frying pan. <laughs> all right, so I'll fix the door right after I dig the well. And when'll that be? Next year? In the meantime, we got no water. What'll the neighbors say? What'll everybody else think? Huh? Morning, Ma. Uh, uh, oh, hi, Willowell. Hello, daughter. What's the matter with the water this morning? Uh, oh, uh, I guess the uh, water company's resting its pipes. <laughs> yeah, you know how it is. You just gotta rest them now and then, you know. Oh, I see. How much do we owe them? Oh. Uh, $6.84. Oh, but don't you fret, honey. We'll pay them this afternoon, and they, they'll turn it on again in time for you to get scrubbed up pink as a radish for the high school dance tonight. Mm-hmm. Oh, that old thing. Well, who's worried about that? Well, I'm not even going. What? Not going to the dance. Listen here, Luella. If none of them young buckaroos has asked you, I'll go right down there and I'll tell oh, them a thing. Oh, I've been asked by two of the nicest boys in my class. Oh, of course she's been asked. A pretty girl like Luella doesn't have to worry about that. Yeah. I might have known she was popular. Oh, <laughs> just like I was. Oh. Yeah, back in my grammar school, the three R's for me was rooting, wrestling, and romance. <laughs> <laughs> I tell oh, you, I was a little serious. The only reason any gal looked at you in grammar school was to see whether you'd shaved. Oh. <laughs> If two of the boys has asked you, I don't see why in tarnation you're not going. Oh, who cares about dancing? It, it's just kid stuff. Just a bunch of youngsters with a lot... Oh, gosh, I'd better be going. I'm supposed to meet Janie before school. We have some important things to talk about. Oh, well, wait a minute. How about breakfast? No, thanks, Ma. I'm not hungry. Well, now, what's they eating her? I don't know. When a crab tree skips breakfast, there's got to be something mighty wrong somewhere. All week she's been talking about that dance. And now all of a sudden she... Oh, oh, oh. Don't... look who's coming up the path. The huh? bean pole that walks like a woman. <laughs> well, it's Mrs. Trilby. Yeah, old skinny and ornery. Well, here now, you tidy up a bit, Tom. Hmm? Either take your feet off the table or put your shoes on. Oh. <laughs> but that old skin... Come in. Good morning to you, Lucinda. Uh, howdy, Matilda. Hi, Mrs. Trilby. Oh, are you here, Mr. Crabtree? My husband left the house an hour ago to go to work. I'll thank you not to use that kind of language around here. <laughs> well, have a seat. No, no, not that one. Over here on the bench. If you slip through the cracks, you won't have far to fall. <laughs> Well, Trilby, what's the gossip from over the back fence this morning? Mr. Crabtree, I'll have you know I don't gossip over the back fence. <laughs> Got a front fence now? <laughs> Mr. Crabtree. That'll be enough, Tom. Mm. How have you been, Matilda? I'm fine. Just thought I'd drop by on my way to town. I'm uh, going to the Raycraft apparel store. Oh, going to make a copy of one of the dresses so you can make one up, huh? No, I'm going down to buy one already made. You're getting a store bought and dress? Oh, heavens to Betsy. Must be a mighty special occasion. Yeah, what's up? You getting married again or you're planning to die? <laughs> Neither. Too bad. Both ways, it's a tough break for your husband. <laughs> the new dress I'm getting happens to be for my daughter. Mary Ann is going to the high school dance, you know. And, of course, you know how important a new dress is. Oh, we, of course, do. Yes. <laughs> uh, you, of course, are getting Luella a new dress for the dance, aren't you? Oh, y- y- yes. Sure. In fact, uh, we bought her two to wear to the dance. <laughs> Yeah, that square dancing is pretty strenuous, you know. If the top dress gets mussed up, she can peel it off and be all decked out in the one underneath. Goodness, wouldn't the one underneath be just as must? Well, a girl can carry an iron in her purse, can't she? 
Mr. Crabtree, I, no doubt, am being joshed. And you, no doubt, ain't so quick to catch on, either. Huh. Well, I'd better be going. Uh, see you later, Lucinda. Uh, so long, Matilda. Good day, Mr. Crabtree. It was, but you haven't helped it any. <laughs> so that's what's bothering Luella. All the other girls at that dance are going to have new dresses. She didn't want to come right out and say it. Yeah. But you can bet your boots that's why she's not a-going. Lucy, I think you're right. Of course I'm right. When have I ever been wrong? Yeah. <laughs> she's going to that dance, and she's going to have the prettiest dress she ever did see. Now you're talking. It'll be something frilly and yellow with little doodads all over you it. You bet your life with buttons and bows and a belt in the back. <laughs> It'll be one of them there originals. Oh, uh, you tell them, kid. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, hey, Lucy. Yeah? How are we going to pay for this here dress? We can't even pay the water bill. Yeah, there's always that, ain't there? Listen, by gosh, I'll get the money. You'll get the money. Uh, you're darn right. I'll sell all my valuables. I'll, I'll put everything I own in hawk. What have you got that'll bring more than two dollars? All right. I'll, I'll kill myself. That's what I'll do. Then you can collect my insurance money. You ain't got no insurance. <laughs> okay. If it's got to be, it's got to be. I'll go to work. <laughs> oh, no, Tom. Oh, no, not that. You don't realize what you're saying. I won't have you doing something you'll be regretting the rest of your life. I know, but principles be hanged. When my little girl's wanting a new dress, well, by gum, I'll do anything to get it. Never let it be said that a crab tree... Tom, wait a minute. I finally decided. I'm going to kill two birds with one stone. You going to make the dress out of feathers? <laughs> no, I'm not going to make the dress out of feathers. But this is the big emergency, ain't it? And I've been preparing for one... I got me some money saved up. No. Yep. Hand me the sugar bowl up there. Huh? I got ten dollars in it. Ten dollars in the sugar bowl. Well, what do you know? Oh, Lucy, you're the one, all right. I tell you, whenever we're in trouble, you always come through. Yep, Lucy, no doubt about it. You're... Well, you're... Just, uh, like I say, you... Well, you... Oh, stop. But see, uh, you are. Yeah, and you're, you're, you're pretty, too. Oh, go on. You're just the same. Oh, man. you're the prettiest girl I ever saw. Oh, Tom, you're fibbing. Sure, but who cares as long as it makes you happy? <laughs> you. Now, you get going into town. Here's the money. Hmm. Pay the water bill and get two yards of taffeta trimming. Okay. I think it's a... Lucy, sort of, uh, uh, no, hold everything. Yeah? I just got one of my brilliant ideas. What? Now, maybe we can buy Luella a new dress after all. Yeah. Now, if I was to drop by and see Joe Longfoot, borrow some money from him... Borrow some money from Joe Longfoot? Sure. You keep away from that engine. He's a no-good bum. Oh, now, Joe's a friend of mine, Lucy, and I won't have you talking that way about him. Besides, he's a very wealthy man. Gets a big royalty check every month from the government for his oil lands. Why, he can buy and sell most of them senators back there in Washington. Who wants to buy a senator? <laughs> I tell you, he's bad news for you, carousing and gambling and taking your money or playing poker. Oh, now, Lucy. You get a hold of some money and he can smell it a mile away. <coughs> Never see the likes of it. Why, he must just... Uh-oh. Uh Come in. Oh, Tom. Ha, <laughs> ha, well, if it ain't Joe Longfoot himself. <laughs> oh, Lucy. I've often wondered. <laughs> well, how you been, Joe? Can't kick. That's good. That's bad. Got him sore foot. <laughs> Too bad. Here, uh, got him letter from son in college. Oh, guess you want me to read it to you, huh? Ugh. Well, excuse me. Got to go and see what color trimming I need to get on the... Well, Joe... Sent your son any presents lately up there at the college? Yep. Sent him a little trinket other day. Oh, a little trinket, huh? Yep. Thing me saw in store. Call him Cadillac. <laughs> Some trinket, I'll say. Well, I'll get on with the letter here. Let's see. My bifocal suggested. It says, Dear Chief, Hope this finds you well and happy. Thanks for the Lincoln converter. Hey, I thought you sent him a Cadillac. How come he thanks you for a Lincoln? That last week. That last week. <laughs> oh, 
I see. Yeah. Well, it goes on to say... Never mind. Two mix-up. Let her make more good sense when we read them in Kelly's saloon. Let's go for little snort. Hey, Tom. Uh, no, Joe, no. I, I can't do her. I, uh, I uh, got to go to town. I got some important stuff to do. One little snort won't hurt him. Uh, no, no, sorry, Joe. No, not today. Do you feel him all right? Sure. It's just that I've made up my mind. And a crab tree can't be tempted. When I say no, I... Oh, Tom, say, help me. I'm surprised. Huh? I heard you two in here, and you're a mighty fine man not to go a-yielding to that old devil temptation. Oh, shucks, Lucy. You know me. Yeah, that's why I'm surprised. Oh. <laughs> now, listen. After you pay the water bill, pick me up two yards of pink taffeta trimming. Two yards of pink taffeta trimming. And don't be wasting any time with your no-good friends. Not to mention in any names, of course. You heard me, Joe? Ugh. Well, don't you worry, Lucy. I'll be right back. So, you pick them up trimming to fix Luella's old dress, huh? Yeah. Small fix it pretty all right. Of course, a new one would be prettier, I guess. Ugh. Well, hear him, Kelly's. You drop in for a quick one, huh? Nope. You sure? I'm positive. Okay, see him later. Yeah, uh, so long, Joe. Ooh! Oh! Hell! What's the matter? Oh. What happened? Sprain him sore toe. Heap big pain. Well, how'd, how'd you do it? Don't know. Maybe step him on rock. Need him medicine. I'll go get a doctor. Never a mind. Kelly got better medicine. You, uh, help me in saloon, huh? No. Okay, okay. I'll help you in. All right, here we go. Come on, now. Oh, easy. There you are. Oh, thank him. Tom, you lifesaver. Yeah. Ah, smell him bar smell. (laughs) Heap good, huh? Man, it's not bad. Nice, damp sawdust, smoke, stale beer. Make a mouth water. You here now, Tom? Just one. Well, all right, but just one. Hey, Kelly! Oh, hi, Tom. How you been? Oh, fine. And you, Joe? In pink. That's good. That's bad. Pink caused by fever in sore toe. <laughs> oh, too bad. What'll it be, fellas? Two beer. Separate check. <laughs> You're coming right up. Say, fellas, nobody else around this morning. How about a little three-handed poker? Good. No. Count me out. Oh, Tom, just a little friendly game. No, Kelly, no. I got some business in town. I've got no time for poker. Mm. Play poker. Win the money. Buy Llewellyn new dress. Dance. Jay, you know, I never thought of that. Okay, get out the card. Fine. But I'm doing it for my little gal, Luella. Uh, no gal of mine's going to be wearing a made-over gingham if her old pappy's got a chance to get her a new one. All right, let her go. Two bit Annie, oh, for good sense. Okay, here's your 50 cents. I'll call you. Me got them two queen. Oh, I got aces. Two queen, gone steady with two jack. Oh. <laughs> Me take them pot again. That does it. Now I'm broke. Say, Joe, think maybe I could put the bite on you? Nope. Your teeth are too sharp. <laughs> I mean, could you lend me a little money? Can't hear you. <laughs> but, Joe, the ten dollars Lucy gave me is gone. Think what'll happen to me. I just hate to think what will happen. Oh, Tom Crabtree. Oh, Lucy. Where's that ten dollars? Now, Lucy, I can explain everything. Tom Crabtree, you lost that ten dollars of gambling. I can tell by the expression on your face. Oh, now, Lucy. Come here. Now, Lucy, stop it. Now, cut it out. Stop. Spanking a man my age ain't legal. Lucy. No! <laughs> Well,
Well, Lucy gave Tom ten dollars to pay the water bill and get some material so she could fix a dress for Luella to wear to the high school dance tonight. And Tom, true to form, proceeded to lose the ten in a little poker game with the boys. But a little problem like no money certainly doesn't stand in Lucy's way. We find her sitting in the rocker, busy with needle and thread, waiting for Luella to come home from school. Oh, let me see now. Just a few more stitches and out. <gasps> Ooh! Gee, stuck myself again. Should be using my thimble, but I won't do it. No, sorry. I look at that thimble and I think of Tom Crabtree's head. <laughs> Don't want to be thinking about that man. Of all the low-down tricks I ever knew play on. Is that you, Luella? Yes, Ma. Come here. Come here and look at this. Why, Ma, it's beautiful. Do you think so? Oh, Gosh, yes, it's... Why, it's my last year's party dress. Yeah. Put the trimming on the bottom. And those ruffles. Where did you get the material? Oh, just some old stuff I had laying around. Ma, you ripped it off your wedding dress. So what? After what I've been through, I ain't planning to get married again. (laughs) You've been in all these years, and now you've ruined it. Well, think of all those memories you associated with it. Memories? Yeah. Here's where your pa spilled beer on it at the reception. And here's where... Ma, you're just saying that. I know how much it meant to you. Oh, honey, that's all in the past. We're perking on the present now. You think maybe you might change your mind about going to the dance tonight, huh? Gosh, yes. I'll run over and see Johnny right away. We were going to a show, but not a... Well, I mean, I really think I'd rather go to the dance. <laughs> oh, hi, Pa. Hi, Luella. Hello, Lucy. Luella, tell your Pa I ain't talking to him. Pa, Ma says she's not talking to you. Oh. Now, Luella, I'll have it finished in a couple of minutes. Then I'll hang her out in the air and we can press it later. Gee, Ma, that'll be super. <laughs> You're wonderful. Oh, no doubt about it. Your Ma's a clever, charming woman. Luella, tell your Pa flattery will get him nowhere. Tell your Ma I can hear her. I got ears. <laughs> tell your Pa he might have ears, but that thing that's holding them apart is as hollow as a Halloween pumpkin. <laughs> Tell your mom... Oh, yeah? Well, you can tell her I'm going out to do something big. Something she'll be very happy about. Tell your pa if he's thinking of shooting himself to skip it. We ain't got money enough to bury him. (laughs) Man, it's mighty nice of you to come over and... Help me dig a well, Joe. Ugh. Always glad to help him, friend, when at no cost of money. <laughs> well, I guess we'd better get to work. Now, you grab that shovel there and start digging. I'll sit here on this box. <laughs> you what? Oh, I'll just sit here on this box. Wait a minute. If we work them together, let's both get them blisters in same place. <laughs> Now, Joe, that's no attitude to take. You know I can't do any hard work. Why, I'm a sick man. Sick? What am wrong with you? Oh, why, uh, haven't you heard? I've got, uh, softening of the spine. <laughs> softening of them spine? Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. i got to take starch injections all the time. <laughs> Never heard of that disease before. Oh, well, you can't get it in this country. We had to send to Europe first. <laughs> Um, yeah, Joe. Indian never scalp you. Oh, why not? Vacuum in head, keep him hair on too tight. Oh. <laughs> oh, dear. You expect him, Joe, to believe all heap big lies? Oh, now, Joe. Don't worry, him, Tom. Me come prepared for digging well. Me no work disagree with you. Look. Brought him dynamite. Dynamite? Oh, boy. That'll do her. You bet him. Did you bring along a cap, too? Why wear him cap? Dynamite just blow him off. <laughs> I mean, 
for the dynamite to make her go. I know how to make go, watch. Just drop them dynamite in hole here. Touch a match to fuse. Then we hide them behind this tree. What tree? <laughs> hey, something happened. Everything dark. Me can't see a thing. No wonder your head's in my pocket. <laughs> Ugh, much better. Boy, what a blowout. Oh, well, Lucy always wanted the house on the other side of the track. And... <laughs> well, I guess... Oh, so, look! Squirting out of that hole. Why, it's oil! We struck oil! Oh, wet wampum! Wet wampum, and we've done it! Look at that! Boy, oh, boy! What's the carnation <laughs> going on out here? Good gravy! Tom Crabtree, look what you've done! It's oil, Lucy! Look at that black stuff squirting out of that there hole! Never mind what it's squirting out of! Look what it's squirting on! All over the dress I just finished making for Luella. I had it hanging out on the line. Look at it. It's ruined. Oh, Tom Crabtree, you've done it again. But, Lucy, we struck oil. We're rich. Why, we can buy Luella millions of dresses. And for you, Lucy, you can have all them luxuries you've always wanted, like water and food and clothing. <laughs> Bread now and again. Oh, believe me. Anything in the Sears Roebuck catalog is yours. Oh, gosh, Tom. You mean it? Yep. I'm going to call one of them big shots down to the oil company and make a deal right away. Joe, look at me. I'm a millionaire. I'm flying. Good. Fly while I'm can. Pretty soon income tax man come and sober you up. <laughs> And then we'll, uh, we'll get a washing machine, a vacuum cleaner, refrigerator, all that stuff like that there. Oh. I really want... Uh-oh. That must be the man for the oil company. No. Now, let me do the gabbing, Lucy. Come in. How do you do? Mr. Crabtree? None other. I'm J.P. Conrad, vice president of the Midwest Oil Company. Oh, nice knowing you, J.P. This here's my spouse, Lucy. Charmed, Mrs. Crabtree. Likewise. Now about this oil on your property, Mr. Crabtree. Oh, yeah, yeah. We got black gold out there flown away like 60. Well, my company is always interested in developing new fields. However, I have one of my engineers outside right now. And oh, he's... did you come by train? <laughs> Pardon? You said you had one of your engineers outside. Yes. He's uh, making a cursory survey, and uh, that must be him now. Come in. Well, how does it look? Amazing. Really? What's it in? Sand? Shale? Neither. It's in a pipe. A what? I think he said a pipe. Oh, my gosh, a pipe! I might have known it. You mean to tell me that this oil is coming out of a pipe? But, but Mr. Conrad... Of all the idiotic things. Mr. Crabtree, damaging a pipeline is a serious offense. Especially since you used gross negligence in doing it. No, we didn't. We used dynamite. <laughs> I know you use dynamite, stupid, and we're going to... Slow speak. down there, Buster. Just who you think you're calling stupid. That's telling them, Lucy. Shut up, stupid. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mrs. Crabtree, but the fact remains that we plan to collect damages... But, and... Mr. Conrad, I've been trying to tell you, this isn't one of our pipelines. What? I have the records right here, and we don't have a line running through the Crabtree property. But we're the only oil company in this territory. I know, sir. But remember that oil we've been missing every month? Yes. This line accounts for it. Some crooks have been piping it off our main line. Hijackers! Yes, sir. I'll notify the sheriff immediately. Good heavens! You mean if Mr. Crabtree hadn't blown up this illegal line, we would never have found out about it? That's right, sir. Well, what do you know? <coughs> uh, Mr. Crabtree, I... I guess I owe you an apology. Oh, it's nothing, J.P., Nothing at all. Nothing that a cash settlement couldn't fix up just dandy. Huh? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, in appreciation of your services to our company, uh, we will send you a check for uh, $500 in the morning. Well, that's mighty nice of you. Uh, haven't got a couple of extra 20s on you right now, have you? <laughs> Why, yes, I, I believe I have. Here you are. Oh, thanks. Here, Lucy. 
Uh, take Luella down to the store and get her a brand spanking new dress. Oh, Tom, I declare you could fall in a pickle barrel and come up smelling like Chanel number 10. <laughs> <laughs> that is Chanel number 5. For him, it goes double. <laughs> and, uh, uh, J.P. Yes? On your way back to town, drop in and pay our water bill, will you? At Home with the Crab Trees, starring Joe Kearns and Verna Felton, was written by Fred Fox, with the music by Leith Stevens. Joe Longfoot was played by Jim Backus. Others in tonight's cast were Elvia Allman, Donna Hainer, Hal March, Earl Ross, and Joe Forte. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS for Columbia Broadcasting System. Wait a minute. Have you heard the weird tales of the Whistler? I'm the Whistler. Sanitarium, Harvey. Is he still unconscious? Yes. Here comes the attendant. We're all ready for him, Mrs. Jackson. Take his feet, Harold. Oh, had to tie him, eh? Yes, I had to give him a good one on the chin. You'll have to watch him. He may try to get away when he comes to. Don't worry, we've got a lot of tough cases here. Don't let him know who brought him here. And don't let him know I had anything to do with it. Leave everything to us. It's a two-hour drive back to the city, Donna. Yes, sir. Well, I'll, I'll phone you tomorrow. Good. If anything happens, we'll call you. Thank you. Uh, good night. Saturday night, and again, CBS presents The Whistler. I, the Whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales. I know many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the mysterious tale of Death Has a Thirst. The long black car with the handsome man at the wheel and the woman beside him returns to the highway and speeds on through the night. The man and woman sit staring ahead, lost in thought. The man is Harvey Davis, the woman Mrs. Victor Jackson, wife of the unconscious man recently deposited at the sanitarium. I'm sorry I dragged you into this, Harvey, but I had to have some help and I knew I could depend on you. It's all right, Donna. I only hope it'll do some good. Victor never drank a drop while we were in school. He didn't drink when we were first married. But after his father died and Victor took over the business, he started. It's a huge concern and I guess he just couldn't take it. He's always had an inferiority complex. But the thing that hurts me most is that the drinking has completely changed him. Why, he's suspicious of every move I make. He accuses me of the most disgraceful things. Accuses me of lying to him about everything and of being in love with with other men. Oh, countless things. Other men? (laughs) What men? Any men I speak to. (laughs) Even you, Harvey. Me? Well, after all, if he's going to be suspicious of any man, it would logically be me. Why? You've brought most of your troubles to me. He knows that. I'm as good a victim as any. He knows I'm terribly fond of you. Are you, Harvey? From the first day I met you, I said, here's a woman, a strong woman. Maybe she'll develop some backbone in my willy-nilly friend, Victor. That's very nicely put, Harvey. Let's hope the sanitarium does him some good. If it doesn't... I don't know what I'll do. Don't worry, Donna. Just remember, I'll do anything for you. 
Thank you, Harvey. About midnight, the black sedan arrives at the Jackson mansion. The butler greets Harvey and Donna at the door. Evening, Mrs. Jackson. Evening, Mr. Davis. Evening. Uh, Dr. Saunders is in the library, ma'am. He's waiting for you. Dr. Saunders at this hour? What on earth does he want? You'd better see him, Donna. Maybe he knows. How could he? Come with me, Harvey. Of course. Oh, good evening, Dr. Saunders. Good evening, Donna. Evening, Harvey. Hello, Doctor. This is quite a surprise. I can imagine. I, um... Um, Harvey and I, we've just been for a little drive. I felt I needed some air. All right, so? Um, did you come to see Victor? Uh, Victor isn't here. Really? But I know where he is. You do? He's in a cheap dive of a rooming house downtown. What? But that's impossible. That's where he always goes. Well, you're wrong this time, Doctor. I took him by force to a sanitarium tonight. Harvey, help me. Maybe they can do something for him. You told the sanitarium that I was his physician, didn't you? Yes. Well, they called me an hour ago. He's escaped. <gasps> what? Oh. They said he came to and broke away from them. I know where he usually goes, and I can find him. If you want me to find him. Well, what are you inferring, Doctor? Donna, I know what you've been through with Victor. I know what a trial it's been... I've tried and you've tried. We've all tried everything we could do to make him stop. Not many women would have put up with what you have. We've dragged him through before. We probably can do it again. I just thought, well, maybe you'd had enough. You do know where he is? Yes, I'm pretty sure I know. Well, then find him. I'm, de I'm determined to cure him if I have to take him to a desert island. That's an idea. A long ocean trip might be the answer. You'd have to hog time. I could do that, too. Very well, I'll have a talk with him. I'll phone you in the morning. Good night. Good night, Doc. Oh, Harvey. No, no, no. You've done your best, Donna. Oh, but I feel so hopeless. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Try the desert island. Why not? Harvey, it might work, mightn't it? You can help. Your yacht, Dr. Saunders, may be right. Oh, at least it's worth a try. I wonder. Please, Harvey, it may be the answer. I can't get away just now, but if you're determined, you're welcome to the aunt. Oh, please, I, I'd feel better if you came along. All right, Donna. I'll go. I'll arrange it. But he won't want to come. We'll take him aboard by force. Shanghai? Well, all right. Just let me know when you find him, and I'll arrange everything. <sighs> He sure was plastered. Well, I'll leave you alone with him, Doctor. Thanks. That high pole will bring him out of this. Victor. Victor. What? What? What's going on here? Who are you? Get away. Quiet, quiet. Take it easy, Victor. Huh? Who are you? Doc Saunders. Doc? What do you want? I want to talk to you, Victor. It's very important. Yeah. Important. Come on, Victor. Snap out of it. Okay. Hey, hey. What's the idea? What'd you slap me for? To wake you up. I've got to talk to you. Oh. Oh, hello, Doc. What are you after? Is your head clear? Uh, I guess so. Well, then listen to me. You know where you are? Yeah. Yeah, my old haunt. You know how you got here? Well, let me see. I... No, I, I can't seem to remember. Well, I'll tell you where you're going if you don't pull yourself together. Where? To the insane asylum. Did you say asylum? I did. I haven't told you this, but your great-grandfather died insane. What? And that was your father's greatest fear, that he would be a victim. Oh. And there's nothing that hastens final mental breakdown more than alcohol. Insanity? Are you just telling me that? No, I can prove it. Good Lord. Do you want that to happen to you? Oh, no, no. Oh, but I... Well, I, I just can't seem to quit. You're going away, Vic. Away? Where? I'm sending you on a long voyage with no liquor. Oh, no. No, you're not. No, now, no, I'll get hold of myself. You said that before. I can take it or leave it alone if I want to. But you haven't so far. 
You've gone from bad to worse. Now you're going where you can't get it. But, Doc, I, I can't. I'd die. I, I couldn't stand it. You'll stand it and like it. If I have to kill you. No. No, I won't be pushed around by anyone. I know who's back of this, Donna. She wants to get rid of me. Asylum, yeah. Yeah, that'd suit her fine. She'd like that. So she can cavort around with Harvey and all the others. Shut up, Vic. You're all planning to get rid of me. You don't like me. You're taking a trip. Get rid of me and you all share in the estate. Well, you'll see how much good it'll do. Oh. But you are taking a trip, Victor. <laughs> and now, here you are, Victor. Several hundred miles at sea. And worried, too, aren't you, Victor? That talk about insanity really upsets you. You believe it, too. Don't you? <laughs> uh, what? Oh, what's this? Where am I? Donna. Do you feel better? What is this? It, it's moving. I, oh, I feel dizzy. I don't think you're dizzy. We're on a boat, darling. What boat? We're on a boat in the middle of the ocean. A boat? Doc Saunders. That's what he said. A, a voyage. It's his oh, idea. Oh, now, Victor. Everything's going to be all right. I know what you're planning to do. You're planning to kill me. You want to get rid of me. Want me to die. You won't die. Whose boat is this? Harvey's yacht. Harvey. Now I know it's a plot. Now I know what it's all about. You and Harvey, that's it. Please don't be ridiculous, Victor. Harvey consented to let me have the yacht. Is he on board? Yes. Of course. You and Harvey and me are prisoner. But a perfect setup. You don't mean that, Victor. I've been suspicious of you two all along. Who else is on board? Nobody but the captain and the crew of four. And Harvey and the doctor. Where are you taking me? We're just cruising. Just cruising? Will you find the right spot? Right spot for what? To dump me overboard. No one will ever know, will they? And you'll say I jumped over. I was washed over the side. Oh, Victor, what has happened to you? You're like a stranger to me. I, I just don't know you. It doesn't seem possible that you're the man I married. My darling, what's happened to you? Don't you know? If I only did. Why, I'm crazy. Insane. Surely you knew that. My great-grandfather was insane, and my grandfather, and undoubtedly my father, so why not me? You're talking nonsense. No. Hasn't Doc Saunders told you what he knows? I know. Oh, come now. You three are closer than that. Stop talking such nonsense. I won't listen. Uh, I'm getting out of this cabin. I can't stand to be cooped up like oh, no, this. No, please stay here for a while, Victor. Please. Here, I... I brought you some milk. Please drink it. Milk? Ah. Oh, got a funny color to it. And it smells strange. What's in it, arsenic? It's just plain milk, Victor. Now drink it. Do you like milk, Donna? Yes, I love milk. Then drink it yourself. Bitch! Oh, all over my dress. You're trying to poison me, that's it. Now get out of here. Get out! Oh, Victor, please, darling. Get out! Oh, what do you want, Doc? How do you feel, Victor? They're trying to kill me. They plan to kill me. Who? Donna and Harvey. She just brought me some milk and it had poison in it. I could tell by the color. I think you're imagining things, Victor. No, no, I'm not. They want me out of the way. I can tell. What made you think the milk was poison? It, it was a purplish color. Here, here's the glass. Smell it. Hmm. Mm, maybe I'm not so crazy after all. I didn't all. say you were crazy. I only want you to stop drinking. Drink may bring it on. Doc, where would they get poison? Oh, come now, forget it. Do you know where they get poison, Doc? I'll see you later, Victor. Maybe. Did you send for me, Doctor? Yes. Did you take some milk to Victor? Yes, I did. What'd you put in it? Why should I put anything in it? Victor thinks you did. You should know me better than that, Doctor. You did put something in it? Oh, yes, I did. Some of that red liquid to make him quiet. Oh, yes, of course, that's what it was. He threw it all over me. Oh, I... I'm thoroughly disgusted, Doctor. I... I can't go on with him this way. He isn't drinking, but... There's something wrong... 
I decided to give it up as a bad job. I... I'm going to get a divorce. Divorce? I'm afraid it's too late for that, Donna. Too late? Why, what do you mean? Well, there's something I haven't told you. I've been hoping it wouldn't be necessary. But after today, I've given up all hope. Why can't I get a divorce? You can't get a divorce from an insane person. Insane? Good heavens. There's been a secret in Victor's family for several generations. Not even Victor knew it. It touched his father ever so lightly, but Victor has all the symptoms. And the liquor has hastened the crack up. I couldn't be certain as long as he was drinking. But today, I realized the truth. Why? Well, I'm bewildered. I've never been so shocked in my life. I wish you hadn't told me. I'm sorry, Donna. I wanted you to be on your guard. He has some strange hallucination about you and Harvey. He thinks you're planning to do away with him. Do away with him? Oh, but that's ridiculous. I... I've never had such a thought. Never. Oh, but now I am frightened. Doctor, what about Alice? Your daughter's only eight years old. There are no symptoms, and it may miss her entirely. But think what this will mean if, if this gets out about Victor. Why, it may ruin her whole life. I understand that. That must never happen. It must remain a secret. That'll be difficult. It's going to be hard to handle when that craving returns. Yes, he will. I'll think of something. I'll find a way. Doctor, come quickly. It's Harvey Davis. What's wrong, Captain? Found him in his bunk with a cord around his neck. Good heavens. Sit quiet, Donna. Come along. Is he dead? No, he's breathing. Found him just in time. He'll be all right in a few minutes. Thank heaven. Harvey, Harvey. Harvey. Uh-huh. Donna, what, what's wrong? What, what's happened? Nothing much, Harvey. Just a little accident. You'll be all right. Oh, my throat. What's going on? You don't remember? No, I was just taking a little nap. I, I feel as though I'd been choked. Better tell him, Donna. Come along, Captain. Any liquor aboard, Captain? Yes, Doctor. Several bottles in the locker in my cabin. Let's have a look. I gave it locked because I... Hey. It's been jimmied. Well, what do you know? It's all gone. Yes, I expected that. I'll skin those men alive. Don't don't blame the men, Captain. What do you mean? What the devil is that? We did something. Come on. Captain. Captain. What is it, man? What's wrong with you? The, the boilers blew up. We must have hit a reef. All three of the men of the crew were down there. We've got to abandon. I... I'm, I'm hurt bad, Captain. Now. He's dead. See to the light bulb. Round up the others. I'll go below. Yes, Captain. Murphy! John! Murphy! Are you there? Good Lord, what a mess. I can't imagine. The... Oh. days pass. The sun beats down relentlessly on the five survivors in the open boat. The doctor watches anxiously over the still unconscious captain. And Donna and Harvey keep a constant eye on Victor, who sits alone in the end of the boat, staring at the horizon. How's the captain, Doctor? Still holding his own. Must have had a bad fall down that companionway. I don't think he fell. Good thing you went down after him. We're running low on water. I hope we sight some land today. How much water have you left in your canteen, Donna? Apple. Hey, look over there. What's that? Why, it's a ship. No, it's land. An island. Grab an oar, Victor. Come on, Doc. Well, I've looked all around. The place is as barren of food and water as the Sahara Desert. I'm afraid if we do locate any water, it won't be fit to drink. There must be water. What do you care about water? You've got a canteen full of whiskey. How much water is left? I have some, and Dr. Saunders has some. So I'd better get busy. Although my experiences on these islands uh, haven't been so good. Here's a chance to put your chemistry to use, Harvey. You know the test for lead and zinc? Yes. I'll give you two vials, some sodium sulfide tablets and some potassium chromate. You know the test, one tablet of each and ten cc's of water. Mm -hmm. A dark precipitate means poison. Yes, I know. Thanks, Doc. Well, I'll start off and keep a direct line to the other side. Wherever that is. Wait a minute, Harvey. I think I'll go with you. Oh, why? 
Oh, maybe I can help. I'd go with you, Harvey, but I'd better keep my eye on the captain. He's the only one who knows where we are. I've got to pull him through. That's all right, Doc. I don't need any help. I think I'll go anyway. All right. If you insist, come on. Harvey, wait. I'm going too. Why? Because I want to. We don't need you. But I'm coming just the same. <laughs> Please, Harvey, I, I'd like to come. All right. Let's go. Certainly hot. How do you feel, Donna? All right. How far have we come? Oh, ten miles, I should say. This is a pretty big island at that. And nothing but desert. Are you sure those last two water holes were poisoned? Certainly. Look good to me. I'm getting mighty thirsty. Better quit drinking that whiskey. It'll only make you thirstier. Harvey, can I have a little water? I'm sorry, Donna, but you'll have to suffer it as long as you can. Please wait. You suppose we'll ever get out of here? I don't know. Oh, it's all my fault. What a shame to get you into such a mess. Please forgive me, Harvey. There's nothing to forgive, Donna. I'd do it again a hundred times over. For you. Would you, Harvey? Yes. Poor Victor, what a sad thing. No one must ever know, Harvey. Promise me, if we get out of this, promise me you'll never let anyone know. No one will ever learn from me. I got him! I got what him! What on earth? Harvey, he's got a gun. Where'd he get it? Come on. I got him. Look. Look. A lizard. A big one. I knew we'd find something. Put that down. You can't eat that. There must be water around here. There must be. Where'd you get that gun? Out of the captain's locker. Better take it easy with those shells. We may need them. Yeah. Maybe I will. Have a drink? No. Uh, all right. <coughs> I'd sure like some water. How about it? There's just enough for one of us to get back. And if only one goes back, it'll be Donna. Donna. How chivalrous. Who's got the water? I have. Come on. Let's keep moving. There's water around here. There must be. And I'm going to find it. Donna, if we don't find water, he's going to start pleading for what you have. No matter how much he raves or pleads, don't give it to him. He will be, even if he threatens us with a gun, tell him you drank it all. I want you to have the best break out of this. Thanks, Harvey. I appreciate that. I found it. Water. I found water. Hurry, Donna. Hurry. <laughs> What about it? What's the test show? Just like all the rest. It's full of lead and zinc and heaven knows what else. Poison, huh? Worse, Jen. How about some of that water? What water? In Donna's canteen. There isn't any more. Who drank it? I did. You both did. You left none for me. You've got your whiskey. I can't drink whiskey all the time. You've done pretty well on it for several years. I've got to have some water. Harvey won't. You? Harvey, Harvey, Harvey. Is that all you think about, Harvey? You should have married Harvey. Perhaps you're right about that. You sure that water's poison? I'm not drinking it, and I'm thirsty, too. Maybe you're just waiting. For what? I don't know, but I can imagine a few things. Well, we'd better stop here for the night. Are you very tired, Donna? Awfully. Better try and get some sleep. Where are you going, Victor? Just going to look around. I may find something. I'm hungry. I'm going to build a fire with this brush. Don't get too far away. I'll be around. Don't worry. Keep a close watch on your canteen, Donna. I have an idea what he's up to. I'll try not to sleep, but... I'm dead tired. I'll do my best, Harvey. If he goes to sleep, I'll try to get that gun away from him. Good night, Donna. Good night, Harvey. Night comes on. The fire burns low. And only a red glow remains. Donna, in spite of herself, drops off into a sound sleep. Victor stirs from his place twenty feet away, looks about him, and crawls silently toward the sleeping Donna. Put it down, Victor. I want some water. There isn't any more. I think there is. You heard what I said. You're lying. You have got some. Victor, what is it? You've got some water and you won't give me any. Harvey. I'm wise to you. You don't want me to have any. You want me to die. You're in love with each other. You're drunk. What if I am in love with Harvey? What of it? Donna. You want me out of the way. Neither of you is very thirsty. No. Because you had some water. And you got it out of that pool. You're lying to me. It's good water. You're crazy. You sneaked it out of there while I was asleep. You, you tried to make me think it was poison. I ought to shoot you both. All right, Victor, if you're so positive. Go on down and drink out of the pool. Oh, that gives me an idea. I'll just find out if that water's poisoned. 
Go drink some of it, Harvey. Certainly not. I'll give you 30 seconds. It's poison, Victor. Go ahead, drink, or I'll shoot. No, don't do it, Harvey. And supposing you drink some, Donna? Very well, I will. Victor, it'll kill her. Donna, wait. I'll drink it. You're a fool, Victor. But come along. Uh, uh, this is going to be very interesting. Not as much as you think. Get, get off of me, I'll kill you! Mm. Oh. Uh, maybe that'll hold you, Harvey. Oh, Harvey. All uh, right. I'm all right, Donna. Just at my shoulder. I hope you're satisfied now that it is poison, Victor. Maybe. But you two are getting water for some place. All right. Hand over that canteen, Donna. Please, Victor. That's what Donna. I'll take care of them for all of us. And if either of you make a move toward me, I'll shoot both of you. Good night. And sleep tight, both of you. The night slowly fades, and the chill of dawn creeps in. Then, as the sun comes over the horizon, Harvey stirs fretfully, opens his eyes, and looks for Donna. She sits beyond the dead embers of the campfire, her hands folded before her, staring blankly into space. Harvey raises up with a start and moves quickly to her side. Victor is sprawled on his back, the hilt of a hunting knife protruding from his breast. Donna. Donna. Good. What's happened to Victor? He's dead, Harvey. Dead? That knife. Why, it's yours, Donna. Yes, it's mine. Now no one will ever know. Will they, Harvey? No. I had to. I had to. Harvey, hello there. It's Dr. Saunders. Hey, here we are. Oh, thank heaven we found you. Sighted a ship, built a signal fire. They're waiting for us. Well, what's this? Well, Victor must have, uh, must have gone crazy in the night and stabbed himself. Well, let me see. He's dead, Harvey. How'd this happen? I told you, he, he must have, uh, stabbed himself. No, he, no, he didn't. I stabbed him. It's my knife. I, I got to thinking and I did it. I crept over and I stabbed him. Oh, I see. When did you do this, Donna? It was, it was not more than an hour ago. I couldn't help it, Doctor. I, I couldn't help it. Please, Donna, please. There's nothing to fear. I didn't want anybody to know. Because of Alice. They won't know, Donna. You didn't kill him. What? He's been dead for at least three hours. Oh, what do you mean? Look at his eyes. Look at his lips and his tongue. The swelling of his stomach. Did you test the pool, Harvey? Yes. Every pool we've come to has been heavy in mineral content. I warned him, but he thought we were lying to him. Last night, he pulled a gun and took Donna's canteen. There wasn't much in it, but it was all we had. He's been drinking whiskey, so a little water wouldn't satisfy him. So he drank from the pool. Ah, poor Victor. I guess it's just as well. Don't worry, Donna. No one will ever know. Will they, Doctor? There's nothing to tell. Except Victor Jackson poisoned himself in a fit of extreme thirst. No, Donna. No one will ever know. You did your best. You tried hard to make things work out. But somehow fate seemed to take things right out of your hands. <laughs> but you know better, don't you, Harvey? You know what happened. Tell us, Harvey. Tell us. After Victor took the canteen from Donna and drank the few swallows in it, he fell off to sleep. Then I took the canteen and filled it from the poison pool. I knew he'd wake up with a greater thirst, and he did. But I'm not sorry. He's better off. And I found I do love Donna. And I'll take care of her for the rest of her days. There you are. From drama to tragedy. From tragedy to a beautiful love story wherein they will live happily ever after. <laughs> I know. <laughs>
CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler stories are written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originate from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, same time... I, the Whistler, will return to tell you the incredible tale of the Secret Seven. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Jealousy, fear, human passions, everyone, parts of life, parts of death. They're things a newsman deals in, things which make up people, people behind the front page. The Mutual Benefit Health and Accident Association of Omaha, the largest health and accident company in the world, brings you America's ace commentator, Gabriel Heater, and the story he found behind the front page. This is Gabriel Heater. When I first heard the story you'll hear tonight, I thought about a thing I heard Will Rogers say one day, that he never met a really bad person in all his life. Oh, I've heard lots of people argue about that, and they'd say, oh, that was just one of Will Rogers' sentimental moods. But a fellow named Ed Robin agreed with him about that all the way. How did it work out for Ed? Well, it's his story I want you to hear tonight. Ed Robbins is a man I think you'd like to know. And by the time I finish my story, I'm sure you'll know why. But suppose I go back and begin at the beginning. The time is a gray morning in early autumn. Along a country road, a big comfortable car is heading back to town, coming back from a funeral. The funeral of Sam Briggs. And inside that car, Ed Robbins looks up at his good friend, Dr. Gil Hamilton. That poor old Sam Briggs. (laughs) Funny dark guy been an orphan all my life. I never felt like one until now. Why? You weren't that close to Briggs. No. He wasn't a man to be overly chummy with anybody. But in a way, he was the only father I've ever known. Whatever I am today, I owe to him. You never mentioned that before. <laughs> You'd ever ask me. Yeah, I was a pretty discouraged character when I first walked into Sam's office at the bank. I was at the end of my rope. If you'd have turned me away that morning, I might have spent the rest of my life in and out of jail. <laughs> Nonsense. Uh, I don't say that, Gil. It's true. There was no reason for him to give me a job. Why, he even lent me money to get a new suit so I could come to work. <laughs> I guess he just liked my looks. That's just what I mean. Anyone could see that you had decency and intelligence and character. You'd have succeeded help or no help. Old Sam could tell a bad egg a mile away. Gil, give any human being a break and he'll come through. And, uh, someday, my cynical friend, I'll prove it to you. Prove it? That's right. Now that old Sam's gone, I think it's time for me to pass the favor along. That evening, when Ed's big department store closed for the night, he decided to walk home. He had to pass a street which was dark and uh, deserted. He was halfway down the block when a noise behind him made him turn on his heel. What? Uh, wait, why you... Let, give, me, give me that. Oh, you stop. Wait. Oh, I'll take you. He, he grabbed an upraised arm, twisted it sharply, and an empty beer bottle smashed down on the pavement. The owner of that hand collapsed in Ed's arms. He was a scrawny young mean, fellow Mr. in shabby dungarees mean, and reeking of cheap gin. Honest, I didn't. 
I've been just a little slower. You'd have cracked my head open. Ah, why'd you try a stupid trick like that? I'm broke, mister. I'm broke. I need a drink. A drink awful bad. I'm half crazy wanting it. Please, go easy on go me. Go easy on you. You're done. You're killed me. I tell you, I didn't mean it. I didn't know what I was doing, honest. I, I was out of my head. Please, you're not going to turn me in, are you? Are you? What's your name? Joe Smith. What's your name? Danny. Danny Leeds. How old are you? 23. Where do you live? Well, up to today, I... That is, I... Get out of the way! Right. Come here, you! Stand still. Try that again, I'll break your arm. Oh, no, you're... You're hurting. Now, just walk along quietly and you'll be all right. Where are you taking me? Home. I'm taking you home with me, Danny. <laughs> Ed, you're a fool. Now, look, Gil. What do you want me to do? Throw the kid back into the gutter? There are institutions that handle this kind. You're only asking for trouble. Well, maybe I just liked his looks. Ah, Doc, be a good guy and go look at him. I promised Ellen I'd call her and explain why I stood her up tonight. Ellen Stanton and Ed were engaged, and I think you'd say she was just about the kind of girl you'd pick for Ed. She was loyal, sympathetic, and understanding. Somehow I'm afraid she wasn't very understanding about Danny. Ed, I think Doc's right. You're taking an awful chance. Ellen, if I picked up a stray dog and fed it, you'd think it was wonderful, wouldn't you? Now, Ed, it's not the same thing at all. This man tried to kill you. He didn't know what he was doing, I tell you. Not now, Ellen. Please have dinner with Doc and me tomorrow. When you meet Danny, you'll change your mind. But the next night, it was an embarrassed Ed who approached the table where Ellen and Dr. Hamilton waited. Where were you, Ed? You were starving. Oh, hi, I'm sorry. I... I... Had a little trouble. The boy finds your liquor supply, Ed? Yeah. He put down a whole bottle. Huh? I had to lock him in his room. Oh, Ed, I'm so sorry. Nah, it's all right. I just shouldn't have expected a miracle. No? <laughs> My boy, a miracle is the one thing you need. And for a time, it certainly looked as if Dr. Hamilton was right. He'd need a miracle. But everybody, including Danny, I think, reckoned without Ed's perseverance. You know, he was one of those wonderful people who'd fit the description. He won the fight because he was too dumb to know when he was beaten. And just a short six weeks later, Ed was able to say... Well, Gil, what do you think of my boy now? I wouldn't believe it if I didn't see it with my own eyes. Quite a transformation. Congratulations, Dan. Oh, don't congratulate me, Dr. Hamilton. Ed's the one who had the rough end of it. <laughs> Forget it, boy. Somebody did the same for me once. I don't think it was quite the same, Ed. Doc, please. Well, Dan's going to work for me at the store tomorrow. I have an auditor's desk all ready for him. And so? Any experience in the store, Dan? No, but I'll try anything Ed wants me to. Dan, try something for me, will you? What's that? Try not to Ed... Well, try not to let Ed down. He's an awfully good friend of mine. And to celebrate uh, Dan's first day at the store, Ed gave a little dinner party the following night. He asked Ellen and Dr. Hamilton. And that was when Dan and Ellen finally met. Well, just as after dinner coffee was being served in the library, the doctor was called to the phone. And when he came back, they, they heard the words so familiar to every doctor. Ed, it's an emergency. I'll have to go. Oh, what a shame. You haven't your car and my chauffeur's gone for the day. I tell you what, if it's all right with Ellen and Danny, I'll drive you. It shouldn't take long. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, don't don't even think of it. I'll, I'll get a cab. No. Now, Gil, you'll have to wait hours for a cab. Do take him, Ed. <laughs> well, that settles it. Come along. Be back in no time. Bye, really bye. Good night. Thanks. For what? For sending him away. I don't know what you mean. Oh, yes, you do. I think I'll go home. You can tell Ed I had a headache. <laughs> that tells me you're afraid to stay here alone with me. Don't forget, I'm a reformed character. 
Perhaps. But you're not very good company. Why do you want to marry him, Ellen? How dare you? Why? I don't owe you any explanations. I hardly know you. Can't be money. You've got plenty of your own. Do you love him? Yes, I do. I don't believe it. I don't care what you believe. I'm going. Now, wait. Come here. Oh. Crazy about you, Ellen. You knocked me for a loop the minute I laid eyes on you. I think you're just crazy. Is this your idea of gratitude? Gratitude, Ted? Don't be funny. You got a great kick out of reforming me. If anything, the gratitude should be on the other side. Oh. Now, don't fight me, baby. Let me go. <laughs> you know you don't mean that. But I do mean this. Now, will you let me go? Sure. Get out. Hello? Oh, hello, darling. I didn't wake you today. Oh, oh, Ed. No, you, you didn't wake me. I, uh, I had a headache and I thought I'd better go home early. Oh, that's all right, dear. I, uh, I know the real reason why you went home. You do? Mm-hmm. Danny told me. Oh, Ed, send him away. You've cured him of his drinking. You've given him a new start. Now send him away. Now wait, wait now. Don't condemn him. He wasn't being vicious, just thoughtless and smart alecky. He'll do anything to make amends. Anything. I don't want him to do anything. I just want him to keep away from me. Uh, you're not being very charitable, dear. He's never had any upbringing. You could do a lot for him, darling, if you would. I could? Yes. Let him get to know you. Let him learn from you what a decent girl's like. I tell you, pretend you're his older sister. He's practically my kid brother already. Please, Alan. Oh, Ed. Uh, could you take him around the country club and have him arrange with a pro for some golf lessons? I promised him he could call for you Saturday afternoon. Ed. Please, Alan. All right, Ed. Let him come. <laughs> You know, this girl must have loved Ed very much to be willing to do that for him. Especially after what she'd been through with the same Danny just a few days before. I wonder if Ed was wise in asking her to go that far. I wonder if he had any right to ask it of her. I've got my doubts about it. And I rather think you have yours, too. Well, it's natural to have one's doubts about that. As it is about many things in life. Friends, I'm sure you'll agree there's one thing no man should ever be in doubt about. That's his income. Everything we mean by peace of mind for a man and his family depends on that income. I'm thinking about a certain man they call Rusty Ellis, a farmer. Oh, he didn't think in his line he'd have to worry much about an income. And then that happened. A plowing accident. Laid up at harvest time, no cash coming in, bills piling up, and, well, it almost ruined him. Two years he and his wife have worked to catch up. Yet Rusty could have saved himself all that frightful experience by merely saying there's one thing I'm not going to leave in doubt. That's my income. I'm going to protect it. I'm going to make sure of it. Well, friends, you can protect your income. There's Mutual of Omaha's famous income protection plan with lifetime benefits. This practical plan. Why, it's backed by the world's largest health and accident company, Mutual of Omaha. Gives you more complete security than you ever thought possible. It'll pay you a liberal, steady income and to do with as you like. Whenever you're confined by sickness or totally disabled by accident. My, that can mean so much. Why not get all the facts? Everything about this amazing income protection plan, friends. All you do is write a penny postcard and say, I'm interested. Add your name and address. Mail it to Mutual of Omaha, care of the station to which you're listening. That's all you've got to do. I'll do the rest. Will you mail that card tonight? Well, let's get back to our story and see what happened. It's Saturday afternoon, 
and Ellen keeps her promise. She's driving a somewhat chastened Danny out to the golf course. Ellen. Yes? I, uh... I don't know what to say. Ed told me how sorry you were, Danny. Let's forget it, shall we? Okay. I wonder what Ed would say if he knew I went right out after we had our talk and got tanked up. Oh, Danny, you didn't. You didn't, Danny. I couldn't help it, Ellen. I was so low down miserable I had to. Acting that way after all Ed did for me, I, I had to stop thinking about it. But liquor doesn't solve anything, Danny. I know. Ed couldn't bear it if he knew you were drinking again. I'm trying, Ellen. I'm trying. Danny, look. I'll help you. I'll play golf with you and tennis, and and you'll meet lots of people, and you won't even have a chance to think about drinking. You're swell, Ellen. If I don't make the grade with you and Ed rooting for me, I ought to be shot. Well, that was fine talk for Danny. And uh, Ellen was impressed by it. As a matter of fact, for the rest of the afternoon, she tried to see him out of different eyes altogether, the way Ed might see him. Raw material out of which a decent, worthwhile individual might be fashioned. And she watched him while he played the golf, carried out the instructions. As a matter of fact, every time he hit a good shot, she was excited with real pride. And afterwards, back in the locker room, Danny ran into Dr. Hamilton. I noticed Ellen outside. Did she bring you? Yes, Doc, she did. A word to the wise, Dan. Three's a crowd. <laughs> Meaning? Meaning it would be a lot healthier for all three if you stayed away from Ellen. <laughs> it's your opinion. Ed doesn't think so. He, he made this date for me. Ed's been doing a lot of things that aren't good for him. Ed wants Ellen to be a big sister to me. That's all there is to it. Ellen happens to be a very charming girl. And wealthy besides. How good are you at resisting temptation, Danny? Now look here, Doc. If you think I'm working up to a big rush act on Ellen, uh, you can stop worrying. No. You're too smart to risk that. I'll stop worrying when you're out of the picture, Dan. And not before. <laughs> Well, Danny did go to work. He applied himself to his work in the stall with so much will. By the end of the second month, Ed felt it was only fair to give the boy a promotion. And Ellen had only praise for Danny now. He was changed quite a lot. Modest, gentlemanly, and so grateful for everything it touched her heart. Only lately they noticed for some reason he'd become rather quiet and kept to himself and was depressed. And Then one evening... Ed... What's this I hear about Danny? Doc says he's going away. That's right. He's upstairs now, packing. But why? Uh, I don't know. He won't say anything, just that he's leaving. That's funny. Ed. Yeah? Ed, would you mind if I talk to him? You? No. <clears throat> no, good idea. Maybe you could find out what's eating him. May I come in? Ellen. I was hoping I could get away without seeing you again. Why, Danny? What have I done? Oh, it's nothing you've done. Well, then what? Why are you running away? Oh, Danny, don't you realize what you're doing to Ed acting like this? Ed, Ed, it's always Ed. That's the only reason you ever looked at me, because Ed wanted you to. Danny, that's not true. No? Maybe I did feel that way in the beginning, but now I... Well, I care about you for your own sake. Sure. I, I do, Danny. Sure you care about me, the way a school teacher cares about our pupil. I've tried to be satisfied with that, Ellen. It, it won't work. Danny. All right. So now you know. I can't stick around and see you marry Ed. I love you, Ellen. Oh, Danny. I'm sorry. Yeah, so am I. Sorry Ed didn't leave me where he found me. At least I, I'd never have met you. A job, respectability. <laughs> well, the trip back won't be too long. The trip back? What do you mean? Back to the gutter. Don't say things like that, Danny. Why not? You're not the same person you were then. No? You couldn't go back. Couldn't I? Just watch me. Danny... Ellen, I need you. I need you. Oh, don't, Danny. Is it really Ed you want? Are you sure, darling? Is it really Ed? Danny. Danny, please don't make me say anything I'd be sorry for. Tell me, darling. Do oh, no. No. 
I can't. Ellen, wait. Ellen. <laughs> Ellen, what happened? Nothing yet. Nothing. You're crying. Tell me. I can't tell yet. Don't ask me to. Then I'll guess. Danny's going away because he's in love with you. Yes. How do you feel about Danny? What do you mean? Ellen, I've been watching you two kids lately. You seem to have a lot of fun together. What are you trying to say, Ed? Are you in love with Danny, Ellen? Why, no. No, of course I'm not. I... Oh, Ed, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. No, 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 no. don't cry. <laughs> if you are, then that's the way it'll have to be. It'll be for the best. Everything always turns out for the best, dear. <laughs> So Ed Robbins, in his infinite generosity, left it to time. And time decided against him. I have news for you, Gil. You have? Ellen and Danny are going to be married. Ellen and Danny? That's right. And you're idiot enough to let him get away with it? What can I do about it? Those things happened. The boys are wrath. There's not a spark of decency in them. He's completely no good, always was and always will now, be. Now, hold, hold on, Gil. That isn't fair. To Danny or Ellen. <laughs> but I suppose he did keep his promise. He didn't use the rush act anyway. What was that? Never mind, Ed. It doesn't matter anymore. Ellen gave a reception on the night of her and Danny's departure for New York, where they were to be married. Ed, of course, had to beg Dr. Hamilton to come. That was ironic, for the doctor did come. But Ed, he was conspicuous by his absence. Danny, hmm? where can he be? <laughs> I'm worried about him. I don't know, but our train leaves in half an hour. Gil. Gil, will you try phoning Ed to... Oh. But Ed had walked in. Only this was an Ed nobody had ever seen before. His face was hard and drawn, and so were the words he spoke. Danny, come into the library, will you? But our train, Ed, it leaves This just... won't take long. I have very little to say. Danny. What? The auditor gave me an accounting of the books today. There's $4,000 missing. So? Your train leaves in half an hour. There's no time for you to deny it, and I have all the proof I need. So? So you're going to give that money back, and then you're going out there to Ellen. And tell her? Oh, you fool, you're not going to tell her. You're going to make her a good husband. Only Danny, if you don't, I'll kill you. And then Dan looked long and hard at Ed. He took a roll of bills from his inside pocket and handed it over. Four thousand dollars. Then with a laugh, he suddenly walked out. Ed took a long time to get his face under control. When he finally came out and joined the others, he was again the old Ed they used to know. But his composure was in for a worse shock. Danny, mm. I uh, I think you've had enough to drink. Uh, what's one little drink? Darling, you've had more than one. As long as it isn't one too many. Well, what are you kicking about, sister? Uh. Danny, don't be vulgar. Why not? Do you know this phony culture wears off under the influence of liquor? Dan. Sure, where I come from, we treat our women like this. Oh. Dan, you've gone too far. Come back here. Come back here. Ed, no, Ed, no. Ed, Ed, stop. Let's be... Now, stop. Oh, you hear me? Ed, get back to Ellen. She needs you. I'll go after him. I'll bring him back. By the time the doctor had gotten outside, he was just in time to see Danny tear away in Ed's car. Now the doctor rushed for his own car. Danny was driving like a fool. Each time the doctor slowed down for a curve, Danny got a little farther ahead. Now they were coming to the railroad tracks with a terrible turn in the road. The doctor watched Danny's car ahead in horror. It would never make it. It would crash. A huge brick warehouse was beside the road. (laughs) 
Danny's was the second car in a year to hit that wall. And for the second time in their lives, Ed and Dr. Hamilton rode home from a funeral. Well, Gil, I was wrong. About what? Yeah. No, you weren't, Ed. Gil, please. Ed, there's something I haven't told you. When I got to the crash, Dan was still alive. He told me something. When you took him into the library, he realized something for the first time. I was the real sucker, he told me. And Ed... That drinking scene and the slapping of Ellen's face was all put on. He was trying to send her back to you. So, Ed, you won. For the first time in his life, Danny was committing an honest act. There was good in that boy. What a terrible tragedy for Ellen. But only the same as your tragedy, Ed. She wasn't in love with him. She was just seeing him through your eyes. Pity and the maternal instinct. She loves you, Ed. Well, what do you think about this man, Ed Robin? Would you do a thing like that? Would you say he was a fool to go as far as he did? Most men, I imagine, would have been fed up a long time ago, would have thrown Danny out. Instead, Ed gave up so much for him, even to a point where he was ready to give up the woman he loved. But what, would you, what would you call a man who'd do a thing like that? A fool? Or would you say, why, no, that man's a saint. That was noble. A man trying desperately to help a fellow human being as somebody had helped him once before. Well, whatever you think, one thing is certain when the chips were finally down, even the man who was marked down as bad and hopeless, he came through, putting on that act, the drinking scene, slapping her face, to make the girl hate him so she could go back to Ed, and then getting out of their lives as he did. Maybe the one decent thing he did in all his life, but he did it. Yes, I think I'm going along with what Will Rogers said. No man is all bad. In just a moment, Mr. Heater will return. But first, here's an important message. The week of July 25th through 31st has been proclaimed by the President of the United States as Farm Safety Week. So during the next few days, let me urge every rural resident listening to observe this worthwhile campaign by doing two important things. First, see that all safety hazards on your farm are eliminated. Second, make sure that you are protected against burdensome hospital expense through Mutual of Omaha's Family Hospital Expense Plan. Yes, this famous plan gives you real protection, all right. It pays liberal benefits for hospital care, surgery, x-rays, laboratory fees, and many other hospital costs for any insured member of your family. Mutual of Omaha is licensed in all 48 states, the District of Columbia, all provinces of Canada, Alaska, and Hawaii, with 191 offices serving nearly 2 million families. For complete information about how Mutual of Omaha will serve you, just write a postcard saying, I'm interested, with your name and address, to Mutual of Omaha, care of your station. Be sure to do it now. Next week, another grand story out of real life. And tonight we salute not one, but eight newspapers. All eight serving the city of Boston. The Boston Post for its Alphonse MacDonald Fund. The Boston Globe for its foresight in promoting aviation. The Boston Herald Traveler for its great interest in Boston's young people. The Christian Science Monitor for its unbiased interpretation of news. And the Boston Record American Sunday Advertiser for wholehearted cooperation in promoting citywide affairs. And so to the Boston newspapers we say congratulations. Now until next week, 
This is Gabriel Hita saying good night. Listen again next week, friends, to Behind the Front Page, starring Gabriel Heater, brought to you by the Mutual Benefit Health and Accident Association of Omaha. Mutual of Omaha, the largest health and accident company in the world. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mrs. Cobb? Yes, Mr. Cobb? You know, being married to you has made life like a beautiful song. I feel the same way. But I sure wish you'd stop hitting so many sour notes. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, Katie. Ah, Jim. Presenting the Cobbs, brought to you transcribed, starring William Demarest and Hope Emerson as those two heartwarming characters, Katie and Jim Cobb. Created for radio by Henry Garson. Just outside of Bakersfield, California, is the small town of Button Willow, and just inside the town of Button Willow is the home of Jim and Katie Cobb and their 18-year-old daughter, Susan. The Cobb's home is also their place of business, that being a trucking outfit. The outfit consisting of one truck, affectionately known as Scarlet. It's evening, and Katie and Jim and their daughter, Susan, are having dinner. Mmm, the soup is good, Mom. It is pretty good, even if I say so myself. Best I ever tasted. You know, there's nobody can make soup like you, Katie. (laughs) Jim, are you going to drink the soup, or are you going to swim across it? (laughs) Want some bread, Dad? No, thanks. (laughs) Jim... Yeah? Will you cut that out? You sound like Niagara Falls. Ah, oh, Katie. That ought to be music to your ears. It's a compliment on your soup. If I want that kind of music, I'll tune in to Spike Jones. <laughs> like more soup, Dad? Well, I could go He's for... He's had enough. Oh, just, just a little more, Katie. You've got the rest of your dinner to finish. We've got chicken and dumplings, string beans, carrots, and peas. No dessert? No, I didn't make any. Well, just put some whipped cream on the dumplings. <laughs> I haven't got time for that if we're going to the movies. What time does the movie start tonight, Katie? You going to the movies? Oh, about 8.30. Hey, you'd like to come along, Susan? I'm taking your ma to a drive-in movie. Thanks, Dad. But I have a date. Your daughter's going out with Freddie Clinton. Can I have just a little more soup, Katie? Not another drop. Oh. And wipe your chin. You look like you just swam the channel. <laughs> Who's Freddie Clinton? Oh, Archie Clinton's son. Don't you know him, Dad? Oh. Why, he was only the biggest hero at state during the football season. A football player, huh? Say, last month you were going around with that fellow on the track team. And then last winter, you were going with that basketball player. Don't you ever go out with anyone in college who don't wear a uniform? I leave her alone. All girls Susie's age like athletes and heroes. Yeah, I guess they do. Freddie won the all-round athlete award at school, too, Mother. He did? Mm-hmm. Well, the game I went to see him play I was pretty you good was on great. Hot Myers Horseshoe pitching team. How many touchdowns did he make that day? Four. Oh, he was all I'd over won the field. Thing. The horseshoe and pitching contest back in 22, except for a slight mishap. He threw three of the touchdown passes, too. Remember, Mother? Yeah, practically the whole We ran out of horseshoes, so when I went out to get a... (laughs) When I went out to get one from a horse, he kicked me in the head, I'm saying. Kicked me right in the head. I'll never forget it. And in high school, he was an all-round athlete, too. Uh, Yeah, I was on the boxing team in the Navy. That's right, Susan. You told me. Yeah, I was on the wrestling team, too. He got a lot of cops. I'm glad you're going with him, Susan. He's I was real a catcher on the board the baseball athlete. team, too, you know. Jim, what are you talking about? Well, what, what are you talking about? Do you think Freddie's the only athlete? Jim, we were just talking. Well, why don't you talk about me? We're talking about athletes, Jim. Football. Well, we had a football team on the USS Ohio. 
And I'll never forget when we played the championship of the fleet. I didn't know you played football, Dad. Then how? I was a regular Red Grange, Jim Thorpe, Tom Harmon, Bob Waterfield, all bunched up into one. Yeah. And when you unbunched him, he was still Jim Cobb. <laughs> how can you talk like that, Katie? You never saw me play. Why, in that championship game, I ran 64 yards with a broken leg. A broken leg? Mm, come to think of it, it was a fractured knee. A fractured knee? No, it was a sprained ankle. A sprained ankle. I had a corn on my little toe. <laughs> well, did you make the touchdown? I wasn't carrying the ball. I was running alongside the sidelines, cheering them on. Some hero. Get the dumplings, Susan. Okay, no. ma'am. Well, I was pretty good. Ah, oh, you don't have to build yourself up for us, Jim. We like you the way you are. Everybody can't be a hero. There's a place in the world for people like you. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, don't get jealous just because Susan's going with a football player. You're a father and a husband. Leave the hero stuff for the younger people. Here are the dumplings. Watch it. The plate's hot. Oh, boy. Chink. Chicken and dumplings. Oh. What's playing at the drive-in, Mom? The high and mighty with John Wayne. John Wayne. Mm, whenever I think of him. <sighs> whenever I think of Freddie. <sighs> <sighs> Who are you thinking of? The chicken and dumplings. <laughs> Well, let's eat so we can get to the picture. Gee, it's crowded in here. Hey, find a place to park where we can get a good view of the picture now. I, I think I can squeeze right in there between those two cars. <clears throat> I guess I can't. <laughs> Back her up, Jim. Back her up. I'll, I'll back her up now. Don't worry. Oh, we're going to miss half the picture. Look out, Jim. Hey, where are you going? Back. Well, you're going to hit that other car. Hey, what are you driving with your eyes closed for? I like to watch a picture from the start. Not in the middle. Well, open them. Uh, all right, all right. How am I part? Huh? Oh, I don't know. I'm watching John Wayne. Oh, look at him in his pilot uniform. Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he grand? Oh, he looks so big. That's because the picture's in stethoscope. <laughs> I think you're wonderful, honey. Well, I think you're wonderful, too. Uh, you're my little pretty Wiggy. Mm -hmm. You're my little pretty Wiggy. You're my little buddy Woodgum. When you're my little buddy Woodgum. I never heard John Wayne talk like that before. <laughs> Eloise, I'd love to come to the drive-in with you. Uh, it's hey, wait a minute. It, it's Steve and Eloise in the next car. Hiya, Steve. Eloise. Oh, hi, Jim. Hey. Hi. How's the picture? Uh, we don't know. Hey, how do you like them two, Nicky? <laughs> hey, why don't you come over here and watch the picture with us? Oh, why don't you come over here and watch the picture with us? Why don't you come over here and watch the picture with us? Oh, why don't you come over here and watch the picture with us? Ah, uh, come on over and watch the picture with us. Why don't you people stop? <laughs> get out of the car and get the speaker so we can hear the picture. I'll get it. Oh, look at Wayne. Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he grand? What's so wonderful about him? He's just sitting in a plane. What's so wonderful about that? But look at him. A hundred and ninety pounds of solid man. So what? You're two hundred and ninety pounds of solid woman. <laughs> Will you get out and get the speaker so we can hear the picture? Okay, okay. Hey, Eloise, where's Steve go? Oh, he had to leave for a minute. He got air sick. Oh, here he comes now. What happened to you? Oh, brother, when that plane started to dive, my stomach turned a complete somersault. 
Oh, you feel any better, Stevie? Oh, yeah. Say, I, I bought some buttered popcorn. Here, have some. Well, thanks. Get the speaker, Jim. I got it. Now, I better get back to Katie. See you after the show, Steve. You missed a great scene, Jim. Everyone in the plane is sick with fear except Johnny. Oh, it's Johnny now. And you should see the way girls look at him. He doesn't give any of them a tumble. Sure, sure. Big hero. Ha! Turn on the speaker. I'm trying to. Oh, look at Duke. Duke? Well, that's what John's best friends call him. Oh, just look at him. Eyes flashing, lips compressed. Yeah. Chest heaving up and down, yeah. and every muscle in his body quivering with excitement. Ooh, isn't that romantic? That's not romance. He's air sick. <laughs> Will you put on the speaker? I'm trying to. Hey, Jim. What's the matter, Steve? You took my popcorn. Oh, so sorry, Steve. Here, here you are. Uh, thanks. I'll see you after the show. <laughs> what happened. Well, Jim slammed the door too hard. Now Scarlett has a short. Jim, will you fix it? I will. I will. Or we're going to be thrown out of here. Oh, keep still. Who do you think you're talking to? Not you. The other blowers. Get out. Get out of the floor. I don't have to do that. I'll just open and close the door again. There. Let's sit back and watch the picture. There's more action here than on the screen. <laughs> that you, Ma? Yes, honey. Where's Dad? Oh, he's out in the garage looking over Scarlet. I think she's caught pneumonia. <laughs> well, how is the picture? Very good. You like John Wayne in it, huh? Yeah, he's nice. But I wouldn't change him for your father. You wouldn't change me for who, Katie? For John Wayne, Dad. Oh, did you say that, Katie? Really? Yeah. I lost my head for a minute. <laughs> hey, I'm... I'm tired. So am I. And if we're going to the lake with Steve and Eloise tomorrow, we'd better get to bed, Jim. Well, I'm ready. Good night, Susan, dear. Good night, Mom. Good night, Dad. Good night, Susan. <laughs> Katie? Yes? Who put this thing in the bathroom? What thing? I've been looking for it for two weeks. My pump head. That's my nightgown. <laughs> I'm tired. Oh, that's catching. I'm tired, too. Uh, <laughs> did you set the alarm? Yeah. Mm. I'm just waiting for you to get to bed so I can put out the light. Oh, okay, poor Molly. <sighs> wasn't that a good picture? Oh, wasn't it thrilling? Yeah, I thought it was very good. Very. Very. <laughs> I loved it. Good night, John. Good night, Marilyn. <laughs> now, back to the town. It's the next morning, and Katie and Jim are having their coffee while waiting for their friends, Steve and Eloise. Hmm, good coffee, Katie. I wonder what's keeping Steve and Eloise. I think I'll have another cup. That makes five with four eggs and two slabs of ham. Hmm, best coffee in a long time. You know, nice and strong. Nothing like a good cup of coffee in the morning, eh, Katie? You have to use all that sugar? Oh, I like it sweet. Well, put in less and stir it more. Mm. Hey, Katie, you're not eating anything. What's wrong? Oh, nothing. Well, there's got to be something wrong. Must be the picture I saw last night. Oh. Oh, 
I can't get over how wonderful that John Wayne is. <coughs> what happened? I think John Wayne went down the wrong pipe. <laughs> how long are you going to keep that up? I wonder what's keeping those two. John Wayne. John Wayne. Can't you get him out of your mind? They're usually on time. John Wayne. What has he got I haven't got? I ain't got time to tell you. <laughs> They're leaving early. Sorry we're late, but I thought I'd better pack a lunch. Well, that's nice. Yeah, two ham sandwiches, two cheese, two roast beef, two liver with some tomatoes and hard-boiled eggs. What's the matter? Nobody gonna eat but me? <laughs> Jim Cobb, you'll eat your share and no more. What bathing suit are you gonna wear, Eloise? My green one. I wanted to wear the bikini, but Steve won't let me. A bikini? Why not? <laughs> Because it's his time to wear it. <laughs> hey, we, we better get started, huh? Yeah. Let's go in the bedroom, Eloise, while I get my things. And there's a picture of John Wayne in a photo magazine that I want to show you. See? Did you hear that? There she goes raving about that John Wayne again. Oh, stop worrying. They're all like that. But she never lets up. She thinks he's the greatest hero that ever lived. So what? You could yeah. be a hero like that, too, if you were in pictures. It's all in the planning, you know. Yeah, but what good do you think that would do me? I ain't in pictures. Well, you could be a hero if you wanted. That ain't hard. Me a hero? I can't stop a runaway turtle. Look, if you wanted the little woman to think you're a hero, it's a cinch. What do you mean? We're all going to the lake, ain't that right? Yeah. Well, when we get there, we hire a canoe. Canoe. You get Katie in the canoe, and all of a sudden, it starts to rock, and she goes overboard. Go on. Then you dive in after her, smack her in the jaw, put her on your back, and fly for the shore. (laughs) Are you kidding? To fly her to shore, you'd need a (laughs) B-59. I see what you mean. Wait a minute. I got it. I hope so. I got it. I tell you, I got it. Well, good. I got it. I got it. I got it. Well, that's it. Don't talk to him. I got it. I got it. I got it. What is it? I forgot. (laughs) Oh, oh, oh. Here it is. I got it. I got it. You and I will get in the canoe, see? I'll stand up, lose my balance, and fall over. You jump in and save me. Why, you'll make John Wayne look like Shirley Temple. Steve, you're a real friend. Come on, shake. Uh, yeah. uh, one more thing. What? Can you swim? <laughs> Can a pig grunt? Yeah, but he can't swim. <laughs> I just want to make sure, just in case anything goes wrong. Well, don't worry, Steve. I'm very good in the water. You know, like Esther Williams. Oh, then we got nothing to worry about. Oh. Let's go. Jim, you take the beach chairs and I'll take the grip. Okay. Uh, you got the lunch, Eloise? I got it. Here's a suitcase. Let's go. You ready, Jim? Be right out. I'll just like the lockers. Okay. Oh, what a day, huh? It's Jim? a beauty, huh? I wonder where the girls parked all the stuff. Hey, it's good to get out, ain't it, Steve? Uh, there they are, out on the pier. Uh, oh, just look at my key. Ain't she something in a bathing suit? Ain't she, Steve? Yeah, I gotta go along with you there, Jim. Yeah. She sure has got a nice shake. Not like some of the other girls, padding here and padding there. Some of them, you know, some of them are nothing but padding. Yeah, like the other girl with them. There's no one with them. That's still Katie. <laughs> Don't the sand look nice? Uh, ooh, ooh, it's hot. Katie, Eloise, Yoo-hoo! Yoo-hoo! wow, this sand is hot. Don't the sand bother you, Jim? No, that's one good thing about having calluses. <laughs> <laughs> Hiya, girls. You girls have been in, huh? Not me, but Katie has. Oh, I just swam across the lake and back. That's all. <laughs> hey, that's pretty darn good. Jim, your wife is a whale. She certainly... Uh, she sure can swim. <laughs> the water's nice, Jim. Let's see you dive in. Uh, in, in a minute now, Doc. Uh, I, uh, I want to limber up a little. Uh, None of that limbering up business, Jim. You're getting a little too old for that. Oh, yeah? Well, I can still touch the tips of my toes without bending my knees. See, now, watch this. 
<coughs> Eloise, <coughs> push me down a little, will you? <coughs> there you are. Uh, Katie. Yes? Pull me up. <laughs> hey, let's play follow the leader. That yeah. might be fun. Yeah, yeah, I'll be the leader. First thing we do is go off the diving board at the end of the pier. Now, come on. Yeah, come on. Let's yeah, yeah let's go. go. Come on. Yeah, yeah, come on. Here we go. Uh-huh. Hey, that was pretty good dive, Steve. Yeah. Oh, that's his circus training. Wasn't it good, Jim? Yeah. Pretty good. Come on. Who's this? Go ahead, Jim. No, no. Uh, ladies first. Okay. I'll go. Hey, watch this one, Steve. That was a knockout, Eloise. Oh, so beautiful. Hey, Ned, I'll go. Now, now, be careful, Katie. Don't try to be too fancy. You haven't done this for a long time, though. I'll watch it. Don't worry. Okay, Jim, come on. Would you all mind moving away from the front of the board, please? Uh, how many turns did she do, Steve? Uh, one. One. Ha. Ah, well, watch this. Don't you think it's about time we hired a canoe? A canoe? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, the canoe. Oh, I think that should be fun. Oh, Jim, I don't think you ought to go in a canoe. That's kind of dangerous. Yeah, don't be silly. It ain't dangerous as long as you know how to swim. And the lake isn't rough. No, I don't feel like going out in a canoe. Mm, neither do I. You boys go ahead. Boy? Oh, that's a hot one. <laughs> you think I'm just a tottering old man, huh? Ready for the junk heap, huh? Well, well, you're not John Wayne. Ah, you and your John Wayne. Come on, Steve, let's get the canoe. <laughs> so she doesn't think I'm a hero, huh? Well, I'll show Katie. I'll give her the surprise of her life. Uh, uh, let's get this canoe in the water, huh? Steve... I'm going to save your life like it was never saved before. <laughs> okay, now, Jim. Give her a little shove. I right. hit. Now, once more. Easy does it. Mm. Yeah. Now, I'll, I'll hold the canoe, Jim. You get in first. Uh, okay, uh, steady. Uh, right. Uh, uh, there we go. Uh. Get in, Steve. Uh, wait till I get the paddle in. Uh. Yeah. Uh, there. Yeah. Now, hold it. Hold it. Uh. Ah, now we're off. Now, wait till I push you away from the dock. Now, what's the routine? It's a cinch. Yeah. When we get about 50 yards from the shore, yeah. I'll stand up in the canoe, yeah. and you shake it from side to side, yeah. and I'll fall overboard. Then you jump in and save me, and you're a big hero. Gotcha. Now, let's rehearse it just once before mm. we get over there. Huh? Now, okay. Now, I'm standing up. Now, shake the boat. Uh, here we go. Heave ho, you land lovers! Jim, I'm supposed to fall in the water. <laughs> give, give, give me a hand. Easy now. Here you are. Now get one leg over in the canoe and I'll, I'll pull you in now. Easy. Ooh. Uh, uh, I got the idea now. You paddle over near the float. Right. Now don't forget, the minute I go overboard, you dive in. I will. And then what do you do? Then I whack you on the jaw. And pull you in by the hair. Yeah. Yeah. Now remember, this is all make believe. <laughs> then, when you get me up on the float, everybody will think I'm a goner. <laughs> and that's when I become a hero. Right. I'll turn you over on your stomach and bring you back to life with artificial restitution. Right? <laughs> oh, brother, this is gonna be good. Hey, hey Steve, yeah. let's stop here. Right. Hey, there are the girls on the shore. Katie! Eloise! Oh, you kid! Does your mother know you're out? You be careful out there, Steve! Oh, I'm all right. Don't stay out too long, Jim. Hey, now's the time. 
stand up, Steve. Right. Here I go, Jim. Oh, oh Jim! Jim! It's all right, buddy. Now, don't Help! worry. I'll save you. Oh, Katie! Oh. Eloise! Oh. I'm going to save Steve! Oh, 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 no. Well, do something, Jim. Oh. Don't worry, Katie! Oh. Don't worry, Eloise! I'll jump in and save your husband. Well, go ahead and do it. Well, From where you are. Yes, I see Good. Come on, Jim. Guys, good. I'm going after him now. Everything will be all right. Jim, Jim, where are you? Where are you? Jim, Jim, where are you? Jim, I am safe. Grab me. Grab me. You're, you're supposed to grab me. I can't. It's too deep here. You grab me. No, no, no. Don't get excited. Don't, just put your hands on my shoulder. Oh, God. Jim, my throat. Let go of my throat. My hair. Let go of my hair. Katie! This is Roy Rowan inviting you to tune in for another chapter in the lives of the Cobbs, starring William Demarest and Hope Emerson. The Cobbs was directed by Henry Garson. This is the CBS Radio Network. And here's our host, the distinguished motion picture star, Mr. Pat O'Brien. Thanks, Jimmy Wallington, and hi, everyone. Welcome again to your radio theater. Today's play, like all our shows, was suggested by one of you listeners. So it's really your show. Now, if you haven't sent in a story idea, we'll tell you later how to go about it. Today's play was suggested by Barbara Shepherd of Ellery, Illinois. But right now, let's get into our play. An exciting look into the future and the past. As three men and a girl find adventure in outer space. Our play is Destination Mars. And our star today, that superb actor, Mr. Dane Clark. Behind his desk in the administration building of a great southwestern guided missile base, a little man with graying hair and alert eyes pours over a stack of mysterious charts and lengthy reports. His manner showing more and more interest and vitality as he reads on. He is Dr. Amos Griffin, one of the world's greatest scientists. And the papers before him contain a promise of history in the making. Satisfied at last, he turns to the intercom on his desk. Carol? Yes, Dr. Griffin? The uh, young men I asked you to send for, uh, have any of them arrived yet? Yes, sir. Joe Blakely, Randy Coles, and Dr. Peter Haley. They're all here. Good, good. Uh, have them come in at once. Yes, sir. Oh, and Carol, uh, you'd better come in, too, and bring your book. I may want you to make some notes. Hmm. So we're going to try it at last. Hmm. Well, uh, come in, come in, Joe and Randy and yes, Peter. Uh, find chairs. Uh, you sit here, Carol. Yes, sir. There we are. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you're all curious to know why I sent for you, so we'll get right to the point. Gentlemen, I have news for you. The robot rocket ship that we dispatched to the planet Mars several days ago has returned safely. You mean the ship actually got to Mars, sir? As close as we wished it to, yes. Within a few hundred miles, that is. The uh, instruments recorded perfectly all the way. Then there must be pictures, Dr. Griffin. What do they look like? Do they show life on Mars? That is the only part of our project that was not a success. There are no photographs at close enough range to give us the information we want. But we'll do better in that department the next time. When will be the next time, sir? Tomorrow. 
Uh, if you men can be ready by that well, time. That's pretty fun. Yeah, I don't know. But it'll take longer than that to fit her up again. We won't be using the XL-24 this time, Joe. It'll be the DM-1. But that's not a robot, sir. The DM-1 has been designed for manual operation. That's right, Peter. And that's why I've sent for you three men. Dr. Griffin, you mean you're going to send Joe and... and... Well, I've given this matter a great deal of thought and study, gentlemen. And after careful consideration, I've decided that you three are the best suited for the project. That is, if you care to undertake it. Uh, uh, this is not compulsory. It's not an order, you understand. I want to go, sir. Same here. Good. Peter? Uh, you can count me in, Doctor, of course. Fine. <laughs> now, about your duties. Joe, you've had more experience in supersonic piloting and rocket control than anyone in our division. And I'm putting you in command of the expedition. Yes, sir. Thank you. All clear? Yes, sir. All clear. Oh, Dr. Yes, Griffin. Sir. All clear. Yes, Carol, what is it? The DM-1 was actually designed for a crew of four. Yes, that's true, but uh, on this first flight... May I go, too? What? Surely you must be joking, Carol. No, I'm not joking at all, Dr. Griffin. I just want your permission to go with them, that's all. But this project is no place for a woman, and You've you... often told me I know as much about the work as the men in the division, sir. Well, certainly I have, and that's very true. But uh, what you ask is impossible. Why, if this first trip is successful... Perhaps you can go along the second time. We'll see. Oh, but don't you, you understand... You heard the doctor, I... Carol. When do we get our instructions, sir? Well, I have them already, Joe. Here we are. Set for you. Mm-hmm. Here's yours, Randy. Yes, sir. Peter. Thank you. I'll take care of final details of the ship and meet you at the launching platform tomorrow at 19.00. That's all. Thank you, sir. Come on, men. Yep. Gosh, Joe, that was a bolt out of the blue. I, I feel sort of numb all over. Well, let's get back to our quarters and study these instructions. Yeah, okay. better, huh? Joe. Yes, Carol. Would you stay a minute? I want to talk to you. Huh? Um, uh, sure. Look, fellas, you go ahead. But yeah, I'll, I'll be along in a minute. All right. Well, what's on your mind, honey? Darling, I've got to go on this trip with now, you. Now, listen, you heard what Dr. Griffin said. I don't care what Dr. Griffin said. He wasn't too positive about my not going, and the ship was designed for four, and... Well, if you talk to him about honey, it... Honey, honey, I don't want to talk to him about it. Because I don't want you risking your pretty neck on a thing like this. If things turn out badly, Can't I... Can't you understand? That's why I want to be with you. I realize the danger, but... Well, if anything happens to you and you don't come back, I, I wouldn't want to go on living anyway. Or perhaps you've forgotten that I love you. Baby, I know you love me. And I love you, too. And I understand how you feel, but we'll be all right. I'll be back, Okay. Well, all right, darling. That's my girl. Well, I've got some studying to do. I'll see you later. All right, Joe. And by the way, don't forget to be out at the launching platform tomorrow night. Got to have you there to see me off for uh, Mars. What time you got, Joe? Oh, uh, 1926, Randy. Just four minutes more. Yeah. How about you, Doc? All set? Hmm? Oh, oh, yeah, Joe. I'm all set. I wonder what's happened to Carol. She was going to be oh, here. I saw her a few minutes ago talking to Dr. Griffin. Oh, if she thinks she can sell him on the idea of Joe! coming... Joe! Oh, th- there she is now. Yeah. You think I'd forgotten you, did you? Oh, I hope not, honey. You know, Randy says you were talking to Dr. Griffin. Mm, yes, I was. What about? Making one last pitch to go along? Mm-hmm. You know what he said? No. That's right. No. <laughs> uh, we'll get on into the ship, Joe. You, you better step on it. Yeah, I'll be right along. Goodbye, Carol. Bye. Be good. Carol. Oh, Joe. Oh, there's Dr. Griffin. He wants to see you before you blast off, I guess. Yeah. Oh, gosh, 1928. I've got to get going. Goodbye, kiss, honey. Mm-hmm. Mm. Bye, darling. And please hurry back. I'll bring you a wedding present from Mars. Bye, baby. Bye, Joe. You wanted to see me, Dr. Griffin? Well, nothing special, Joe. You know your instructions. Now, keep in touch with us as often as you can. That new sonic radio should operate properly all through your flight. Yes, sir, I know. Now, uh, you better get aboard, because we want to blast off right on time if possible. And, uh, good luck. Um, yes. Yes, sir. Well, uh, what's the matter? You forgotten something? No, no, I was just going to wave goodbye to Carol, but I don't see her. Well, goodbye, sir. Be seeing you. Goodbye, Joe.
Doc, Randy, you all set? All set, Joe. Waiting for you. Well, you better check time. Dr. Griffin's a bear for keeping our schedule. It's 1929.45. Good. Are you both strapped in? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then. Here we go. DM-1 to control tower. Prepare to blast off. Five seconds. Okay, control. Yeah, thanks. Three, two, one. Here we go. Okay, Mars, here we come. Have we cleared the Earth's atmosphere yet? Not quite. Any minute now. According to the aero density gauges, it's getting thinner and thinner. Good. That means we're really making time. For pressure, 3.75, 0. 0.47, 26. It's dropping fast now. We get ready to drop the booster section. Do you need any help? Not yet. Say one, Randy. 10, 5, 2, we're out of it. Okay, hang on. Nothing had happened. Nothing at all. That's right. And we're on our way. Nothing to do now but settle down to a few dull hours till we get into the Mars atmosphere. Dull, he says. What's dull about traveling through space faster than man's ever gone before? Headed for a little pinpoint of light that may even be gone when we get there. Don't get so worked up, Randy. I was only kidding. Still, we might have time to work in a hand or two of bridge before we land. By the way, how's your vector reading? Perfect. I just looked. We're headed straight for Mars, just like it worked out on paper. Uh, I was just thinking, Joe, wouldn't it be possible for a rocket ship to run into a star or a meteor or something out there in space? Well, it's possible, sure. Just have to wait and find out. None of our robot rockets have. Dr. Griffin figures his radar repellent device will pull us off course long enough to avoid hitting anything in our way and then rectify the course again when we're out of danger. I certainly hope he's right. Yeah. Hey, look out there through the port. Did you ever see so many stars before? Yeah. Want to wish on one? No, I... Hey, uh, what, what are you doing here? Carol, you... Hi, darling. How in the name... How did you get here? I just walked aboard, that's all. She's a stowaway. Honey, how'd you find a place to hide? You might have been back in that booster section we just dropped off back there. Not a chance. Don't forget, I know almost as much about this spaceship as you do, Joe. Oh. Well, aren't you glad to see me? No. Huh? Well... I mean, sure, I'm glad to see you safe, honey, but you just can't be here. You've ruined the whole thing. I'll just have to radio back to Dr. Griffin and tell him what you've done, and then we'll have to turn back and we'll have... You can radio him if you want, but it'll just be a waste of time. Why do you say that? I had a little talk with Dr. Griffin this afternoon. You mean he agreed to let you come? It wasn't easy, but I won. I also knew you wouldn't hear of it if you knew, and that's why I stowed away. Women. Now, darling, you know you can't do without us, even on Mars. Okay, I guess you're right. (laughs) And now, can we look at the stars? We cannot. As long as you're here, you'll have to be useful. Get a pad and pencil, lady. From now on, I'm going to dictate my reports. Joe? Hey, Joe. What's the matter, Randy? I don't know what's the matter. Our vector control has gone completely screwy. Well, that's impossible. What could happen to... It may be impossible, Joe, but it's happening. Randy and I were watching the astrometer. It was holding steady on Mars, and then as though something hit it, it seemed to go crazy. Let me see it. All of a sudden, we started veering off to starboard. Mars dropped out of the astrometer, so I tried to operate the vector control to get us back, and nothing happened. Hey, what is it, Joe? What's happened? We don't know yet. Must be the vector control that's out of order. But it isn't. It's operating perfectly. All the pilot lights and indicators prove it, and yet we can't get back on vector. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'll try it. There, you see, you've got the lever way over, and it doesn't have any effect at all. Yeah, can't make it out. According to the panel, everything is working perfectly, but... Joe, look. What is it, Carol? In the astrometer, do you see what I see? Huh? Why, that's the moon. Yeah, and we're holding steady on it. There's some kind of a pull working on us. I'll try a deflection. Maybe we can duck below the pool and get back on the Mars vector. I tried that a minute ago, Joe. It doesn't work. Nothing works. We're being pulled straight toward the moon. Doc, get on the radio. Call the base. Get Dr. Griffin. Tell him I'll talk to him when you make contact. Okay. Though I don't know what good he could do us back on Earth. It's like a magnetic pull, Joe. Isn't there anything we can do to break it? DM-1 to base. DM-1 to base. Hello. You reading me all right? Yeah. Put Dr. Griffin on. And hurry. There's one way to break the pull, I think. I can put a big charge on the rejector, make a fast dive, and 180 degree turn. That ought to do it. Dr. Griffin is on, Joe. Let me have the headphones. Thanks. 
Hello, Dr. Griffin. We seem to be running into some trouble out here. Can't stay on the Mars Vector. And we're being pulled straight toward the moon. That's right. No, the Vector controls have no effect. Yes, sir, I can try loading the rejector and... Oh, what's that, sir? But, well, don't you think it's foolish to... Yeah, yeah, I see. Yes, maybe we can. Very good, Doctor. I'll report to you as soon as any new development. DM-1 out. What did he say, Joe? Did we try the rejector? We try nothing. We just keep on going as we are. Dr. Griffin says if we can't make it to Mars, he'll settle for the moon. Sure. Dr. Griffin will settle for the moon. But what about Joe and Carol and Randy and Peter? They're the ones whose rocket ship is off its course, unable to reach Mars. What adventures they'll find awaiting them... We'll find out in Act Two of Destination Mars, starring Dane Clark. Our travelers into space. Joe Blakely in command of the rocket ship M1. Randy Coles, engineer and dynamics expert. Young Dr. Peter Haley and Carol Chester, first assistant to the great scientist who has planned the expedition. They have met with an unexpected complication. Intending to be the first to reach the planet Mars, they have suddenly found their course changed by some unexplained force and are headed directly for the moon. Now well within that planet's atmosphere, they watch the scene that unfolds outside the rocket's portholes with strange emotions. Joe, look out there. We're close enough to see us now. I know, Carol. I have been looking. So have I. And how do you explain it? According to all the scientists, the moon's supposed to be uninhabited. And yet right there... Uh, big uh, structures and towers, canals or something like that, and roads. Those things couldn't just happen, Joe. They must have been built by somebody. I don't see anything moving out there. You know, Joe, maybe being shuttered off to the moon like this instead of Mars will get us somewhere after all. Maybe we can study a civilization that's been extinct for years. Yeah, maybe a lot of things. What are you going to do, darling? Just what any other crazy American would do, land and look over the situation. Well, uh, hadn't we better pick out a place first? I already have. You see that group of towers and buildings and streets right down there? Yes, I've been looking at it. Must be a city. Or whatever the lunar equivalent is. Well, there seems to be a big clearing in the middle of it. And that looks like a good spot to land. Think I'd better powder my nose, Joe? Just in case there is any civilization down there? I do not. We don't know what kind of atmosphere we're going to find when we get out of this rocket. We'll all be wearing the Terralite mask Dr. Griffin developed. And we'll get them on now. Hey, we only brought three masks. What about Carol? Don't worry, boss man. I made my plans very carefully. I brought my own Terralite mask. <laughs> you don't forget anything, do you, honey? Of course not. Aren't you proud of me? Yes, you'll do. All right, get set. All of you. We're about to pay our first visit to the moon. And we hope it's not our last. <laughs> Well, here we are. No complications so far. And a mighty fine landing, I might add, Joe. Thanks, Randy. Doc. Yeah, Joe? Did you call Dr. Griffin and tell him where we are? I tried, but nothing. The Sony is dead. We don't seem to be able to put out any signal at all. Hmm. Strange. Well, maybe something about mineral conditions on this place, huh? Well, never mind. We'll try them again later. Now, Terralite masks on. Be sure your shortwave radio equipment is turned on. All right, let's check. You hear me, Doc? Sure. Fine. Randy? Good here. Joe? How about you, Carol? <laughs> Carol, what's the matter? <laughs> you look like a moon man yourself in that get-up. Well, never mind that. I'm going to open the hatch, and we'll go out one at a time. Follow me. Take it easy, everybody. We're not on Earth, you know. Say... This is a surprise. Uh, I half expected to float away or something. Oh, it's so pretty here, but so strange. Everything seems so blue. The scenery comes later, honey. 
Uh, everybody out? No. Yeah. All out. Okay, I'm going to try taking off my Terralite mask. Now, the rest of you keep yours on until I test it. Peter, mm-hmm. you stand here beside me. If anything happens to me when I take off my mask, slap it back on me fast. Right. Here I go. Well, I'll be darned. Okay, the rest of you can take them off. They can't hear me. You can all take your masks off. It's all right. What? Joe, this is almost like the Earth's atmosphere. That's right, a little lighter, if anything. Still, it doesn't give any trouble in breathing. Might as well leave the masks here. We won't need them. And what do we do now? Well, come on, let's get going. Where, Joe? First, we'd better have a look into one of these buildings. How about this uh, big one right there with the tower? Come on. Looks like a castle. Probably is. City house of King Carl's friend, the seventh or something. Was, you mean. We haven't seen a sign of human life anywhere, you know. Yeah, that's right. Hey, maybe they're all invisible. Why, right now, there may be a couple of guys walking along beside Carol. Randy, no. <laughs> all right, here we are. Now, try to be sharp and be ready for anything. I'll see if these big doors open. You'll probably need help. They look pretty heavy. Yeah, they do. Maybe even locked to the former occupants of... Well, how about that? They open by themselves, just as I put out my hand. Like in the Penn Station. Hey, maybe somebody got here before we did and sold them the idea... Hold it, Randy, not... hold it. Come on, we'll go in. Joe, this place is gorgeous. What do you suppose it is? Or was? Search me. Looks like a super colossal theater, something Joseph Urban might have dreamed up. No seats, but there's a big curtain at that end. Joe, it's opening. Yeah. Now stand still, everybody. And look what's behind it. Hundreds of men. Tiny men, and they're all blue. We better get out of here. No, 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 wait. They're, they're coming toward us, all of them. But there isn't a sound. Are you sure this isn't a bad dream we're having? Keep your heads and don't move. But, Joe, they're surrounding us. They're not armed, and I've got my gun. That ought to stop them. There. There's a leader stepping out. Joe, we got to do something about getting out of here and fast. I'll pull my gun on the leader. Stop or I'll shoot. He can't understand you. I'll shoot once over his head. That's a language anybody can understand. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. He's taking something out of his robe. Maybe he has a gun. No, no, it's just a little stick, like a baton. He's pointing it at you, Joe. Yeah, I know, but watch him scatter when they hear this shot. Oh. Oh. Joe, what happened? I don't, don't know. He was pointing that stick at me, and I started a fire, and all of a sudden my hand got paralyzed, and I couldn't hold my gun. Then I, maybe I can pull my gun without his seeing it. No, don't try. Don't try. They probably all got those things. Our only chance is to go along with the gag and try to figure out something later. Now, hold it. Here comes the leader. Maybe you can talk to him in sign language or something. Maybe, but... Uh-oh. He's the one that's doing the talking in sign language. And he's making it quite clear we're to march toward that door over there. Oh, we're cooked. Hey, stop pushing me. Now, don't fight it, Carol. At this particular moment, we're not running the show. Let's get through that door like our little friend requests, and then we'll see what happens next. Look, Joe, they're taking us right up to that throne thing. The little man on it must be the king or something. What can we do, Joe? Well, I don't know yet. I... Look, Joe, at that king person. He's smiling. Yeah. Yeah, he is. Come closer. Hey, Joe, he speaks English. Yeah. Come on, come on. I welcome you to us, my friends. You speak English, sir. Um, English? Uh, Your Majesty... I I am afraid I do not understand. I speak the language of Luna. Well, I don't know what you call it, but at least you know what we're saying. Yes. Tell me, where have you come from? My observers saw your strange device approaching the moon from out of space. But we could not tell from where you came. Well, Your Majesty... Majesty? Majesty? That is a strange word that we do not know. I am not majesty. I am Panum, as I have been for these many centuries. But you were saying... Well, we weren't headed for your moon. We were on a flight to Mars. Mars? Ah, that 
is why we brought you to us. Brought us to you? I'm afraid I don't understand. We wouldn't be here at all except that your moon seems to have a gravity all of its own. A gravity which we control. Which I control. I am able to switch it on and off at my will. And in any direction I see fit. Yesterday I was making experiments in the direction of Mars. That is why we drew you to us. Oh, I'll be darned. How about that, Joe? Turning gravity on and off when you feel like it. You still have not told me from where you come. Oh, uh, well, we're from the Earth. Earth? The planet Earth? <laughs> you are joking. Please tell me the truth. But that is the truth, Panu. It is impossible. There is no life upon the planet Earth. Our scientists have made certain of that. Well, then they'd better change their thinking. We're from the planet Earth. We left last night to try to make the first flight to Mars. There are millions of people living on Earth. Wait. There may be an explanation of your fantastic story. Yes, I believe there is. Ralgan, my most able scientist, has made a study of that kind of thing. And this bears out his theory. His theory? What theory? You see, though you did not know it, you have passed not only through space, but you have also passed through time as well. Now, we know that there is no life on Earth today, but we have determined that in a million years there will be life on that planet. This moment is your yesterday of a million years ago. And we see living creatures who will exist long after we are gone. Interesting thought, isn't it? Uh, 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 yes. Yes, it's interesting, all right, but a little confusing. I, I wonder if I could ask you a favor. Naturally, I shall be happy to listen. But first, there is something I must do. What do you call yourself on the earth? My name? It's Joe Blakely. Joe Blakely. Well, we could change it. Yes, you seem to be exactly right. Lorak, come here. Hey, what does he mean, Joe? You seem to be exactly right. For what? Well, how do I know? He's thinking faster than I am, and he's on his home ground. Joe, look at that gal who's coming in. Well. Joe. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Carol. Now, there's what I'd call a heavenly bit of woman. Well, if she's like her father, she's 500 years old. Oh, yeah, but she doesn't look a day over 20. Of course, if you like your girls to be colored blue. Lorak, how do you like him? That he's one. exactly as I had dreamed, Father. And I thought I should never find him. What is his name? He is called Joe. Joe? Joe! The name is not so bad. I have been waiting for you for a thousand years. He is not of today, Lorak. He is of Earth a million years hence. Ah, it is even better than I thought. You will take me with you to your Earth of tomorrow. Well, Joe, yes. don't you dare fall for that line. I'll slap her right in the face. Yeah, no, yeah yes, of course. No, but shh, please. Uh, look here, Panum. I'll be glad to come back here and talk about this in a few days. But first, I've got some things to do on Earth. Father, you, just... you will not let him go away. Of course not, Lorak. He is yours. He is not. He's mine. Well, look, and... uh, sir... <laughs> Uh, even though you're thinking of keeping Joe, uh, you'll be a good guy and let the rest of us go, of course. Now, wait a minute, Randy. It Don't will you... be impossible for any of you to leave Luna until I will it. Uh, but of what use are we to you? Maybe much. I cannot say. But as I have told you, I control the gravity of Luna. Until I release it, your puny little ship cannot get off into space. And at the moment, I do not will it. Joe, aren't you going to do something? Uh, yeah, Carol, I'm going to do something. I'm going to try turning my charms on for this Lorac dame. Joe, you've fallen for it. You think she's so pretty. Yeah, that... sure, sure. She's blue, too. So don't you be. I'll keep you posted. <laughs> 
You see? Feminine nature doesn't change a bit. A million years and a few hundred thousand miles of time and space notwithstanding. Carol is quite understandably jealous. And Joe seems helpless to escape Lorak's infatuation. Being the first travelers through space from our planet Earth to the moon has brought not only exciting adventure, but also some challenging problems for the pioneer party commanded by young Joe Blakely. Not only do they find themselves the unwilling guests of Panoon, who seems to be the ruler of Luna, now Joe has suddenly become the chosen mate of Lorak, the ruler's daughter, much to the dislike of Carol Chester, Joe's fiancé. As the four Americans walk with Lorak through the constant bluish light of the lunar atmosphere, Carol, Peter, and Randy, well ahead of Joe and the princess, the American girl is silent, seething inside. Come on, snap out of it, Carol. You haven't said a word for an hour. What is there to say? I don't feel like making jokes. Randy's right, Carol. This could be worse, you know. At least we're still alive. Oh, yes, we're alive, all right. But we might just as well be dead. At least I might as well be. Here I am, a million miles from home, with no prospect of getting back. And on top of that, I've lost Joe to that, that horrible Lorax. Oh, you haven't lost him, Carol. He's just trying to work through her to get us out of this place. Well, he's using a strange way to go about it. Besides, she isn't horrible. She's beautiful. Now, if the king had picked me for well, her... Well, he didn't. He picked Joe. And so did she. And you can deny all you want to. He's fallen for her. You know... If we could make Panum and Lorak change their minds about this romance, it might be easier for us to get off the moon and back to Earth. Yes, if. And if Joe would just once tell me that he loves me and wants no part of that siren, I think I might even be happy. Just why do you think they're walking alone back there and not with us? Oh, don't be so suspicious, Carol. This may turn out all right after all. Hey, look up ahead there. Those big trees. Mm, what about them? They're just another shade of blue like everything else in this horrible place. But the branches... You see, they're moving around slowly, just like human arms. And there's no wind. Hey, you're right, Randy. Well, that's the strangest thing I've ever seen. Come on, let's get closer and look at them. Why not wait here until Joe and that girl catch up with us? Well, they'll be along in a minute. Come on. Oh, all right. Say, this is one for the report. If we ever get back to Mayfair, I wish I'd brought my movie camera from the ship. This is something nobody believes. Don't you see, Lorac? This thing won't work at all. You people on Luna live to be thousands of years old. We don't. If you stay here on Luna, Joe, you too may be a thousand years old. You will never get any older than you are now. Oh. You are but... attracted to me, aren't you, Joe? Well, yes, of course I am. Who wouldn't be? You're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. And it wouldn't be hard to spend the centuries with me, would it? Look, I don't understand why you want me instead of one of your own men here on Luna. Then I will tell you. It is partly because you fascinate me, as no man of Luna has ever done, and partly because we may further a great plan of my father. A plan? What kind of a plan? Bring the people of the planets together, to intermingle the races until the entire universe is united. With Panum as head? Naturally. Well, that's a king-sized plan, all right, but... Hey, that's Carol screaming. Yes. Do not worry about Carol. Of course I'm worried about her. Come on, let's see what happened to her. I can tell you what has happened to her. I can see up ahead. There they are, by those big trees. Yes, the Gormalis trees. She has come too close, and one of them has got her. What do you mean? What do you mean it's got her? How can a tree do it anything? It is the only dangerous tree on Luna, a destroyer of men. The limbs are like arms of flesh. They reach out and grasp one and squeeze until the victim is dead. Carol! Joe, hurry! This tree's got hold of Carol. We can't get her loose. Lorak, we... what can we do to stop it? There must be something. Perhaps there is. But why are you so concerned about this girl? We do not need her. Joe, Joe, do something. Get me out of here. This thing is squeezing me to death. Oh, Randy, give me a hand. We'll try to unwind this branch that's twisted around her. It will do no good, Joe. The tree is stronger than a hundred men. But we've got to do something. We just can't stand here and see her crush to death. Why not? Joe! Joe! Look, Lorak, Lorak, you said there might be a way to save her. What is it? Tell me how to get her out of the grass of that tree. I'll do anything you say. I'll even agree to this, this crazy plan of yours. All right. 
I will keep you to your promise. Here, take this knife. Cut the branch. That little knife, it's ridiculous. I couldn't cut a big branch with that. It will cut very easily. The branch is like flesh and there is no bone. Cut the branch quickly, but be sure another one does not wrap itself around you. All right, give me the knife. What are you going to do with that, Joe? Well, Laura says it'll cut the branch. It doesn't make sense, but I'm going to try. Hold on, Carol. I'll get you. Oh, I hope she's right. If this branch will cut... Look out, Joe. One of those branches is coming for you. Yeah, I see. Joe, quickly. Joe, look out. That other branch. Yes, I'm watching it. I'm watching it. Oh. I've got the limb all right. Now pull Carol out of the way. We've got her. Oh. Carol. You all right? Yeah. I guess... Joe. Joe, take me back to that palace. Yes. Peter and Randy will take you back. Joe is coming with me. What? Now, look here. Joe will come with me. He has made a certain promise that we must discuss with my father. Now, look here, Penum. I know I made that promise to Lorak. It was the only way to save Carol's life. And my daughter showed you how to do that, did she not? She kept her part of the bargain? Yes, but... Oh, I'll keep my promise if I have to. I guess none of us would stand a chance unless I did, but I'm trying to make you see how impossible it is. Impossible? Why? Look, I don't know whether you know anything about love here on Luna, but on Earth we do. And I'm in love with Carol. I don't love your daughter. That should make no difference if this is what she wants. But it makes a difference to me. Why, there are a lot of men back on Earth who'd go for a deal like this. If you let us go back, I'll send a dozen of them up here for her to look over and take her pick. But she only wants you. So... The alarm. There is trouble. Trouble? What kind of trouble? I do not know. Come on. Invaders! Invaders? What are you saying? Invaders! A whole fleet of spaceships have appeared suddenly out of nowhere. Our sentries did not even have time to sound the alarm. More Earth people. No, it couldn't be, Panum. We don't have a fleet of ships that would... Not be... Earth people. They're from Mars. Already their leaders have landed and announced they have come to conquer us. Not all the ships have landed. No, only a few when I left the Great Square. Then there is still time to keep the rest away from us. What are you doing? Releasing the lunar gravity. Without our gravity, they cannot land. Then I will use the repulsion ray and drive them off. You mean you can control gravity of the whole planet right from here, from this control board? Of course. There. We are too late for noon. Even while you were going to the controls, they've landed out there with the speed of light. You did not release the gravity soon enough. And they're carrying strange weapons. Wait. Let me look out there. They are marching right on the palace. What is the matter with our guards? What is it, Joe? What's happening? People from Mars, they're coming into attack. You can see what's happening to our guards, Panoom. They're disintegrating them with those strange weapons as they come. Our people are powerless against them. Hey, this is a fine way to end up. Isn't there anything you can do, Panoom? There is nothing. We have no defense against people such as these. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe we have. What do you mean, Joe? When we landed, you took our guns, our automatics. Where are they? They are right here. But do you think that those ineffectual little Earth weapons would have any effect on men with ray guns? Well, I'm not so sure about that. They've got the offense all right, but what about their defense? Let's have those guns. But they will disintegrate you as they are doing to the others as soon as they see well, you. Well, they're not going to see us first. And I've got a hunch even those guys can't stand up against a forty-five. Well, here are the guns. Okay. Okay. Hey, come on. Come on. Grab one, Doc. Okay. You too, Randy. Yeah. Each one of us will take one of those windows, stay out of sight, and start firing the leaders when I say. Right. Got it. All right. Come on. I'll get that leader first, the one in front. And, oh, uh, Panum, if this works and we save Luna for you, will you let us go back to Earth? If you save us, you may do as you wish. Okay, then. Here we go. Let him have it. Joe, you got their leader. He's fallen. I got his sidekick, too. Oh, they seem to be bewildered. Panum, you've got a big loudspeaker outside. I saw it. Yes, Switch it on and start talking. Tell them to get in their ships and take off or we'll kill every one of them. But, Joe, you couldn't do that. You'll run out of ammunition. Well, they don't know that. And maybe they can't understand what Panum's saying. Well, they'll get the idea anyway. Go ahead, Panum. Yes, yes. And keep up the firing, but not too fast. We've got to make every shot count and don't get in sight. Boy, I got that big one. Attention. Attention. You will all be killed like your leaders. 
Unless you leave at once in your ships. We have a weapon that will kill you all. Go to your ships at once and take off. Go at once! Joe, they seem to understand what he said. At least they've stopped. They can understand our shots and their dead leaders, that's certain. Look, they're running back for their ships. I hope they don't get ours by mistake. That would be the end. They wouldn't know how to operate the DM-1. Yeah? Yeah, they're leaving. Look at them go. Shall I say anything more? No, Panum. Looks like you've said enough. They'll be off Luna before you can count to 20. See? There goes the first ship. And another. And another. They have gone. Yeah. And we made a bargain, Panum. Father, I heard what he made you say, but if you let them go... I know, Lorak, I know. But there is no other way. We have made a promise, and we must keep it. Don't feel too badly about it, Lorak. I'll send up a bunch of candidates better than me, and you can take your choice. I hope that you two will come again soon, Joe. The Earth people of tomorrow and the Lunar people of today must be friends. Uh, yeah, that's right. Well, Your Majesty, if you'll just get ready to operate that gravity control of yours again, we'll shove off and... and, uh... Don't think it hasn't been fun. Gentlemen and Carol, these are the most amazing reports I could have imagined. Joe, you receive high claim for your work as head of the expedition. Thanks, Dr. Griffin. Yes, you've now proved that it's possible to travel out into space. And backward in time, don't forget, sir. I thought we'd never get caught up with today. (laughs) I can imagine. Yes, you've all done well, as a starter. But there's more to be done. You were not able to bring back photographs, geological data. That's as much as we could do to bring ourselves back. So, that will be our next project. Your next trip should be easier. The moon people are friendly to you now. So on your next flight... What, Dr. Griffin, you mean we got to go up there again? Why not? You know all about it now. But we can discuss that at a future date. Now, you had better all get some rest. <laughs> oh, boy, and am I going to sleep for a million years. Randy, don't use that word. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, the old boy seems to be pleased. Yeah, we keep our jobs. Come in, Joe. Yep. No, wait a minute, Joe. I want to talk to you. Uh, okay, Carol. I'll see you guys later. Right. Yeah. All right, honey. What's on your mind? Well, in the first place, you're not going on that next trip to the moon. I'm not going to have that Laurel Eye up there getting another chance at you. Oh? And in the second place, you and I are going to town and get a marriage license the first thing we do. And we're going to get married. Today. <laughs> All right, honey. You know, you, you sound just like Lorak. I do not. Sure you do. One of those what Lorak wants, Lorak gets things. Joe? I'm only kidding, honey. You know I love you. Come here. Mm-hmm. That's better. Darling? Yeah? You didn't like that Lorak better than me, did you? Well, she did have her good points. You didn't. <laughs> of course not. I'd take you any day instead of that gal. Besides... Lorax has been dead a million years, and I like him better when they're alive. He stood there on the floor of the sculptor's studio, his eyes fixed on the man who was climbing higher and higher on the marble statue that towered above him. His lips curled as he heard the desperate pleading. You've got to give me a chance. My work is good, really good. Look at this figure. The line. The power of these lines. I tell you, there's no use climbing up there. My mind's made up. And this higher figure. Look. It's like music. Music in stone. Music in stone. Murder in stone. Attention, all units. General alarm. Attention, all units. General alarm. Criminal at large. Repeat, attention, general alarm, attention, listeners, criminal at large, wanted for murder, $1,000 reward. Repeat, $1,000 reward. Attention, all listeners, criminal at large.
Criminal at Large, radio's newest, most exciting mystery show. A complete half-hour mystery play, and then a thrilling nationwide manhunt with a chance for you, the listener, to win $1,000 for the capture of Criminal at Large. Listen first for drama, action, excitement. But listen, too, for the clues scattered throughout the play. Clues that can bring you the reward of $1,000 in cash. Immediately following tonight's broadcast of Criminal at Large, somewhere in the United States, a person answering the exact description of the criminal in the play will begin a seven-day tour of the nation, stopping in towns and cities, perhaps your town, your city. Remember, the clues will be scattered throughout the play itself. Listen carefully. Watch for description of height. Age, color of hair, clothes he is wearing, identifying marks, habits, mannerisms, the type of place in which he is most likely to be found. The criminal at large will not resist capture. When you find him, he will quickly admit his identity and arrange for immediate payment to you of $1,000. If he is not found before next Friday night, the reward will be increased to $2,000 for next week's fugitive with an additional $1,000 being added each week until you, the listener, discovers the criminal at large. And now the play. You'll enjoy it whether or not you're interested in the $1,000 reward. But you'll enjoy it more if you play the detective game All America is Playing. Remember, listen for the clues that can bring you $1,000 for the capture of Criminal at Large. There in his studio, Greg felt almost like a god. Those marble figures towering high above him, his hands had created those figures, given them warmth, almost life. To the 30-year-old sculptor, this was the hour of triumph. That huge memorial group, it was a dream completed. A dream that started the day Ricky had given him the commission. He should have known Ricky wasn't giving him anything. He'd never given him anything. Ricky hated Greg. Hated him because Ruth loved him. Ruth was the only thing Ricky had ever wanted. And he couldn't get. And he wasn't a good loser. No, anything Greg got from Ricky, he paid for. This time, the price tag was... Death. Yes, old Franz's death. The huge block of cement supporting the tall marble statue. Franz's body was in that block. Franz, whom Greg loved and who he killed. And that was only part of it. Part of the horrible thing began when Franz came to the studio to tell Greg that the plan for a statue to be erected in a central square had been approved. The committee has approved the memorial, even appropriated the money. It's to be in marble. And to be done by a sculptor of this state. Oh, Franz, if they name me. That victory group of mine, think of it done in marble. Massive stone and power. Uh, wait, Greg. A committee is to choose the sculptor. A committee headed by Ricky Thorne. Ricky? But why? Why? Ricky's no artist. He has money, Greg. Money and influence. Well, maybe the rest of the committee will... Oh, what's the use of pretending? Ricky will see I don't get it just as he's done before. I think you are wrong, Greg. Ricky wants to help you. Even with your plan to build an art museum, he helps you. Helps me. But he does. He helped raise almost $15,000. Even leaves the money in your care until the building can be started. Sure, because he knew what it would do to me. Not having enough to live on, sitting here without a dime to buy stone, without the tools that I need. And all the while having that money, money I can't touch. Oh, I don't think Ricky meant that. No, no, nobody ever thinks Ricky means that. He's clever, all right. Clever and cruel. Oh, Greg, Ron. Oh, wait, are you here? Oh, here what? With the state memorial, it's been approved. Greg, do you realize what it means? Yes, I do. Another chance for Ricky to knife me in the back. Oh, Greg. Ricky's with me. He's parking his car, and he has wonderful news. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, how sorry he'll be that I didn't get the commission. How he worked for me. How he pleaded with the rest of the committee. No, Ruth, is no use. Hiya, Greg. Ruth, tell you the news. She told us only... Wait a minute, that... France. Wait a minute. Let Ricky tell it. He enjoys this, don't you, Ricky? 
A chance to watch me squirm a little. Oh, now, wait secret. a minute, old man. Wait a minute. No, Give me no, a no. chance. Go ahead, go ahead. Tell me why I wasn't picked as the sculptor. But you were picked. Here. These are the official papers. You mean... I mean you've been commissioned to do that victory group of yours. In marble. <laughs> But it was. Everything Greg had ever wanted, all his plans, his dreams, handed to him by Ricky. Greg tried to take it in. He tried to shut out the little voice that was beating against his brain. Don't trust him. Ricky hates you. He wouldn't give you this. He wouldn't make it easier for you to marry Ruth. Watch out for him. But... There were the official papers commissioning Greg to do the memorial. Ricky couldn't stop that. Nothing could stop it. This was it for Greg. The start of everything. Of horror and violence and murder. How Ricky must have laughed as Greg plunged eagerly into preparations. But it was like being a new person... He was no longer an unknown struggling artist. Now he was the Gregory Hunt, commissioned to do a quarter of a million dollar memorial. How simple it was for him to arrange for credit for everything. And in the months that followed, the group slowly took form, became even greater than Greg had dared to dream. Even Franz approved, good old Franz, the most exacting of teachers. Franz looked at the work, smiling pleasure as he said, Yeah, Craig. It is good. I am proud of you. But always I knew your hands held the key to beauty. Oh, oh, wait now. What about all those times you made me destroy a model just when I was sure it was perfect? Training, Craig. Training so that now you can do a great thing like this. But you must be careful, Craig. The size of this. So tall it is. Yes, I know. I'm going to brace it with steel rods in the back. You see those two forms? They'll be cement blocks to hold the rod. Yeah. Good. And then later the bronze base will give added support. But you should put the rods up now. Well, it's just that I hate to take the time. The, the days seem too short as it is. <laughs> like a man with a sweetheart, no time for other things. No wonder they say sculptors are a little mad. <laughs> Passing of time, the changing of seasons, they meant nothing to Greg. All that mattered were the figures emerging from the marble. Finally, it was time to order delivery of the bronze base. Up till then, Ricky hadn't even visited the studio, but he showed up that day and seemed strangely interested in the matter of the bronze base. His voice was very casual. Oh, uh, Greg, about that bronze base, won't it cost quite a bit? Mm, yes, $12,000. But it's all right. You see, Ricky, having this commission makes it easy. The Atlas Company said not to worry about payment until I was paid. The Atlas Company? Uh, that's where you're getting the bronze? Mm -hmm. I'm going down there now. Why not come along? Oh, well, thanks. I uh, I have an appointment. Oh, well, wait, though. At least you have time to see how the work's going. Hey, let me show no, you. No, 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 Greg. I, I'm in a hurry, really. Some other time. Greg watched Ricky walk out through the door. Suddenly, he had that same feeling of danger, of warning. Something about the way Ricky had looked, the casual way he had spoken. Greg shrugged away the thought, pulled his light-colored trench coat over his brown suit, and went to see about delivery of the bronze vase for the statue. At the Apollos Company, the clerk seemed courteous as ever. Why, uh, yes, Mr. Hunt, the vase is all ready for you. A magnificent piece of work. Oh, fine, fine. How soon can it be delivered? Immediately, of course. Well, that is, <laughs> after the uh, payment... Payment? Well, yes. $12,037. That includes delivery, of course. Oh, but I've made arrangements to pay for the base when I get my check for the memorial. Oh, huh. I'm afraid there's been a misunderstanding. No, no. I, I made it quite clear that... Wait, uh, may I see the manager? Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Hunt, but it was the manager who instructed me. The base cannot be delivered until we receive payment. Payment in full. <laughs> Why had they suddenly closed off his credit? Greg had made the mistake of forgetting Ricky hated him. Why, he even went to him for help. As always, Ricky was polite, polite, 
but regretful. Oh, I'm awfully sorry, Greg, if there's any way I could help but, you. But, Ricky, there is a way. It's only $12,000, and you know the fee I'm to get for the memorial? Yeah, that's just it. I do know. I'm on the committee that appointed you. It has to pass on your work when it's done. But that wouldn't make any difference oh, about... But it would make a difference. Look, this is a state project, and that means politics. If they found out that I'd loaned you money, they'd charge collusion, cancel the whole thing. But, Ricky, I've got to get that money. I've got to. But Greg couldn't get the money. Every door that had been wide open was suddenly closed. He gave up. Sat there in his studio like a half-dead person, staring at the monument towering 60 feet above him. The monument that meant everything in the world to him that might never be finished. And then again, that little voice started beating against his brain. That money, the $15,000 you're holding for the art museum, it's in your name. You could repay it from your fee. No one would ever know. It would be months before the material for the museum would be available. Yes, he'd have plenty of time. How simple it was. Maybe they're always simple, the things that lead to murder. They didn't question Greg at the bank. He hurried back to the studio, called the Atlas Company, and told them he'd be right down with the money. But just as he hung up, old Franz walked into the studio. Oh, hi, Franz. I'm sorry I'm just on my way up. No time to waste these days, hmm? I see also, no time yet to put up those steel rods. Greg, if that should fall... Oh, don't worry, it's all right. Everything's all right. Mm-hmm. And yesterday, there was no hope in all the world. <laughs> well, that was yesterday. Ah, the company changes its mind, eh? The bronze base. They trust you for it after all. Well, they don't have to. Look, I'm paying cash for it. Greg, all that money, where did it come from? Ricky? No, no, I, I borrowed it. Yes, I borrowed it. At the bank. I, uh, I used the marble for security. But the marble is not paid for. Greg, look at me. Where is that money from? Well, I told you, the bank, they... Oh, what difference does it make? Greg, the truth. You must tell me the truth. Well, I tell you, it doesn't matter. It's just for a few weeks. They're not ready to start the museum, and by that time Greg, I'll be... no. Able... That money is not yours. Well, it's in my care. I'll put it back, Franz. It's just a loan. Look, Franz, I've got to. I've got to finish this work. It's my whole life. It's everything. Yeah, and that is why you can't. Beauty is not the thing only of hands and chisels. If you did this, it would show. There would be ugliness. No, there wouldn't. There wouldn't. The group's almost done. I'll have time to... No. Hey, Franz, wait. Franz, where are you going? To Ruth. You will listen to her, and she will stop you because she loves you. Oh, Ruth won't understand. She think I was no. stealing it. I... Franz, wait. No, I do it for you, Greg, to stop a bad... You're not going to tell Ruth. You can't stop me no. now. Nobody's going to stop me now. Greg, let me go. Let me go. I said you're not going to. I told you not to, Franz. Franz, speak to me. I didn't mean to hurt you. I didn't... Franz! Franz, you're... You're dead. You have just heard the first act of tonight's play on Criminal at Large. Remember, immediately following this broadcast, a man answering the exact description of the sculptor in this play will start on a coast-to-coast tour of the nation, stopping in towns and cities along the way. If you recognize that person, he will immediately admit his identity and arrange for payment to you of $1,000 in cash. We'll continue with tonight's play in just a moment. And now, back to Criminal at Large. A young sculptor, Gregory Hunt, needing money to complete a memorial statue which was to be his masterpiece, embezzled funds left in his care. Surprised in this act by his old art instructor, Franz, Greg had struggled with the old man. In his fury, he'd struck Franz with a heavy chisel, and now the old instructor lies dead on the studio floor. They wouldn't believe it was an accident. They call it murder. If only he could find some way to... But wait. There was a way. The cement. The 
platforms were ready for the huge cement blocks into which the rods were to be fastened to support the statue until it was in its permanent base. All Greg had to do was mix the cement and pour both blocks. They'd look the same. No one would know that in one of them was Franz's body. Greg waited two days for the cement to harden. Not answering the door, not sleeping, just sitting there waiting. Afraid to look at that cement block. Afraid that in some way he'd be able to see Franz. His body held upright in the cement, his eyes open, staring. And then the second night he fell into an exhausted sleep. It was 9.30 the next morning when he was awakened by someone at the door. Oh. Who is it? Oh, it's me, Greg. Ruth. Well, I've been wondering what... Well, Greg, what's the matter? Have you been sick? No, I... I fell asleep sitting up last night. Oh, but you look so... Greg, your hand's all bandaged. I... I cut it on the marble. It's my left hand. It doesn't matter. Well, of course it matters. Oh, Greg, you look so tired. You're killing yourself with this work. Yes, but it's almost done. <sighs> oh, Greg, and it's so beautiful. But... What's wrong? I... I... Nothing. I... Well, maybe it's just because it's so big. Looming so far above us. But just for a second, I felt a chill. As though... As though what? Well... As though there was something, somebody watching. Oh, Greg, there's nothing wrong, is there? I mean... Well, of course there's nothing wrong. Who's that? Did someone come with you? Oh, no, I came alone. Why? Were you expecting someone? The man who stood there chewed sleepily on a toothpick. Greg knew what he was as surely as though he'd worn his detective's badge on his lapel. The man walked in, slowly looking around the studio. Uh, you happen to know where I can find Fran Shukin? Oh, Fran? Is there something wrong with Who Fran? are you? Uh, she happens to be a friend of mine. Now, what is it you want? Nothing. Just looking for Fran Shukin. His landlady's kind of worried. Seems nobody's seen him for a couple of days. She said he was good friends with some blonde-haired artist in this building. It's you, ain't it? Yes. Well, that is, France and I are good friends... But I haven't seen it for several days. Uh-huh. Hey, aren't you scared this thing will fall over on you? It can't. It's braced by those rods and then anchored in cement. I just poured those blocks this week. Yeah, I noticed you got cement splattered all over your shoes. Good-sized blocks, ain't they? Well, they have to be. That marble weighs tons. Where if it ever fell... Yeah. It... Well, let us know if you hear anything from Fran Schuchin. What a strange person. Greg, the, the cold way he looked at you. Oh, Greg, what's wrong? Don't let me alone, will you? I got enough worries trying to get this work done, having to worry about materials, about money. But a I thought those he... things were taken care of. Well, Ricky. Oh, was... sure, Ricky said. He doesn't know what it is to be broke to lie awake nights worrying about pennies. Oh, Greg, I didn't know. Well, you shouldn't have to worry about money. It isn't fair. I'm going to do something about it. You're an artist, Fred. You shouldn't have to be bothered with that thing. Why didn't you tell me before? The detective will be back. Something you can work out. But it doesn't matter. All that matters is my work. Finally, Ruth left the studio. Greg went to the Atlas Company, paying the embezzled money for the bronze base. And again, he plunged into his work. Forgetting everything except the creation of beauty. And it was beauty. To Greg, that made it worth it. Yes, worth even Franz's body inside that block of cement. Then the detective came again. He pushed past Greg into the studio and leaned against the block in which Franz's body was hidden. I just dropped by, still looking for that old guy, Franz Schuchen. You never heard anything from him, huh? No, I I told you I spend most of my time working. How come you weren't in when I called yesterday? Well, I have to spend hours at the library on research at museums. It's part of my work. Yeah? You're about done with this, huh? Uh, yes, almost. Uh, in fact, the committee will be here this week to accept it. After that, it'll be moved to the state park. Those blocks of cement, too? No, you see, it'll be on a permanent foundation. It won't need those supporting rods then. Uh-huh. Those rods don't look very strong. They're only temporary. Yeah, 
And what are you going to do with the cement blocks? I, uh, I don't know. Well, give us a ring if you hear anything about Fran Shoup. Greg knew he'd be back. He always came back. But in a few days, it wouldn't matter. The blocks would be gone by then. Greg would have them hauled out to where the city was filling in that swamp. Maybe then Greg could forget them and the thing hidden inside. At last, it was the day for the committee to inspect Greg's work. He waited there in the studio alone. Only a few more hours and he'd be free from tenseness, fear, waiting. Ricky, come in, come in. Where are the others? Others? Oh, the committee. Well, you see, they, uh, well, they sort of agreed to leave the final decision up to me. Oh, oh, fine, fine. Uh, Ricky, I, I haven't said anything, but I, I, I guess you know how much it's meant to me, all your help. Oh, skip it, I haven't done anything. Well, shall we have a look at your work? <laughs> I've never seen it. <laughs> yes, I know. In fact, you made almost a point of not seeing it. Well, I wanted to be impartial. Then if I approved your work, it'd be on merit, not friendship. Oh, well, don't worry, Ricky, it's good. Not just because it's mine... Sometimes it seems as though it weren't mine. As though it belonged to someone greater than I. <laughs> you sound like you did in college. <laughs> you used to say I was an artistic phony. Yeah, and Ruth used to jump all over me. We've come a long way since then, haven't we, Greg? Yes, uh, Ricky, I, I don't want to hurry you, but I'm... Your whole future rests on my words. Ruth should be here, huh, Greg? Uh, yes. Uh, now, Ricky, if you want to come She'd over here... She'd be on I'll... your side, wouldn't she, Greg? She was always on your side. Well, let's not go into that, Ricky. It doesn't make any difference now. Besides... Maybe it will. At least it'll be easier for you, having her. Easier? Yes. You know how Ruth is, as far as you're concerned. Failing with this won't make any difference to her. Failing? But I haven't failed. Well, Ricky, it's the best thing I've done, better than I ever dreamed. Yeah, I know you've tried. Ricky, you're talking as though... As though I might decide it isn't acceptable? But you can't. The commission, you gave it to me yourself. Yes, because I wanted to help you. No, no, you wouldn't. Remember you... the terms of the commission, Greg. The finished work had to be approved. Oh, Ricky, even if you hate Why me... Why should I hate you? This is business, Greg. And you... You're going to... I'm sorry. Sorry. Sure, of course. And I was fool enough to believe you. You never meant to accept it, did you? Oh, I know it's tough... Particularly when you've tied up so much money in it. It's going to be a problem, isn't it? Paying for the marble and that bronze base. That was it. Ricky had done this, done it all. Putting the museum fund in Greg's care, then stopping his credit at the Atlas Company. He'd known Greg would use that money. Then afterwards, when the work was refused, Greg would be exposed as a thief. And then... That little voice started again. Don't let him stand there laughing at you. It's his fault you stole the money that you accidentally killed Franz. He should be killed, too. But this time it wasn't going to be an accident. This time it would look like an accident. The huge weight of that marble towering above him. But wait. Ricky mustn't suspect. He had to make Ricky think he was still begging for another chance. Please, please, Ricky, you've got to listen. If you'd, if you'd look at my work, it's good, Ricky. Look, it's, it's really good. Greg, there's no use climbing up there. My mind's made up. I'm sorry. Look but... at it. This figure, Ricky. Look, the length, the power of these lines. I'm down, Greg. I tell you, there's no use. And this higher figure. Look, Ricky, look. It's like music. Music in stone. Music in stone. Murder in stone. Greg could see Ricky's face far below, his lips curling in contempt. Now Greg was near the metal plate which the steel rods were fastened to. He lifted the heavy mallet, judged the blow carefully. <coughs> Bolts loosened. The massive figures trembled. Then they began to lean. Ricky was trying to see what Greg was doing. Greg kept pounding. Now the plate was loose. The tons of marble hung in delicate dread balance. And then started over. Greg forced his voice to a scream. Go move! Look, Ricky! Let it my word! Greg 
had done it. Ricky was dead, pinned beneath the huge blocks of marble that had thundered 60 feet to the floor below. Greg let himself down from the scaffolding. And then the door was opening. Oh, Greg! Greg! Just as I turned in from the street, I heard the crash and... Oh, Greg. Oh, no. Oh, no. Don't look. Don't look. Ricky was standing in front of her when, when the rods gave way. He's dead. Oh, Greg. Oh. And this was to be such a happy day. I had good news for you. And... Good news? Yes. At front for the museum. I, I talked to the others. The money's yours now. The, the money's mine? Yes. We didn't know you needed funds, Greg. When I explained, they insisted that you take the money. The museum can wait. The words echoed against Greg's mind. The money was his. If they'd only done that when Franz was still alive, when... But wait, if the money was his, then he wasn't an embezzler. Yes, Greg, it was better than ever, wasn't it? Because Ricky couldn't stop you now. Ricky was dead. Ah, but you had to play it carefully. Call the police first, then. But you didn't have to call them. You turned, and there in the doorway was the detective, his cold eyes taking in the chaos of the studio. What happened? What's going on in there? The statue. What you warned me about. The steel rods pulled loose, and they came... Hey, wait a minute. You got somebody, huh? Who was it? Ricky. Ricky Thorne. Accident, huh? Yes, yes, he was in front of it. I shouted to him, but he didn't move fast enough, and I yeah. can't... You mind if I look around? Just curious. I can see how it happened, all right. Oh, Greg, what a horrible man. Those cold eyes and... Oh, Greg, wait, where are you going? I've got to get out. I can't stand Oh, Greg, here. wait! Hey, where'd he go? Oh, I don't know. He's completely unstrung by all this. Such a horrible thing. Yeah, pretty bad, all right. You know, for a minute, I couldn't figure out that accident story of his. Oh, it's not a story. Why, Greg might have been killed himself. Maybe that would have been easier. Easier than what they'll do to him up in that little room in the pen. Penitentiary? What are you talking about? I'm talking about murder. We won't have any trouble picking him up. We got a perfect description of him. We know where he spends his time. Oh, but you're out of your mind. It, it, It was an accident. Maybe. Doesn't matter. See, I've been looking around behind what's left of the statue... And there was an accident, one that your friend hadn't counted on. What do you mean? Ma, I'll show you. That ain't so bad. Just like you was sitting there in a cement chair. Like who was sitting there? Ma, I'll show you. See, when that statue fell, a big hunk of the marble fell over backwards. Well, what's that got to do with... And it fell right on this cement block, cracked it wide open. You see, uh, I finally found that Franz Schuken guy we've been looking for. <laughs> At this moment, somewhere in the United States, a person answering the exact description of Gregory Hunt is beginning a seven-day tour of the nation. $1,000 reward. Criminal at large. Gregory Hunt wanted for murder. Sculptor by profession. 30 years old. 5 feet 11. Bandage on left hand. Cement stains on shoes. Wearing brown suit. White trench coat. Frequents the vicinity of public libraries, parks, museums, civic buildings. $1,000 reward. Yes, $1,000 reward to you, the listener, for the capture of this week's criminal at large. You've heard his description, the places he's most apt to be. When you find him and say to him, are you the criminal at large, he will quickly admit his identity and arrange for you to receive $1,000 in cash for the capture of criminal at large person portraying the criminal at large and the entire operation of radio's most exciting mystery game is under heavy bond with Lloyd's of London and conducted under the constant supervision of the world famous Burns Detective Agency. Tune in next week for the next thrilling mystery play in this exciting series. Hear a report on the capture of Gregory Hunt. Hear the new clues for the next week's criminal at large. Remember a new play each Friday night and a new reward of $1,000 for the capture of Criminal at Large. The 
WOR Special Features Division presents a program in observance of the annual award by the Drama Critics Circle of New York to the best play of the season. The award for the 1947-48 season went to Tennessee Williams' play, A Streetcar Named Desire. And on this program, you will hear several scenes from this prize-winning production with Jessica Tandy, Kim Hunter, Marlon Brando, and Carl Malden playing the roles they created on Broadway. Mrs. Irene M. Selznick, producer of the play, is here with us, and Elia Kazan, who directed the drama, will accept the award for Mr. Williams, who is in Italy. The presentation will be made by John Mason Brown, distinguished critic and president of the Drama Critic Circle. Mr. Brown. Let the first robin come bob, bob, bobbing along, and all of us can be certain, even in the contemporary world, of one thing. The season for prize-giving is upon us. There are Americans more loved and less abused, more loving and less abusive, too. But even we, regardless of our mounting ages, seem susceptible to the spring. For then it is that we meet, as we did on Wednesday last, at the Algonquin, to vote upon what in our group opinion has been the season's best play on Broadway. Our sessions in the past have often been stormy enough to make the Executive Council of the U.N. look to its laurels. Last Wednesday, however, we met without raised voices, bloody noses, pierced hearts, or even wounded feelings. A group of Quakers could not have been friendlier or less warlike. This year, it was Terence Rattigan's moving and well-written drama, The Winslow Boy, which was chosen as the season's best foreign play. The circle's choice for the season's best American play was A Streetcar Named Desire by Tennessee Williams. It is the second time a drama by Tennessee Williams has been honored by the reviewers, the first time being in 1945 with The Glass Menagerie. A Streetcar Named Desire is a fascinating and unflinching study of the disintegration of a southern school teacher who has not confined her professional activities to the classroom. This school teacher is a woman who, well, in deference to the radio's extreme sensibilities, can perhaps most safely be described as having lost her amateur standing. It is her descent into madness that Mr. Williams follows. He writes of her and her days in New Orleans with both force and sensitivity. Mr. Williams passes no moral judgment on his school teacher. He does not condemn her. He allows her to destroy herself and invites us to watch her in the process. The Circle is proud to uh, bestow its prize again upon Tennessee Williams. He, alas, is in Europe at this moment. As a matter of fact, just this morning from Rome, the Critics Circle has received from Mr. Williams a cable reading to all of you my deepest and most heartfelt thanks, which I will try to express in good work since I cannot in words. But though Tennessee Williams is absent, the Circle is proud to have Ilya Kazan present to accept its award in Mr. Williams' name. Mr. Kazan is one of the finest directors our theatre knows. It was he, after all, who directed All My Sons, which won last year's Critics' Prize. His direction of this year, on a streetcar named Desire, is as sensitive and creative as Mr. Williams' writing of the play. Mr. Kazan. Thank you, John. Of course, I'm most sorry that Tennessee himself can't be here to be honored. On the other hand, I do have an opportunity to say a few things about him that I could never say to him or even if he were listening. You may not know it, but every director secretly prides himself on his ability, generally unappreciated, he believes, as a play constructionist or script expert. I was no exception. But unfortunately, in the differences that Tennessee and I had in rehearsal, most of which time has mercifully erased from my memory, experiment in the first audience proved him right too often for my comfort. I also found that while I didn't know as much as I thought about playmaking, he knew considerable about staging plays, particularly his own. I found him an inexhaustible source of stage business. I finally arranged to keep him tethered to the footlights and have his food and liquid refreshment brought him to him. I wanted him there constantly and used him as a cook uses a superbly stocked larder. The significance of this might escape you unless I add that too often the only thought the director has for the author after a couple of days of his company at rehearsals is, oh, please, where can I send this man for two weeks while I stage his play? But not so here. Tennessee knows as if by instinct that the theater is the collective expression of many arts and crafts, and it conveys what it does to the audience through a full repertoire of these means. Words, of course, but action as much, and also music, props, paint and light, sound and color. 
And so I'm sure today Tennessee would want me to express on his behalf his great debt not only to the actors who are seen and applauded, but to other craftsmen as well. To Joe Mazzina for a setting which successfully and superbly houses both the action and the spirit of Streetcar Named Desire. And to Lucinda Ballard, who found just the right thing to put on the back of each actor to make him meaningful and still humble and right. And now, speaking for myself, allow me to note that for the second year in succession, a young and comparatively fresh playwright, playwright has been honored in this forum. Both Arthur Miller and Tennessee Williams are at the threshold of their careers. And it makes me particularly happy that our New York theater is so richly replenishing itself, is so fertile and growing. It makes me proud to be part of it. Thank you, Mr. Kazan. The circle is also pleased today to have Mrs. Irene M. Selznick present. Mrs. Selznick had the discernment and the courage to produce A Streetcar Named Desire. We would like to hear from you, Mrs. Selznick. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I'm humbly and gratefully aware that my brief career in the theater has been blessed with great good fortune. First, that rare artist, Tennessee Williams, entrusted me with the production of A Streetcar Named Desire, which was a true privilege. Then to secure the extraordinary talents of Ilya Kazan made it seem that the guards of the drama were watching over Streetcar. To prove it, they brought us the brilliant performances of Jessica Tandy, Marlon Brando, Kim Hunter, Carl Malden, others of our cast, and the splendid contributions of Joe Mildina and Lucinda Ballard. For all of them, and for the many others to whom the production was a labor of love, I want to express the happiness and appreciation we feel to be permitted to share in this tribute to Tennessee. But to you, Mr. Brown, and your eminent colleagues, I must speak bluntly. I simply love the critics of this year. Thank you, Mrs. Helsnick. And now to the play itself, with Mr. Kazan serving as narrator. The Sabbath being the Sabbath, and the radio being the radio, A Streetcar Named Desire is not an easy drama to present on the air of a Sunday afternoon. That is one of its virtues. I trust that what follows will not be too inhibited or diluted to suggest the full strength and power of A Streetcar Named Desire when it is seen on the stage. Blanche Dubois has come from Laurel, Mississippi, to visit her sister, Stella, in New Orleans. To reach Stella's home, Blanche has taken the streetcar named Desire, which bangs up one narrow street of the French Quarter and down another. She finds her sister living in a shabby two-room apartment with her Polish-American husband, Stanley Kowalski. Stanley has no background and little education, but he does possess a strong animal magnetism. And Stella is so deeply in love with him, in spite of the contrast between them. Oh, stop, Tutti Frutti. Oh, Stanley. Hey, what's all this monkey doing? Uh, Stan, I'm taking Blanche to Galatoire's for supper and then to a show because it's your poker night. Hey, how about my supper? I'm not going to Galatoire's tonight. I put your cold plate on ice. Well, ain't this just dandy? I I'm going to try to keep Blanche out till your poker party breaks up because she's very sensitive and I don't know how she'd take it. Oh, you better give me some money. Yeah, help yourself. Hey, where is she? She's in the bathroom soaking in a hot tub to quiet her nerves. She is terribly upset. Uh, over what? Well, she's been through such an ordeal. Yeah, well, that singing doesn't sound like she was upset. Well, she is. Dan Blanche says we've lost Belle Reeve. What do you mean, a place in the country? Mm-hmm. Well, how? Oh, it had to be sacrificed or something. Yeah, well, uh, let's have a gander at the bill of sale. I haven't seen any. Oh, what do you mean? She didn't show you no papers, no deed of sale, no nothing like that? Well, it seems like it wasn't sold. Well, then what was it, then? Give away the charity? She'll hear you. Well, I don't care if she hears me. Let's see the papers. There weren't any papers. She didn't show any papers. I don't care about papers. Uh, have you ever heard of the Napoleonic Code, Stella? No, Stanley. I haven't heard of the Napoleonic Code. No, all right. Code. Will you just let me enlighten you on a point or two? Yes. Now, in the state of Louisiana, we have what's known as the Napoleonic Code, according to which that what belongs to the wife belongs to the husband also, and vice versa. Like, you know, it looks to me like you've been swindled, baby. And when you get swindled on the Napoleonic Court, I get swindled, too, and I don't like to get swindled. Look, there's plenty of time to ask her questions later. But if you do now, she'll only go to pieces again. 
I don't understand what happened to Belle Reed, but you don't know how ridiculous you're being when you suggest that my sister or I, anyone else of our family, could have perpetrated a swindle. Now, where's the money if the place was sold? Not sold. Lost. Lost. You're lost, huh? Yeah, now, now, look, at, look at all these clothes in her trunk. Well, you think she got the, them out of teacher's pay? Hush, Dad. Well, will you look at these fine feathers and furs? Doctor, what is that? This is a solid gold dress, I believe. Now, look at this one. Oh, please, Dad. And what's this here? Genuine fur fox piece that's a half a mile long. That, where, uh, where are your fox pieces, Stella? That's ridiculous, Dad. Uh, what do we got here in this jewel box? We got pearls, ropes of them. Well, now, what is this, sister? Is a deep sea diver? Stanley, you don't know what you're talking Yeah, bracelets, solid gold. And where are your pearls and gold bracelets, Stella? Be still, Stanley. Are you kidding? Like, the, here, here's your plantation right here, what's left of it. Oh, you've no idea how stupid and hard you're being. I'm going outside and get some air. Oh, well, go ahead. You come on out with me while Blanche is getting dressed. Look, since when you give me orders? Are you going to stay here and insult oh, her? Darn tootin' I'm going to stay here. Look, Stan, try to understand and be nice to her. Admire her dress and tell her she's looking wonderful. That's important to Blanche, her little weakness. Yeah, yeah, I get the idea. Hello, Stanley. Hiya, Blanche. Here I am, all freshly bathed and scented and feeling like a brand new human being. Well, that's good. Where's Stella? She's outside getting some air. How do I look? Look okay. Many thanks. Well, looks like my trunk has exploded. Yeah, me and Stella was helping you unpack. Well, you certainly did a fast and thorough job of it. Well, it certainly looks like you raided some stylish shops in Paris. Yes, clothes are my passion. Yeah, what does it cost for a string of furs like that? Why, those were a tribute from an admirer of mine. Well, he must have a lot of admiration. In my youth, I excited some admiration. But look at me now. Would you think it possible that I was ever considered to be attractive? You look so okay. I was fishing for compliments, Stanley. But no, I don't go in for that stuff. What stuff? Compliments to women about their looks. I'm, I never met a woman yet that didn't know she was good-looking or not without being told. You know, and there's some of them that give themselves credit for more than they've got. You know, some men are took in by this Hollywood glamour stuff, and there's some men that are not. I'm sure you belong in the second category. That's right. I cannot imagine any witch of a woman casting a spell over you. That's right. You're simple, straightforward, honest. But on the primitive side, I should think. To interest you, a woman would... Lay have... her cards on the table. Well, I never cared for wishy-washy people. That's why when you walked in here last night, I said to myself, my sister's married a man. Of course, that was all I could tell about you at the moment. Blanche, in the state of Louisiana, there's such a thing as the Napoleonic Code. They, according to which whatever belongs to my wife is also mine and vice versa. Oh, cards on the table. Well, that suits me. I know I fib a good deal. After all, a woman's charm is 50% illusion. When a thing is important, I tell the truth. And this is the truth. I haven't cheated my sister. Nor you, nor anyone else, as long as I... All right, where are the papers? In your trunk? Everything I own is in that trunk. I keep my papers mostly in this tin box. Yeah, well, uh, what's them underneath? Those are love letters. Yellowing with antiquity. All from one boy. Let me see them. <gasps> Give those back to me! Now, I'm just going to have a look at these first. Uh, the touch of your hand and uh, uh, Don't pull that stuff. Well, no. well, what are they? Poems. A dead boy wrote them. I heard him the way you'd like to hurt me, but you can't. I'm not young and vulnerable anymore, but my young husband was. Never mind about that. Give them back to me. Well, take them. Well, what's so special about them? I'm sorry. Everyone has something he won't let others touch because of their... Their intimate nature. Here are the papers you want. Uh, uh, who was that? It is Ambler and Ambler. The firm that made loans on the place. Well, then it was lost on a mortgage. That must have been what happened. No, I don't want no ifs, ands, or buts. Now, what is the rest of them papers? There are thousands of papers stretching back hundreds of years affecting Belle Reeve. I hereby endow you with them. Take them, peruse them, commit them to memory even. I think it wonderfully fitting that Belle Reeves should finally be this bunch of old papers in your big, 
capable hand. Weeks pass, and Blanche has become a fixture in the Kowalski household, with tension constantly mounting between her and Stanley. Knowing she must find a way out, Blanche clutches eagerly at the possibility of a romance with Harold Mitchell, a young man who works with Stanley. One evening, Blanche and Mitch return after an evening at an amusement park. Uh, I guess it must be pretty late and you're tired. Mitch, see if you can locate my door key in this purse. When I'm so tired, my fingers are all thumbs. Yeah, is this it? No, honey, that's the key to my trunk, which I must soon be packing. Why, you mean you're leaving here soon? I've outstayed my welcome. Oh, is, is this one it? Eureka! Honey, will you open the door? Well, I guess you want to go now. Can I, uh, I mean, well... Can I kiss you goodnight? Why do you always ask me if you may? Well, I don't know whether you want me Why to or not. So do- <laughs> Are you laughing at me? Oh, no, 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 honey. I, I'm not laughing at you. Come on in. The Lord and Lady of the House have not returned. We have a nightcap. Let's see the lights off, shall we? Uh-huh. Uh, you, you want a drink? I want you to have a drink. You've been so anxious and solemn all evening. We've both been anxious and solemn. And now for these last few remaining moments of our lives together, I want to create what of ease. <laughs> I'm lighting the candle. Oh, that's good. <laughs> we're going to be very bohemian. We're going to pretend that we're sitting in a little artist cafe on the left bank of Paris. <laughs> here. Here, I found some liquor. Just enough for two shots without any dividends, honey. There. Oh, Oh, boy. That's good. Sit down. Why don't you take off your coat and loosen your collar? Oh, no. No, I... Well, I... All right, if you say so. This is a nice coat. What kind of material is it? It's a very lightweight alpaca. Oh, lightweight. Wait, alpaca. Uh, a man with a heavy bill like mine has to be careful of what he puts on him so he don't look too clumsy. Well, you're not the delicate type. You have a massive bone structure and a very impressive physique. I thank you. Blanche. Blanche, guess how much I weigh. Oh, I'd say in the vicinity of the 180. Oh, no, no, no. I weigh 207 pounds, and I'm six feet one and one half inches tall on my bare feet. Oh. Without shoes on, and that is what I weigh stripped. My goodness, that's awe-inspiring. <laughs> well, my weight is not a very interesting subject to talk about. What is yours? You guess. Well, let me lift you. Oh, Samson. Well, go on, lift me. Uh, oh, well? My, you're light as a feather. <laughs> well, you may put me down now. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> Well, unhand me, sir. Oh, Blanche. Now, now, Mitch. Mitch. No, Blanche. Mitch, just because Stanley and Stella are not home is no reason you should... You, you shouldn't behave no, like a I, gentleman. I, I tell you, Blanche, I just... Just give me a slap whenever I step out of bounds. Well, that won't be necessary. Why, you're a natural gentleman. One of the very few there are left in the world. No, I... No, I, I, I don't want you to think that I'm severe or old maid school teachers or anything like that. It's, it's just... Well... Well, what? I guess it's just that I have old-fashioned ideals. Oh. Oh. oh, where's Stanley and Stella tonight? Oh, they've gone out with Mr. and Mrs. Hubble upstairs. Uh, you're an old friend of Stanley's. Well, we was together in the 241st. Has he talked to you about me? Well, why do you ask that? Well... Don't you get along with him? That is putting it mildly. If it weren't for Stella about to have a baby, I wouldn't be able to endure things here. Well, he isn't nice to you? He's insufferably rude. He goes out of his way to offend me. No, Blanche. Yes, honey? Blanche, how old are you? Why do you want to know? Well, I... I talked to my mother about you, and she said, How old is Blanche? You talked to your mother about Mm -hmm, me? Yes. Why? Well, I, I told her how nice you were, and I liked you. Were you sincere about that? Oh, you know I was. Well, why did your mother want to know my age? Well, um, my mother is sick. Oh, and... I'm sorry to hear that badly. Well, she won't live long, maybe just a few months. Oh. And, well, she worries because I'm not settled. She she wants to see me settle down before she... 
You love her very much, don't you? I think you have a great capacity for devotion. You'll be lonely when she passes on, won't you? I understand what that is. To be lonely? I loved someone, too, and the person I loved, I lost. Dead? Mm -hmm. A man? He was a boy. Just a boy when I was a very young girl. When I was 16, I made this discovery. Love. All at once and much, much too completely. It was like you suddenly turned a blinding light onto something that had always been half in shadow. That's how it struck the world for me. But I was unlucky. And with his death, the searchlight that had been turned on the world was turned off again. And never for one moment since has there been any light stronger than this kitchen candle. Blanche, you need somebody. And I need somebody, too. Well, could it be you and me? It could be. Oh, Mitch. Sometimes there's, there's heaven so quickly. <laughs> Several weeks pass, and the relations between Stella and Blanche get progressively worse, in spite of Stella's efforts to keep them on a friendly basis. But as Stanley comes home to, di to dinner one night, he finds Blanche, as usual, in the bathroom, soaking in a hot tub, and singing to herself. Well, the temperature, the temperature is a hundred on her nose, and she's soaking herself in a hot tub. She says it cools her off for the evening. Well, I got the dope on your big sister, Stella. Stanley, stop picking on Blanche. Hey, you know, she has been feeding us a pack of lies here. No, I don't, and I don't want to hear any more. Well, she just has, however. But now the cat's out of the bag. I found out some things. What things? Yeah, there are things I already suspected, but now I've got the proof from the most reliable source, which I have checked on. Well, please tell me quickly just what you think you found out about my sister. <clears throat> okay. Line number one. All this squeamishness that she puts on there. That, uh, you should know the line that she has been feeding to Mitch. You know, that he thought that she'd never eat but more kiss by a fella. You know, Sister Blanche is no lily. What have you heard and who from? Our supply man down at the plant has been going through your town of Laurel for years, and he knows all about her. Yeah, and everybody else in the town of Laurel knows all about her. That she is as famous in law as if she was the president of the United States. <laughs> Now, this supply man stops at a hotel called the Flamingo. What about the Flamingo? She stayed there, too. My sister lived at Belle Reve. No, uh, this is after she let the place slip through her lily white fingers. She moved to the Flamingo, which is a second-class hotel, and then has the advantages of not interfering with the private and social life of the personalities there. Now, the Flamingo is used to all kinds of goings-on, see? But even the management of the Flamingo was impressed by Dame Blanche. In fact, they were so impressed that they requested her to turn in a room key, honey, for permanently. And this happened a couple of weeks before she showed here. A few minutes later, Blanche finally appears for dinner. And Stanley tells her she is to pack her things and go back to Laurel the following day. And he gives her a bus ticket he has bought for her. Later that evening, he takes his wife to the hospital as the baby is expected momentarily. While he is gone, Mitch shows up and tells Blanche in no uncertain terms that he's through with her. And why? As soon as he is gone, Blanche feverishly searches through her wardrobe. And when Stanley returns, he finds her dressed in an elaborate a crumpled white satin evening gown, preening herself before her mirror. Stanley. Yeah, it's me, Blanche. How's my sister? She's doing okay. And how's the baby? Well, the baby won't come before morning, so they told me to go home and get a little shut-eye. Does that mean that we're to be alone in here? Yeah, it's just you and me, Blanche. 
Hey, what he got all them fine feathers on for? I received a telegram from an old admirer of mine. Oh, yeah? Anything good? I think so. An invitation. To what? A cruise of the Caribbean on a yacht. Well, what do you know? I've never been so surprised in all my life. I guess not. Came like a bolt out of the blue. Uh, uh, who did you say it was from? An old bow of mine. Oh, sure. I want to give you them white fox fur pieces. Mr. Shep Huntley. I wore his fraternity pin my last year at college. I hadn't seen him again till, till last Christmas. I ran into him on Biscayne Boulevard. And then, just now, this wire invited me on a cruise of the Caribbean. The problem was clothes. Yeah. I tore into my tongue to see what I had that was suitable for the tropics. Well, it just goes to show you, Blanche, you never know what's coming. When I think how divine it's going to be to have such a thing as privacy once more, I can weep with joy. Yeah, this uh, millionaire isn't going to interfere with your privacy now. This man is a gentleman. He respects me. What he wants is my companionship. A cultivated woman, a woman of intelligence and breeding, can enrich a man's life immeasurably. Physical beauty is passing, a transitory possession. The beauty of the mind and and richness of the spirit and tenderness of the heart. I have all these treasures locked in my heart. I think of myself as a very, very rich woman. But I've been foolish, casting my pearls... A swine, huh? Yes, swine. Swine. And I'm thinking not only of you, but of your friend, Mr. Mitchell. Mm -hmm. He came to see me this evening. He dared to come here in his work clothes. But repeated slander to me. Vicious stories that he'd gotten from you. I gave him his walking papers. Oh, you did, When he came back, he returned with a box of roses, begging my forgiveness. He implored me to forgive him. That some things are not forgivable. Deliberate cruelty is not forgivable. Uh, was this before or after you got the telegram from Texas? What telegram? No. No, after. Yeah. As a matter of fact, yeah, as the a matter of to... fact, there wasn't no wire at all. Oh. And there isn't no millionaire. And Miss Stink come back with roses because I know where he is. Oh. There's not darn thing but imagination and lies and conceit and tricks. And uh, look at yourself. Now, look at yourself in a sworn-out Mardi Gras outfit rented for 50 oh. cents of some rag picker. Please. You know, I, I've been on to you from the start, and not once did you pull the wool over this boy's eyes. You come in here and you sprinkle a place with powder and spray perfume, you stick a paper lantern over the light bulb. And lo and behold, the place has turned into Egypt, and you're the queen of the Nile, sitting on your throne, <laughs> swilling down my licking. You know what I say? Ha-ha! <laughs> did you hear what I says? Ha-ha-ha! <laughs> I'm going into the bathroom and get ready for bed. Operator. Operator. Operator, give me long distance, please. I I want to get in touch with Mr. Shep Huntley of Dallas. He's so well known, he doesn't require any address. Just ask anybody. No, wait, wait, please. I I, know I couldn't find it right now. Please, Please understand. No, wait. Operator. Operator, never mind long distance. Get me Western Union. There isn't time to... Western Union. Union, take down this message. In desperate, desperate circumstances. Help me. Caught in a trap. Caught in a... Oh, Stanley. What's the matter? Do I interfere with you? You know, come to think of it, maybe you wouldn't be bad to interfere with Stay me. back. Don't you come toward me another step you or... You know what? Something awful will happen. It will. What kind of act are you what putting kind... on now? Don't, don't. I, I'm in danger. <laughs> you smash the bottle for? So I could twist the broken end in your face. I bet you would do it. I would. I will. Oh, you want some rough house, huh? All right, let's have a little rough house. Not that bottle top, you tiger. Drop it. We've had this state with each other from the beginning. The WOR Special Features Division has brought you the presentation of the annual Drama Critics Circle Award to the best play of the 1947-1948 season, A Streetcar Named Desire by Tennessee Williams. The award was made by John Mason Brown, president of the Drama Critics Circle. The entire broadcast was under the direction of Jock McGregor. You also heard Mrs. Irene M. Selznick, the producer, and several scenes from the play. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
The American Broadcasting Company presents Charlie Lung, the man of a hundred voices, in his new Western series, El Lobo Rides Again. Underlay! Underlay! Aster, my black beauty! Aster! Aster Lorena, faster! Run like the wind! <laughs> Charlie Lung, the man of a hundred voices, brings you another thrilling western story of El Lobo, foe of evil, defender of right. The story of lightning draw Lobo and his mighty black mare, Lorena, fast as horse in all Mexico. In just a moment, the action-packed story of the ambush, but first... Last year... Charlie Lung's one-man show had a coast and mountain release on another major network, Saturday morning from 8 to 8.30. It started with a point four, zero point four. Five months later, a special Hooper survey gave The Adventures of Charlie Lung a 2 as a first rating. The show started with seven stations and finished with over 30. Before one year, its rating reached a 3.2 at 8 o'clock in the morning. Today's story of the Old West opens in the little cow town of Lone Pine, Arizona, near the Mexican border. Its one claim to notoriety is the Silver Dollar Gambling Casino, rendezvous of gunmen, gamblers, and riffraff from both sides of the border. Our scene opens in the lavish office of its gambler owner, Ace Kimball, who looks up from his desk to greet his evil henchman, Steve Cody, who stands at the door. Well, there you are, Steve Cody. Come in, come in. <laughs> Close the door, Cody. Here, you are ace anything you say. Well, what's on your mind, ace? The Lazy Y Ranch. Shucks. So you're still hankering to get your hands on the Lazy Y, huh? I want to possess that ranch more than anything else in Arizona. (laughs) And you know, when Ace Kimball decides he wants anything, he always gets it, no matter the cost. Why, sure, but you... If in that old coot gold pan Jeffers who owns it don't want to sell, <laughs> and your money ain't going to do you much good, is it? I don't remember mentioning money, Cody. This deal calls for a six-gun. Well, now you're talking my lingo. <laughs> who do you want fitted for a wooden overcoat this time? An Indian. Huh? An Indian? Why does an Indian fit in? Very simple, Cody. You know of Chief Big Horse and his son running deer. Oh, sure. Big Horse is chief of them OG war tribe. And listen, those redskins will be riding through Rattlesnake Canyon to Lazy Y in one hour. Yeah? So? You'll be waiting on the canyon rim above them. Yeah? And a well-placed bullet will knock young running deer off his horse. <laughs> Consonities. I get it. <laughs> Them Indians are going to think they was ambushed by a lazy white rider. Right, Cody. Then them redskins will hit the warpath and kill every man on the lazy Y. Steve Cody, gunslinger and batman, hurries out to the hitch rack that fronts the Silver Dollar Casino. Quickly, he leaps into the saddle and swings his powerful buckskin toward the south. His flushed face twists into a cruel grin as he rides madly for Rattlesnake Canyon to keep his rendezvous with death. Meanwhile, at the Lazy Y Ranch, completely unaware of the sinister shadow drawing closer, its kindly owner, Gold Pan Jeffers, supervises the final arrangements to receive his Indian guests. His little Chinese cook, Charlie Sam, assisted by his huge colored friend, the Lazy Y handyman, Cyclone Jackson, heaps good eats upon the long ranch table. Now, just a minute, you two. Look what you're doing. Ding, bust it. Our Indian friends are going to be here any minute. You know you ain't using your heads. Cyclone. Yes, sir, Mr. Jeffers. Don't be putting all the apple pie on this end of the table. Put some of that blueberry down there, too. Now get to moving. Yes, yeah, sir, Mr. Jaffer. Get out of my way, Charlie. Lord, the Chinaman you is always under my feet. You crazy, Mr. Cyclone. You too much talking. Talking, talking, talking. One go, don't listen to go. You only tell me like a big man. Uh-oh, I is as I use satchel mouth. Someday, brother Charlie, I want to bust you wide open. By jings, you two, stop your gabbling, will you? 
I don't know which one of you it was. I know who he was. Mr. Cyclone. He biggie windbag. He never do anything. He all the time just he talk, he biggie bluff. Oh, eyes of bluff. Is that so now? Well, try this pot on full side. Ah! Hey, jump, swiggle me ass for it, Charlie. Get that bowl off in his head, Cyclone. <laughs> Can't see an inch of his face for whoop cream. <laughs> <laughs> While Gold Dan Jeffers roars with laughter at the hapless Charlie Sam, smothered in whipped cream by Cyclone, the sinister Steve Cody spurs his lathering horse out through the dense pines that fringe the rim of Rattlesnake Canyon. He dismounts, pulls a rifle from the saddle scabbard, then inches his way cautiously to the canyon rim's edge. Far below, he sees Chief Big Horse, his son running deer, and the Indian braves riding slowly into the narrow defile. Then dropping to one knee... The merciless Steve Cody draws a bead on the unsuspecting redskins below. Well, if this ain't going to be just like shooting fish in a rain barrel. <laughs> How to get running deer in the sights. Like this. And pull the trigger. Got him. First shot. Now to get out of here. This ain't going to be no praise for a white man for quite a while. Steady, steady, Consanya. Now get to running and fast. Ha, ha, stretch, ha, ha. The remorseless Steve Cody, convinced his cowardly shock will fulfill its vicious promise, spurs his big buckskin into a breakneck gallop and rides for the badlands below. Will the cowardly bullet that hurled running deer from his horse start an Indian massacre on the lazy Y? Listen! Listen to what Billboard, March 20th Review, says about the Charlie Lung Show. Quote, Here's a kid show which closely approaches a radio version of the standard motion picture cliffhanger. Versatile Charlie Lung handles all the voices and scripting. On show caught, Lung played 11 roles, each clearly established and smoothly voiced. To create strong visual imagery which complements Lung's multi-voicings, the show leans heavily on sound using authentic tom-toms, six-shooters, and pounding horses throughout. It's the kind of stuff children eat up and should glue youngsters to their sets on Saturday mornings. Charlie Lung's new Western series, El Lobo Rides Again, makes an excellent sales vehicle. Cost is exceedingly low, returns are exceedingly high. And now, back to our story. As Chief Big Horse kneels, horror-stricken beside running deer, he realizes that if his son is to live, he must receive immediate attention. Gently lifting the still form to the shoulders of his massive paint horse, he signals the braves to ride on to the lazy wine. The face of Chief Big Horse is immobile. Only his eyes reveal hate and revenge. Revenge on the people he believes responsible for this cowardly ambush. The lazy Y riders. A few minutes later at the ranch house, the Indians' faces livid with anger surround Gold Pan Jeffers as the old rancher examines the fallen brave. Then Jeffers turns and speaks to the chief. Well, he's still living, chief, but mighty bad, mighty bad. Then me take him back to my village. My medicine man make him well. No, no, siree. If you move him now, he's going to die for sure. Now, wait a minute. I know something about doctrine. And I've got to prove for that bullet, and quick. Uh, Cyclone, go get that there first aid kit of mine and them doctor tools. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm going to get it. Charlie, give me scads of hot water and clean towels. Hold on. I'll go catch you. I'll be back very quickly. Now, Chief Big Horse, how'd this here shooting happen? We ride through pass. White man ambush my son. Eh? A white man? Me see white man right away. On high rim of Mesa. Now you and all white men shall pay. Huh? All white men? Me? By jings, now that don't make no sense, Chief. That ain't good reasoning. You and me has always been good friends. Friends for years. I, Chief Big Horse, take oath many moons ago. If one of my tribe be killed by white man's treachery, Ojiwa tribe shall make war to death. Why, Dad, right, it ain't one of my riders would pull a trick like that. Now, you've got to listen here. Say, Lovey, here's all the stuff, Mr. Jeffers. 
Hmm? Well, this ain't no time for argument, I guess. Set that first aid box alongside of running deer there, Cyclo. Yeah, right, yeah. Now, open her up. Every minute's going to count. Now, Chief, you and your braves are standing there scowling at us. Ain't helping none. So I suggest you beat it for a while. Go on. I go. Make to our shoe. Come here, Skuga. Did you do that? No, we go. But if your white medicine no bring life back to running deer before the sun set right in the sky, then white man's blood and Indian blood shall darken the earth. I have spoken. <laughs> Chief Big Horse and his braves thunder westward toward the Ojiwa village to prepare for sunset massacre of the white men. As the plume of their dust fades in the distance, Gold Pan Jeffers realizes the deadly seriousness of the chief's words. Quickly, a makeshift operating table is prepared. Cyclone, Charlie, and Old Jeffers group around the still form, and the operation begins. Now, Cyclone, put them instruments on that little table there alongside them. Yes, yeah, there yeah, yeah. Oh. You think he's going to die, Mr. Jaffa? Eh? No, he ain't going to die if I can prevent it. Now, now, Cyclone, you start to drip in that ether on the towel on his nose. Yeah. Easy, easy now, just a drop at a time. Now to get that consigned bullet out. Steady with ether, then. Charlie, hand me that probe out of the tin now. Oh, hold on, I get Here you are, Mr. Jaffa. Well, here we go, gents. It's his life and ours. Gently, old Gold Pan Jeffers sounds the wound in the young Indian's chest, praying that the answer will be, this young life may continue. Meanwhile, at the Ojiwa village, Chief Big Horse, bound by his oath that should ever one of his tribe be killed by a white man's treachery, he would make war, calls together his tribe. Mektor Osinas Kuga, Onisu, son of the Ojiwa. I know my son running deer is dying by white man's bullet. Now we'll ride on the war path against treacherous white dog. When the sun turn red... Our tomahawk shall bite with great vengeance. Behold, braves of the Ojiwa. Already the sun grows yellow. Now, Ginawa, sound the war drums, we ride. Led by the mighty chief Big Horse, the Indian braves sweep from the Ojiwa village like a tidal wave of copper-colored vengeance, framed in the multicolored dress of their full war regalia. Back at the Lazy Y Ranch, Gold Pan Jeffers has successfully removed the bullet from Running Deer's chest. With anxious hearts, they await his return to consciousness, realizing, should this not take place by sunset... The Ojiwa Indians will surely strike to kill. At this same moment, a mysterious horseman streaks toward the Lazy Y. Mounted on a magnificent black mare, both rider and horse seem as one. The man garbed completely in black. Only the silver encrusted gun swinging at his hips flash in the sinking sun. Underlay! Underlay! Faster, my black beauty! Faster! Faster, Lorena! Faster! Run like the wind! <laughs> It's El Lobo, foe of evil, defender of right. It's El Lobo and the mighty mare, La Reina, fastest horse in all Mexico. Together, once more, they ride on the side of the law. As the first pink glow heralds sunset in the Arizona skies, El Lobo swings in through the rock entrance to the Lazy Y. He pulls the great black mare, Lorena, to a sliding stop before the ranch house. Dismounts and runs quickly to the main doorway. By James, you said Lobo. Si, Senor Jeff. I am welcome at the lazy wine, oh? Well, welcome, you dead burn right here. Come on in, come on in. By James, you just come in time, my Lobo. 
I'm in a peck of trouble. Running the ears in there, getting over a gun wound. He was... I know, amigo. He was ambushed from the rim of the canyon. Jumping Jehoshaphat. You know about it? See, si, senor. I see it happen. I'm right along on ridge. Then I see man on canyon get off a big buckskin horse and shoot down into the pass. Sure. Did you recognize Maverick? No, senor. He's too far away. But quickly I ride over to where he was standing with his horse and I find track. <laughs> Very important one. Yeah? Which find out? That the horse he ride had a broken shoe on the left front foot. Uh-huh. A buckskin with a shoe that was broke. See, si, senor. And the only man who ride big buckskin around these parts is Steve Cody. Huh? Steve Cody? But how are you going to prove it? By riding to the Silver Dollar Casino and check the left front foot on one buckskin, no? Then, hello, Bo, you're going to have to hurry. Why, amigo? Because if running deer ain't back on his feet by sunset, Chief Big Horse has swore to massacre every man on this ranch. The Indian, they are going the war path. You betcha. And if and you can prove it was Cody and not one of my riders that fired that shot, I think we can stop them engines. But you got to do it before sunset. Then, senor, we have not a second to spare. Only my great male arena could make the run to Lone Pine and back here by sunset. Well, what's your plan, El Lobo? I ride to the Silver Dollar Casino, Steve Cody's hangar, senor, to trap the man I know is guilty of this crime. Until sunset. Adios, amigo. Adios. Andale. Andale. Faster, my black beauty. Faster. Faster, arena. Faster. Run like the wind. <laughs> Once again, El Lobo rides on the side of the law. The mighty Lorena, her flying hooves burning distance like a meteor of vengeance as she flashes northward in her battle with time. Will El Lobo trap the ruthless Steve Cody before sunset? Will running deer recover consciousness before the sun turns to a ball of red? Our next episode, The War Drums of Death. Be sure to listen for the next thrilling episode. El Lobo Rides Again is written and portrayed by one man, Charlie Lung, a man of a hundred voices. Music by Rex Corey, sound by Bob Conlon, Jack Robinson, and Rob Sutton. Production and direction by Larry Robertson. This is Ralph Langley speaking from Hollywood. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Harold Perry Show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And now, Harold Perry, as Honest Harold, the homemaker. Well, let's look in on the Honest Harold household in the little town of Melrose Springs. It's early morning now, and we find Harold just coming in to breakfast in a cheery Valentine mood. Well, good morning, Mother. Good morning, Harold. Ah. <laughs> I want to thank you for that sweet valentine you left on the waffle iron for me. Oh, uh, did you like it, Mother? Oh, yes. Such a sweet sentiment. Mm. Roses are red, violets are blue. I'm a lucky boy to have a mother like you. Yeah, and I sure am, Mother. <laughs> did you make that up yourself, Harold? Uh-huh. Guess I'm kind of a poet, Mother. I wrote all my own valentines this year. Finished them last night. Oh, yeah, here's the one I'm going to send to my boss, Stanley Peabody. <laughs> Little old prissy pants Peabody sees this. <laughs> it's addressed to dear yogurt face. <laughs> oh, Listen to this, Mother. You belong in the kitchen with the muffins and the bran. You've got a shape just like a skillet. No, brother, what a pan. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I made some nice valentines for old Doc Yak Yak and Pete. And for Theodora, of course, I wrote a real romantic one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, I bet you two will have a wonderful time at the Valentine costume party tonight. Yeah. 
Guess we look pretty cute dressed as Romeo and Juliet. Oh, oh, that reminds me. I mustn't forget to dye your tights today. Oh, yes, that's right, Mother. Well, better hurry up and get down to the radio station for my morning program. When are you going to deliver your Valentine's, Harold? Hmm? Oh, Cousin Raymond promised to deliver them for me if he ever wakes up this morning. Well, I, I think he stayed up rather late last night, writing a romantic Valentine to his sweetheart, Gloria. Oh, well. But I'm sure he'll be up soon. Then he'll deliver your valentines on winged feet like Mercury. Mercury? Oh. Good morning. Uh, Hello, Raymond. Hi, Cousin Harold. (laughs) Well, here's Mercury. Yeah, Mercury. It's like his battery has run down. (laughs) Sit right down, Raymond. I'll get your oatmeal. Thanks. That's it. Well, my boy, did you finish composing your valentine to little Gloria? Yeah. <laughs> I stayed up till two o'clock writing it. You did, eh? Well, let's hear it, Raymond. Oh. <laughs> oh, come on now. Don't be bashful. All right. Here it is. Mm-hmm. You're a little snooky wooky with your eyes of baby blue. <laughs> I'll be your sugar cookie if you'll be my cutie poo. <laughs> Very nice, Raymond. Thanks. <sighs> Raymond, will you please wake up? You know you promised to deliver my valentines for me this morning. Oh, yeah. Now, be careful you don't get them mixed up. Now, this one goes to Stanley Peabody. Now, you just sneak into his office and put it on his desk while he's not looking. And this one, to a wonderful friend, goes to Pete, the marshal. And here's old Doc Yak Yaks right here. And this big one is for Theodora. Oh, you got that all straight? Oh, sure. <laughs> I wonder if this is such a good idea. All right, quiet musicians, it's time to go on the air. Oh, where's my ukulele? Oh, okay, hit it, Yasha. Good morning, ladies. This is your old friend, Honest Harold, the homemaker, bringing you an hour of household hints, humor, and harmony. And now, girls, since today is St. Valentine's Day, I want to sing a little song in honor of the occasion. Love is the sweetest thing What else on earth could ever bring Such happiness to everything as love's old story. Love is the strangest thing, no song of birds upon the wing shall in our hearts more gently sing than love's old story. Whatever heart may desire, whatever fate may send, this is the tale that never will tire. This is the song without end. Love is the greatest thing, the oldest yet. The latest thing I only hope That fate may bring Love's story to you Guess Raymond has delivered the Valentine's by now. I think I'll drop into Stanley's office. That he's really burned up over that poem. <laughs> but you'll never guess I wrote it. Dear Yogurt Face. <laughs> Come in. Oh, good morning, Ham. Hello, Stanley. Just happened to be passing your little door. Thought I'd drop in. <laughs> I see. Hemp, I've just been looking at this Valentine somebody left on my desk. Oh, that's so? 
fair. She got peach. <laughs> and I love the last two lines. Oh. We're two old pals like Damon and Pythias. I know our friendship will always be with us. <laughs> I didn't know you felt that way about me, Harold. I didn't either. <laughs> Really, quite touched. Oh, shucks. You know, we should spend an evening together sometime. Huh? Maybe play a few rubbers of lotto. lotto. <laughs> yeah, well, let's do that sometime, Stanley. Well, see you later, Stanley. And drop in the office any time at all, Harold. We'll split a bottle of yogurt. Yogurt? Oh, sure. We'll have a lost weekend together sometime. <laughs> well, gotta be going. Goodbye, Damon. Who? Oh, yes. Goodbye, Pythias. <laughs> Gee, I should have known Sleepy Raymond would get the Valentines mixed up. Never trust a relative. Say, wonder who he gave Stanley's to. Suppose Theodora got it. I'd have an awful time explaining that to dear yogurt face. Hello, Harold. Oh, hello, Gloria. Happy Valentine Day. Thanks. Hey, Gloria, did you see Raymond down here this morning? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till I see him. That boy's walking around in his sleep. Oh, that explains it. Explains what? Well, he kissed the water cooler and put a Dixie cup in my hand. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, there's no telling who he gave that comic Valentine to. If Theodora got it, she'll never go to the party with me tonight. Oh, I wouldn't worry about that, Harold. What? I know somebody who'd like to go with you. Who's that? My mother. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's... Very nice of your mother, Gloria, she's but... coming down the station to see me this morning, so if you'd like to talk to her... Well, well... some other time, Gloria. You see, I, I've got a... <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Sounds like an air raid warning. <laughs> Who's my mother, Harold? Zeef trapped. Well, if it isn't Mr. Harold... Oh, hello, Mrs. O'Day. <laughs> Well, imagine we two meeting like this on St. Valentine's Day. Tis kismet. Tis who's met? <laughs> uh, fate. Fate, Mr. Hemp. Fate? Oh. Yes. Are you familiar with the rubiat of Omar Khayyam? Ha. Huh? <laughs> a loaf of bread, a jug of wine, and thou. Well, not today, thanks. Mother's made some meatloaf for lunch. <laughs> I suppose you're going to the Valentine costume party tonight. Well, I sort of hope so. <laughs> I'll be there, too. Good. <laughs> Don't tell anyone, please, but I am going as the Queen of Egypt. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You'll recognize me. I'll be wearing a long train. Oh? Uh, well, I'll be in tights with a short caboose. <laughs> oh. Raymond. Well, maybe Theodora didn't get Stanley's Valentine. Could have been Doc or Pete. I'll drop in and see Pete first. Hello, Pete. Hello, Harold. Pete, just wondering if you got my Valentine. Yeah, I got it, boy. Ah, uh, well, which one did you get? The one you sent me. It, <laughs> I like the way you addressed it, boy. To my adorable. <laughs> the one Raymond wrote for Gloria. And I thought that poem you wrote me was beautiful. But you're a little snooky wooky with your eyes of baby blue. <laughs> I do declare, Harold, when I read that, I blush clear down to my toes. <laughs> Pete, will you stop being so silly? The whole thing's a mistake. And that last part, Harold. I'll be your sugar cookie if you'll be my cutie poo. <laughs> <laughs> Right, that Raymond did. Well, now that was mighty thought of you, him. Why, I hardly know the boy. Forty. Here, tell him I think he's a cutie poo too. Oh, cutie poo yourself. Well, thanks, Harold. <laughs> Doc's my last chance. I hope he got that Valentine. Come on, you old horse doctor. I'm in. Hello, Doc. Oh, hello, Harold. 
Uh, I'm mad at you. Uh, oh, you are? Well, I guess Doc got it all right. Uh, that's a fine way to treat an old friend. Well, Doc, I can explain it. You see, I didn't mean to send you that valentine. Harold, you didn't send me any valentine. What? Oh, my goodness, Raymond forgot him altogether. Forgotten on Valentine's Day by my oldest friend. But, Doc, I meant to send you one. Oh, it's all right. Who am I? Just an old horse doctor. Doc, will you listen to me? My animals didn't forget me on Valentine's Day. Why, this morning, Torrance, my Airedale, came in and laid a red heart label right at my feet. (laughs) Doc, that dog has got more sense than you have. Well, naturally, he's an Airedale. <laughs> there must be some answer to that, but I can't think of it. See you later. Uh, looks like Raymond gave that comic Valentine to Theodore, all right. Well, might as well drop into the dancing academy and try and explain it to her. I'll just go in. Hey, what's that sticking out into the door there? Yeah, let's stand Lee's Valentine. Looks like I got here just in time. <laughs> just get down here in my hands and knees. <clears throat> just a little corner of it sticking out. I can get a hold of it. Come here, little Valentine. Come to Papa. Darn it. Now I pushed it inside. I know. I'll just reach up, open the door real quiet like, turn the door knob. Easy does it. Oh, those door chimes. Why, Harold. Oh, Theodora. <laughs> what are you doing down there? Uh, I'm um, just checking your weather stripping. <laughs> <laughs> Why, Harold, you were putting a valentine under my door. Uh, well, you see... Uh, Let me see what it says. But, um, I bet it's something real romantic. Uh, Dear Yogurt Face. Uh, now, Yogurt Face, I mean, Theodora, let me explain. I think I'll read the rest of it. Uh, You've got a shape just like a skillet. Yeah. Well, that's very funny. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> You see, the whole thing was a mistake. It certainly was. And you can just get someone else to go with you to that costume party tonight. Theodora, I've got my Romeo suit already. My tights are drying on the line right now. (laughs) There is the door. Goodbye. Uh, Goodbye. Ah, shut up. (laughs) Will I get my hands on Cuz Raymond? I wonder who got the valentine I wrote for Theodora. The real romantic one. Somebody must... Yoo-hoo! Oh, God, Mrs. Day. Oh, Mr. Hemp, when I got home, what do you think I found on my porch? A box of Girl Scout cookies? No, no, a valentine from you. <laughs> oh, brother... Oh, and you wrote me such a charming, charming poem. Oh. When you get to the ball, my queen of beauty, look for the man in the Romeo suity. <laughs> Mrs. O'Day. Oh, I'll see you at the party tonight. Romeo, oh, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? I don't know. <laughs> Turn for the second act of our story, Honest Harold, in just a moment. It's the fight of the year, Sugar Ray Robinson and Jake LaMotta for the middleweight championship of the world. Tonight? And it's on CBS exclusively tonight. All the color, all the action, these two brilliant fighters are bound to bring. Yes, they'll be here just a little later tonight on most of these same CBS stations. Thanks, Bob. Don't miss the fight of the year. Sugar Ray Robinson versus Jake LaMotta on CBS exclusively. And now back to Harold Perry as Honest Harold, the homemaker. Well, this hasn't been a very happy day for Honest Harold. 
His little messenger of love, Cousin Raymond, has managed to deliver the right valentines to all the wrong people. And now Harold's love life is all mixed up. <laughs> we find Romeo at home now discussing his problem with his mother and Cousin Raymond. Gee, Cousin Harold, I'm sorry I got your valentines all mixed up. Oh, uh, it's all right, my boy. Harold, maybe you can make up with Theodora at the party tonight. Yeah, uh, won't get a chance to with Mrs. O'Day on my trail. And I can't dodge her. She knows I'm going to be in my Romeo suity. Oh. Uh, yes, there's just one thing to do. I won't go to the party at all. But, son, you've been looking forward to it for so long. Yeah, but what the heck, Mother? Wouldn't be any fun this way. I'll just stay in my little room, look out the window, and watch the television next door. <laughs> I just woke up. It's about time. No, I mean, I just got an idea. Why don't you wear a different costume tonight and Mrs. O'Day won't know who you are? That's a wonderful idea, Harold. Hey, might work at that. Sure. What kind of a costume could I get? wonder if they have Hopalong Cassidy suits my size. <laughs> well, uh, I guess not. Harold, I know what you could go as. Oh, what's that? A bear. A what? You can wear that old bear skin we have up in the attic. The one Grandpa Clemtrap shot in the polar zone. Where? <laughs> Sew the tail back on. <laughs> Mother, you know, I think you've got something. Nobody would recognize me in that. Yeah, I'll go up and get it for you, Cousin Harold. All right, Raymond. But don't take a nap on that bear skin. Uh, well, just think. You're going to be a bear. Yeah, Mother. Guess this is my night to growl. <laughs> <laughs> Well, how do I look? Oh, you look swell, cuz, just like a real bear. Really? <laughs> kind of hot in here, though. Lucky I got these bullet holes for ventilation. Uh, uh, hold still, Harold. I'm sewing on your tail. Yeah, yeah. All right, mother. Yeah. One stitch. One stitch. Another stitch. Another stitch. Another stitch. Oop! Watch it, mother. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. There. Now your tail won't come off when you twirl. <laughs> Thanks, mother. Let's see how I look in the mirror. Yipe! Is that me? Look pretty ferocious, all right. I'd hate to have to brush these teeth every day. <laughs> I wonder if I can dance in this outfit. May I have this waltz, Mother? Why, of course. Well, Mother was there with a cinnamon bear, and the band played on. You held your ma, and then I took your pa, and, and the, the band, band played on. on. Well, this is certainly fun. I bet I'm the first bear that ever drove an Essex. <laughs> yeah, I hope this bear skin don't shed on these new seat covers. <laughs> well, this may work out all right. Oop, didn't see the signal change. Oop, and there's a car right in front of me. <laughs> Darn it, I ran right into him. Oop, there goes my headlight again. <laughs> Driver getting out of his car. Here he comes. Well, Stanley Peabody. <laughs> Here's where I have some fun. Of all the stupid drivers I've ever seen, why don't you look like... No! Oh, it's a bear! Help! Help! <laughs> well, I've got plenty of time. <laughs> Think I'll drop in and see Doc. Throw a scare in the old veterinarian. <laughs> I'll get down on all fours. Yeah. I'm in. Watch him jump when he sees a bear walk in. Whoa! Well, hello, little bear. <laughs> what can I do for you? It didn't phase him a bit. Now, just have a chair. There's one patient ahead of you. What a character. There's some old Reader's Digest on the table if you want to look through it. <laughs> oh, you're in a hurry. All right, little bear, I'll take you first. 
Oh, my goodness. How did you happen to come here? Did another patient recommend me? Or did you see my ad in the phone book? <laughs> now, tell me, have you ever had night sweats? <laughs> I'm having one right now, Doc. This is me. <laughs> I knew it all the time, Harriet. <laughs> I'm going to wear this thing to the costume party tonight, Doc. Oh? Yeah, you see, I'm going as a bear because... Yeah. Oop. What's that? Oh, that's Arthur, my goat. He just got your scent, Harold. Yeah? Well, he can have it, too. <laughs> Doc, I don't like the way he's glaring at me. Tell him I'm not really a bear, Doc. <laughs> Arthur! It's your old friend, Honest Harold. Don't you know me? No. <laughs> <laughs> Doc! He's got his head down. He's going to charge. <laughs> See you later, Doc. <laughs> I made it. Harold? Yes, Doc? Here's your tail. <laughs> Thanks. Goodbye. Yeah, big crowd here at the dance. Now they can just find Theodora. Oop. There's Mrs. O'Day, the Queen of Egypt. Well, what I'm worrying about, she'll never recognize. Hello, Harold. Raymond, quiet. What? Mrs. O'Day will hear you. Oh. Yes. How do you like my costume? I'm that famous pirate, Blackjack. Okay, well, get out of here, Blackjack, before you gum the things up. <laughs> oh, my goodness, the kid's been hitting the sarsaparilla again. <laughs> I wonder where Theodore is. I don't see any Juliet's. Take a look in the foyer. Maybe she's out there. Sure crowded in here, too. Excuse me. <laughs> I can just... Oop. Mister, watch that sword. <laughs> Admiral Dewey. Got his hat on backwards. <sighs> I made it. Hmm. Sure dark in this foyer. Can't see it. Yeah, Somebody sitting over there on that divan. He's wearing a red cape. Theodora has a red cape like that. This is my chance to make up with her. Theodora! It's your Haroldy Waroldy. Won't you say hello? Oh, don't be mad, honey. I can explain that, Valentine. Please forgive me. Darling, speak to me. What do you want me to say, cutie poo? <laughs> in that blonde wig. Why, I'm Little Red Riding Hood, and I've heard all about you, Woo. <laughs> oh, goodbye. Uh, I wonder where... Oh, there's Theodora. Gosh, she looks as beautiful as Juliet. I'll just sneak over there and surprise her. Woo, my goodness. Oh. Oh, hello, little bear. Zoof, Mrs. O'Day. Oh, my, but you're cute. <laughs> oh, you big bad bear. <laughs> uh, I'm looking for Mr. Hemp. Have you seen Romeo tonight? No. Oh, I wonder where he could be. I don't know. <laughs> well, I... I think I'll just stay here with you. <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> oh, you're an awfully cute little bear. I think I'm going to tickle you behind the ear like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cut that out. Stop tickling me, Mrs. Moday. What? what, what? <laughs> Mr. Ham, is that you in there? Well, yeah. <laughs> Why, you naughty boy. <laughs> Were you trying to hide from me? Me? No. Oh, well, now, I'm not going to let you get out of my... My... Uh, Achoo! Gesundheit. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my nose tickles. I wonder what's the matter with me. Well, uh, maybe you're allergic to bears. <laughs> oh. No, no, no. I I'm only allergic to spices. Yeah, but I'm a cinnamon bear. <laughs> Then I'd better stay far away from you all evening. Yeah, 
good idea. Yes. Farewell. 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 Gosh, am I glad I wore this cinnamon bear suit. Hello, Harold. Huh? How's my little teddy bear? Theodora. Raymond explained to me about that valentine. He did? Mm-hmm. I'm sorry I misunderstood. Uh, that's all right. And just to show you I forgive you, I'm going to give you a big kiss. A kiss? <laughs> just a minute, I'll take off this bear head. I'm waiting. <laughs> Ye gods, I forgot Mother sewed it on. <laughs> then I can't kiss you. Oh, well, what the heck. Just tickle me behind the ear. A little farther back, Theodora. <laughs> you have just heard the Harold Perry show, Honest Harold. Can't get the head off, though. <laughs> the supporting players tonight included Jane Morgan, Parley Bear, Olin Soleil, Eddie Firestone, Isabel Randolph, and Mari Alden, and featured Gloria Holiday as Gloria and Joseph Kearns as old Doc Yak Yak. Who directed? Norman MacDonald directed, and the music was composed and conducted by Jack Meekin. Honest Harold, created by Harold Perry, was written by Gene Stone and Jack Robinson. Remember, there are two big events still coming along on CBS tonight. Only on CBS will you hear the broadcast of the Sugar Ray Robinson, Jake LaMotta battle. I'm going to listen to if I can get the head off. And now stay tuned for Bing Crosby with the lovely Dorothy Kirsten as his guest. The Bing Crosby show follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Bob Lamont speaking. <laughs> This is CBS, where you thrill to suspense on Thursday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Wheat checks, rice checks, and good hot Winston present Space Patrol! <laughs> High adventure and the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol. In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy are investigating a space factory revolving in an orbit around the planet Venus. The pool in this room is toward the ceiling. Well, now how are we going to get down to the floor? We'll get down to it all right, the hard way, I'm afraid. They'll reverse the gravity field from floor to ceiling till they break every bone in our bodies. We'll return in just a moment with today's Space Patrol adventure, the Venus Space Factory. <laughs> Hi, gang. Space Patrol Rick Tufel reporting to you from the Terra Airport. Just got back from a trip to Venus, and boy, do I need supercharging. Well, I'll just have myself a Space Patrol breakfast with one of the super cereals, Rice Chex or Wheat Chex. They're bite-sized, you know, and so easy to eat and so different and delicious, the commander made them official cereals of the Space Patrol. Try them yourself, gang, and don't wait. Not for a swell treat like Rice Chex and Wheat Chex. Try them today. And say, gang, here's something important. We are swamped with orders for space binoculars. We have plenty of them, but we just can't mail them out fast enough. So if you're waiting for space binoculars, please be patient. We'll soon be caught up. Well, I got to go get supercharged right now. See you later, gang. <laughs> and now, today's Space Patrol adventure, the Venus Space Factory. Swinging in wide orbits around the planet Venus are two gigantic constructions, popularly known as space factories. Power is obtained from the sun by use of solar energy reflectors. These privately owned factories are inspected at regular intervals by space patrol personnel to see that United Planets regulations are observed. Right now, in the control section office of one of the factories, space patrol inspector Curtis is talking to Vincent Trowbridge, owner of the plant. I've completed the inspection, Mr. Trowbridge. Oh, find anything wrong, Inspector Curtis? No, nothing serious. 
The heat insulation on the mercury vapor conduits needs replacing. Oh, you aren't going to enter that on a report, are you? Well, I should. But I'll overlook it this time if you promise to have it repaired by the time of my next official visit here. Of course. Uh, you just play ball with me, Curtis, and I'll play ball with you. Fine. Oh, uh, Mr. Trowbridge. Yes, Curtis. About the investment you're handling for me, uh, is everything all right? Well, uh, it doesn't look good right now. What, can I get my 10,000 credits back? Perhaps in a few months. A few months? Well, Mr. Trobit, you said last month we could expect a quick profit. Yes, I also said there were certain risks involved. You remember that, don't you? Yeah, but all our other investments, they turned out all right. They were for small amounts, 100 credits or so. I was counting on that money. You put me in a terrible spot. I didn't put you on the spot, Curtis. You insisted I take your money. It uh, was your money, wasn't it? Well, of course it was, except for a few hundred I borrowed. But it has to be paid back right away. Well, I'm afraid there is nothing I can do. Oh, look, you've got to help me. If the Space Patrol finds out I've been having business dealings with one of the firms I inspect, I'll lose my job. Well, you didn't worry much about that when you were winning. That was foolish, I admit it. But I was relying on your business judgment. This gets out of it. I'm finished. Hmm. Perhaps I should have realized you weren't in a position to risk so much money. Tell you what. Suppose I return those 10,000 credits to you. Will you, Mr. Tobridge? Now, understand, Curtis. I only do this out of the goodness of my heart. This is just a loan, you understand. It's my money you're getting. Your 10000 is still invested with another firm, and I can't touch it. I'll pay you back every credit when the other deal begins to pay off. Yeah. Oh, uh, in the meantime, uh, you're in a position to do me a favor. Well, what do you have in mind? Well, you you also inspect the other space factory, don't you? Stan Larkin's plant? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, what's his record? Excellent. Why? Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps you've been somewhat lax in your inspection. Somewhat indulgent, shall we say. Oh, no. I'm always very careful. Yes, but there is always room for improvement, Curtis. From now on, you can even be more careful when you check on Larkin. Uh, when are you due there again? Two days from now. Well, just make sure you examine his entire factory thoroughly. I'm sure you'll be able to find that Larkin is guilty of several uh, irregularities. You aren't asking me to turn in a false report. Would you rather a true one be turned in on you? All right, Mr. Crowbridge. <laughs> oh, uh, this may ease your conscience a little... I have a couple of men working at Larkin's factory. You wouldn't have to use your imagination too much in reporting violations. Commander Corey's office. Get that happy here. Yes, sir. All right, Major, I'll tell him. Well, what is it, Happy? Oh, it's Major Robertson, Commander. He says Inspector Curtis is due back at Venus City headquarters tomorrow. Uh, he's been on sick leave. Pat, remind me to space a phone, Curtis, in the morning regarding the space factory report. Yes, sir. I can't understand what's happened to Stan Larkin's operation. Well, who is this Larkin, sir? He owns one of the two space factories circling Venus. The last two inspection reports have been pretty bad. Till three weeks ago, Larkin's plant had a very high rating. Well, what's the trouble, sir? Curtis listed six counts of defective safety equipment, including the main airlock. When he returned for another checkup two weeks later... Three of the previous citations hadn't been corrected. Well, what about the Trowbridge station? Oh, that's excellent. You know, it looks to me as though Larkin's trying to cut corners. That's not a very smart move with a new government contract still sitting on the Secretary General's desk. Well, that's not a smart move in any case, Happy. Any negligence in one of those space factories could cost the life of every man in the plant. First, I'll see what Curtis has to say about the situation. Then I may pay Larkin a visit. Curtis at Venus City calling Crowbridge at Space Factory number two. Curtis calling Crowbridge at Space Factory number two. Crowbridge here. Go ahead, Curtis. I just thought I ought to let you know. Corey's going to blast off for a visit to Larkin's factory. Is he coming here, too? He didn't mention it in our space phone conversation. But better be prepared just in case he does. I am always prepared. Uh, did he question your report on Larkin? I don't know. Not yet. But I'm worried. I don't want to get into this any deeper. Now, look, Curtis, stop worrying. Just take it easy. All right, but I won't make any more false reports. Well, we'll talk about it later. When is Corey due at Larkin? At about 900 hours universal start time tomorrow. All right, Curtis. Throw bridge out. Uh, now, what can my men do to convince Corey that 
Larson isn't Mrs. Larson. You can start decelerating now, Happy. We're nearly on the factory's orbit. It certainly doesn't look very solid, Commander. Like a bunch of wheels strung together with wire. Well, it would never do on a planet, of course, but out here in space with no gravity pull, it's strong enough. Where do we join airlocks, sir? At the end of that tube projecting from the circular structure, we'll make our approach from the other side. Yeah, it looks like we've got a clear approach on this vector, sir. Right. Let's contact Larkin and tell him we're coming in for inspection. Commander Corey, I've been in the manufacturing business for 20 years. This is the first time I've been accused of mismanagement. All you're being accused of right now, Mr. Larkin, is failure to correct certain faulty equipment after receiving a citation from our inspector. But I tell you, I ordered it corrected. Did you check to see if your orders were carried out? Well, frankly, no, I didn't. In the past, I've never found it necessary to check up on my employees. Mr. Larkin... Our inspectors have a regular procedure to follow. Would you say that in the past, Curtis has ignored defective equipment? I don't know whether Curtis has ignored defective equipment or not, but I haven't. Well, then what about those last two reports? What about the complaints of impurities in your products? Commander, would you like to inspect this factory right now? I certainly would, but you haven't answered my questions. Maybe we'll both know the answers after inspection. I manufacture plastics, not excuses. All right, Larkin. I'll call my cadet and we'll inspect the plant. I'll say this for you, Larkin. Overall, your factory is run very efficiently. We haven't finished the tour yet, Commander. With these accusations against me, I think it only fair that you make a complete inspection. All right. What's next? Well, you've seen the crew's living quarters, the power control station, and the process control room. As I recall your inspector's last report, there was a defective airlock in number two loading chamber. That's right. Has it been repaired? I ordered it repaired. Come with me. You can see for yourselves. Oh, here, uh, wait. You'd better both put on heavy coats if you're going in there. Why? Is it cold in there? About five degrees below zero centigrade. Uh, the coats are here in the locker. Here's one for you, Commander. Thank you. And here you are, Cadet. Thanks, Mr. Larkin. Oh, why is the loading chamber so cold? This chamber is where we keep the hexaplast sheets. They're moved directly into the hold of a cargo ship, which is also at five degrees below zero. Hexaplast? What's that? It's a light but very strong plastic, Happy. It's called the material with a memory. A memory? Mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me, Commander, the intercom. Lock in the chamber, too. Yes? Can it wait? No, but I'm... Oh, all right. I'll, I'll be right back. Commander, I've got to go back to the central control room. Two of my technicians seem to have misinterpreted my instructions on a process routine. Uh, why don't you examine loading chamber two, and I'll join you in a minute. Of course, go ahead. Thanks, Commander. Now, let's go in, Happy. We'd better secure the door to hold the temperature down. Oh, it's not as cold in here as I expected it to be. It's a dry cold, low humidity. These coats are pretty heavy. Boy, there sure isn't much room to move around with all these bales stacked in here. Now, there's the airlock at the other end of the chamber. Let's check the indicator and see if there's any leakage. Yes, sir. Oh, by the way, Commander, what did you mean when you said hexaplast was a material with a memory? Well, it can be molded into a certain shape at a fairly high temperature. Then when it's cold, the way it is now, it flattens out. Uh-huh. When the temperature rises, it springs back into its original form. It's as though its molecules remembered what shape to take. <laughs> what was that? I don't know. It sounded as though something snapped. Oh, look, up up there. The top bale came undone. Yeah, somebody did a sloppy job of packing. Oh, there goes another one. Hey, look, it's moving. The cargo's shifting. We've got to get out of here, Happy. Hey, Commander! Commander, what's happening? The hexapass, expanding to its original shape. Open the door, hurry! We've got to get out of here in a hurry. We don't the hexaplast will crush us against the wall. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. This is Captain Dick Tufeld reporting the morning news direct from Terra City. First, the headlines. Commander Corey offers projectoscope to boys and girls on Earth. Space Patrol mail bags jammed with orders. The commander interrupts all communication lanes to warn projectoscope is offered for limited time only. Those are the headlines, now the details. 
Today, Buzz Corey is again offering all boys and girls a chance to send for the new six-inch pocket projectoscope. This streamlined blue and yellow plastic model in the shape of the commander's rocket ship has been designed to do three important things. One, to flash on and off so rapidly it can be used as a signal light. Two, to throw a steady beam of light so it can also be used as a flashlight. Three, to throw pictures on the wall by means of a special strip of film. Response from Earth has been terrific. Orders have been pouring in without let-up. But supplies are still big and work is on schedule. When a letter is received, a projectoscope is mailed at once. But Commander Corey warned in a special bulletin that the projectoscope could be offered for a limited time only. So, gang, send for your projectoscope today. Just buy a box of rice checks or wheat checks. Then, with your name and address, send 35 cents in coin and a rice checks or wheat checks box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in the USA and may be withdrawn at any time. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. And now back to today's adventure, the Venus Space Factory. Vincent Trowbridge, owner of a space factory revolving around Venus, has forced a space patrol inspector to turn in false reports against Stan Larkin, owner of a competing space factory. Commander Corey and Cadet Happy went to the Larkin plant to investigate. While in loading chamber number two of the space factory, the two space patrolmen find themselves in danger of being crushed by a rapidly expanding plastic known as hexoplasm as the temperature rises in the chamber. Stand back, Happy. Let me try that door. Yes, sir. Somebody must have locked it after we got in here. You suppose it was Larkin? Hat, look out! Huh? Oh, wow, if you hadn't yelled, sir, I'd have been smashed between those two blocks of hexaplast. It's going to keep expanding till it fills every inch of this chamber. That's hard as rock. Yes, after it reaches its original shape. Commander, could it break through the hull of the chamber? Uh, By the time it does, it won't matter to us. Hey, wait. You've given me an idea. There's a bale that hasn't broken open yet. Help me drag it to the door. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let's move fast, Happy. This bale feels soft. Yeah. Now let's wedge it between the stack of hexaplast and the door. A little tighter. Commander, I can feel it expanding. Stand back. When those metal packing strips burst, they'll lash up like whips. There it goes. It's swelling up. Let's hope that door is the weakest part of the chamber. Hey, it works, sir. The door is open. Let's get out of here quickly. Hey, Commander, it's colder out here in the passage than it was in the chamber. Let's get to the control room. I want to hear Larkin's explanation of this. Uh, here's the control room, Hap. Larkin. Commander, you're safe. And you know what happened in the loading chamber. Yes. Uh, did you secure the outer door of the passage? Yes, I did. Now, maybe you'll tell me who locked the refrigeration door. Locked it? It wasn't locked. Oh, no. We had to use expanding hexaplast to break it open. You, you were in there with that wild plastic? Where did you think we were, Larkin? I don't know. I settled the argument between the two technicians, then I came back here and checked the instruments. I could see the temperature was rising in the loading chamber. And what made it rise? The thermostat must have been defective, but it's all right now. Even if the hexaplast bursts the chamber hull, we won't lose any air in the other sections of the factory. But I'd still like to know what made the temperature rise in the door lock just when Cadet Happy and I were in that chamber. Commander, you don't think it was deliberate? I don't know, Larkin. But somebody here is guilty of criminal negligence. As of this moment, your factory is officially closed. Closed? But why? Safety. One incompetent or vicious man in this space factory could destroy the lives of everyone aboard it. I'm going to order a ship to be sent here from Venus to remove every one of your staff to Venus City until we can have a complete investigation. I'll assign a space patrol ship to cruise alongside this factory in its orbit around Venus to protect your interests. Very well, Commander. I'll order a complete shutdown. All right, Larkin. Come on, Happy. We'll get to our ship and space upon Venus City. Then we'll head for Terra and organize an investigation. Curtis calling Trowbridge aboard Space Factory Number Two. Curtis calling Vincent Trowbridge at Space Factory Number Two. Trowbridge here. Go ahead, Curtis. Are there any cargo ships loading or unloading at the factory? No, no ships are due till tomorrow. Why? I'm coming there to talk to you. What am I? I'll tell you when I get there. Now, isn't that rather stupid? You aren't due to inspect for another ten days. I'm nearly there. Have the airlocks ready. Why can't you tell me what you want over to space phone? We're both on the scramble circuit. I've got to talk to you. In person. All right. Come ahead. But if you are in trouble, don't expect me to get you out of it. Come 
Commander, shouldn't we be on the Terra Vector? I've changed course, Happy. We're heading for the other space factory on the opposite side of Venus. Why? Is something wrong at the Trowbridge plant? Well, so far it's not as serious as what went on at Larkin's. I've been getting some interesting information from Major Robertson, though. Trowbridge has been putting out some defective plastics, too, worse than Larkin's. Was it in the inspector's report, sir? No. The Bureau of Standards discovered it. It should have been detected by our inspector at the factory. Yet he's consistently given Trowbridge a high efficiency rating. Does the same man check both factories? Yes, George Curtis. Well, maybe he needs a vacation. Yeah, he seemed to be right on his toes when he checked Larkin's plant. Inner City Space Control was supposed to notify me when they located Curtis. He's off duty for 18 hours, so he must be somewhere in the city. Now, oh, there's another collection of wheels in the viewscope, sir. We're getting close to the Trowbridge factory. All right, Curtis, tell me what was important enough to bring you here to the factory at this time. I found out what your men tried to do to Corey with the hexiplast. You might have killed him. Oh. Oh, and that have put Larkin in a hot spot? As it is, this will probably finish him. Yeah, but you don't know the rest of it. Corey had the whole crew, including Larkin, flown to Venus City for an investigation. I'll be called in to testify. So what? That close call, Corey Ed will convince him that Larkin isn't fit to operate a factory. Now, ah, you just calm down. Go back to Venus City and be there when he calls you. But, Trowbridge, don't you realize? Corey will probably give Larkin and his crew a -a brainograph test and find out about your spies. Uh, I I hadn't thought of that. Corey will find out you're behind this whole scheme and find out about me. You know, I'm glad you did come here, Curtis. You can find me to Venus before Corey organizes his investigation. We'll have to eliminate those spies of mine before they're given the brainograph test. I won't have any part of it. All you have to do is keep your mouth shut. Being a space patrol inspector, you won't be asked to take a brain of half test. Not if you play calm. Commander Corey aboard Terra 5 calling Venus Space Factory number 2. That's Corey. Shut up. Corey aboard Terra 5 calling Space Factory number 2. Now keep your mouth shut, Curtis. Let me do the talking. Venus Space Factory number 2 to Commander Corey. Throwbridge here. To Throwbridge, I want to talk to you on official business. Why, of course, Commander. You'll be ready to join airlocks with the factory in about three minutes. Uh, three minutes? Yes. Well, come ahead, Commander. Thanks, Mr. Trowbridge. Corey, out. You recognize my ship. Why didn't you stall him till I could get away? It's too late now. He'd see you anyway. Don't worry. Just do as I say and we'll both be all right. Just get back in that living compartment and lock the door. I'll handle Corey. What are you going to do? Just leave that to me. Go on, get in that compartment. Go on, Happy. Yes, sir. Well, Commander Corey, this is rather a surprise. Hello, Mr. Trowbridge. I recognized our inspector's ship at number two airlock. Is he in here? Yes, he's inspecting my factory. It was my impression that he was here four days ago. Oh, you mean you didn't know he was coming here today? I'm afraid Inspector Curtis is a very thorough young man. I've been getting quite a going over from him. You have? Why? Well, I'll let him tell you. It's probably in the handling room now. Uh, This way, please. On second thought, maybe I'd better tell you myself. Frankly, I tried to deceive Curtis on his last trip here. And I thought I succeeded. Deceive him? Uh, How? Some defective insulation. What about it? Well, I could tell that Curtis wasn't feeling very well. And I thought I'd put it over that he would notice. Well, I found out differently. He's going over the entire plant with a vengeance. After I see Curtis, there are a couple of other matters I want to discuss with you, Mr. Trowbridge. Well, certainly. You'll find Curtis right in here, Commander. The handling room. Just go right... In. Hey! hey you. On your feet, hey, get through that door after him. Oh, oh, oh. Commander. Commander, I can't touch the floor. What happened? We're floating. Trowbridge cut off the artificial gravity in here. We're going right toward the ceiling. Now, take it easy. When you reach the ceiling, push yourself gently toward the floor. Yes, sir. Gently now. You might bounce back up again. When your feet touch, make your way carefully toward the door. Remember, we're completely weightless. I can reach the ceiling. Oh, here it goes. That's it. We're going down. Yeah, like a couple of feathers. Oh, this is the strangest feeling. Easy now. Your feet are almost touching the floor. Oh, oh, my head. Smoke and rockets, Commander. We were pulled up, up to the ceiling. There's the floor down there below us. Trowbridge reversed the gravity field. The pull in this room is toward the ceiling. How are we going to get down to the floor? The hard way, I'm afraid. 
Trowbridge can keep reversing the gravity field from floor to ceiling till he batters us unconscious. Look, sir. Everything that wasn't bolted to the floor is up on the ceiling all around us. Crates and tools, everything. Now you see why Trowbridge called this the handling room. It can handle any object by adjusting the gravity field, no matter how heavy. Yeah, including us. Wow, feel that. I'm pressing harder than ever against the ceiling. Trowbridge is increasing the gravity field. What's he going to do? Knock us out by giving us extra G's? I doubt that he has that much power. Well, it's strong enough so that I can't stand up on the ceiling. If he reverses it at this strength, we'll break every bone in our bodies when we hit the floor. Wow, well, this is awful. Just waiting for him to smash us down. Happy, look down there on the wall. See that switch box? Yes, sir. It's right by the outer loading hatch. Maybe a gravity control emergency switch. We can just turn that lever to the off position. But we can't reach it, sir. Not even if we could stand up. No, but there are a lot of objects around us up here in the ceiling. Small things we could throw. We can hit that switch before Trowbridge reverses the gravity. There's a small crowbar. It's even hard to crawl with all this high gravity. There. Now take careful aim, Happy. Remember, be ready to duck. That bar is going to fall back up to the ceiling. Yeah, that's right. I'm glad you reminded me. Well, here goes. <coughs> Oh, oh, watch out, it's falling back. I didn't throw it nearly hard enough. I'll try it with this wrench. If you hit it, we'll have quite a drop to the floor. If I hit it, we'll stay here in the ceiling till we push ourselves down. Across your fingers. Hey, you hit it, sir. We're weightless again. All right, Happy. Easy now. Press against the ceiling with your legs. Push yourself down toward the door. Okay, careful now. Let's go. Come on, Curtis, quick. Get him to your ship. What'd you do with Corey? He's floating around in the handling room, up near the ceiling. What? Well, just as I was about to reverse the gravity pole and smash him to the floor, the field cut off. I guess I overloaded the coils. Come on, we gotta get out of here. Hurry, get it to your ship. All right, Trowbridge, stay right where you are. Corey! Commander, I didn't know you were here. Curtis, you had the right hunch in coming back here, but evidently you didn't know just how far Trowbridge really would go. But no, Commander. Uh, yeah, that's right, Curtis. I... I might even take a brainograph test. Happy, take Trowbridge into custody. No, you don't. Get your hands up, Cadet Curtis. Go on, you too, Corey. Uh, hey, what is this? Curtis, are you out of your mind? <laughs> Good work, Curtis. Now, Corey, we'll... See. Get him, Happy. <laughs> All right, you two, on your feet. I've got their weapons, sir. Commander, Trowbridge forced me to help him. He bribed two of Larkin's guards to heat up the hexaplast chamber. I didn't have a thing to do with it. Curtis, keep your mouth shut. You might as well let him talk, Trowbridge. We've got enough on you right now. Commander, I'll tell you everything. Honestly, I will. I only did what I did so, so I wouldn't lose my inspector's job. Curtis, you have a peculiar idea of an inspector's duties. Yeah, don't worry, Curtis. You'll still be an inspector. Uh, you can inspect the inside of a criminal rehabilitation center. <laughs> An action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. Gang, everybody's talking about the projectoscope, and no wonder, it's terrific. Now, here's a boy who's been talking about his projectoscope since the moment he got it. That was on Saturday morning. Hey, Junior, look. I got my projectoscope. Man, it's really neat. Look at that. It's shaped like a real outer space rocket ship with tail fins and a radar antenna. Sunday night, and he's still going strong. Hey, Dad, turn out the light. There now. I'm going to show you some pictures on the wall with my projectoscope. That's Buzz Corey and Cadet Happy, you see there. In a real space patrol adventure. It's called Mighty Meteor. And there's three other adventures on the same film. And so it went with his friends on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Hey, look, look at Joe. Look at this projectoscope flash signals in the dark. See how fast I can blink it on and off? Then Thursday, Friday, and Saturday again. And this boy is still talking about his projectoscope. Now, don't cry, sis. I'll find that nickel you dropped here in the dark. See, I got my projectoscope in my pocket. And it's a swell flashlight, too. See that beam of light? And here's your nickel, sis. Good old projectoscope. Gang, get yourself one of these wonderful projectoscopes. We have enough for all of you, and we'll send you on the day we get your order. Just buy a box of rice checks or wheat checks. Then, with your name and address, send 35 cents in coin and a rice checks or wheat checks box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. Write that down. Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. <laughs> 
And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy have joined airlocks with a spaceship in which two criminals are holding Carol captive. Although the criminals have meekly surrendered over the spaceophone, Buzz is still wary. Happy, I'm going to open the inner hatch. Have your ray gun ready. Yes, sir. You got us, Commander, with our hands up. Uh, look, I'll turn on the lights so you can see better. Happy, the lights. They're blinding, Commander. I can't see. Let them have it, Rambo. They can't see. They're helpless. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Cosmic Ray Detector, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! Special bulletin for boys and girls in Indianapolis, Indiana, and Washington, D.C. Buzz Corey's own space battle cruiser, the Ralston Rocket, will be in your area next week. Don't miss it. The Ralston Rocket. <laughs> Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmerer's Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. <laughs> Other players were Ken Mayer, Bela Kovach, Norman Jolly, and David Duval. Dick Tufel speaking. <laughs> Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks Rice... It's National Wheaties Week. Yes, it's National Wheaties Week. And Wheaties present Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. On stage tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another in the Wheaties' big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Tonight's case, The Open Range. It's August 4th, 1948. Maury Buckler and his son Dave are driving across their ranch in a jeep, dropping off salt cakes for their cattle. That was the last stop, Pa. Here. Well, drop this one here. What's the matter, Pa? Well, the last salt cake we dropped here is hardly touched. Look at it. Huh? Why, yeah. No point in leaving another one. There's usually quite a few head around here. Wonder why they're not touching it. Suppose somebody could be running them off. <laughs> Rustler's paw. That's kind of out of date, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, maybe there's a break in the fence down by the old road. Yeah. yeah. Well, you better drive around the cottonwoods and have a look. There's a break. We can fix it right now. I'll have to go back and get horses, though, if we're going to pick up the strays. Yeah. We'll be able to see the fence now as soon as we get over this rise. Hey, Paul. Hmm? Paul, a big truck down there and a bunch of men with some of our stock. So that's what's been happening to him. Speed it up. I'll get my rifle and back here. Let's see us coming. You fellas better stay right where you are. Oh, oh. oh me. Dave. Dave. Oh. I'll get you for this. Paul, Paul, come back, Paul. Oh. Oh, Paul. 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 Oh, Paul.
Tales of the Texas Rangers will continue in just a moment. It's National Wheaties Week, all right, and it couldn't happen to a nicer flake. Because, look, there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. And you know whole wheat. Of course, the naturally sweet whole wheat flavor of Wheaties is important, too. And good? My, my, come on, help celebrate National Wheaties Week. Just buy them, that's all. Buy them and see how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. Dave Buckler managed to drag his father to the Jeep and drive to the nearest hospital, but the father was dead on arrival. Sheriff Clyde Johnson immediately called the Texas Rangers and Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. What are you looking for, Ranger? I thought we'd find some truck tire markings here, Sheriff. The ground's plenty hard, except for the dust settled on top. That'd hold a track, but... Hey, look. Hmm, just a big, wide mark. Yeah, probably some brush hung from the tailgate of the truck. Wipe the tread right out behind him. Let's go through the fence. Yeah. Must have been operating right about here. Yeah. Plenty of cattle tracks, but no boot prints. Wiped out their tracks like they did with the truck. Smart. Probably dragged branches behind them. You can see where they were here, though. Tobacco crumbs and paper where they ground out their cigarettes. Yeah. Looks like 15 or 20 head they run off from the marks. Mm-hmm. All right, let's go back to the car for a second. Now, how do the bucklers brand their herd? Oh, just a simple letter L. Buckler's wife's name was Lou. Do you know if their brand has been registered? I don't believe it ever was, Ranger. Why? I've got to make a radio call to KTXA in Austin. Unit 10 to KTXA. Unit 10 to KTXA. KTXA to Unit 10. Go ahead, Unit 10. Unit 10 requests headquarters to ask all commission houses to be on lookout for marketing of any cattle carrying letter L brand or any altered brand that might have been made to cover letter L. Will do, Unit 10. May be part of stock stolen from Buckler Ranch on 8-4. Notify Unit 10 if any lead turns up. Unit 10, 10-4. We'll keep Unit 10 informed. KDXA Austin. Good idea, that call. Might get a lead. Yeah, when we get through here, I want to go into the hospital and see Dave Buckler. He might just be able to describe the... Hey, wait. Hmm? What do you got? Old cigarette lying right here near this bush. And scorched. Somebody started to light it but didn't finish. Yeah. That matchbook lying in the bush. Whatever happened, it made a fellow forget about his cigarette. Must have been when the bucklers came over the hill. Feller saw him, threw the cigarette and matches down just as he was getting ready to light up. Yeah, that could be all right. Half the matches are still in the book. Ones that are missing are all torn off from the left side of the book. So? So the man who had this book of matches is left-handed. Let's get into the hospital. <laughs> I'm right-handed, so was Pop. Matches couldn't have been ours. Just making sure. Can you describe any of the stock they made off with, Buckler? Well, yeah. yeah most of them were white-faced. But there was one of the calves that had a mottled face. Mottled, huh? Yeah. Good. That helps. My Pa was such a good guy, Ranger. I wish I could climb out of here and help you find those dirty... N- Can you give me any kind of a description of the men? No. I never got a good look at him. A couple of days went by, then a week. There was no sign of the buckler cattle with the L brand. I went back to headquarters to see Captain Stinson. Ah, uh, no sign of those cattle, huh? Not ahead, Captain. Well, they might be afraid to unload them so soon after a killing. That means they'd have to vend or alter the brands and put them out to graze. I don't think they'd want to be too close to them for fear of being spotted. 
Neither do I, Jace. That's why I've got an idea. Ever think of trying Camp Hood? No, but I should have. It's a perfect spot for them. 35 square miles of free grazing land. Yeah. Ever since the army deactivated the camp, a lot of ranchers have been using it. Our last check showed 15,000 head there. All kinds of brands. Fattening up until the owners cut them out for marketing. Sure. And Buckler's cattle with altered brands covering that L could be waiting there for the thief to come back and get them whenever he wants. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's a lot of territory and a lot of cattle for one man to cover. I'm going to have Bud Kurtz come in and go with you. Kurtz? Fine. The commission houses are still on the alert. We got them stopped on the selling end. Now it's up to you to find those cattle. They're the only key to the killer. Bud Kurtz and I drove to Camp Hood, unloaded our horses and started to check the open range. In three days, we ran across more than 50 brands, all legitimate. But on the fourth day... Cow folks are pretty busy, Kurtz. Yeah, cutting out a few calves over there. There's a branding fire and two men. They see us coming. Keep your eyes peeled. They may be all right, but if they aren't, one of them may throw a gun. Oh, oh boy. Howdy, Rangers. Howdy. You can let that one go, Pete. No. Hold him for a minute. What's the matter, Ranger? Let me frisk you. I'll get this fella. Why? What's wrong, Ranger? I ain't got no gun. Just checking out. What's your brand? Nothing on this fella, Jay. Well, there's the iron right there. Jay in the center of a box, huh? Yeah. My name's Jack Stern. Got a ranch up in Box Canyon. Brand's supposed to be Jack in the Box. What are you doing with this stock? Well, changing over to my brand. From what? An L brand? No, square you. Like that one over there. Ain't added my brand on him yet. Take a look at it. See? Yeah, I see. It's a square U now, but it was an L. That brand's been altered. Okay, let him go. Find something, Chase? Yeah. Where'd you get this stock? I bought them last night. Anything wrong? They were stolen a week ago. I got a bill of sale for them, Ranger. The fellow who had them was cutting them out yesterday. Said he was taking some steers to market, but he wanted to sell the cash for $60 a head. So he wouldn't have to keep coming all the way back from Rollo to get him. Came from Rollo, huh? That's what he said. But here's the bill of sale. Name was Vic Moran. Ranger, you must be making a mistake. Maybe. How many calves did he sell you? Eight of them. Boys bought these two in here, and they're getting the others now. Good. Is there a model face in the bunch, Stern? Yeah, there is. Guess that settles it, Chase. This is Buckler's stock. Yeah, we'd better drive him out and have a van pick him up. Lab can examine the brands. Now, what about my money? Your claim is against the man who sold them to you, Vic Morath from Rollo. If that was his right name. If he moves steers out too, Jace, they should be turning up at a commission house in a day or so. Yeah. In the meantime, Stern, I'll have to hold you and your boys in custody for possession of stolen property. Ain't it enough that I lost $480? Maybe it'll teach you not to pay cash for cattle until you've checked on them. I didn't pay cash. I gave Marath a check. A check? You mean he took a check from you? Yeah. Hey, maybe I can stop payment. You won't have to. We'll do it for you. Where's your bank? Ranchers and Merchants Trust in Abilene. The president knows me. His name's Chalmers. All right, Stern. Kurt, you bring him and his boys into town with a stock. I'll meet you there. I gotta get to a phone and call that bank. I rode charcoal hard into town. Found the phone and put a call through for Mr. Chalmers, president of the bank in Abilene. But I was too late. I'm sorry, Ranger Pearson, but Mr. Morath cashed that check shortly after we opened this morning. Did you ask Morath for identification? Yes, but he didn't have any on him. And you cashed the check anyhow? Well, he asked us to call his bank in Rollo for a reference to save him time. He even paid for the call. You mean he actually comes from Rollo and they've heard of him there? The Rollo State Bank said he had an account there. But you don't actually know whether the man was Morath. Well, after all, Ranger, when the man paid for the call to his own bank in Rollo... Did Morath endorse the check? Yes, it was endorsed in my presence. Will you rush that endorsed check to my headquarters? I want to look at that signature. When the check came through, Kurtz and I left for Rollo, Texas. At Rollo, we went directly to Morath's bank. 
Uh, Vic Moran? Well, yeah, I know him. This his signature? I'd have to compare it with his signature card. Just a moment. M M A M A S M A U. Ah, yeah, here we are. Uh, now he takes both signatures and C. They're not the same, Jace. No. Thank you. Any time, Ranger. Come on. What now, Jace? Morales Ranch is only about a mile out. We better drive out there and see him. You sure you won't have a drink, Ranger? No, thanks. Oh, so somebody's been using my name, huh? Looks that way. You know who it might be? No, but it's a cinch it wouldn't be a friend. Forgery's a mighty low trick. I figure it may have happened a hundred times before, Mr. Morath, but this is the first time we caught it. I'm mighty glad you did. I don't like my name being mixed up with thieving and killing. Of course, you'd never see the checks. They'd go right back to the man who made them out after they were cashed. Anybody ever forged your name to a check that went through your own bank? I know. If anybody had and I knew it, I'd have taken a bullwhip to him. No help here, Jase. No. Well, thanks for your cooperation, Mr. Morath. We can find our way out. So long, Mr. Morath. You sure you won't take one of these before you go? I'm having another. No, thanks. That certainly led us into a blind pass. Huh? I said Morath was no help. What's the matter with you, Jace? I was just thinking of that book of matches I found on the range out at Buckler's. The ones that were dropped by somebody left-handed? Yeah, I watched Morath pouring that drink for himself. He's left-handed, Kurtz. Well, that's mighty thin and circumstantial, Jase. Sure, I know it is. Just a passing thought. I better call KTXA. Unit 10 to KTXA. Unit 10 back in service. KTXA to Unit 10. Have message for you. Go ahead, KTXA. Cattle with L brand offered for sale this afternoon at Tully Commission House, Fort Wood. Cattle inspector reports brand might have been L brand from Buckler Ranch. Did Commissioner get name and address of seller? Seller refused to have check mailed. Said he would pick it up tomorrow after stock was weighed and priced. Gave his name as Vic Morath, Rollo, Texas. Just left Morath at home in Rollo. Unit 10 and Unit 6 proceeding to Fort Worth. We'll be there when Commission House opens in morning. Unit 10, 10 4. Got a long drive ahead of us, Jace. Yeah, but this is the break we've waited for. <laughs> it's not so important now, is it, that Morath happened to be left handed? No. Not now, it isn't. In just a moment, we continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. It's National Wheaties Week everywhere, even backstage in our studio here tonight. Sure it is, we're all buying and eating Wheaties this week. And here's living proof, the man who dramatizes Tales of the Texas Rangers, Mr. Joel Mercott. Am I right, Joel? Are you getting your Wheaties? I sure am, Frank. And not only that, I've got Wheaties written to the breakfast script for Mrs. Murcott and our four kids, too. Seems like eating Wheaties is little enough to do for them when they do so much for us. Folks, I hope you feel that way, but even if you don't, try Wheaties once. Just to show us you like our shows, what do you say? After all, National Wheaties Week only comes once a year. Thank you, Joel Murcott. <laughs> We reached Fort Worth during the night and examined the cattle in the commission house stock pens. They were part of the Buckler L Brands, all right. All next day, Bud Kurtz and I were staked out in the commission house office. But the man impersonating Morath never showed to pick up his check. Well, have to wait again tomorrow, Jace. I don't think so. He won't be coming. What do you mean? Our man didn't show because somebody tipped him not to show. Think somebody in the commission house slipped up? Maybe not, Kurtz. Maybe we slipped up. Maybe we did. What do you mean, Chase? I'll tell you as soon as we find a photograph of Vic Morath. 
the real one from Rollo. It took almost two days to find a picture. We went through newspaper files, breeders' publications, cattlemen and ranchers' journals, county fair souvenir books. Captain Stinson found what I was after. Chase, look. Is Marath one of these? Yeah. Yeah, that's it, Captain. That's Marath in the center. Group picture. Who are the others? Picture comes from a breeders' journal. Caption says it's the Marath Ranch Rodeo Team. Had the highest group score at the Rollo Rodeo in 1946. Two years ago. I want to see if Stern or Chalmers, the banker, can identify Marath as the man who sold those calves. Well, we know it wasn't Marath, Chase. The signatures didn't match. They don't have to. Marath is left-handed. He might have endorsed the check with his right hand just to cover up. Hey, Jace may have something there. It's worth trying. Stern has been released. I'll call him at his ranch and have him meet us at his bank in Abilene. How about it, Stern? Is this the man, the bareheaded one in the center? No. No, Ranger. Uh, I never saw him before. How about you, Chalmers? Is this the man who presented the check? No, no, it isn't. Another washout, Chase. And uh, let me see that picture again. Sure, here. I, uh... I'm not sure, but, uh... This fellow on the end, right here. Uh, you look at it, Chalmers. Why, yes. Yes, I believe that is the man. One of the cowpokes, huh? Come on, Kurtz. We're going to visit the sheriff at Rollo. Yeah, yeah, I know that feller. Quit working for Morath about a year ago. Bought himself a little ranch not far from Morath, uh, over near Comanche Gulch. Cowpoke has to be pretty thrifty to buy a ranch. What's his name? Uh, Buzz Black. Better get over to Comanche Gulch, Jace. Yeah. Thanks, Sheriff. Sure. Glad to be of service. Well, we're going to be able to tell Marath who's been using his name. We don't have to tell him. I got a hunch he already knows. What makes you say that? Black didn't go back to pick up that check. Somebody warned him those cattle were getting hot. That means Marath. But if he's in on it, why would he let Black use his name? Because he's smart. False signature makes him look like an innocent victim. His reputation is good. And as soon as we went to him, he knew we were on the trail, and he told Black and the others to lay low. Right. Let's get Black for a starter. All right, Black, throw up your hands. What? Huh? Oh, you scared me, right? Drop that hammer. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, I don't know what this is all about, but I... It's about an old man who was shot to death while you were running off some of his cattle with an L brand. Me? Oh, you're crazy. I never... We've got three people who can identify you. Man who bought the calves, banker who cashed a check, and the commissioner who bought the steers in Fort Worth. All right. So what? I, I found the cattle out at Camp Hood. I... You don't find cattle with a brand on them. They weren't mavericks. You better talk, Black. I'll talk when I see a lawyer. You wait that long and Marath will run out and you'll be facing it alone. That old rancher was murdered. I didn't shoot him. I, I swear, Ranger. No jury's going to believe you. Unless you tell us who did it and we find the gun he used. Huh. All right, all right. It was Marath. He started the whole thing. It was his idea. Who rode with you? One pokes from here, six from Marath's place. What's that? Why are they taking off in a brush, Chase? Stop, yo! Too late. He made cover. Isn't the Marath Ranch over that way, Black? Yeah, yeah, that was my rider. Must have sneaked up and hurt us. I'm going to handcuff you to this wagon. Oh, now, wait a minute. I... We'll be back for you later. Come on, Kurtz. They'll know we're coming on. They'll scatter, Jace. You better call headquarters for more units. We put through the call and headed for Marath's ranch in the car, hoping to beat the rider. He must have stopped on the way and phoned Marath because the ranch was clear when we got there. Ah, they cleared out, Chase. Better get the horses out of the trailer and start tracking. Wait a minute, Kurtz. Look at this driveway. Funny marks. Yeah. Brush trailing behind a truck to wipe out the tracks. I've seen that before. And this is fresh. A branch caught in the edge of that mesquite when they turned into the road and snapped it. The brake is new. That means they're heading for the highway. Probably all riding together in the truck. There'll be an arsenal on wheels. Come on. Units we called for can set up roadblocks and converge on them. 
Unit 10 to KTXA. Unit 10 to KTXA. KTXA to Unit 10. Go ahead. Subjects wanted for killing of Maury Buckler making getaway in cattle truck from Morath Ranch at Rollo. Check license numbers of vehicles registered to Morath. Will do, Unit 10. Subjects headed for Main Highway will probably turn south toward closest border point. Unit 10 and Unit 6 headed that way. Have other units converge on area and set up roadblocks with highway patrol. Units 3 and 8 nearby. We'll notify them. We'll make direct contacts with units as we close in. Unit 10, 10 10-4. Kurtz, you can commandeer the sheriff's radio car in town. Give us a chance to spread out more. It's going to be like tackling a tank, Jace. Yeah. Break out a Tommy gun and put it on the seat. in from all points. There were no side roads that weren't covered by our units. Morath and his men were locked in our ring. I kept my foot heavy on the gas pedal. Then far ahead as I approached the intersection of State 12, I saw the truck dip over a rise. Unit 10 to Unit 3. Unit 10 to Unit 3. Unit 3, go ahead, Unit 10. Subject's truck less than mile ahead of Unit 10, nearing intersection point your area. Ready for them, Unit 10. Unit 6 to Unit 10. Go ahead, Unit 6. Unit 6 now on main highway south of intersection. Block highway at that point, Unit 6. Subjects are between Unit 6 and Unit 10 now unless they turn off. Unit 3 has reached intersection point of State 12. We'll block off intersection. Good, Unit 3. Unit 8 has blocked still further south if subjects break through. closer to the speeding truck as it topped a rise and headed down toward the intersection of the state highway. I could see the sheriff's car Kurtz had borrowed blocking the road in Unit 3's car in the center of the turnoff. The truck skidded and started to make a turn and come back toward me. I swung my car across the road, grabbed the Tommy gun, and jumped out. Come out. All of you still alive, come out with your hands up. You all right, Jason? Yeah. How about you, Clint? I'm okay. All right, you men. Get over there and keep your hands up. I got them covered, Jace. One dead in the back there and a couple wounded. Hey, where's Barat? Around the other side of the cab. Dead. He came out shooting and I nailed him. Ah, there he is. Better break that rifle out of his grip. Ballistics can tell if it's the one that killed Buckler. He'll be the one, all right. Or he wouldn't have tried so hard to keep us from getting him. Vic Morath's rifle was positively identified as the one used in the slaying of Rancho Mori Buckler. Buzz Black and the other men who had assisted Morath were given penitentiary sentences ranging from 20 to 99 years. And now, here's the Wheaties man, Frank Martin. Another triumph for the Rangers, and another grand performance by our distinguished star, Mr. Joel McRae. And here he is with a few words for you personally about National Wheaties Week. I hope you're enjoying Tales of the Texas Rangers. And it would give me a whole lot of pleasure, partner, if I thought you'd go out and get a box of Wheaties tomorrow because of our program. Since it's National Wheaties Week, it's a pretty good time to get those Wheaties. Will you do that? Good night. Good night, Joel. You know, Wheaties and I were going to send you a free case of Wheaties. But uh, then we thought, oh, that's silly. Joel McRae eats Wheaties, so chances are his kitchen shelf is loaded. And what National Wheaties Week is really for is to get other people to eat Wheaties. Frankly, folks, it's to get you to know and appreciate the fact that there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. That's right, a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. National Wheaties Week is for you to buy Wheaties and try them and see for yourself. 
how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. So, no free Wheaties to you, Joel. Uh, you can buy them just like all the rest of it. Right, folks? Uh, don't forget, breakfast of champions. Come on, everybody, to the Wheaties party. Eat a lot of Wheaties like the champions do. Dance together cheek to cheek. This is National Wheaties Week. Eat a lot of Wheaties like the champions do. Wheaties are breakfast of champions. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae will soon be seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Saddle Trent. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Tom Tully, Bert Holland, Joe Duval, Byron Kane, Paul Dubuff, and Bob Cole. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. And this is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen on Wednesday night to Brian Donlevy in Dangerous Assignment on the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. And remember, it's National Wheaties Week. Tomorrow, Sam Spade cuts a caper and Robert Merrill sings on NBC. Wait a minute. Have you heard the weird tales of the Whistler... Sunday night, and again, CBS presents The Whistler. I, the Whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And so I tell you the amazing story of House of Greed. A taxi cab rolls through the night and comes to a stop before a brownstone mansion on West 52nd Street. The driver opens the door and a handsome, well-dressed man steps out, pays the driver, slips quickly up the stairs, fumbles with a bunch of keys, but the door opens. Oh! Hello, Jackson. Mr. Talbot, welcome home, sir. Where's Mrs. Talbot? Oh, uh, she left three days ago. Uh, went to the place in the Catskills. There's a note on your desk, sir. Oh, good. Your brother, Frank, is waiting in the library. Oh. Hello, Frank. What do you want? John. Now, look, Frank, I told you the last time I'd give you no more money. Oh, but it isn't gambling debts this time. I'm reforming. I'm going to settle down and work. Work. Hmm. I met a big cattleman from South America. He has a very lovely daughter. And she talked her father into letting me buy an interest in the business. How much? Ten thousand. Oh, I'm sure I'll make good, John. Oh, very well. I don't mind doing something like that for you. When are you leaving? Tomorrow. I've had a plane reservation for four days. Mm-hmm. Thanks for the check, John. You're a swell guy. Uh, tell Mary goodbye for me. Yeah, she's up in the Catskills. Yeah, so Jackson told me. Oh, that... Good Lord. What's wrong? She hasn't gone to the Catskills. I, I can't understand this. What on earth does she mean? Well, what is it? Well, read it. John, this life is too lonely. I can't go on like this, so I'm leaving you. I found someone else who is more considerate of me. But I... First, I'm going home, and from there, it doesn't matter. I'm sorry, but things just didn't work out for us. Mary. Someone who's more considerate of her? Why, I have given Mary everything her heart desired... She must be out of her mind. Uh, of course, you have been gone a lot, and women get crazy ideas. I, it's knocked the pins right out from under me. Yes, I can see that. You better take it easy for a while. Yes, I feel, I don't know, kind of sick. 
All of a sudden, nothing seems to matter. Oh, maybe she'll wake up before she gets too far. Perhaps I'd better cancel my trip for a few weeks until you get straightened out. No, 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 never mind. I'll, I'll pull myself together. I wouldn't have you sidetrack your plans for the world. I think you better go now, Frank. I'd rather be alone. All right. But uh, don't do anything foolish. What do you mean? Well, if you brood about it, you're liable to get some crazy ideas and end up really holding the sack. Good luck, Frank. Lots of luck. Thanks. Goodbye, John. John sits for the remainder of the night staring over the top of his desk. The next morning he closes the house and starts on Mary's trail, which takes him to London, Paris, Berlin, all over Europe, but to no avail. Finally, he drops his active interest in his business and goes to live in his country estate. And one day, 14 years later, he finds himself on a honeymoon. He has married a widow named Helga. Well, John, dear, <laughs> we got away without too much trouble. Well, it does seem a bit silly, rice and honeymoons at our age. Our age? Well, you sound as though we're a couple of old grannies. I'm 36 and you're 45, and I certainly don't feel old. Why, of course you're not, Helga. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. John, now that the wedding's over, there's something I haven't told you. Oh, I, now I... I well, I, I haven't said anything because I was afraid it, it might make a difference. Well, I know what it is. You have a son. How did you know? <laughs> I wondered when you were going to mention it. Oh, well, he finishes school this year. It's been quite a struggle putting him through college. But he's very bright. Paul has studied hard and managed to cram two years into one. Could he spend the summer with us? Why, of course. Oh, John, you're a darling. I should be able to find a place for him in the business. Oh, ask him to come down to our place in the country. Oh, thanks, John. You're wonderful. <laughs> so Helga's son, Paul, came to spend the summer at the country place... And he stayed the next winter and the following summer and the next winter. Now it is summer again. And Paul is still visiting his mother and stepfather. The first year he worked in the office every day until noon. Found business very boring. So finally he quit going to the city at all. But mother, I've looked the whole thing over and there's nothing there that interests me. Well, you can learn about the business. You seem to be able to learn anything else you want to. But I don't care for business. Oh, you're a fool. I worked my knuckles to the bone to give you an education. I married John Talbot to give you a chance, a chance to do something. John has no children. It's a huge business. And one day you could control the whole thing. I'm disappointed in you, Paul. You're letting me down. Well, it seems to run very well without too much attention from him. If we were to uh, inherit it, why wouldn't it continue to run just as well? You either get down to that office or you pack your things and get out. Why should I? I'm perfectly satisfied. I'll tell John to make you go. And suppose I tell him what you just said? That you married him just to give me a chance? Married him for his money? You wouldn't dare. And uh, suppose I tell him that you were never divorced from father... But he's still down in South America, still wandering around trying to find a gold mine. If you dare open your mouth, I'll... Oh, hello there. How are you, Helga? What's this I heard about South America? Oh, why, why, nothing, darling. Paul was just talking about someone he met from down there. Who do you know from South America, Paul? Oh, uh, oh fellow, I met him today. Were you in the city today? Uh, no, uh, I was down the village. I didn't suppose you'd been out of the house today. What's his name? Why, uh... Oh, I don't remember. I didn't think you would. You haven't been out of this house for three days. Paul, I think you're the laziest man I've ever met. All right, all right. I'll start back to the office Monday. If that's what you and Mother want me to do, I'll do it. Why, well, I'm sorry I wasn't here for dinner, Helga. I was detained in town. Well, I have quite a bit of work to do. I'll be here in the library for two or three hours. Very well, John. I, I won't bother you. I'll go on upstairs. Besides, I want to have a little talk with Paul. Good night, dear. Good night, Helga. <clears throat> what on earth? Who's out there? Why? What do you want out there? May I come in? I, I want to talk with you. Well, why do you come to the library windows? Why didn't you ring the bell? I, 
I didn't want to cause a disturbance. Disturbance? What do you mean? May I come in? Yes, yes, come ahead. Don't you know me, John? Good Lord. Mary. I'm sorry, John, I had to talk with you. I saw the light in the library. What do you want? I... I need your help. Where have you been all these years? Oh, every place. Are you still filled with resentment? It's been too long ago. At first I was. I followed you all over Europe, but never quite caught up with you. Now I'm glad I didn't. There's no telling what I might have done. I'm sorry, John. I was a fool. And I know that now. <coughs> May I sit down? Why, of course. Have you a cold? Yes, I can't seem to shake it. I've had it for weeks. You see, I, I hate to mention it, but you look a bit shabby, Mary. Aren't you doing well? Oh, well, yes. Yes, I'm doing all right. Are you? You've uh, married again. Yes. And your wife is here? Yes. Then I'll be as brief as possible. I, I wouldn't want her to know that I was here. You want me to help your husband? No, not that. I have no husband. What about the man you said was more considerate of you? He left me four years after the baby was born. Baby? You have a child. Yes, John. She's 17 now. And where's the man? I don't know and I don't care. Oh, John, I made the biggest mistake of my life. I should have known better. But he practically carried me off my feet. And I learned later, to my sorrow, that he was not worth shooting. Where's your daughter? She's in a school in Vermont. I've worked hard to give her an education. I've done everything I could do to give her a chance. I've not seen her very often. But now, well, I... I'm sort of cracking up. I've been ill a lot. and I seem to have trouble getting a job. Job? What kind of a job? Why, any kind of a job. What have you been working at, Mary? Oh, John. I made such a miserable mess of it. I was never able to face things. I always took the line of least resistance. What a shame. And now I've come to the end of my rope. Joan has finished school. She's a lovely girl, John. I can't let her know. I can't take her with me. Why not? She deserves so much more. She deserves a chance in life. I want you to do something for her. Well, why should I? Because she's your daughter, John. Da My daughter? Yes, yours and mine. She was born seven months after I left. Here's the birth certificate. Please, John, do something for her. She shouldn't be made to suffer for my mistake. She's innocent. Well, does she know I'm her father? <laughs> No. And she doesn't remember the other men. Here, I'll give you her address. Fernwood College. And, and I'll write a letter to her explaining all about you. Well, I, I... Oh, John, you could do so much for her. She's a young lady now. And so lovely. Please see her. I know you'll fall in love with her. All right, Mary. I'll, I'll see her. I'll have her come down here. Oh, John. John, I'm so sorry. So sorry for everything I've done. Please forgive me. I've forgotten everything, Mary. Oh, wait a moment. Take this check and do something about that cough. No, thanks, John. I won't need it. You'd better take it. Thanks. I'll be all right in a few days. The cough will be gone. Good night, John. Good night, Mary. this girl here, do you realize what it means, Mother? Yes. It's his own daughter. If he falls for her, if he, if he likes her, he'll change his will and split the estate. She's entitled to it, isn't she? Now, why should she be? Strange girl he didn't even know existed. Popped up out of nowhere and cheats us out of half the estate. Hmm. I know what you mean. We've been here for several years. You're his wife. It isn't fair. What would you do about it, Paul? I'd see that she didn't get anything. How would that be possible? Suppose she, uh... She didn't like it here. Supposing that before John got attached to her, the things happened that would make her dislike everything here. If she runs away soon enough, he won't change his will. 
Perhaps you're right. And if she doesn't? Then maybe something could happen to John. Later, something could happen to the girl. But in any event, the will must not be changed. Where do you get such ideas? <laughs> That, Joan, dear, is the story of your mother. I trailed them all over Europe, but never quite caught up with them. You mean you planned to kill them? Kill them? I was filled with revenge, but I finally gave up the chase and returned here to wait. I knew that sooner or later she'd show up. But it's been so long ago. Surely you've lost the desire for revenge by this time. Time heals many wounds, my dear. If you had caught up with them and satisfied your revenge, what good would it have done? Quite right, my dear, quite right. Tell me... Have you no recollection of this man? You can recall nothing about him? Absolutely nothing. Remember, I was only four when he went away. And you do believe that I'm your father? What else am I to believe? Mother proved that with the birth certificate. Proved that I'm Joan Talbot, not Joan Evans, as I've always believed. Of course. And would you like to remain here? Why, yes, I, I think I would, well, but There seems I... to be a doubt. Why do you hesitate? I don't know. From all the evidence, I belong here. I have a legal right, but... Well, I can't seem to find words to express it. Express what? From the moment I stepped in the door of this house, I've had a, a strange feeling. A cold, chilly sensation of, of fear. Well, is it something you feel about me? Yes. You're afraid of me? No, I, I don't think so. Is it Helga? Well... Is it Paul? Oh, please, please don't ask me anymore. I don't know what it is. Well, what has Paul said to you? Nothing. No one said anything. It, it's just a premonition of... of evil. There's something wrong. Something horribly wrong in this house. Oh, you're imagining things, Joan. It's all in your mind. It will pass as suddenly as it came. You're young, Joan, impressionable, and you suddenly found your life turned upside down. A new environment to which you've never become accustomed, but you'll get used to it. You're my daughter. I want you to have what you deserve, what is rightfully yours. I understand. And I'll try to overcome this feeling. Yeah, that's better. You're a lovely girl, Joan. An intelligent girl. I know I'm going to be very proud of you. Thank you. I think I'll go to bed now. Well, it is rather late. Good night, dear. See you in the morning. Hello. Paul, what are you doing here on the stairs in the dark? I wanted to tell you something. What? You're very, very beautiful. Your eyes, your hair, just like gold. Gold moonbeams. And so... Paul! In your throat. Your throat is slender and soft. I... Take your hand off my neck. Paul! I don't know many girls. Girls don't like me. Let me by. You don't like me either, do you? Well, I... I know. I can tell. Elsie didn't like me either. She was afraid of me. Who's Elsie? She was a girl... In the village. She worked here in the summertime. No one knows what became of her. What? I don't remember what happened to her. But her throat was slender and white like yours. Let me by! <laughs> Who's here? Who's in this room? Don't turn on the light. Helga, what do you want? I must talk to you. What about? You're not safe here. No one is safe in this house. You must leave at once. What do you mean? What's wrong? The house is wrong. It's filled with evil and hate. I know. Why do you stay? I can't leave. It's too late. But you must go at once. Do you mean that Paul... That's part of it. Then what else? John. John? What about him? I can't tell you, but you must believe me. What about my father? 
He doesn't believe he is your father. And he's planning to get revenge on your mother through you. I don't believe you. I won't. Get away while you have a chance. No. I won't run from it. I'll face it, whatever it is. Very well. Good night, Joe. Now it is nearly midnight. John still works at his desk in the library. But outside, a man steps softly through the trees upon the terrace, quietly opens the library doors. Steps in. Hello, John. Frank. Good Lord. Yes, Brother Frank. <laughs> well, why don't you say something? Come in, or get out, or something. Why, why, come in, Frank. You fairly knocked me off my feet. I didn't know whether you were alive or dead. It's been a long time, John. Why haven't you written me? Well, I was hoping I could make a go of that ranch and pay you back, but uh, I guess I was just born unlucky. Oh. They had a revolution and cleaned Senor Gonzalez out and me with him. That's too bad, Frank. But you're still the same steady, reliable John. Yes, sir, I've tried my darndest to be like you, but... Well, it just isn't in me. I don't have what it takes. The last two years, I've had a pretty tough time. I caught some sort of a malarial fever down there, and it's impossible to get rid of it. it keeps recurring. You certainly don't look well. You've aged quite a bit. You better have Dr. Richards look you over tomorrow. <laughs> She's still kicking around. I thought he'd be gone long ago. How's your new marriage turned out? Oh, very well. Very well indeed. Good. Ever hear from Mary? Yes. She came to see me. I knew she would eventually. She was broke and quite ill. She'd had a tough time of it. And you helped her out. <laughs> you would. You couldn't turn anyone down. Well, she was mainly interested in my helping the girl. She had her in a school in Vermont. And so now you're taking care of both of them. What else could I do? Good old Joe. I sent for the girl and brought her down here. She's a lovely child. Sweet as can be. And you'll give her everything her heart desires, I suppose. And then you'll have another problem on your hands with Joan. A girl 17 either wants to get married or go to college. Oh? Well, I've decided that. <laughs> really? I'd like to send her to Wellesley. Good. Isn't every man who can have... Just a minute, Frank. I'll be right back. Well, what are you doing out here in the hall at this time of night for? Oh, well, uh, 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 Mother sent me down to see why you hadn't come up to your room. Oh. Well, tell her I'll be up in a few minutes. Yes, uh, yes, I'll tell her. My stepson, Paul. His mother thought I was staying up unusually late. Oh, well, I'll run along. It. Good heavens, it's after 12. Now, when's the last train back to the city? 12 o'clock. You've missed it. Well, when's the next one? 5 a.m. Oh, well, I, I suppose I'll have to wait for that. Can you put me up? Yes, of course, Frank. Oh, thanks. Wait a moment, Frank. I probably won't be up when you leave, so I'll give you this now. Oh, now, John, I uh, I didn't come here for that. Hmm? I... <laughs> well, that is not exactly. <laughs> no, you never have. Here you are, Frank. A thousand. And see Doc Richards first thing in the morning. And drop in at the office and let me know what he says. Thanks, John. I... I'm sorry to have to take this. I, I only wish that... Oh, forget it. We're not kids any longer. You're too old to learn new tricks now. Run along to bed, Frank. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, uh, take the guest room at the head of the stairs. Good night, John. See you in town at noon. Night, Frank. strikes three as two figures slip down the darkened hall and quietly enter John's bedroom. Then a few minutes later, the same two figures make their way in the moonlight through the trees to the back of the estate, carrying a long, gruesome bundle wrapped in a sheet. <laughs> Now it is three nights later, and Joan, Helga, and Paul are in the library as Joan paces back and forth anxiously. But where could Father have gone? He didn't say a word about going out of town. Oh, maybe he doesn't want to come back. Why not? Mm, I don't know. Maybe he doesn't like it here. You should have listened to me. 
But you didn't say anything about... Well, well, you just mentioned me. Could it be a mistake? I just had a weird feeling of impending disaster. Something is wrong, I know. If I didn't belong here, if I could leave, I'd not stay another moment. Who knows what will happen next? I know. What do you know? I know what will happen next. They always happen in twos. Many people have come here, stayed a while, and then suddenly disappeared. What time is it? 11.30. There's a train at 12. I'm leaving here. Hello? Yes, this is Joan Talbot. What? Good heavens, who? Where? Yes. Yes, I understand. Yes, I... I'll be here. Yes. Who was it? Uh, I don't know. I've never heard anything like it. What do you mean? It was a man and he... What man? He said he had a message for us. And he'll be here at 12 o'clock and... to wait for him in the library. The police? I don't know. He said he'll come to the garden windows, to the library window. Who could it be? I don't know. But we'll wait. I'm going to see this through. Here he comes. Through the garden. Who... Who is it, Mother? I, I don't know. The lights... Why did you turn out the lights? I turned them out so we could see outside. Who is he? I don't know. He, he, he's up on the terrace. Who, who are you? What do you want? I came to talk to you. What about? About what happened here at three o'clock in the morning several days ago. Nothing happened. Nothing. But something did happen. Turn on the lights. No, don't turn them on. You couldn't see me if you turned on the lights. Paul, good Lord. Was it you who phoned me? I spoke to you, but I didn't phone you. Mother. What happened in this house at three o'clock several days ago? A man was murdered. What? Paul. Turn on the lights. Turn on the lights. Joan Talbot, open the top drawer of that desk. Now take out the paper. It says, on the night of August 5th, we, the undersigned, murdered John Talbot in his bedroom, and buried his body on the estate. We didn't. We didn't. It's John. It's John. Sign it. Sign the paper and I'll go. Sign it, Paul. Sign it. You did it. You killed him. Sign it. You help me. You sign it. I can't. I can't. Turn on the lights, Joan. John. It's, it's him. It's him. He isn't dead. No, Paul. If we didn't. Paul, what happened? I'll tell you. You killed my brother Frank instead. Come on in, Sergeant. You heard it all. Yes, we heard it all. Father, what on earth happened? When you phoned a while ago, I almost fainted. I was sure you were dead. I knew from the moment you told me you were frightened in this house that something was wrong. I put two and two together and realized what it was. They didn't want you to share on the estate. I knew they were planning something on that night. And then my brother came. He accidentally got into my room by mistake. And they killed him instead of me. I saw them carrying his body through the trees. So I disappeared for a few days and evolved this plan. You've nothing to worry about any longer, Joan. Nothing. No. <laughs> nothing to worry about. But the truth would certainly amaze you. All that Helga said about Paul and John was true. John was planning revenge, but not through Joan. That night your brother Frank came back. You discovered something, John. What was it Frank said? And then you'll have another problem on your hands with Joan. A girl 17 either wants to get married or go to college. It was then, John, that you knew the truth. The only way that Frank could have possibly known that the girl's name was Joan and that she was 17 was to have been with Mary. So John knew then that it was Frank who ran away with Mary and deserted her when Joan was four years old. And then, John, knowing that Helga and Paul planned to kill him, deliberately let Frank occupy his room on that fateful night. John's revenge was satisfied. 
and he didn't have to turn a hand. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> CBS has presented The Whistler. And now an important announcement regarding a change of time. Beginning one week from tomorrow night, on Sunday, September 13th, The Whistler will come to you at 9.15 p.m. Remember, Sunday, September 13th, at 9.15 p.m. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of the Scarlet Cloak, starring Wendell Niles. This is a story of the Golden West, as it was more than a hundred years ago. A land of mystery and intrigue. A romantic paradise where the dons and senoritas held their ancient customs while rubbing elbows with rugged American frontiersmen and pioneers. Where lace-trimmed handkerchiefs from Barcelona were carried next to the heart under crude buckskin jackets. The territory was a melting pot, quiet on the surface like the Pacific, but torn with undercurrents and riptides. It was a restless and growing land where the strong made their own laws and the weak obeyed or perished. This is the saga of Brad Carver, a fabulous man in a fabulous land. Some called him an angel. Some called him a devil, and many claimed that he never lived at all. But the story of Brad Carver is as colorful and exciting as were his roaring guns and flashing rapier as he cut a flaming swath through this glorious land. Our story starts in October of 1842 as a dusty and battered wagon train at the end of the Santa Fe Trail paused within sight of a settlement of 200 people. Oh, hold your teams! Hold them! Well, we made it, Carver. Los Angeles dead ahead. So that's Los Angeles. Doesn't look like much, McKeever. Well, I guess it ain't Boston, Carver. But it's going to be a mighty big city one day. And it looks good to me right now after 3,000 miles of prairie and engines and mountains and desert. It still doesn't look like much to me. Well, this is where you and I park, McKeever. Where are you striking for? North. Monterey. I'm heading north myself, San Francisco, as soon as I get these folks in and settled. I'll ride along with you if you're willing. Sure, McKeever. Thought maybe you'd had enough of me. Look, Carver, when we started out, you was just another Boston tea drinker to me. But back there on the trail, you proved I was wrong when the going got rough, and I'm admitting it. So do we ride together, or don't we? We ride together, McKeever. Good. We'll hit the trail as soon as we get the train into town. Come on! We're moving! Get up, everybody! Get up! I ain't one for asking a man questions, Carver. But you're in a powerful hurry to get to Monterey. I haven't been there in 20 years. I've got an old score to settle. Old score? You couldn't have been more than a kid 20 years ago. I was old enough to remember my home on fire. My mother and father murdered. I'm sorry, Carver. Couldn't be a bad country. You're lucky they didn't get you. 
They would have, except for the loyalty of a Mexican named Sancho who worked for my family. I don't know what happened to him afterwards. But he got me to San Francisco and put me on a ship that took me to my father's people in Boston. You know who murdered you folks? No. They rode in at night with their faces covered. My father wounded a leader through the shoulder with a rapier. And one of the mob stabbed him in the back. I've got to find the leader. Well, it won't be easy. He may be dead by now. He may be. But if he isn't, he'll carry a rapier mark on his shoulder. If that man is alive, McKeever, I'm going to find him and kill him. Now I know why we've been knocking on these ponies. We'll switch mounts at the next station. I want to stay on the trail all night and make Monterey by dawn. All right. Get up there, boy. the house? Near that grove of trees? Yes. What's left of it. My, uh, mother and father are buried in the grove down there. That's the only news of them I ever had. Well, goodbye, McKeever. If, uh, if I thought I could help... Thanks. Uh... It's my fight. I want to go down into the grove and, uh, be alone for a while. If you, if you ever come up to San Francisco... I'll look you up. I promise. Goodbye, and good luck. Goodbye, McKeever. Get up there, boy. Take care of yourself, daughter. J. Carver. 1785... 1822. Priscilla Carver. 1795. 1822. Dear Lord, blessed be their memory. Senor, what are you doing here? I, I, I just come to place the flowers on the graves, Senor. The, the, these people, they were my friends. Sancho, you... You must be Sancho. Si, si, senor. I am Sancho. But I, I, I do not recall ever seeing this senor before. Sancho, you remember me. I'm Brad Carver. Bradito? You, you are the little Brad Carver? Oh, senor Brad. Don't call me senor. Not you, Sancho. I knew I'd find you. Oh, I, I, I prayed this would happen. I, I have been living in the ruins of the old house, uh, but you should not be near the house. You must go away from here for a long time. They tried to find you. The men used to come at night. But that was years ago. They wouldn't know me now. Seeing you near the old house, they might suspect. A stranger come from nowhere. A stranger of your age. No, 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 Bradito. You must go. They would kill you as they killed your father. That's why I'm back, Sancho. Because they killed my father. And I'm going to stay. Then you must go into town like any other stranger. Hey, there is an inn, the inn of San Bonaventure. Hey, you must also change your name. You cannot use the name of Carver in Monterey. You're right. At the inn, I'll be Senor Bradford. Bueno, bueno, but we must not stand here talking. A rider might pass. Come, Bradito, I lead your horse, eh? But you said being near the house is dangerous. No, we do not go to the house. I will show you something that you never saw before. <laughs> Even when you were a little boy. Hey, it's really grow from behind these bushes, huh? But, but this is the base of a cliff. It's solid rock. No, no, not solid, Bradito. Here, you help me push this big rock here, huh? All right. It's a cave. See, see, but even without the rock, the bushes hide the entrance. Hey, it's best now to leave it open in case you should need shelter, Sally. Let's go in. Uh, wait, I strike a light for you. Now you take the torch from the wall. Sancho, these... These things... I remember them from the house. <laughs> si, si, Bradito. I say what I could so that one day... You could have them. Here, look over here. The portraits of your mother and your father. I never knew this cave existed. Nobody ever told me. 
Uh, your father wished it so. Only he and I knew. Ah, see. I see now by the portrait your resemblance to him. My father. See. You know, Sancho, I never believed that anything had happened to him. He was strong, and that gave me faith. And you gave me more faith with your fairy tales. Oh, I never told you fairy tales, Bradito. You don't remember. The stories about El Diablo, the devil himself, and the scarlet cloak who came riding at night to punish the wicked. It's too bad your El Diablo wasn't around the night my father was killed, Sancho. A child builds up a lot of hope in a legend. Bradito, El Diablo was not a legend. He defended the good against the bad. Perhaps you're right. When stories are told often enough, people begin to believe them. Oh, they were not just stories. I did not deceive you. Ah. Turn and look at the wall behind you. Masks. Masks and the image of the devil. See, and beneath the masks, a trunk. Open it. Sancho. Open it, Bradito. I know the truth. A scarlet cloak, a black sombrero, and a rapier. And do you remember, Bradito, when you were a little child? Bad men who did bad things in this land. Then one morning they would be found dead wearing the mask of the devil who had come to claim them. That was the work of El Diablo. And he lived in Monterrey while your father lived. Because, Bradito, your father was El Diablo. El Diablo? Si. And that's why he was killed. Because they found out that he stood in the way of their robbing and plundering. And they were strong enough to destroy him and they will also destroy you. Bradito, you must go away, please. No, Sancho. This cave is mine now. And so is my father's rapier. But you have been raised in Boston. What do you know of such a weapon? I lived in Europe too, Sancho. I fenced with the greatest swordsmen in the world. Fenced with them until I could beat them. Because I knew that someday I must come back here to kill a man with a rapier. Now I have to find that man. Sancho, if I need you, I'll come here. But if you ever need me, ask for Senor Bradford at the Inn of St. Bonaventure. You slept well, Senor Bradford? Yes, very well. Say, uh, what is that mob doing outside? Some kind of celebration? No, senor, there is much trouble. American gunboats from your country there on the harbor of Monterey have taken down the Mexican flag and put up the American colors. Oh, I don't believe it. Not unless there's war. We have heard nothing of a war, but they say other nations would like to seize California. Oh, that's no secret. Half the world is after this territory. I am Mexican, senor. But Mexico is weak, and this land is too big. Many of us would welcome the American flag. It is our hope for peace. That mob outside doesn't seem to agree with you. That mob outside is not led by Mexicans, senor. It is led by Americans. Oh, really? See. Si. See, at times I don't return for the night, think nothing of it. But if I'm ever gone for more than two nights, there's a note for one of your countrymen under my pillow. Please deliver it. Si, senor. Muchas gracias. Change. They say they brought them gunboats in to protect the country. Protect it from what? I don't see nobody else trying to grab it. Damn it, boy! They're going to get more than they bargained for. I got men riding in from all over the countryside. Men with guts and guns. Are you going to join them? Yeah, Here comes some of them now. Go across the room. Look out there. I'll get her. Adverse pass moving, stranger. She's fainted. Somebody get some water from the... Thank you, Charlie. Right. That gal's Maria Alvarez. There'll be the devil to pay for this. There's always the devil to pay when a mob like this cuts loose. Yeah, but this just isn't a girl, stranger. This is the niece of Don Raymond de Torres, the richest man in California. Thanks. Come on, miss. Drink this. Gimme. Que paso. A horseman almost ran you down. Yes, would have, too, if this fella hadn't grabbed you. Oh, gracias. I will be all right now. Let my horse through. Let me through. Maria. Maria, what has happened? I was almost trampled, but this gentleman has saved me. My uncle, Don Ramon de la Torres. Senor? Bradford. I am most grateful, Senor Bradford. Who were the horsemen? 
It isn't the horseman you want. Some madman named Daggard has been inciting this mob or it wouldn't have happened. Hey, uh, I'm here, Don Ramon. Who gave you the right to endanger the lives of the people of Monterey? Have you appointed yourself governor of this territory? They changed the flag at the customs house and we don't And you will let the officials determine what action is to be taken. Disperse this crowd at once, or I shall ask the governor to place you under arrest. All right. I guess we made a mistake, man. The governor's job. If you cannot stay in town peacefully, get out. Now move on. Move on, all of you. You should not have come into town, my dear. Daggett is an impetuous fool. I am all right, thanks to Senor Bradford. I have invited him to visit with us this evening. By all means, you will be most welcome, Senor. And we shall try to erase this sad impression of Monterey. It's not Monterey I'm worried about, Don Ramon. It's that man Daggert. He was planning to lead an attack on the customs house tonight. Well, please, do not be so concerned. The mob has scattered. They will drink and gamble, and by night they will have forgotten. Now, come, Maria. I will take you home. Adios, Senor Bradford. Adios, Senor. Until tonight? Until tonight. Sancho. I am here, Brady. There's trouble in town. I know, I know. I was there this morning. Senor Doggett finds their anger. He was stopped by Don Ramon de la Torres. But I think he still plans to go through with an attack. I do not think there will be an attack. Not in the town. If there is one, it will be out here in the country. In the country? See? Si. I don't understand. Well, the American ships have cannon. They have also taken the cannon in the customs house. And Doggett knows that. An attack would be hopeless. But why is he bringing in armed men from all over the countryside? Well, perhaps to leave the countryside itself unprotected. Uh, do you remember Don Castillo and the Senora, your father's old friends and neighbors? Oh, of course I do. They have been receiving threats. Somebody wishes to drive them from their land. There has been no open attack against them because they have more than 30 men working on their place. But tonight, Bradito, Daggett will have those men in town. The old couple will be alone. You're right, Sancho. But they won't be alone. Oh, Bratito, you are only one man. It will take the devil himself. That's what I mean. El Diablo, the devil himself. Tonight I wear my father's scarlet cloak, black sombrero, and his rapier. If the Castillo Hacienda is attacked, it will be protected, just as it would have been 20 years ago, by El Diablo. Let's take just a minute now to mention one or two of the many advantages this program provides for an astute advertiser. It's a Western-type story, utilizing the basic success pattern of galloping horses, gunfights, and high adventure. However, through its authenticity, believability, and imaginative presentation, we have widened its appeal to attract the young and the adult audience. The locale of Monterey a hundred years ago, which will be kept historically accurate revives the romantic flavor of beautiful senoritas, colorful habits and costumes, old-world weapons such as the rapier, and interesting characters of Spanish, English, Mexican, and American origin. It gives you a dramatic, exciting radio program, but is even more suited to a filmed television series. The performers have been selected for their ability and experience, and also for their appearance, so that the television picture will bring you most of the same people you are hearing on this record. Our star for both the radio and television programs probably has talked to more people more often than any man who ever lived. The name of Wendell Niles is familiar to everyone. For 20 years, he has announced and performed several times a week on the highest-rated radio shows. The name is already universally associated with a pleasant, sincere, convincing voice. Through these programs... We now associate that familiar name with a likable, virile, adventurous personality who will quickly spring to life in the hearts of millions of Americans. As you listen to the second act, 
Imagine, if you will, a television screen where you can watch this believable, exciting, romantic man of action, the wearer of the scarlet cloak and rapier, as he rides against the evil to bring hope to the oppressed. Returning to Monterey after a 20-year absence, Brad Carver has learned that his murdered father was the legendary El Diablo, protector of the weak and helpless. Through his father's old friend and servant, Sancho, he also learns that an attack by night riders is planned against the neighboring hacienda. Donning the scarlet cloak, black sombrero, and rapier that his father wore, Brad and Sancho ride to a hill overlooking the threatened hacienda. The lamps of the hacienda are out for some time now. And still no signs of a raid. They would wait for sleep to come in the house. I hope you're right. Oh, Bradito, I bless myself. Here in the moonlight with your father's cloak and sombrero, I feel that once again I ride with El Diablo. Let's hope the raiders feel the same, Sancho. Uh, there may be many of them. We'll have help. Come on. Where do we go? Down to the corrals to release the livestock. You have a plan? Yes. If they expect no resistance, they'll take the easy approach to the hacienda. That means they'll ride in on the road from town and across the bridge that forged the stream down there. See, si, see, si, that is the way they should come. Now, we'll herd the oxen and cattle and horses into that blind pass between the hills, just this side of the bridge. When they approach from the other side, I'll charge the bridge. From there on, it's up to you. Bueno, just tell me what to do. I want you to stampede the herd behind me. Drive them toward the bridge. In this life, with the sound of the stampede, they won't know what's coming at them. They'll scatter and run. Uh, here is the main corral. Uh, move them out as quietly as possible. I'll get the horses from the stables. You drive them into the blind pass, and I'll meet you there. About ten of them. Look. Coming over the hills. They're carrying torches. Good. They're on the road to the bridge. Just as they approach the far side, I'll make my ride. Turn the stock toward the bridge and stampede them behind me. Then keep after them and keep them moving. See, I understand. And luck ride with you. El Diablo. Here they come. When you get across the bridge, cut into the hills. I'll double back and meet you near the old missions. See, be careful, Paradipo. Now is the time, Sancho. Adios. Sancho? Here, Bradito. I am here. Are you all right? See, si. All but my leg. I was caught for a little while in the stampede. It was just squeezed a little, that's all. I told you to stay behind the herd. See, si, I know, but I wanted to be closer to you in case they made a fight. Oh, but you were just like your father. Just like him. They were frightened. I'll help you back to the cave. No, no, no. You must not go there. Tonight you must be in the company of others, so they will not suspect but I can't leave you while you're injured. Pratito, you have taken your father's place. El Diablo returns on the same day a stranger comes to the town. They could make much of this unless you spend the evening with others. Yes. Senorita Maria, the niece of Don Ramon de la Torres, invited me to call. Ah, bueno, then you must go there. He is known and respected. It will be perfect. I will take the cloak and sombrero. I'm the rapier. Ah, now you are once again Senor Bradford. A stranger who stops at the inn of San Bonaventure. My 
my niece plays that music box incessantly, Senor Bradford. I am afraid we are poor competition. It is so new and exciting, and has come all the way from Paris. Yes, I know. I've seen them there. You have been to Paris? Our Senor Bradford seems to have seen a great deal of the world. I was in Europe about two years ago. I thought I noted traces of European culture. Do you fence, Senor? A little. It's part of a gentleman's training. Excellent. I enjoy the sport. We must try it someday. It is fortunate for me I have the music box to entertain me. Oh, forgive me, my dear. I have been monopolizing the conversation. Now I have some work in my study. I will leave you alone. Why don't you show Senor Bradford the gardens? Perhaps the Senor wouldn't care for... I'd like to see the gardens. They are very lovely. Adios, Senor Bradford. You must honor us again. My pleasure, sir. You must find Monterey different from your native Boston, senor. Different in many ways. Do you plan to stay here for a time? Do you think I should? I'm sure my wishes would not influence a man who has seen so much of the world. Are you... Will your family join you here? No, and aunt and uncle in Boston are the only family I have. Oh, I have not known many Americans. The man I am engaged to marry is an official of the Mexican government. Our families arranged it when we were both children. Oh, I see. I hope he isn't riding the horse that's headed this way. No, he's in Mexico. That is probably some friend of my uncle's coming to play chase. Good, because I want to stay here a while longer, Maria. I'm very much taken with this... this garden. That is nice to know, senor. Jack, you fool, why do you come here? Let me in. I had to see you right away. Did something go wrong at the Castillo Hacienda? Did something go wrong? Everything went wrong. We were driven off by El Diablo. He's back. Tiger, have you been drinking? El Diablo has been dead for 20 years. Well, he wasn't dead tonight. I saw him as clearly as I'm seeing you. You let yourself be frightened by an apparition? I tell you, the man is dead. You saw him die. Yeah? Well, maybe we were wrong. Maybe we killed the wrong man, or... Maybe somebody's taking his place. Ah, that's impossible. Is it? How about the fellow who tried to make trouble for us in town today? Uh, don't be an idiot. His name is Bradford. He comes from Boston and he is stopping at the inn. Besides, he is here in the garden with my niece at this moment. And he must not find you here when they come in. Now go. I talk to you tomorrow. I ain't waiting till tomorrow. I'm going to see what I can find out tonight. <laughs> Sancho. Is that you, Bradito? Is something wrong? Were you in town looking for me? I have been waiting here in the cave. I left De La Torres and rode to the inn. My room had been searched. A note I'd left for you was missing. A note with money for you to get out of California if I were discovered. Oh, then somebody knows about you now, Bradito. Yeah, I'm afraid so, Sancho. Uh, yeah. Got to do something about that leg of yours. Uh, it will be all right in a few days. We haven't got a few days. We've got to get you away from here to a safer place. No, no. You are the one who must go. Someday when the Americans really come, then the land will be safe and to my return. Now the Americans are here now, Sancho. No, no. I met men returning from town after I left you at the mission. The raising of the flag was a mistake. The command of the ships had a false report of a war. Mexico again controls California. Shh. Quiet, somebody calls. Quickly, Sancho. Get down behind that trunk. All right, Bradford, don't move. Well, this is quite a layout, ain't it? So this was El Diablo's hideout, and you took it over. How did you find this place? I had to look through your room at the inn. And I stayed around until you came. I figured you'd run for cover when you found that note was missing, and I was right. So the devil had a son. Might have figured you'd come back, only you're not going to last as long as your father did. You can what? drop your gun, Senor Dagger. All right, Dagger, I'll take that. Pretty tricky, ain't you? Throwing down on me behind my back. Brave when you got an unarmed man. Yeah, it didn't bother you when I was unarmed. Take this gun, Sancho. 
Throw it outside. Why? And throw your own out, too. What, oh, brother? Do as I say. There's still two of you against one, you know. No, Dagger, just you and me. Sancho won't interfere. Can you use a rapier, Dagger? Yeah. I can use one. There's one on the wall behind you. Under the devil masks. Take it. You've seen those masks in the past, haven't you, Daggett? My father's mark for men like you. Yes, I've seen them. But you'll never put one on me. He's right, El Diablo. This is your last mistake. And you are good, aren't you, Daggett? Yeah. Next one, you, you won't be talking. I had the pleasure of killing your father. And this blade will do for you. I'm glad to know that, Daggett. Because that's going to cost you your life. This is your... Finish! Oh, good! You know what I did? Yes. There's a chance nobody else has seen it. I want to look at his shoulder. There must be a rapier mark there. See, si, Bradito, see. Si. No mark, Sancho. Dagger was one of the mobs that killed my father, but he wasn't the leader. And so from now on, you play a game of death in the dark with a, a man whose face you do not know? Yes. But at least I know that the man responsible for the death of my family is still alive. Bradito Daggett's men will search for him tomorrow. We must bury him. No, Sancho. He must be found. With the mark of El Diablo, the mask of the devil. I'll put the mask on him and strap his body to his horse and leave him near the town. They... They will put a price on your head. There's already a price on my head, Sancho. The price of a life for a life. Because men like Daggett must die for every innocent and helpless person they kill. My father could carry that price on his head and pay it. Then so can I. As long as there's injustice, as long as the good people of this country are at the mercy of the lawless, they'll have El Diablo to protect them. You have just heard An Adventure of the Scarlet Cloak, starring Wendell Niles. Music by Lynn Murray, story by Joel Murcott. Produced by Vic Hunter and directed by D. Engelbach. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell about another exciting adventure he shared with that master detective, his old friend Sherlock Holmes. And say, I want to tell you about a little present I've got for you. Uh Uh-huh. A present, and it's free. It's a swell ripple color, and it's good for two years, 1945 and 46. Loads of swell recipes and ideas for cooking with Petri wine. Want to know how to make spare ribs that are out of this world? You want to learn a new way to fix liver and onions. A swell way to make soup more delicious than ever. It's a cinch with this calendar handy in your kitchen to tell you how. In fact, this calendar tells you all you ought to know about wine. And remember, it's free. Just write to Petri Wine. P-E-T-R-I, Petri Wine, San Francisco, 26, California. Petri Wine, San Francisco, 26, California. We'll send you your swell recipe calendar immediately. And now for our weekly visit with the genial Dr. Watson. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Foreman. Come in and settle yourself down. Thank you. You're looking particularly comfortable tonight, Doctor. Feet up on the sofa and the puppies asleep on your lap. Yes, my boy. The three of us went for a long walk on the beach this afternoon. And Monty and Winnie had a running battle with the seagulls. Ever since we got home. Well, I hope you're not too tired, Doctor. I'm counting on a new Sherlock Holmes story, you know. No, no, no. I'm all ready for you, Mr. Foreman. In fact... I was going through my notes on the case just before you arrived. Well, last week you told us it concerned a strange society who held their meetings in an underground vault of a furniture warehouse. Yeah, that's right. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. no. The story really began one stormy November night in 1887. I was married at the time and living away from Baker Street. 
On this night in question, my wife had already gone to bed and I was nodding in front of the fire over one of Clark Russell's fine sea stories. I'd had a very tiring day, I remember. It was about the hour that a man gives his first yawn and glances at the clock. Then suddenly, my front doorbell jangled discordantly. Oh, our servant Edna had gone up to bed, so I crossed to the window and opened it. It was uh, very dark, but I could just see the outline of a figure standing on my doorstep. It looked like a woman. Suddenly, a cultivated voice called up to me. Is the doctor in? Uh, yes, madam. Uh, I'm the doctor. Then please come at once. It's a matter of life and death. I have a carriage waiting. Gracious me. Oh, all right, all right. I'll, I'll be down immediately. I closed the window, scribbled a note to my wife, grabbed my coat and hat and my bag, and a few minutes later I stepped out of the front door and closed it behind me. Carriage was standing at the curb, but I couldn't see any trace of the lady who called me. The only person in sight was an old and repulsive-looking bigger woman, dressed in rags and tatters. After a moment of bewilderment, I spoke. Uh, my, my good woman, did you see a lady leave here a moment ago? No, Douglas, she didn't leave. She's still waiting for you. Oh, oh. oh forgive me, madam, but, uh, those clothes are yours. I, I thought you were a beggar woman. There isn't any time to discuss that now. Please get in this carriage. Uh-huh. But, uh, where, where's the driver? I'm going to drive. Please get in. Oh, well, very well, well. It's the only business. Uh... Are you sure that you can handle those horses, madam? Of course I can. You tell me the way you're, you're driving, ma'am. Please don't ask me any more questions, doctor. You'll find out soon enough. Oh, thank heavens we've finally reached our destination. Must have driven halfway across London. Well, hello, must be somewhere down near the river. No dwelling places here. Nothing but enormous warehouses. Uh, why have we stopped here, madam? Oh, this is where we're going. Please follow me down these steps. I wish you'd tell me where you're taking me. We have a, a club here in the basement. You'll see for yourself in a moment. A very solid-looking door. How do you propose to get past it? I'll show you. Oh, it must be a very secret club of yours, madam. It is, Doc. Who knocks? Number seven. Give the password. To the lanterns. You may enter. Follow me, Doctor. Madam, I do wish you'd tell me where you're taking me. This looks like the entrance to an opium den or a a thieves' kitchen. Don't worry, Doctor. You're in no danger. There. Does that look like a thieves' kitchen? Great Scott, I don't believe my eyes. A luxuriously furnished room. What a strange collection of people. Some look like beggars, others in full evening dress. Amazing. Uh, number seven. Who is this man? He's a doctor. I went to fetch him. I thought I said there would be no strangers inside Now look here, here, my good man. I've been extremely patient, but my temper's beginning to wear a little thin. Either let me see your patient at once or show me out. My time's valuable and I don't propose to waste it. I'm sorry, doctor. Where is Julian? He's in the back room. And if you know what's good for you, doctor, whatever you call yourself... You'll forget everything you see in here. Stop threatening me, sir. I'm not the least interested in your blasted club. Just take me to the patient. Ah. This is the man we want you to examine, Doctor. No? What happened? He fell down the stairs leading into the club room. Well, why'd you move him? We wanted him to be comfortable. It's the worst thing in the world you could have done. Never, never move a person with an injured skull. Is he? No, madam, I'm afraid he isn't. His neck's broken. He's dead. Huh? So I am dead. You sure of that, Doctor? Of course I'm sure of it, my good man. I'm afraid you need an undertaker, not a doctor. We must tell the others. 
Mark Potter. Uh, Julian is dead. Julian? Julian dead? Oh, this is terrible. Who is this man? He's a doctor. Oh, better get him out of here at once. We don't want any strangers nosing about. That's right. No. Shouldn't have brought him here anyway. Now, just a minute, just a minute. I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, I have the slightest desire to stay here one moment longer. If you'll direct me to the door again, madam, I'll try to find a cab myself in this godforsaken district and go home. Show him out and give him his money. Follow me, please. I'm delighted to. Do you mind if I don't drive you home, Doctor? Oh, well, uh, no, I should prefer it. My nerves aren't uh, in the best of shape. You mustn't be angry with me, Doctor, please. Leaving again, number seven. No, but this gentleman is. Will you see if you can find a cab for him? Right. To whom shall I send in my bill, madam? Oh, here's a five-pound note. That should cover your time and trouble, shouldn't it? No, 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 no. It's, it's far too much, madam. No, I, Doctor, I, I, it's late at night, and it has been a very pleasant case for you. Please take it. Oh, it's uh, kind of you. very generous indeed, but by the way... Uh, uh, how did you happen to, to come to me in the first place? Well, I was driving about looking for a doctor, and a policeman directed me to your house. Oh, I see. I have found a cab for you. Well, uh, thank you, my man. Thank you. Oh, doctor, may I come round in the morning for a death certificate? Of course, of course. You remember my address? Yes, but I don't know your name. Uh, Watson. Uh, Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson? Not, not the Dr. Watson who's associated with Sherlock Holmes. Oh, that <laughs> That is that you know of me. <laughs> Good night, Doctor. And please forget about everything you've seen. Well, upon my soul, what an amazing business. Holmes will be interested to hear about this. And that's the way it was, Holmes. One of the most curious adventures I ever had without you. Very interesting, Watson. You say this underground cellar was luxuriously mm. furnished. Yes, and the people there were an amazing mixture. Some were in rags and some in evening dress. Huh. Some in tags and some in velvet gowns. Exactly. In the feeling that I was taking part in a story out of the Arabian Nights. I must say, though, I was pretty angry at the time. However, after a good night's rest, I, I feel quite differently this morning. But I thought I'd just drop round and tell you all about it. I'm glad you did, my dear fellow. It would be interesting to see if any repercussions of your strange adventure reach us. Oh, I doubt it. The woman seemed frightened to death when I mentioned your name. We shall see. Meanwhile, I'm expecting a client. You're not too busy. Perhaps you can stay. No, I'd like to very much. Uh, who is it? You this know? telegram will tell you much more than I can. Arrived an hour ago. Mm, let's have a look. Be at your lodgings this morning to discuss our problem. Signed, AMS. <laughs> Pretty high-handed message. Be at your lodgings. Oh, please. <laughs> what do you suppose AMS stands for? I was just tying with that problem when you arrived. Could it be the uh, American Medical School? No, no, there's no such body. It's the American Medical Association. Oh, yes, 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 yes. The course, imperious yes, yes. Uh, a tone of the message inclines me to believe that the A stands for amateur. Very possibly. Oscar Society. Or uh, the amateur murderers. <laughs> that, uh, that would be a nice thought, wouldn't it? Mm. Uh, they're representative now, no doubt, to save us further guesswork. Holmes, it looks like the same carriage that I drove in last night. The girl standing on your doorstep dressed in the height of fashion. This is Hudson turning her in. Splendid. It seems that we have not heard the end of your adventure. Go and meet the lady at the top of the stairs, will you, old chap, and save Mrs. Hudson's legs. Right, you are, Holmes. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Thank you. All right, sir. Uh, come in, madam. Want you come in? Thank you, Dr. Watson. Mr. Sherlock Holmes. At your service, madam. Won't you, uh, won't you sit down? I'm Lady Dorothy Brownlee. It's your voice. Last night, uh, dressed up as, as a beggar woman. Yes, I am, Dr. Watson. Forgive me for being so mysterious at the time. Doubtless you have come to consult me regarding last night's unfortunate accident at the Amateur Mendicant Society. How did you know what the initials stood for, Mr. Holmes? Well, after hearing Dr. Watson's story of last night's happenings, the uh, connotation seemed obvious. Am I right? Perfectly. Last night, when Dr. Watson told us Julian was dead, we thought it was an accident. And now you think it is a uh, murder. Oh, there must be no more. Well, I'm afraid it'll be a little hard for you to understand our motives. 
where a group of people, rather wealthy people, I suppose, will find pleasure in deliberately leading a steamy life disguised as beggars. We use the basement that you were in last night, Doctor, as our headquarters. We keep our beggars clothed there and change out of them before we go home. Mm, what a fantastic idea. What a few to your leisure time, Lady Barnett. I suppose <laughs> it must seem so, Mr. Holmes. But we're curious to learn how the other half lives. Mm -hmm. and of course, there's a certain thrill in rubbing shoulders with the police. At least we do some good. Indeed. I should be learn how. All well, the money we make as beggars, we give to charity. Oh, do you really? And you feel that this gesture on your part absolves you from any responsibility to the real beggars whose livelihood you are impairing? I hadn't thought of it just like that. No. Then... I suppose you won't want to help us. Oh, that's quite another matter, madam. As a professional detective, I cannot afford to be a moralist. Yes, I will investigate this case for you, though I warn you my fee will be an extremely high one. Money isn't important, Mr. Holmes, as long as we can solve Julian's death without bringing the police into the case. Lady Brownlee, who is the dead man? The man you refer to as Julian? Julian Trevor, the poet. Oh, he was yes. the one who started our society. Mm -hmm, yes, I think I've read some of his work, Decadent. Distinctly decadent. Well, what makes you think that he was murdered, Lady Browner? Well, after you left last night, Dr. Watson, there was a terrible scene. You remember Sidney Holt? Oh, was he the big fellow who was so unpleasant to him? Yes, that's the one. Oh, do I remember him? <laughs> he said that he saw Lord came to the head of the staircase. Oh, Lord Cecil being, uh... Lord Cecil Dillenforth, son of the Earl of Mission. Oh, yes. yes. There was a bitter argument. Cecil accused Sidney of doing the same thing. Then they had a dreadful fight. And it ended up with Cecil threatening to go to the police. But well, that's when we decided to send a telegram to you, Mr. Holmes. Oh, yes, yes, I see. So the proof of murder depends on such flimsy evidence as to whether the dead man fell or, well, should we say, uh, was pushed? <laughs> what it seems like. Mr. Holmes, even to prove, please help us, won't you? Yes, Lady Brownlee, I will. Then you come back with me now to our headquarters? I shall join you within the hour. In the meantime, my old friend Dr. Watson can go with you. But Holmes... What can I do without you? You know my efforts, old chap. Act accordingly. Oh, very yes, well, Mr. Holmes. But you promise you'll be there. I promise you that I will be there, madam. Thank you so much, Mr. Holmes. We'll be expecting you. Come on, Doctor. Well, I'll, I'll just get my hat and coat. Doctor, go with her and ask no more questions. I shall join you within the hour. Holmes, there's a glint in your eye. I don't think you, you believe the story. Of course I don't, Watson. Well, then what? Then go with her, old fellow, and keep your wits about you. The game's afoot. <laughs> The story of the Amateur Mendicant Society will continue in just a few seconds. Time I'd like to use to remind you that you're really missing something until you try having wine with your dinner. And I mean a Petri wine. Let's say a Petri California Burgundy or a Petri California Sauterne. Both wines are just made to make good food taste better. If you like a red wine, try Petri Burgundy. Try it with hamburger, with stew, with any meat or meat dish. And if you like a delicious white wine, a wine that'll make chicken taste better than ever... Try a well-chilled Petri so turn. With food, nothing can take the place of a good Petri wine. And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. The Amateur Mendicant Society, a group of wealthy eccentrics who pose as beggars, have come to Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson with a problem. One of their members has apparently been murdered, and the famous pair have been asked to investigate the killing. As we rejoin our story, Dr. Watson, still awaiting the arrival of the great detective, is cross-questioning three of the members at the headquarters of this unusual society. This is very convincing. Oh, don't you now? Well, then suppose you stop asking questions until Sherlock Holmes gets here. He's the man we've engaged to settle this business, not services, not those of his assistant. Uh, Mr. Holmes asked me to conduct this preliminary investigation, my good man. I'm perfectly familiar with his methods, so keep us on any more questions till he gets here. Doctor Fuller, uh, Lord Cecil, you say that you saw Holt deliberately trip the dead man as he came down the stairs last night. Yes, I did. Well, uh, where were you standing, sir? At the head of the staircase. Holt was beside me, and as Julian came by, he deliberately... Excuse me, please, excuse me, number 11, excuse uh, me. What is it? There is a strange man just come in. He is dressed as you when you work, but I do not remember to have seen him here before. He speaks very rough. Mm. Did he give the correct signal? Yes, and the password. Remember. I suppose we better see him. Bring him in. Oh, bad time for him to come here, can't we? Oh, this way, please. Stop it. What nice place you got here. Yeah, what nice place. 
certainly do yourself proud, don't you? Who are you, and how did you get in here? I'll give you a signal and a password, just like Julian told me to. Are you a friend of Julian? Of course I am. You got me to meet him here today. Who are you, really? Are we all friends here? Yes, you can talk freely. And permit me to introduce myself. I am Don Luis Jose Fernando de las Torres at your service. Why? Why do you want to join us? When Julia tickled my, how you say, uh, my funny bone? <laughs> it is a so charming idea to see another those of mendicancy. Huh. I suppose he's all right. Big of course, I'm all right. Now, where is Julian, please? He will uh, vouch for me. He's in the other room. That an accident. An accident? Not a bad one, I hope. A very bad one. Dr. Watson, you better take him in there and break the news to him. Uh, well, well uh, follow me, sir. This is terrible. Please, tell me what happened, Doctor. I'm afraid you must prepare yourself for a shock, sir. Your friend is dead. His neck was broken last night in some brawl. Yes, except that I do believe it was an accident, Watson. Holmes! Chiquado, Chiquado. But not quietly enough, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Come on, come back to the others and let all take a look at you. Come on, get moving, both of you. This isn't a pop gun in my hands. Sorry, Holmes, I gave the whole thing away. It's all right, old chap. Oh, Cecil, Dorothy, come here. I want you to take a look at the great Sherlock Holmes. Walked into our trap just like any stupid policeman. Now, I had to dress up to do it, though, Mr. Holmes. We were waiting for you here anyway, you know. Oh, I was well aware of that, Mr. Holt. You see, I knew I was walking into a trap. How did you know that, Mr. Holmes? Lady Brownlee, the story you brought to us today was so obviously a false one. Just as there is no amateur mendicant society. Yes, go ahead. Why should I tell you what you already know? Go on, talk if you know what's good for you. Oh, you're so persuasive, aren't you, Mr. Holt? Very well. Undoubtedly, Julian Trevor's death last night was an accident. You fetched the doctor, Lady Brownlee, a very natural move, and later discovered that the doctor in question was the old friend of Sherlock Holmes. Mm. You were all afraid that I would become interested in your unusual society, and so you invented that very thin story about the accident being a murder. You wanted to lure me here so that I could be disposed of, and you could all continue your nefarious works without hindrance. Huh. Well, now aren't we clever? What is our nefarious work, may I ask? Your password gave me a clue to the lanterns. Try the French revolutionists. They strung the aristocrats up on the lampposts. Then again, the combination of Various costumes and a luxurious establishment in a low-class area posed another question. What political belief provides a common meeting ground for misguided aristocrats and dangerous commoners? And how did you answer that question? Oh, very simple, my dear sir. One word. Nihilism. It's doctrine of assassination and overthrow of government would find every chance of being put into practice by all of you at the forthcoming jubilee celebrations to be held here in London. And also would account... Uh, for your beggar's clothes. A beggar would have greater freedom of movement in a crowd than an ordinary person. You're a clever man, Mr. Holmes. Too bad you'll have to die. I'll get the rope. What are you going to do with him? Do? Give him a first-hand taste of nihilism, of course. He can't live. They know too much. Well, you can't possibly do this, you know. The police will track us here. By the time the police get here, you and your friend Holmes will be blown to kingdom come. Get the rope, All uh, right. Hands together, Mr. Holmes. That's it. Ah. Oh, my God. And the wrist of mine, will you? It's confounded us all. Oh, isn't that a shame now? Is this any better? Ooh. Tie up the doctor, Cecil, while I bind Holmes' legs. With pleasure. I can't go through with this. Living daughter, you can't go through it. I just can't stand by and see two innocent men murdered. But don't be a fool, Dorothy. We can't let them live. They know too much. I don't care. If you go on with this, I'm going out for the police. Are you fool. Oh. Tie her up as well. Leave me alone. Sit down there beside him. Go on. You're the devil. Oh, no, shut up. Now, Mr. Holmes, I'm going to fetch a little invention. A little invention I'm sure you'll be interested in. Mr. Holmes, it's a pity you and your friend didn't learn to mind your own business. I'm afraid it's too late to teach an old dog new tricks. It's too late now, at any rate. Dr. Watson... Don't you speak to me, sir. You're a filthy traitor to your country. Oh, rubbish. Here we are. Example of Mikhail Petrov's mechanical genius. will blow the entire building sky high. And the three of you with it. Now, I wind the time clock so, and we'll set the fuse to go off in in five minutes. It'll give us plenty of time to get away. So, come on, Sydney, let's get out of here. Right, <laughs> charming picture. 
Three of you bound hand and foot sitting beside each other on the sofa. <laughs> well, ta-da, Dorothy. Think of our cause during the five minutes. <laughs> and as for you, Mr. Holmes, and your friend, good riddance to bad rubbish. <laughs> Well, Holmes, this looks like the end. Afraid so, old chap. I blame myself. If I hadn't been so infernally noisy when I recognized you, we wouldn't be in this mess. Wasn't your fault, old fellow. I think they suspected me anyway. Well, I must say, it seemed to me a deal more than was necessary about your suspicions. Surely you could pretend it ignorance. Oh, I suppose I could have done. I can't die yet. I'm not ready to Another die. Have you brown me courage? <laughs> and by the way, was I right in assuming that your associates are nihilists? Of course they are. They're planning to assassinate the Prime Minister during the Jubilee celebration. Prime Minister, great heavens, Holmes, we've got to get free. Assuming some miracle happened, we did get free and your former associates were arraigned in court. Would you testify against them? Oh, of course I would. But what chance is there of that? That part, that devilish part, why doesn't it stop it? If it bothers you that much, Lady Bounty, I'll stop it for you. Holmes, your hands are free. Of course they are, my dear fellow. Bandaged wrist I mentioned just now concealed a razor edged blade. I cut through the ropes almost before our friends had left the room. Then why did you keep us in the suspense, Mr. Holmes? I wanted to be quite sure that you'd testify in the forthcoming trial, madam. There we are. That renders sprung the trap that I set to your associates, Lady Brownley. It's lucky for you that you uh, had a change of heart and prevented you from leaving us. Oh, Mr. Holmes, how could I ever thank you? Holmes, you had the place surrounded with police when you came in here. Of course I did, my dear fellow. Yeah, let me undo your ropes. No wonder you were so calm. <laughs> no wonder you told them so much. You wanted them to show their hands. Precisely, old fellow. And they obliged me most satisfactorily. They attempted our triple murder. They are self-confessed anarchists. And with the evidence of Lady Brownie, I'm sure that we can put them where they all belong. Considering it's uh, barely noon, I think you'll agree, Watson... That is a very comprehensive morning's work. Doctor, tell the truth. Were you scared waiting for that time bomb to go off? Scared, my boy? I was so scared that to this day I can't stand being in the same room with a, a loud ticking clock. He ticked to the clock. He seems to speak to me. He seems to say, tick tock. This is the end. Tick tock. This is the end. The clock ever speak to you like that? Well, yes, Doctor. How did you know? What? What's the clock say to you? Tick tock. Petri took time to bring you good wine. Petri took time to... <laughs> you listen to your clock and I'll listen to mine. Gosh, Doctor, can I help it if I like to hear about Petri wine? After all, that Petri family really knows how to make good wine. And it's no wonder... They've been making wine ever since they started the Petri business generations ago, way back in the 1800s. And because the making of Petri wine is a family affair, well, they've been able to hand on down from father to son, from father to son, the skill and experience of each preceding generation. So naturally, when it comes to turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine, well, you just can't beat the Petri family, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And say, don't forget to take time to pee calendar. It's free. Just write to Petri Wine, P-E-T-R-I, Petri Wine, San Francisco 26, California. San Francisco 26, California. This offer is intended to apply only in those states and other localities where its acceptance is permissible by law and regulation. And now, Dr. Watson, what adventure are you planning to tell us next week? Well, next week, Mr. Foreman, I'm going to tell you a story of old Vienna. The Vienna of sparkling lights, beautiful women... And lilting music. And of an extraordinary murder that takes place to the accompaniment of a Mozart sonata. Boy, that sounds like a thriller. I'll see you for sure next week. Oh, uh, oh just a minute. Before I go, Mr. Foreman, I want to urge every registered nurse listening in to get all the facts about the army nurse. The army needs you, nurses, needs you desperately. They'll make you an officer at once and give you every chance to further your post-war careers. So if you're a registered nurse under 45... Call at your local Red Cross chapter and get all the details. Or wire collect to the Surgeon General, U.S. Army, Washington, D.C. And if you can't qualify for the nurse's call, see if you can't get into essential civilian nursing so that you can release a nurse who does qualify. But do something about it first thing tomorrow. Won't you? <laughs> 
Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Five Orange Pips. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Meanwhile, don't forget to take advantage of our offer of a free recipe calendar. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, Pet, Petri. Wine. This is Bill Foreman saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though. Trouble. But... When I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize this assignment's going to give me a lesson in etiquette. I'd always thought it was rude to turn down a free drink. Now, I know it can be fatal. Morning, Commissioner. Ruth said you had an assignment for me. I do, Steve. Ever done any bullfighting? Bullfighting? Well, <laughs> I've shot a little in my time, but never fought any. Why? Your plane leaves for Madrid, Spain in one hour. I'm flying to Spain to do some bullfighting. And me without even a cape. Steve, ever hear of Dr. Wiecek? Wiecek, sure. He's the greatest European scientist alive today. What about him? Right now, we're not so sure. That he's the greatest European scientist? No, that he's alive today. What? Steve, Dr. Wiecek's field, as you probably know, is electronics. He's developed a new theory that could result in a revolutionary type of radio tube. A tube which does the work of three ordinary tubes. You can see how important that would be in the manufacture of radar and all other electronic devices. Yeah, but what's this business about Wiecek not being alive? Dr. Wiecek agreed to come to this country and turn over his research to us, to work with us in the development of this tube. He and his assistant, a man named Menescu, were due two weeks ago, but he hasn't shown up. You said I was flying to Spain. You think Dr. Wiecek is there? We've traced him to a villa outside of Madrid, the home of La Avispa. La Avispa? Hey, that means the wasp. Yeah, that's what they call her in Spain. She's a lady bullfighter. You kidding? No, she's very famous. A friend of Dr. Wiecek's. But shortly after he arrived there, we lost track of him. We've sent several cables, and a man from our embassy in Madrid called on La Vispa. But she hasn't been very cooperative about giving us any information concerning Dr. Wiecek. You sure she's a friend of his? Right now, we're not sure of anything. So Steve, get over to Madrid. Talk to this La Vispa. Then go anywhere and do anything that's necessary to find Dr. Wiecek. Well, that's it. You've got your assignment. Good luck. The National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignments, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. At all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you'll find Steve Mitchell on another dangerous assignment. Sure, I've got my assignment. Fly to Spain and find Dr. Wiecek. On the surface, it sounds pretty easy, but there are just a couple of small details that could make it not so. First, I'm sure to run into some boys along the line who'll be all out to prevent me from finding Wiecek. And second... I'm slated to tangle with a lady bullfighter known as the Wasp. And knowing the equipment wasps usually carry, I've got an uneasy hunch that her sting is going to be reserved for me. It's Sunday afternoon when my plane lands in Madrid. As soon as I get off, a little guy scurries toward me. Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Mitchell. Eh? They told me you were coming. I have been waiting for your plane. Who are you? Menescu. Menescu? Oh, yeah, the commissioner told me about you. You're Dr. Wiecek's assistant, aren't you? Yes. Look, what's the deal? Have you any idea where Dr. Wiecek is? No, 
No, none at all. And I'm quite worried about him. You, you see, Dr. Mitch, uh, when Dr. Wiecek and I decided to come to the United States, we realized there might be people who had tried to prevent it, particularly in our own country. Yeah. So we decided to split up, to travel separately to Spain. We were to meet at the villa of this La Vispa. Dr. Wiecek left first. I followed a few days later. But when I arrived here in Madrid, I could not find Dr. Wiecek. And La Vispa could not give me any information about him. Couldn't or wouldn't? I am not sure which. Was Dr. Wiecek carrying his research notes with him? Yes, but the papers themselves are worthless. What do you mean? The basic formula Dr. Wiecek did not write down, he kept it in his head. Well, that means we got to locate him. I think I'd better have a talk with this La Avispa. Where's her villa? Outside the city, but you will not find her there now. She is at the Plaza de Toros. The bullfight arena? Yes, the corrida or bullfight is in progress. Okay, let's go to the arena. I'd like to see the wasp in action. See just what kind of a sting she carries. Manescu and I head for the arena. It's packed, but we manage to find two seats. Next to me sits a skinny little guy in a loud striped shirt, complete with armbands and a collar button, but no collar. Every time something happens in the ring, he jumps to his feet, lets out a yell, and jams an elbow into my face. Ah, bravo, bravo! Hey, watch it, will you, Buster? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, senor. It's just that I get so overcome with the excitement. You sure do. What's going on down there, anyway? <laughs> you do not understand bullfighting? I do not understand bullfighting. This is a crime? Ah, it's an outrage. But I fix, senor. I fix. I tell you all about it. Mira, mira. The banderilleros uh, have just finished now. The who? Uh, they are the ones who plant the darts in the bull's neck. No, no. Now comes the suerte de matar. Suerte de... Hey, now look. Hey, that, that's the kill, senor. In a moment, you could just... Hey, caray, la vispa! La vispa! Hey, will you watch that elbow? Ah, lo siento. Sorry, senor. But that is la vispa who just come into the ring. Hey. Even from here, she looks like a pinup girl. Oh, I, I got what you call the most big crush on her. She is the most beautiful, the most brave. Oh, the most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's she doing now? It looks like she is making a speech to that person sitting in the bus. See, you see, the bull she is about to kill. She dedicates her first to El Presidente of the bull fight. And now it starts. No, no. See, she has turned her face to the bull. Yeah. Hey, he's coming at her. Wow. Oh, hey. Those horns couldn't have been farther away from her than an inch. Oh, senor, did you ever saw such a beautiful Veronica? Veronica who? Hey, Veronica, that's the name of the turn she just made to elude the bull. No, 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 he can come again. Oh, brother, that bull charges like an express train. <laughs> that's an Andalusian bull. Huh? They are the most fierce of all. Uh, Mitchell, she has all the grace of a ballet dancer. Yeah, she seems to be working the bull into a tighter circle all the time. Look. The bull is just standing there. Hey, is she crazy? She's turning her back on him and walking away. Ah, bravo. Bravo, bravissimo. If you don't take that elbow out of my face, I'll bravo you, you runt. Oh, sorry, sorry, but you see, the supreme moment has arrived. She has worked the bull into position for estocada. What's that? The death roost. You see, see, now she takes the estoque, the sword. Uh, so that's the wasp stinger. Pretty effective looking. See, see, now she has two choices. Either abolopi or recipiendo. Ah, don't start that double talk again, will you? Oh, but it's quite simple, senor. Look, what I mean is, abolopi is that is the, the method in which the bull stands still and the matador runs at him to deliver the death roost. But she is standing still. She is waving her cape at the bull. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Recipiendo! She going to let the bull charge her and deliver the thrust in his horns, pass on to her arm. The best way, recipiendo! The bull has started for her. He's right on top of her. She's not even... Ah, like a statue, she said. Now watch, watch. He'll... Ah! Wait, she hey. at the last moment and broke the sword home. Oh, bravissimo, la vista! La vista! Senor, the bull is down. One truth, he is done for. Oh, boy, great thing to watch on an empty stomach. Look, look, look. El Presidente, President of the bull fight. Yeah. He's making the sign. Oh, it's too much. He awards to La Vispa the ears and the tail. It's too much. You're telling me. What happens now? They drag the bull away. Then come another bull, another matador. Oh, but for me, I have seen La Vispa. I have lived. It's all over. I go. Yeah, yeah, I go too. Down to La Avispa's dressing room. La Avispa? See, si. who are you? Steve Mitchell from the United States. Oh, 
What do you wish of me? A little information. You see, I'm a newspaper correspondent. Oh, an interview. Yeah, sort of. Very well, but perhaps you will be kind enough to make it brief. I'm rather tired. I shouldn't wonder. That must be quite a workout. How'd you happen to get into this business, love? You may call me Consuela. Hmm. With me, this is not a business. He's much more than that. Oh? But you, as a reporter, had better write down that I do it for money or for publicity. These things people understand. Mm. My real reason, this they would perhaps not understand. What is the real reason, Consuela? We all of us look for reality. We find it in different ways. I find it in the arena. In that moment, the bull charges me. I am alive. You, uh, feel alive by killing something, huh? Well, that is one way of looking at it, I suppose. But what do you do between times? I mean, you can't be fighting bulls all the time. It's quite simple. When I finish fighting one bull, then I wait to fight another one. Oh, no social life, huh? To be a matador such as I, it is necessary to purify the mind, to purge it of all else. Oh. Uh, ever occurred to you that you might be missing a few things in life that way? No. Oh. Perhaps, if I ever found something, or someone who did for me what the charge of the bull does, well, then it might be a different matter. Well, sounds like it would be a pretty tough act to follow. Huh? I'll skip it. Uh, Another thing, Consuela, I'd sort of like an interview with your house guest, too. I have no house guest. I mean, Dr. Wiecek, I understood he was staying with you. No longer. Oh? He left my villa a week or more ago. Any idea where he went? I understand he was going to the United States. I do not know. I see. And you're sure he's not at your villa? I have just told you he is not, senor. Now, if you will pardon me, I'm quite tired. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the interview, Consuela. I'll see you around. What did you find out from him, Mitra? No more than you did, Minescu. She said Dr. Wiecek had left for the States a week ago, but I think she's lying. Perhaps she is. Hold it. Sounds like she's on the phone. A man was just here. Steve Mitchell. He claimed to be a newspaper correspondent, but I do not believe him. He may be an agent. You must be careful. Who is she talking to? I don't know, but I do know she's involved in the deal some way. It is hard to believe. Dr. Weech, I consider her to be a good friend. I guess you never can tell. Well, I guess I'd better find me a hotel, Minescu. Then I think I'll pay another visit to La Avispa at her villa. Come in. You are Senor Mitchell, no? I am Senor Mitchell, yes. Who are you? Enrique of the hotel, senor. I have come to inquire if your room is in order. Oh, yeah, yeah. Everything seems to be fine. I'm just getting unpacked. What's that under your arm? A bottle of the finest Malaga wine, senor, with the compliments of the hotel. Oh? (laughs) It is our way of extending to you the welcome. I see. And now, if you will permit, I will see if everything is in order in the bathroom. Sure, go ahead. Hmm. Desk. This is Senior Mitchell in 211. Is it the custom of the hotel to send a bottle of wine to each new guest? It isn't. Eh? Well, thanks very much. <coughs> so, everything is in order, Senor Mitchell. I hope you will enjoy your stay here. Just a minute, Enrique. Uh, what is it, Senor? Well, as long as you are kind enough to bring me this bottle of wine, I'd like you to have a drink with me. Why, uh, it is very nice of you to offer, Senor. But I'm afraid the hotel regulations forbid the employees to drink with the guests. Oh, well, couldn't we make an exception? Uh, no, I'm afraid not. Now, if you will excuse me, I must leave, senor. You're blocking the door. You can leave, Enrique, right after you have a drink with me. But I have told you it is impossible. Funny. You're perspiring all of a sudden. Weather seems pretty chilly to me. Senor, I must leave. Couldn't be by any chance there's something wrong with this wine, could it? I insist you let me buy. Like a poison, for instance? Get out of my way! I dive for Enrique. He pulls a chair in front of me and I go sprawling on the floor. He jerks open the door and lunges out into the hall. I scramble to my feet to follow him. When I get out in the hall, he's nowhere in sight. I turn a corner and run right into a fat boy who's waddling down the hall. Oh! 
Oh, I beg your pardon, senor. I hope that I... It's okay. Just let me pass. <laughs> but of course, senor. Not that way. Oh, forgive me. Look, let's quit dodging each other. But I am only trying to get out of your way, senor. Yeah, I'm beginning to wonder. Senor? Skip it. Look, you stand still and I'll go around you. But of course, I hope I have not detained you, senor. I pound along the rest of the hall and down to the lobby, but no Enrique. The fat boy delayed me just long enough, and maybe on purpose I go back upstairs, but the fat boy's gone too. Great. But somebody's trying to take me out of the ball game, and that somebody could be Consuela the Wasp Girl. I rent a car and head out of the city to her villa. I park down the roadway and start walking toward the gate. Just as I get there, I hear a car winding down the long driveway, so I duck into the bushes. As the car passes me, I spot the driver. It's Enrique, the boy who slipped me the bottle of poisoned wine in the hotel. I run back, get into my car, and start following him. He's heading toward the city, traveling fast. I keep well back. Finally, he pulls up at a large house on the outskirts of town. I park my car, climb the garden wall, and ease up to a window. Inside, I can see Enrique talking to an old man with white hair, whose back is to me. The old gent half turns, and I get a look at his face and do a big take to make sure I fish a picture out of my pocket and take a look at it. Yep, there's no doubt about it. I finally found Dr. Wiecek. There's a lot about the deal I don't understand yet, but I'll soon find out. I wait until Enrique leaves. Then I go to the front door. Uh, why the gun? The gun is for you if you do not leave. I am not Dr. Wiecek. I've never heard of Dr. Wiecek. And if you do not get away from this house this instant, you will have to be carried away. You are listening to Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell. Well, this is just great. I hear I bust my back trying to find Dr. Wiecek, and now he tells me he isn't. Looks like he's maybe not quite as anxious to come over to the States as the commissioner figured. I don't know why he's lying, but I'm going to find out I didn't fly all the way over here to Madrid for nothing. If you do not get out, I will shoot you. I doubt you. Not much of a marksman. No. Now drop the gun. No. Drop it. No. No. There. I... Who are you? Steve Mitchell from the States. I was sent over here to find you. Why did you lie to me just now about not being Dr. Wiecek? I had no choice. What do you mean? I've been waiting for my transportation. I have just learned that has been arranged. Tonight I leave for the East. The East? You mean back to your own country? Beyond my own country. Those are my instructions. Your instructions? Look, you better start at the beginning. You're leaving me way behind. Uh, very well, Mitch. But it will do no good. I am helpless. You see, my original intention was to come to your country and make available to your government the results of my research in electronics. Yeah, I know all that. You've developed a new kind of radio tube that we need in our radar equipment. Yes. When I told my assistant, Anescu, of my decision, he asked to accompany me. It was decided that we should travel separately. <clears throat> my daughter and I first, Manescu to follow. Your daughter? Maria, 20 years old. Oh, I wasn't told about your daughter. But that is what this is all about. Go on. Manescu was to meet us here in Madrid at Consuela's villa. Well, what happened? When my daughter arrived at the villa, Consuela was not there. Instead, there was a man waiting with a gun. I see. I was brought here. My daughter was taken somewhere else. I do not know where. I was told that if I wanted to see her alive again, I must discontinue my journey and return to the east. You know, it's pretty strange that Consuela wouldn't be at her villa if she was expecting you and your daughter. I naturally suppose she had been called away at the time. Mm -hmm. Either that or she'd arranged to be away at the time. Arranged? Mitchell, you asked me earlier if you were sure I could trust Consuela. What did you have in mind? This boy, Enrique, the one who was just here to see you. Well, he is the one who took my daughter and forced me to come here. What about him? I followed him here from Consuelo's villa. What? Yeah. What? I cannot believe Consuelo could be involved in this. Enrico is also the boy who posed at a bellhop earlier this evening and tried to kill me with a bottle of poisoned wine. Mitchell, I do not know what to say. Have you I... seen Consuela since you've been in hiding? No, but I have talked to her by telephone. I wish to explain my disappearance to her. I see. Look, what time are you supposed to leave for the East? Enrique is to call for me at midnight. Midnight. That gives us just three hours to find your daughter. Mitchell, I will not consent to anything that might place her in danger. Just give me three hours, Dr. Wiecek. You sit tight here. I'm going to pay another call on Consuela. <laughs> 
I do not quite understand why you have come here to my villa, Senor Mitchell. You have already interviewed me once. Well, just put it down that I have gotten to be a fan of yours, Consuela. Well, I'm quite flattered. Uh, may I offer you a glass of wine? Malaga wine, by any chance? Well, as a matter of fact, it is. How did you know? Oh, just psychic, I guess. Would you care for some? Thanks a lot, but no thanks. Consuela, you told me you didn't have any idea where your friend Dr. Wiecek is. See? <clears throat> It is exactly what I told you, and that is exactly what I meant. Therefore, you wouldn't know where his daughter Maria is, either. But of course not. And you haven't talked to either one of them lately? How could I talk to them if I do not know where they are? I see. How about your driver, Enrique? Huh? What about him? I was just wondering if he could know where they are. Senor, if I do not know, how could Enrique know? I guess you've got a point there, Consuela. Senor, I suggest we conclude this interview. It appears to serve no purpose. Oh, I wouldn't say that, Consuela. It's been a very interesting interview. I'll be seeing you. I greatly doubt it. <laughs> you never can tell. So I leave. At this point, it looks like Consuela is my grade-A suspect. I don't think Enrique is the boss of the operation. I think he's taking orders, and Consuela is the logical one to be giving those orders. Of course, there's still the matter of the fat gent who detained me in the hall outside my hotel room when I was chasing Enrique. I don't know yet how he fits into the deal, but right now, the important thing is to find Wechek's daughter. I've got just two hours left, and I don't know where to start. Then, a thought hits me. Why not start right where I am? I circle around through the grounds of the villa to the garage. Consuela's car is a large black sedan. I get in and crouch down on the floor of the rear seat. Then I wait. The minute ticks by. Eleven o'clock, I start sweating. Maybe I'm barking up the wrong tree. Then somebody enters the garage, eases into the car, and we start up. I get a look at the back of the driver's head. It's Enrique. He heads for the city. Twenty minutes later, he pulls up in front of a beat-up rooming house on a side street. Enrique gets out and goes inside. I wait a couple of minutes, then I get out of the back seat. Then I spot a guy across the street. It's the fat boy, and he stiffens when he sees me. I know I haven't got much time now, so I dive inside, but I don't know which room Enrique headed for. There's no one in sight on the first floor. I start up the stairs, then I spot Enrique at the top looking down at me. I dive to one side. The knife plunks into the banister. I scramble up the rest of the stairs. Enrique is disappearing through the window under the fire escape. I pound after him and dive on him just as he reaches the ground. Let go of me. Oh, no, Enrique. You're going to tell me where you're holding Maria Wiecek a prisoner. No. I do not know what you're talking about. Okay, see if that wall behind you changes your mind. Which room is it, Enrique? I will not tell. Okay, this could go on all night. No, stop. I will tell you. Let's have it. The girl Maria Wiecek. Enrique! Enrique slumps to the ground. The shots came from the end of the alley. I take off after them. Then I round the corner, and there in front of me is the fat boy with a gun in his hand. I grab for it. Let go of my gun. Oh, no. I'll take it, Buster. You've already killed once with it. I'm not going to give you a second chance. But you are mistaken, senor. Save it. You killed Enrique just now to keep him from telling me where Maria Wiecek is. But why would I do that when I, too, am looking for Maria Wiecek? What? Now, look, Buster. Come, yes, if you please. If you would care to examine my gun, you will see that it has not been fired recently. But... Huh, you're right, it hasn't. But who killed Enrique, then? The shots were fired in the dark. I could not see. Perhaps it was you, senor. Me? N now, look. I believe it is time I inquired as to your interest in this matter. Who are you? I'll answer them when I know who's talking. Uh, of course. I am Alberto Gomez of the Madrid Police. Police? See, si. And you? Well, here are my credentials. Ah. Ah, so... It would appear, then, that we are both concerned with the same matter. The disappearance of Dr. Wiecek and his daughter, Maria. I've already found Dr. Wiecek. Indeed? Yeah. They kidnapped his daughter, Maria, and told him to stay undercover, but I think they've got her in that rooming house somewhere. Well, in that case, I... Hold it. Listen. Car pulling away out in front. Come on. Perhaps it is Enrique's killer. Here they come past the alley. A man and a girl. The girl is Maria Wiecek. I have a picture of... You got a car around here, Gomez? See. Si. Come on. We've got to catch him. We are almost up to them, Mitchell. Yeah, but how are we going to stop them? I don't want to shoot the tires out. No, the senorita might be injured. Wait, I got it. Mitchell, what are you doing? Just getting out on the running board. Now come up alongside the other car. What? Come on, step on the gas. Very well. Okay, that's close enough. 
You can't drive and shoot at the same time, but then... Maria, slam on the brakes. All right. Drop that gun, chum. I've got it bent towards you. Pull that trigger now and... Ah, Some guys are so hard to convince. Oh, he shot himself. He sure did. Who is he, anyway? I do not know. He has been guarding me. Mitchell, are you all right? Yeah. But we're not much farther along than before, Gomez. We've got Maria, but we still don't know what's been masterminding this operation. This guy was just a guard, and I don't think Enrique was the boss either, which leaves just about one possibility. What do you mean? Enrique was Consuela's driver. I know, but you surely do not think that Consuela could be involved. Why not? But La Vispa, she is a national figure. I cannot believe it. I think I know one way to find out for sure, Gomez. But how? This man is dead. Also, Enrique is dead. First, let's take Maria back to town and put her in a safe place for the time being. Then, I want to make a couple of phone calls. Phone calls? Yeah. This calls for a celebration, Gomez, in my hotel room. I make my calls. Gomez and I wait in my room. Dr. Wiecek is the first to show up. Then comes Minescu and... When he spots Dr. Wiecek, his face lights up like a neon sign. Dr. Wiecek! Oh, what a relief to see you. I feel badly about not communicating with you, Menescu, but I have no choice. Oh, that is no matter. Now the important thing is that you are safe. And Maria. She's safe, too. Wonderful. Then we may continue our journey as planned. Mitchell, I still do not see why you have arranged this meeting. That should be our other guest, Gomez. Come on in, Consuela. Senor Mitchell, may I ask, what is the meaning... Dr. Witch? Good evening, Consuela. Does it surprise you to see him here, Consuela? Why, indeed it does. But naturally, I am delighted. Are you? What do you mean? Skip it. Well, now that we're all here, I'd like to celebrate. The hotel sent me up this bottle of Malaga wine right after I arrived. I haven't had a chance to sample it yet, but now's a very fitting time, I'd say. Consuela, here's your glass. Let's go. Thank you. Ah, uh, Consuela, don't you want your glass? I am sorry, but I do not drink. Oh, I'm told this is a pretty special wine, Consuela. Oh, but I have just told you. I do not drink. But this is a special occasion. I'd like to propose a toast to a safe journey to the States for Dr. Wiecek and Maneskiel. Surely you'll drink to that. Uh, Mitchell, if she does not want to, perhaps we should observe the toast with water. No, no, I do not wish to cause trouble. Give me the glass, Senor Mitchell. That's better. Okay. Glass is up, everybody. Here's the... What's the matter, Manescu? Aren't you drinking with us? It is not proper etiquette for those who are being toasted to drink the toast. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Well, we'll just toast Dr. Wiecek. Now you can drink to it, Manescu. Go ahead. I... What's the matter, Manescu? Not... I feel faint suddenly. Ah, the wine will snap you out of it. Come on. No, I... Drink it... Manesco. He has a gun. He had a gun. Yeah, I have it. Mitchell, I, I do not understand. Well, it's pretty simple, Doctor. We checked. Right after I arrived here, Enrique bought me a bottle of poison wine, and the only other person who knew it was poisoned was the one who told him to bring it to me. The brains of the operation. Your trusty assistant, Manesco. Mitchell, you stand quiet, Manesco. Manesco. All this time, it was Manescu. Yeah, looks like he didn't want you to bring your research to the States. I guess he had other plans for it. Then it was Manescu who shot Enrique in the alley, huh? Eh? Sure, to shut his mouth. But it's all over now, and I could use a drink. Mitchell, you drank the poison wine. Yeah, not bad, either. What? The wine is not poisoned. You, you switched the bottles. It was a trick. Yeah, sort of worked, too, didn't it? I guess it disproves the old saying, doesn't it, Manescu? What are you talking about? They say that what you don't know won't hurt you, but in your case, it looks like what you didn't know is going to kill you. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, is written by Bob Reif and Adrian Jondo, with music by Robert Armbruster, and is produced and directed by Bill Carn. 
Be with us again next week at this same time when Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell, will embark on another dangerous assignment. Dangerous assignment came to you from Hollywood. Now it's the man called X. Tomorrow, hear the big show on NBC. Do you believe in ghosts? Do you? The governor of the great commonwealth sat at his desk in his study, staring at the dying embers of the great fire. The room was in darkness, save for a spot of light from the green-shaded lamp, which brought his shaggy gray head into sharp relief as he sat with hands clasped on the desk before him. Outside, the wind played a minor harmony and sent sharp gusts of rain beating furiously against the tall windows, in the shadowed recesses of the room, a door opened softly. Mr. Governor? Yes, Dabney? The mother is still waiting, sir. Says she won't leave until she has some further word from you. Yes, I know, Dabney. But it's no use. My decision is unchanged. The boy must hang. Oh, yes, sir. I've told her that. But she insists she be allowed to remain until the last minute. What time is it now? It's nearing midnight, Governor. The Governor rose and crossed to the fireplace. Five hours more. It's a terrible thing to hold a man's life in your hands, Dabney. But I have no other course. The boy had a fair trial. The evidence was conclusive. He went to the house to elope with the girl, against her father's wishes. The father interfered, and the boy shot him. That's murder, Dabney, and the law must take its course. I know what this mother is suffering, but the courts have decided what penalty the boy must meet, and I have no moral right to interfere. For a moment, the governor closed his tired eyes, and the room was still, save for the dreary rhythm of the rain against the glass. Oh, your decision is just, Mr. Governor. There can be no doubt of that. Now, sir, please, won't you go to bed? Not yet, Daphne. And the mother, sir. Shall I let her remain? Oh, yes, yes. Let her remain. If it makes it any easier for her. Alone, the governor sank into the deep leather chair back of his desk and resumed his silent vigil with a dying fire. As he sat there, across his blurred vision fell the shadow of a gallows, a straight young figure mounting the thirteen steps, the black hood around a head held high, the solemn intonation of voices, and a mother weeping. Slowly, the governor's head sank forward on his arms. When he raised it again, the last glow had been drained from the coals, and the wind had died to a low moan. Why, oh, oh, I, I beg your pardon. I, I told my secretary to admit no one. A shadowy figure in the chair across the desk relaxed deeper into the darkness beyond the circle of light that fell from the desk lamp. And when he spoke, there was a gentle drawl in his voice. <laughs> Secretaries are to be heard, but not heeded when you want to see a man, Governor. 
The governor made a gesture of impatience. And I'm... I'm sorry, my dear sir, but you will understand. Yes. Yes, I know. I sort of surmised I might be able to help you tonight, Mr. Governor. Well, it's... it's very late. Uh, tomorrow, perhaps. I think maybe it's tonight you need a friend to talk to. You're carrying a big load tonight, Mr. Governor. And it's galling you. Maybe if somebody come along, helped you to heft it just a mite, you'd see your way clearer into what you're doing. You... you mean the boy, of course. I mean that mother who's sitting out there in your anteroom. That mother whose son is to be hanged at dawn. The governor's eyes sought the face of this strange visitor, but all he could see was the vague outline of a man's form slouched deep in the chair opposite him. Well, if you've come to plead for reprieve, you're wasting your time. My decision is unalterable. This boy has committed a crime for which society exacts the payment of his life. Yes. Yes, Mr. Governor. I'm quite aware of that. The payment of his life. <laughs> you know, once there was a boy who went to sleep on sentry post in the face of the enemy. Military law said he must die. A court-martial so decided. Secretary of War proved it. And the Secretary of War was right. But the lad's mother didn't agree. So she went to the President of the United States and asked that soft-hearted old meddler to give her back her boy. Now, the president knew right well he shouldn't oppose his secretary of war. Knew he'd send the country to the demnition bow-wows if he did. But he figured it this way. That boy dead was no good to anybody. Alive, he had a chance to pay back his debt to the nation. So, this puddin-headed old president told the mother she could have her boy back. Which was wrong, according to society. But awful right, according to that mother's lights. Oh, but, my dear sir, the cases are not parallel. This lad deliberately killed a man who was defending his home, his family. It's a plain case of murder. Are you right sure of that, Mr. Governor? Pretty hard to be sure sometimes. <laughs> now here, let's suppose that for 18 years a girl had been bullied by a harsh, unloving father. Father who denied her every right to happiness. Suppose that a lad came to her with clean hands and a great love in his heart offered her a chance to escape. Suppose that on the very night she was to go with him, she found that her father again was blocking her way. And then suppose that in her hot rebellion, she shot the father. Now, boy arrives a few minutes later. He's a man. He's young. He's in love. So he takes the blame. And tomorrow at dawn, he pays the penalty. Or does he, Mr. Governor? He dies, to be sure. But that gray-haired woman praying outside that door, she dies, but goes on living. Suddenly, the cloud of fatigue seemed to lift itself from the governor's mind. In quick, photographic flashes, the evidence in the case came back to him. 
The father had been brutal to the girl, conclusively established by every witness. The girl's fingerprints had been found on the revolver. Then there was the boy's reticence on the witness stand, the girl's hysterical heartbreak, and the mother's abiding faith that her son could not have killed anyone. Oh, yes. Yes, that was it. What this strange visitor said was true. The governor looked up and found that his guest had risen. Within the circle of light he stood, tall, angular, stooped. Then the governor's eyes found his face, and with a start he rose from his chair. Why? Why? Why, sir? He was looking at a square, homely face with deep-set, kindly eyes, firm jaw, smiling mouth, and a rugged chin fringed with a thin, dark beard. For an instant, the eyes and lips smiled down on him, and then the governor was alone in the room. A startled Dabney looked up from his desk to see the governor standing over him. Get the warden on the phone at once, Dabney. Tell him an executive reprieve has been granted. From across the room there came a sobbing triumphant cry, and a white-haired woman stumbled toward the governor and fell at his feet. Oh, oh, my boy, my boy, you, you've saved him. You've given me back <laughs> my boy. Gently, the governor raised her to her feet and took her hands in his. Oh, no. No, madam. I didn't give you back your boy. A man much wiser, much kinder than I, saved your boy for you tonight as surely as he saved another mother's son who went to sleep on sentry post. Why? Why, whom do you mean? The governor's voice was so low she scarce could hear him. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln? Why, sir, he's been dead these many years. Oh, no, madam, no. Not dead. He belongs to the ages. Do you believe in ghosts? Do you? Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. We might call our story today The Battle of the H's, but the title wouldn't exactly fit, although the principle may be true. New ideas have always met resistance by most of the so-called old-timers in any given field. It's a rare thing indeed for an elderly man to readily accept new ideas, even when they're tested and tried. So when the new meets the old, the battle begins. And this is the way it's been down through the years. 
Let's find out how it works in the story, The Book Farmer. Whitey Moore has just arrived on the Fireball Express, and his dad and two brothers are at the Naughty Pine Station to greet him. Whitey's got a coveted sheepskin in his pocket, which says he's a graduate from the State University College of Agriculture. Well, let's join the family now as they greet their educated brother and son. Welcome home, son. My, you look fine. Oh, thanks, Pop. You look good yourself. Hiya, Craig. Woods. Hi. Why, hey, good to see you again. How are you? How's it feel to be through with book learning, son? Oh, just fine, Pop. Oh, I enjoyed school, but I'm glad it's over with now. <laughs> Have you got your sheepskin? Yeah. Sure, right here in my pocket, Butch. Uh, can I see it? Yeah, I want to see it, too. <laughs> now, what in the name of common sense you're doing with a sheepskin in your pocket? <laughs> oh, it isn't a real sheepskin, Pop. <laughs> oh. It's my diploma. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's right. I remember you talking about it now. Yeah, here it is. Wow. Mm. Real oh. fancy, huh? Yeah. How? But is is that all you get after four years of knocking your brains out? That's all, Craig. It's not the value of the paper, but the education it stands for. Oh. Well, come on, boys. We'll go home. Your ma's got some party fixings yeah. made up for a celebration. Oh, Boy, it's sure good to be home. We're glad to have you home, Whitey. Tell me about college. Well, it's just fine, Butch. In college, you pay to learn, and it's up to you how much you absorb. You're really on your own in a lot of ways. There's a lot of real nice fellas here, too. You think I could go to college someday, maybe? Sure, why not? Ah, uh, book learning is all right for some fellas. I'll get my farming from Pop. Well, sure, sure, we both got our basic farming and ranching from Pop. But at college, you'll learn a lot of things that simply amaze you. You mean Pop doesn't know all there is to know about farming and ranching? No, he doesn't. Well, I like that <laughs> remark, young man. Where did come from? So you think I don't know farming and ranching after almost 40 years of it, eh, son? Well, I didn't mean it that way, Pop. Nobody can know all there is about it. Why, at college, they've got professors who specialize in one subject only, because the field is so broad. No one can know all there is to know about agriculture. No, I don't know about that. Pop does pretty good. Right. But our farm and ranch could do a lot better. Oh, maybe so, Whitey, but we get along. Well, I'll tell you one thing. What's that? If you want to keep your happy home, you'll soft peddle your book farming around me. Because I don't cotton to this new stuff until it's tried and proven time and time again. And that's telling them. What did Whitey go to college for if you're not going to let him try out what he got taught? Whitey can try out what he's learned, a little at a time. I'm not going to allow my farm and ranch to become an agriculture experiment station. I can't afford it. We've got to get our bread and butter out of this place. <laughs> don't worry, Pop. I'm not going to start a revolution. Huh, now you're talking sense. Just to see that you remember it. Hey, Whitey, what are you going to do? About what, Butch? About Pop's alt... alt... Oh, you know. He does ultimatum? Yeah, that's what I meant. Oh, I don't think he gave me an ultimatum. Like I said, I'm not going to start a revolution. Maybe not, but I saw you make a face about mil milking the cows tonight. I was just thinking about how much better the job could be done with milking machines. More sanitary, too. That's what I mean. Isn't it going to kind of stick in your craw to have to do things old-fashioned when you know they can be done better? Yes, I suppose it is. But then I like living here, so I'll have to like it, won't I? Yep, that's about the way it stacks up, I guess. Here's the seed you'll need to start out on the north section. Craig and Butch will bring out the rest in the truck about ten o'clock. Okay, Pop. Say, did you inoculate these legumes? The what? 
inoculate them. You dampen the seed and then mix in the inoculating powder and the stuff clings to the seeds. The inoculation helps nitrogen form on the roots and this gives you a bigger and better crop as well as build up the nitrogen content of the soil. Well, you don't say. Well, I had the north section soil tested and the test showed the soil is in good shape. Sure, but... No buts about it. Here's the seed. Now get going before you waste half a day's planting time talking about book farming. What in the name of common sense are all these charts? Milk production charts, Pop. I know what kind of milk my cows are giving. Well, do you know if them all are earning their board and keeping making a little profit to boot? Well, uh, maybe not each one, but this ain't a factory, you know. Sure is, Pop. We shouldn't keep a cow that can't make money for us. It's too expensive to feed and born a deadbeat. Was that so? Now, you listen to me, young man. These cows are good cows, and don't you forget it. I've had them a long time. Men lose their shirts off their backs being sentimental, Pop. Good men, too. No, I ain't lost my shirt yet. And I don't want you running around here with a measuring cup like these cows was giving drops of gold. Stop, Brandon. Take a break, son. Yeah, sure. Yeah, here comes Butch with a bucket of lemonade to take the dust out of her throats. Ah, fine. Uh, Craig, knock off for a while and take a breather. Okay. Here you are. Ma's good homemade lemonade. Yeah. That's good. Oh, I'm better. It's a spa there, boys. It sure does. <laughs> Boy, this dust is terrible. Uh, Pop. Yeah? I've got an idea how to rebuild a branding chute so we could brand four calves at one time. Uh-oh, here we go again. Quiet, everybody. Genius at work. Knock it off, Craig. I ain't heard you giving up with any ideas. Now, listen, you little... Hey, hey cut it out, off. you two. What do you say, Pop? Oh, I say no. Branded one calf at a time is enough work for any two or three men. Four at a time would put us all in our graves early. Oh, no, it wouldn't. But the way I'd build the new chute would make Brandon four almost as easy as Brandon one. It would be through two days earlier. Well, I'll give it some thought. Maybe we can do something about it next year. Pop, you know we've got almost 40 hens in here that should be in the stew pot because they're too old and quit laying? <laughs> sure do, son. Didn't know how many, but I knew we had some stewing hens in the lot. We'll eat them up for Sunday dinners or the like. But, Pop, 40 loafing hens eat a lot of feed. <laughs> well, they sure do. But they'll stay fat that way until we eat them. Oh, that's like pouring money down the drain. Huh? And what would you suggest we do with them? Butcher them and sell them on the market or trade them in town. But then we'd have room to bring in 40 pullets and it'd be good laying hens in three months. Is that so? Whitey, I've had about all I'm going to take from you. If you don't stop calling me down on every turn I make, you're going to have to leave home, understand? Yes, sir. I understand. Hey, Whitey, can I go to town with you? Yeah, sure, Butch. Thanks. Hey, I heard Pop telling Ma that you and he had a pretty good blowout. That is, Pop did all the blowing out at you. Yeah, that's right. You ain't gonna leave home, are you? No, not yet, anyhow. Boy, that's good. You had me scared from the way Pop talked. Hey, Brain, why don't you lay off Pop? What do you mean, lay off? Stop arguing with him. You know I never argue with him. I was only trying to help. Yeah? Well, keep your book farming to yourself and leave Pop alone. He's doing fine the way it is, and that's the way I want it, too. 
Yeah, suit yourself, Craig. I'd like to see you try to run a farm with a wrench all by yourself. Just you and your books. And then be rich. And how? Don't let him rile you none, Whitey. I'm not. Come on, let's go to town. I'll fix the tailgate here. We'll be off. Hey, how come you got all these papers in the cab? Oh, that's a project I'm working on. I'm going to stop and see the county agent after we deliver the milk. Hey, this must be all home week. Look at all the farmers and ranchers in Clay's office. Hello, fellas. I think you're right, pal. This must be old home week. Hello, Bill. Henry, pull up a piece of the floor and sit and let your feet hang down. (laughs) That's no joke. How come all the crowd? Oh, I don't know. Just happened, I guess. (laughs) Uh, Clay, you don't happen to have a spare F-82 form lying around, do you? Well, I (laughs) think so, Bill. I'll take a look. Okay, thanks. Sure. Hi, man. Oh, Whitey Moore. Oh, Whitey. Hey, Whitey. You're getting a taste of real farming again. (laughs) (laughs) Sure, fellas. Come on out and see the improvements in the old homestead. Uh, say, Clay, I'd like to borrow that book again. Oh, well, sure thing. Got it right here. <laughs> you gonna plant that book, Whitey? <laughs> <laughs> I think a plain old bushel of corn would do more for you. <laughs> What's that all about? I don't know, but I'm sure gonna find out. Come on. <laughs> Oh, that's the way things have been going, Bill. That's why the men were ripping you, huh? Yeah, I guess so. Word's getting around like it always does. That's too bad. Some of the fellas that were laughing at you could stand some book farming by the looks of their places. Yeah, Henry's right, Whitey. Don't ever back off because those fellas rip you. Education gives you the last laugh. And I wouldn't feel bad about you and your dad, either. Remember, a father's so used to telling his son what to do and how to do it. It's quite an adjustment to have it turn the other way. Oh, just be patient. He'll come around. Use self-control, and your dad will back you to the hill someday. Thanks for the encouragement, Bill. You've helped me a lot. I guess I need somebody like you to talk to. I'm beginning to lose my perspective. Well, your dad wouldn't have paid your way through college not to have you use it. I think he's testing you to see if you really believe what you learn and if you'll stick with it. When he's satisfied that you mean what you say, then he'll back off and let you take over. He's no youngster anymore, you know. Well, I never thought of it that way. Bill, you put the silver linings back in the clouds. Hey, Whitey! Yeah, what's the matter, Clay? Oh, glad I found you so fast. Your brother just called and wants you to come home right away. Your father's suddenly taken sick. Thanks for coming out, Bill, Henry. Oh, that's all right, Whitey. Is there any way we can help? Not right now. The doc's still with Pop. How bad is he? Heart attack. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Doc says Pop's been working too hard for his age, and he's got to take a long rest now. I guess it's up to Whitey now to run things. Well, it looks that way, but I sure didn't want it to happen this way. Well, that's often the case, Whitey. I'm sure your father can take a good rest, though, knowing that his farm and ranch are in capable hands. Clem, nice to see you. Well, how are you, Herman? And how's the farm? Uh, I'm feeling fine now. But uh, what do you mean, the farm? Well, see, your son has changed things considerable since he's the boss. Why is Whitey using a combine to harvest your grain? Ain't a thrashing machine good enough for him? Uh, I'll have to talk to him about it, Morgan. Seems to me you should have done that long ago. Hank, Whitey told me the steers was prime weight when they sent them off to market. Huh, seems to me he shipped them off three weeks early. Isn't the seat around here good enough for Whitey? 
How come he sent out for it? What's wrong, Whitey? Your call sounded urgent. Well, it is. The doc says Pop's recovery isn't satisfactory. Oh, that's too bad. Sorry to hear it. Did the doc say why? Yep. Pop's too close to home. He's running the place from his bed, and all his friends keep pouring ideas into his head, and they keep him posted on me. Mm, it's like Job's friends, huh? What'd you say, Bill? Oh, I just talking to myself. Uh, how can I help you, Whitey? Well, Pop won't agree to go to a rest home about a hundred miles from here where he can really rest. Would you talk to him? You think he'll listen to me? Well, everybody else failed, even the doc. You have a way of sort of convincing people. Okay, I'll talk to him. Uh, I suppose you've come to see me for one purpose. To twist my arm into going to that Tom Fool rest home. You've hit the nail square, Herman. Uh, well, you might as well save your breath. If you don't go, you'll be the one who will have to save his breath. <laughs> now you're trying to scare me out of here. Herman, don't be a fool. You've got Whitey and Craig and Butch to run the farm and the ranch. Uh, Whitey would make this place an experiment station and... Craig don't have the maturity to run the place by himself. Now, you won't always be around to pamper them, remember? You might pull through this heart attack by staying here, but the chances are that you won't. Or what's worse, you might end up an invalid. And that would be a fine way to live out the retiring years of your life. Uh, I never quite looked at it that way, Bill. You'd better look at it the smart way and look fast. So you can get some rest to save your life. But, well, I can't afford a thousand dollars to go away and rest. Your family would have to pay that much for your funeral. You have all the answers, don't you? Now, let's not get excited, Herman. Why don't you talk it over with Whitey and Craig? Uh, all right. Tell the boys I want to see them. What you got to say? You go to the rest home. We'll run the place while you're gone, and you won't have a thing to worry about. Not even the hospital bill. That's the way I figure it, too, Pop. Yeah. How are you going to pay the hospital bill? Well, I got that all figured out, too. We'll have the money when you come home in three months. Come on, Pop. You know we can do it, and you know you need the rest. That's yeah, so. I see you got some backbone, too, Craig. I wasn't trying to be rude, Pop. But I mean what I say. If you don't go, we're going to have to have you taken there anyhow. Because the doc says you've got to do it to live. Well, now, both of you got your backs up like Tom Cats on a fence. Yeah, here's what I am going to do. I'll go to that Tom Fool place under one condition. Name it. Well, Eddie, you run the farm. And Craig, you run the ranch. And one of you is to keep an eye on the other. How's that sound to you? Fine, just fine. Yeah, that's Jake with me. Huh? It is, eh? Yeah. Well, Craig, you keep Whitey from using too much of that book farming, and Whitey, you keep Craig level-headed. Is that a deal? Sure. Yeah, right. Uh, tell the doc to get the ambulance and take me to the rest home. <laughs> now I'm going to get some real rest. You fellas don't make the grade at your funeral, not mine. We're not worried about our part. But we do want you around for another 20 or 30 years at least. That's right, Pop. At least that long. Oh, well, thanks, boys. It's nice to know that an old-timer is still wanted in this modern scientific age. Don't forget about your younger brother while I'm gone, and take good care of your ma. We will. And you take good care of yourself, too. Oh, thank you, son. I will. That's a promise. Man, 
everything's coming out down out there, but the kitchen sink. Well, now the sink is down too. I'm glad I don't have a stand of grain getting plastered to the ground. You would be. How are you going to harvest your grain, Whitey? What's the book say about rain and wind flattened grain? It says plenty, but you can't read anyhow. Huh? You'll just have to take the loss, like Pop would have taken it. Don't be too sure about that, brother. A combine can pick up pretty close to the ground and save a lot of grain. Uh, Pop wouldn't use a combine. He trashed with a crew. Well, a combine picks up the down grain and saves the heads from being shaken off. Thrashing with the crew would really raise the loss by the time you got through bouncing the stuff around. Oh, maybe so. But we'll see, book farmer. How's it doing with the combine, Butch? Real good, Craig. He ain't losing hardly anything. Ah, I can see that. There's hardly a bit of Don Grain after the combine goes over. Pretty good book farming, don't you think? Huh. Maybe this once he's got it going his way. But I got some news for him that'll make his books look sick. This isn't bad. It isn't? No, no. I've lost about 50 acres of corn from the rain. But I can fix that in a hurry. What did I tell you, Craig? Why do you think you're giving me the business now? This corn's washed out, but good. What are you going to do, swim after it? No, I'm going to send for some 90-day corn seed. It'll grow and mature the same time as 120-day corn that's already planted. I'd say he's a pretty good book farmer, wouldn't you? Well, something wrong with the mower, genius? You ought to know. You used it two days ago to cut hay. Huh. Which worked fine for me, Whitey, honest. That's the truth. I, I wouldn't play a trick like that. Yeah, I believe you. It'll take a long time to get it fixed. Now you can't cut the soybeans. Too bad your big cash crop will go to pot, Whitey. You lose a lot of money because of this busted mower. We'll, we'll see about that. We'll see. Whitey said I should help you the rest of the day, Craig. Oh, fine. I can use it. What's Whitey going to do now that he can't cut soybeans? Oh, he's cutting them. By hand? No. With a tractor and power mower he rented from Paul Boone. <laughs> How do you get it out here so soon? Telephone. Paul picked up the busted mower and dumped off the rented job at the same time. He was here 20 minutes after Whitey called. You know something, Butch? What? I thought I was going to give that book farming brother of mine a bad time while Pop was gone. But instead, I've got nothing but admiration for him. He sure has what it takes to get done what he sets his mind to. He didn't learn that in school. He got that from Pop. Yeah. I guess the smart thing to do is take some of the old and mix it with some new, and it works out fine. So things are coming along fine, huh, fellas? Yep. Oh, we've had our problems, Bill, but then who hasn't? That's what makes a fight better. Ah, now you're talking, Whitey. Whitey's made his roll of dawn. I'm making mine tomorrow. Yeah? What's happening? I'm shipping these steers over here before daybreak. Why so early, Craig? Well, if I get them to market just when the buying starts, I won't have to pay for feed and pens to hold them over. They'll be bought right off the truck, and they won't lose a pound. All I have to do is to pay the broker's commission. Hey, that's sharp thinking, all right. And that's not from a book. Pop taught us that. <laughs> ah, that's fine. You know, experience of our elders is a mighty valuable thing. They know all of the little tricks that count in the long run, just as much as what Whitey's learned in college. You couldn't get your father's experience out of textbooks. That's right, Bill. And I'm going to try and learn all those little tricks from Pop when he gets home. And I'm going to college and learn book farming and ranching. And me too. <laughs> Uh, when's your dad coming home? Next week. Thursday, to be exact. Well, uh, do you have enough to cover the... <laughs> what do you call this? Soap wrappers? And I've got my money from the cattle sale to match Whitey's roll. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Your father can be real proud of his son. Well... 
hell, this is the day, boys. I waited three months for this. Say, you look great, Pop. I'll say. You had a good rest, <laughs> huh? Yeah, I'll say I did. Didn't worry about a thing. I'm glad you're well again. It'll sure be nice to have you home. Oh, thanks, son. Which one of you is going to bail me out of here? We both are. Here's the loot. And mine. Great day in the morning. Two thousand dollars. Are you pleased? <laughs> pleased? I'm tickled pink. <laughs> you know, I sort of like this resting idea after 40 years of working hard. You boys can just run things from now on. Oh, that's great. But first, I want to go to agriculture college. All right. You can use some of the money you made as a starter. And I'll help Craig along, Pop. While he's in school, I'll learn from you all that your experience has taught you. Say, you fellas will be way ahead of me when you get to be my age. Yeah, this book farming really pays off. And that's the way the battle of the old and the new usually turns out. And it's the way it should work out. The experienced seasoning sprinkled in with the new ideas, and you come up with a perfect formula for getting ahead. See you next week for more adventure with... Ranger Bill! This is Stumpy Jenkins, Ranger Bill's old sidekick, as I guess you all know. Just adding a little extra word of thanks for getting yourself in on the program today. Always glad to have you along. And I hope you invite your friends, too, for we sure got lots of adventures to tell you about. And we don't want you to miss any of them. So you make sure to be there by your radio every week. Don't lose out on our next story. The Dennis Day Show returns to the air at this hour the first week in October. Remember, the Dennis Day Show, beginning here October 7th. Presenting Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. On stage tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another in NBC's parade of exciting half-hour presentations. of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Tonight's case, play for keeps. Five minutes past midnight on December 12th, several years ago, Sheriff Bob Smithers of Bradshaw County, Texas, staged a raid on a gambling establishment located on a country road. But there were no patrons in the house, and the sheriff's face grew dark red as he and the local constable failed to find any evidence. There's nothing in the upstairs room either, Sheriff. You're sure of that, huh, Jim? Not even a deck of cards. See, Sheriff, like I told you, I quit the racket. Yet this is the fourth time this year you rousted me out of bed. I know you're operating, Walton. And I'm going to get you for it. You're not going to milk the citizens of this county. Not while I'm sheriff. Look, sheriff, 
This happens to be my house. Warrant or no warrant, you finished your business here. How about getting out? I guess we might as well go, Sheriff. No, Jim. We're going to stay a minute. I want to talk to Walton. And you. About what? I was sure of this raid tonight, Jim. Dead sure. Just like I've been sure the last three times. Because only you and me ever knew about them. I didn't tell nobody but you, Jim. You, the constable. <laughs> Sounds like he's accusing you of tipping me off, Dunn. I know he tipped you, Walton. You better watch what you're saying, Bob. All that talk about law and order and wanting to uphold him. Let me see your wallet, Jim. Take it out and let me see it. Now, wait a minute, Sheriff. You shut up. Come on, Jim. I want to see if you're carrying the kind of money an honest man gets for being a peace officer. What I carry on me is my own business. Why, you cheap two-bit sneak. Nothing cheap about a few hundred once in a while. Be smart, Sheriff. Get a few for yourself. Why don't you listen to him, Sheriff? He's talking sense. Come on, both of you. I'm taking you in. You can't make anything stick. Maybe not. But I'm going to make this county too hot for both of you. I'm going to run you out of it. Keep your hands off me, Sheriff. You're under arrest. Grab him while I'm here. I just I got him. Just hold him, fool, while I get his gun. I got him. Don, Don, you... You killed him. No, no. No, you killed him. You grabbed his gun and killed him. He was after you, Walton. I got a gun of my own, and I'm the constable. Are you set me up for a frame? Not necessarily, Walton. It's up to you. His body could be moved out of here. What's your play? What do you want? No more chicken mash. Fifty percent of your take, and you can go right on operating. With him dead, you crazy fool? You're forgetting something, Walton. I'm top dog now. And investigating this murder will be my job until a new sheriff is appointed. <laughs> but I don't think I'm going to be able to solve it. The body of Sheriff Smithers was found the next morning Dumped in a ditch by the side of an old wagon road During the next few days, Constable Jim Dunn Conducted a seemingly honest but fruitless investigation Even following the efficient peace officer's routine Of making use of the state lab facilities at Austin But citizens of Bradshaw were not satisfied Nor was the editor of the Bradshaw Times Clippings of his editorials were on file with Captain Stinson of the Texas Rangers. And the captain sent for Ranger Jace Pearson. You want to see me, Captain? Yeah, Jace, sit down. There's no acting sheriff appointed by the court of Bradshaw County here, Jace. I think you better take over. About the killing of Sheriff Smithers? Mm -hmm. I'd like to. I knew Smithers. See, that's right. You worked with him about five years ago. When he first took office... Cleaned that county up in three months and cleaned it good. Well, it doesn't look like it stayed clean, Jace. Not according to this editorial clipping from the Bradshaw Times. I've read it. It's going to be a tough one, Jace. No clue to the killer, and the trail has had a couple of days to cool off. Well, then I better get going before it gets any cooler. You'll hear from me. Uh, Jace. Yeah, Captain. I just want to remind you, whoever did it doesn't hesitate to kill a man wearing a badge. Bradshaw in the early morning. The town was waking up and the Bradshaw Times was turning out its bi-weekly edition. I went in to see the editor, Frank Carlin. So you read my editorials, huh? Well, I'm glad no somebody's reading. Yeah, you've got readers, all right. People been clipping them out and mailing them into our headquarters. Yeah, I guess there's always a handful of people to hold out. <laughs> Wonder what the world would do without them. Everybody was so burned the day of the killing. Then in 48 hours, they want to forget it. Yeah, it's always that way. How about the constable, Jim Dunn? Oh, he's all right, I guess. But he's only been constable for a year. He just doesn't have the experience. It'll take the court a couple more days to decide on a new sheriff. I better knock out a story on your rangers coming in. Might wake the people up again. I'd rather you didn't, Mr. Carlin. I'll, I'll be around, and they'll know soon enough. Oh. Uh, See what you mean. Want me to lay off the editorials for a while? If you don't mind. You know, Sheriff and I are on different sides of the fence politically, but he was an honest man and I liked him. I got a headline back there, all set and gathering dust. It says, Sheriff's Killer Caught. Ranger, give me a chance to use it. 
place to park my horse trailer and put charcoal in a pasture. Then I headed for the constable's office and met Constable Jim Dunn. There are all the reports in my investigations, Ranger. You think I haven't done a good job, maybe those will change your mind. I even checked ballistics with the Austin lab. My being here isn't a criticism of you, Mr. Dunn. I'm here because I was sent until a new sheriff is appointed and to give you help. I've done everything possible. I've questioned almost a hundred people. I've checked alibis on more than a dozen possible suspects. It's all there. Yeah. Everything's here. Everything except the murderer. And that's the only thing I'm interested in seeing, Mr. Dunn. A little cooperation between us might clean it up. I'm... I'm sorry I blew, Ranger. It's been getting under my skin. This murder could have been committed by anybody... Some bum from a hobo jungle, some drunk, anybody. We can't arrest anybody. We've got to arrest somebody, somebody definite. Now, exactly where was the body found? Old Wagon Road bypasses town about two miles north. Is it fit for a car? Yeah, but you've got to go round about to get to it, almost 11 miles. You won't find nothing there, though. i like to take a look anyhow. Can't we cut cross-country on horses? Yeah, shorter if you want it. I want to. Horses in a pasture. I'll meet you at the edge of town in five minutes. The body was found just a little further on. You can see the road now. Not much of a road left. No use for it anymore. Sheriff must have had some reason for using it if he came way out here. Here we are. Move one. Oh, oh, charcoal. Oh, boy. The sheriff's car was found right over here by the side of the road. Where was he? Lying right beside it. Been dead about seven, eight hours when he was found. Who found him? Cowpoke, looking for some strays. Mm, That's lucky. Otherwise, the body might have been here for a few days or even weeks before somebody came across it. Yeah. You get pictures of the position of the car and the body? Of course I did. Anything else? Yeah, any exhibits, casts of footprints, anything like that? Uh, No. When I got the call, I brought a bunch of men out with me. I was excited, and I didn't think to stop them from tramping around. I can see why you'd be upset. Well, if there was anything to find, it's a cinch it isn't here now. Whether would have wiped it out if your men hadn't. You want to go back to town? Yeah. I want to look at the car. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. How about the exhibits from the sheriff's body? I sent the bullets and the gun in. Your lab checked it. Verified it was the sheriff's own gun. I'm talking about the clothes he was wearing. You got those, haven't you? Sure I got them. I got all the evidence there was. You should have sent it all in. I want to look at that stuff, too. Well, let's step it up. Come on, Charlie. Get get up! There's everything, all tagged. Everything the sheriff was wearing when he was killed. I see. And is this the shirt he was wearing? You see the blood and bullet holes, don't you? Yeah. How come your lab didn't find any prints on the gun when I signed it in? Didn't even have the sheriff's own prints. It was white clean. Hmm. Well, this is kind of odd. What? Well, the sheriff was shot twice, and they dug one slug out of him. The other one passed clean through. Yeah, according to the coroner's report, one slug hit his collarbone. That stopped it. That's what I mean. The course of the bullets. Both shots fired into the left side, just above the kidney. But the one that came through came out the right side of his shirt collar here, right through his neck. What about it? It's a funny course for a bullet to take, unless the man who fired the gun was lying down and fired up at the sheriff. Yeah, 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 that's what I figured, too. They must have had a fight for the gun. He got it, but the sheriff knocked him down and... No, uh, no, that isn't the way it happened. How do you know? Because the sheriff wouldn't half turn his back on a man who'd just taken his gun. Besides, these powder burns show the gun was being held right against the shirt when it was fired. What do you think happened then? Uh, The sheriff must have been in some position where he was bent over forward, which he wouldn't be unless somebody was holding him in that position. Here, stand in front of me for a minute. Now, you're back toward me. What are you going to do? 
Slip one hand under your arms and then up behind your head in a half Nelson and twist your other arm behind you in an arm lock. Then bend you over forward like this. The sheriff was held like I'm holding you now. The bullets were pumped into him. See what I mean? That, that's just a guess. It's a guess I'm going to back up. And if the sheriff was held in a half Nelson and an arm lock, it tells us something else. That there were two men in on the murder. Unless the killer had three hands and used the third one to fire the gun. That's pretty smart figuring, Ranger. Only because it's the kind of figuring I've been doing for a long time. Uh-huh. Are these the photos that were taken at the scene? Yeah. The sheriff's body in the car. Uh, the car, the body moved any before these were taken? Nope. The car was right there. With the sheriff flat on his face beside it. And less than two feet away from it. His right side toward the car. Yeah. The bullet that passed through the sheriff came out on his right side. That means it should have hit the car. But there's no mark. I don't see that that helps us any. It helps plenty, Dunn. It tells us the sheriff wasn't killed out there. He was killed someplace else and brought out there. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Now we continue with tonight's case, Play for Keeps, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. I knew that Sheriff Smithers had been killed by two men, and that his body had been moved after the killing. But it wasn't nearly enough. It was evening before I figured out my next move, a move I didn't like to make. Evening, ma'am. Remember me? Why, it's Jace Pearson, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Been a long time, Mrs. Smithers. Oh, come in, Jace. Come in. I... I I suppose you know about Bob. Yes, ma'am. And that's why I'm down here. I came by to pay my respects. Funny thing. First time Bob brought you through that door. I never reckoned you might be back someday. Looking for a man who killed him. I wish it could have been for another reason, ma'am. But Bob kept things working so well here, there seldom was any reason for a ranger to come visiting in Bradshaw County. Uh, I know how you fellas keep working along. Can I offer you a bite to eat? Please, Jace. Well, that'd be real fine, Miss Smithers. I knew it might help her and me. If she could keep a little busy with her hands doing woman things in the kitchen. And I tried to eat, but kept remembering the man who'd sat across this same table from me five years before. Big, honest, stubborn, and unafraid. It's mighty nice of you to stop by, Jace. Bob would have been happy to see you sitting here again. He always said a man with a good appetite was right with the world. Ma'am. I guess Jim Dunn has already asked you, but do you have any ideas about who might have killed Bob? Oh, no. Everything went so well for a few years. All I know is the last year or so, Bob was upset about gambling. He after anybody in particular? A man named Walton. Lou Walton. Has a big house on the south road out of town. Bob always says it was a gambling house, but he could never catch Walton. You mean he raided the place? A couple of times. Last time was the night he was killed. Dunn didn't tell me about that. Bob was killed after he left there. Walton's, I mean. Dunn said they didn't find anything, so Bob started back for town. But he never got home. Mrs. Smithers. Hmm? I have to ask a favor. A favor I don't like to ask. I want to help, Jace, every way I can. I want your permission to have Bob's body exhumed for further examination. Is it necessary? I'm not satisfied with the examination that was made here. Uh, All right, Jace. I'd like to have a more thorough examination made for headquarters. I'm sending them the clothes Bob was wearing for lab check, and 
I don't want anybody to know about it for now. All right. You're going to get him, aren't you, Jace? I'm going to try awful hard, ma'am. Ranger, I've been waiting for you. Thought maybe you might have turned in for the night. I'm going to in a few minutes. I just came back to pick up the clothing exhibits. Well, I locked them away again. I'll dig them out. I want to send them on to Camp Mabry for lab tests. Well, all right. I'll give you a receipt for them. Okay. Done. Yeah? In those reports of yours, I didn't see any mention of a man named Lou Walton. Why should there be? I understand that Walton's a gambler and that you helped Smithers raid his place the night Smithers was killed. Now, here are the exhibits. You're thinking way out of line on Walton. His alibi is airtight. According to who? According to me. I was with him all night after Smithers left the place. You didn't come back to town with the sheriff? No. I stayed at Walton's. Why? Because the sheriff asked me to stay there. We didn't find anything, but the sheriff figured if I hung around, somebody might show up or call up looking for a game. And I'd be able to get him some evidence, eh? Is there anything else you want to know? No. I guess that lets Walton out. I'll take these things. Sure. Go ahead. See you tomorrow, Dunn. Number, please. Oak Hill, 243. Moment, please. Walton, done. Now get those people out and shut down. Why? What's wrong? That ranger's too smart. I try to make things look good for myself, and, well, I guess I made them look too good. Well, how much does he know? All he's going to know. You just close down and stand pat until he wears himself out. The sheriff's body was dug up, and the examiner's report sent on to Austin. Headquarters also had the exhibits I'd gotten from Dunn. By late afternoon of the next day, Captain Stinson telephoned me long distance. Got a complete report from the lab, Jace. Go ahead, Captain. You were right about the position of the body when the shots were fired. Autopsy report shows the organs were pierced in a manner that would be possible only if the sheriff were bent over forward. Good. Anything else? Yeah. That shirt you sent up. Lab thinks Smithers was killed indoors. Why? Some lint stuck to the blood and held when it dried. Analysis indicates it comes from a fabric used in expensive carpeting. Violet color. Thanks, Captain. That may be enough to wind this up. Then you're convinced that Walton was running a gambling joint, Mr. Carlin. Was and is. I swear to it. But nobody's been able to prove it. You know how suckers are. They lose their shirts and keep their mouths shut. Think they're in on a smart thing and they help the racketeers to cover up. Then Walton must have been tipped off that he was being raided. Part of the racket. They pay off and get tipped off. You ever been in Walton's house? No. You know anybody who has been there? Well, it's no secret the newspaper men gamble moans good for him. My line of type man plays horses, I know. Uh, uh, Pete. I'll be there in a minute. Howdy, Ranger. Howdy. Uh, Pete, you ever been in Lou Walton's place? Well, come on, I don't stall tell the range. It's important. Well, oh, yeah, I've been there once or twice. I only want to know one thing. You notice any carpeting in the house? Carpeting? Oh, sure, the house is like a palace. Wall-to-wall carpet all over the place. What color? Well, it's a kind of a purple, I'd say. How about saying violet? Yeah, yeah, I guess that's what it's called. You got something, Ranger? Yeah. I'm going to wake up the nearest judge and get a search warrant for Walton. You better brush the dust off that headline you told me about. I think you're going to get a chance to use it. I was wondering when you get around to me, Ranger. Seems like everybody who wears a badge just loves to poke his nose into my life. I wouldn't worry about your nose, Walton. If you want to be smart, watch out for your mouth. (laughs) I didn't mean anything, Ranger. Just that a man ought to, well, ought to have a little privacy. And you love the death cells at Huntsville. They're real private. Well, I I always cooperated. The constable, Jim Dunn, he'll tell you that. I bet he would. 
Nice carpeting you got here. I like the color. Yeah. Yeah, I... Hey, let me get you a drink or something, Ranger. All good stuff. I don't have anything but the best. <laughs> you know the old saying, the best is none too good. <laughs> Walden, there's been a strong cleaning fluid used on a piece of this rug. And one spot faded just a little. Well, I, I spilled some wine. I had a party one night. The night the Sheriff Smithers was here last? No. No, before that. Oh. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Nobody was here the night Smithers came. No. No, nobody. The, uh, the constable, he stayed. Stayed most of the night after the sheriff left. Yeah, so he told me. Uh, let me show you the rest of the house. Upstairs. No, thanks. I just want to look at the walls in this room. Sure pretty. You know, at Huntsville, they don't have pretty walls like these. Just cold concrete and steel bars. What do you keep talking about Huntsville? I'll tell you as soon as I stand up on this chair and... Rip off this new piece of wallpaper. Don't. They have no right to. Just looking for this small bullet hole, papered over. Of course, you know that one bullet went right through the sheriff. The hole was repapered because a heavy picture fell. The nail made the hole. Thirty-eight caliber nail. I did. I'm gonna have this rug ripped up and sent to my lab, Walton. No cleaning fluid made will wipe out all of a blood trace. Even a drop is enough to hang you. I didn't do it, I tell you. Dunn shot him. Huh? It was done. Dunn shot him. Hold your wrists out. You'll never get those on me. You bet wrong this time, gambler. Now get up. I'm taking you in. I took him through town to the county jail. And I walked over to the constable's office, but Dunn wasn't there. I had to find him quick before he knew I had Walton. I headed back for the jail, and as I turned into the street, I saw something move in the shadows. There was another car, not far from mine, the constable's car. And Dunn was getting into it. Dunn, wait a minute! Get out of the way, people! Get back, please! my tires. Unit 10 to KTXA. Unit 10 to KTXA. KTXA to Unit 10. Go ahead, Unit 10. Unit 10 convinced Constable Jim Dunn is subject sought in killing of Sheriff Smithers, Bradshaw County. Attempting getaway headed north on State Highway 19 from Bradshaw. Alert Highway Patrol and all units for complete roadblock of area. Order no further radio communication. Subject in Constable's marked car, equipped with shortwave receiver. Will do, Unit 10. Unit 10's car out of commission. Will attempt to commandeer another car for pursuit. Unit 10, 10 4. KDXA, Austin. Step out of the way, please. Step back, please. Step back. Come on, Charcoal. Let's hope Dunn heard that call. gamble. The last part of my call had been a plant. A plant I wanted done to hear. He'd know he couldn't get more than 15 or 20 miles before he was blocked unless he took some back road. And I'd seen him take a north turn out of town toward the wagon road he dumped the sheriff's body on. It was 11 miles for him by car. Two miles cross country for me. I raked charcoal all the way, reached the road and rope dragged a couple of dead logs across it. We finished just in time. I heard the whine of a car coming over the rise in the rough road as the first glimmer of the headlights stabbed the darkness. I tied charcoal back in the trees and dropped in the brush to wait. It's the end of the road, Don! Don't try backing up! Now you haven't got any tires. I'm giving you a chance to surrender, Don! You get your chances, Ranger! You missed, Don! Now I'm coming around the car to get you. You want to shoot it out? Let's go. Wait a minute. No, Ranger. You don't shoot. 
Don't shoot her. Look, I'll, I'll drop my gun. Here. You see? I ain't armed. Come here. I ain't armed. Neither was Smithers when you lifted his gun and killed him with it. Good thing for Texas all constables aren't like you. Come on. Walton's waiting for you at the jail. Looks like you'll be partners again at Huntsville. The following week, the headlines of the Bradshaw Times read, Sheriff Killers Caught. Though Jim Dunn protested his innocence, Lou Walton's confession and evidence submitted by the Rangers convinced the court of Dunn's guilt. Both were sentenced to life imprisonment at Huntsville. This is Joel McRae. In the 125 years since their organization was founded, the Texas Rangers have written many new pages into the history of law enforcement. With only a handful of men in a vast territory, they have never failed to live up to their slogan, first to advance, never retreat. That is the creed a ranger follows. And they have a belief that was impressed on me by one of their officers, a belief that often brings them victory over tremendous odds. In the words of the Texas Rangers... A man who is wrong can't stand up to a man who is right and keep on coming. Next week, we'll bring you another exciting case taken from the files of the Texas Rangers. Hope you'll be listening. Good night. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the MGM production, Stars in My Crown. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. In just five weeks, Dennis Day and Judy Canova bring back their two delightful programs in an hour of fun for all on Saturday nights. This weekend, 400 Americans have a holiday date with death. Stay off the list. Be careful. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Avenger. The road to crime ends in a trap that justice sets. Crime does not pay. Avenger, sworn enemy of evil, is actually Jim Brandon, a famous biochemist. Through his numerous scientific experiments, Brandon has perfected two inventions to aid him in his crusade against crime as the Avenger. 
The telepathic indicator by which he is able to pick up thought flashes and the secret diffusion capsule, which cloaks him in the black light of invisibility. Brandon's assistant, the beautiful Fern Collier, is the only one who shares his secrets and knows that he is the man the underworld fears as the Avenger. And now... The Avenger and the Ghost Murder. At the end of a long table in her darkened seance room, Princess Stella, the renowned mystic, sits motionless. Opposite her, a man leans forward, nervous and expectant. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a swirling spiral of white mist appears, takes shape, and from it comes a ghostly voice. I am the spirit of Martha, your wife. Horrors do not sell our house. We were so happy there. It holds many memories still dear to me. Keep the house, Horace. Keep it. Now I must leave you, but I will come again. I will return. I will return. Martha! Martha, don't leave me. Come back. Martha! She's gone. (sighs) Princess Stella, call her back. Call Martha back. Princess Stella, wake up! Wake up! Help! Help! What's the matter? What's the matter? What happened? Well, it's the princess. I can't wake her. Don't be alarmed. I'll turn up the lights. She uh, must have had a manifestation. It always affects her this way. Yes, yes, she brought my wife back. Princess, wake up! Princess Stella! She'll come out of it in a minute. Princess, wake up! What? Oh, what is it? Oh, it's you, Mr. Jordan. Yes. Are you all right, Princess? You frightened your client. Oh, I'm so sorry. Was the seance a success? Yes. You recalled another spirit for a lonely soul. Uh, Princess, I I saw my wife. She spoke to me. Mm, I'm glad. I think we'd better leave the princess alone now. She must rest. Of course. This way. Well, how much did he pay you, Jordan? Fifty dollars, Stella. Uh, pennies. No, Stella. Well, I'm getting sick of going through this routine day after day for that kind of money. You promised Have me... Have patience, that... Stella. I told you that before long we'd be cleaning up. Well... And I meant it. Well, you'd better pull something out of the hat, or I'll retire. And then where will you be, Jordan? No, Stella, that's no way to talk. After all I've done for you... After all you've done for me? <laughs> Shut up. There's a woman in the waiting room. You've got to see her now. Yeah, well, she's in for a disappointment. I've had enough of ghosts today. You've got to see her and talk to her at least. Ah, oh, well, all right. I'll bring her in. Then I have to leave. I have an appointment uptown with a fellow by the name of uh, Brandon. <laughs> Jordan, what can I do for you? Well, Mr. Brandon, I represent Princess Stella, the mystic. Uh, no doubt you've heard of her? Well, yes, I have. Well, Princess Stella is going to try for that $50,000 prize the Rollins estate is offering for a genuine manifestation. Isn't that rather a waste of the princess time, Mr. Jordan? What do you mean? Well, so far, every medium who has tried for that prize has failed completely. Every so-called manifestation was promptly exposed as a hoax. Oh, Princess Stella is in a class by herself. Those others were, were charlatans. Princess Stella is a true psychic. A genuine, a genuine spirit medium. Mr. Jordan, suppose you come to the point. What brought you here to see me? You may be a scientist, Mr. Brandon. Yet I feel that some of your ideas may be in sympathy with those of the princess. Why? Well, you've written some... Brilliant articles about your experiments in the field of mental telepathy. So I thought you might be interested in endorsing Princess Stella as a medium. Your word would go a long way in helping Uh, us. Just a minute, Jordan. Let's clarify our terms. My telepathic experiments have to do with the concentrated thought waves of the living. That is a science. Oh, but Princess Stella is... Is a uh... very clever actress, no doubt. No sale, Jordan. If we win the Rollins Prize, we're willing to cut you in for 10%. No, thank you. I'm not interested. 
As a matter of fact, I'm on the other side of the fence completely. You mean you're going to fight us? In a way, yes. You see, I promised Neil Hayden, the Rollins lawyer, to act as a judge when Princess Stella puts in her bid for the prize. You what? <laughs> I'm willing to give your client a fair enough chance. If Princess Stella really can produce a ghost, I'm sure the whole scientific world will sit up and take notice. Well, thanks for being such a sport about it, Brandon. I think you understand my position. Even a true artist needs a little, a little clever exploitation. <laughs> yes, that seems to be a generally accepted idea. Anyway, I feel we'll get a square deal from you, Brandon. I'm merely interested in keeping things in their proper places, Jordan. Mm -hmm. I think Princess Stella's so-called manifestations belong strictly in the field of entertainment, not to be confused in any way with any branch of science. Well, perhaps the princess can convert you. Well, I won't take up any more of your time. I'll see you at the seance next Thursday. Right. I'm looking forward to it. I can find my way out. Uh, thanks for the interview. Not at all. Goodbye. Well, of all the nerve, trying to offer you a bribe, Jim. That's the limit. I don't see how you kept your temper. Fern, Jordan is playing for big stakes, and he's not the sort to leave any stone unturned. Well, I don't trust a man like that. He's not only too glib, but too well-dressed. <laughs> he's a dandy, all right. Uh, did you notice the spats? How could I miss them? Jim, I didn't know you'd been asked to be a judge at this thing. Yes. Princess Stella is by far the cleverest medium to try for the prize. And Neil Hayden isn't going to take any chances of being duped in carrying out the extraordinary terms of the Rollins' will. Who are the other judges, Jim? Oh, you've met them both, Professor Gans and Dr. Strong. <laughs> Princess Stella isn't going to have an easy time of it. No. Even though Gans and Strong are constantly at odds, they'll probably agree this once, that Princess Stella is a colossal fake. Jim, can you arrange for me to go to the seance? I don't believe in ghosts, but I would <laughs> Would you like to see one, huh? Well, yes, I'd like to see what passes for a ghost. All right, Fern. But in the meantime, we have a great deal of research to do. What kind of research, Jim? We're going to look into all the tricks that mediums use, all the accoutrements that the earthly ghost is heir to, the blaring horns and trumpets, the moving tables and the tilting chairs, and all known devices that have ever passed for ghosts. Sounds interesting, Jim. We mustn't underestimate Princess Stella, Fern. This seance will be a kind of challenge, and we can't let science take a back seat. <laughs> You're late, Brandon. Strong and I have finished with that side of the room. Nothing unusual there. You don't mind if Fern and I have a look, Professor Gann? Well, if you're not willing to take our word for it... Go ahead, Brandon. There's plenty of time. Thanks, Strong. This way, Fern. So this is what a seance room looks like. I always thought they were done in black velvet. This one's completely in white. Yes, the princess knows the value of contrast. Uh, she's a showman, all right. Now for the inventory. White painted walls... White rug that completely covers the floor. Eight straight back white chairs. Help me examine them, Fern. Right, Jim. Hmm. They're all metal. No false bottoms. Nothing could be hidden in these chairs. Let's take the table next. It... Hmm. That's all metal, too. Examine the legs, Fern. They're single strips of metal, Jim. Nothing there. Nothing under the rug. Jim, there's no place to hide any ghosts in this room. Certainly doesn't look that way. No windows. In fact, there's only one thing about this entire room that strikes me as a little odd. What's that, Jim? There are four radiators, two at each end. Well, this is a very large room. In cold weather, I imagine all four of them are needed. They're all cold today. Are you ready, Brandon? Uh, yes, Strong, I think so. Oh, just one other thing. Did you and Gans go over the room for hidden wires? Yes, we covered the walls and floor with a detector. Guess that takes care of everything, then. I'll tell Jordan we're ready to begin the seance. Who called me? Who called me from my spirit world? Quick, Gans, put your flashlight on that corner. There's someone there. Yes. Jim, look. Something white floating there near the wall. It's a ghost. I see it, Fern. Turn on the lights. There's something there, all right. I'll do it. Hurry, Jordan. It's gone. Good heavens, Jim. It must have been a ghost. <sighs> Look at the Princess Stella. She's in a trance. Uh, wake up the Princess, Jordan. Wake her up. Of course. Princess Stella. Princess, wake up. 
Oh, gosh, Jim, this is more than I bargained for. She's coming, too. What, what happened? Brandon, strong. Help me examine this end of the room thoroughly. This sort of thing just isn't possible. That was the strangest thing I ever saw. A truly wonderful performance. There doesn't seem to be a trace of anything to mark the passage of that ghost. Well, fellow scientists, what are we going to do? If we can't explain this manifestation, we have to award the prize to Princess Stella. Not so fast, Strong. Well, what do you suggest, Gans? I don't know. What do you think, Brandon? There's no denying it. We saw the ghost, and it's up to us to explain exactly what it was and where it came from. I think we'd better call for a repeat performance. Great. I'll tell Jordan. Uh, Jordan! Jordan, come over here. Yes? Yes, what is it, Professor Gans? Uh, we're not convinced, Jordan. We're calling for another seance. No, no, I cannot. I am exhausted. I cannot. The princess, the judges are within their rights. The terms of the will stipulate that two tests may be demanded. Oh, I am faint. I cannot go through all this again. Now, gentlemen, the princess is nervous and upset. Uh, could we postpone the second seance until tomorrow? Well, I don't see why not. What do you say, Brandon? I think that's an excellent idea. Are you agreed, Gans? Yes. In fact, I prefer that. I've just remembered something that may prove helpful to us. I'll need a little time to check on it. Uh, we'll meet tomorrow, then, hmm? Yes, Jordan. However, I'd like to speak to you privately for a few moments. Now. Oh, certainly. Come into the other room. This way, please. Mm. Now, Professor Gans, what is it? Uh, have you and the princess traveled much abroad? Yes, widely. About 20 years ago... Did you bill yourselves as the Countess and the Clown? Why, no. That must have been uh, someone else. Why do you ask? They were a popular carnival act in Austria when I was teaching there. Something about you two reminded me of them. Well, the Princess and I are not exactly a vaudeville team, Professor. I wonder what became of that act. I must find out before the seance tomorrow. Really, Professor, what can that have to do with Princess Stella and the Rollins prize money? It may have everything to do with it, Jordan. I'm rather certain that the Countess and the Clown are fugitives from justice. Avenger and the Ghost Murder. Fern, we can't let Princess Stella get away with this ghost business. There's got to be an answer here in the seance room. Examine that radiator, Fern. I'll take this one. This one's cold, Jim. That's strange. This one is warm. Turn the valve, Fern. Maybe the heat's turned off. Okay. I'll see about the other radiators. Right, Jim. Fern, one of these radiators is warm and one is cold. What do you make of it, Jim? Don't know yet. I turn the heat on. We'll give them a chance to warm up. Even though we never held the same ideas, Gans, I never thought you'd deliberately oppose me in a thing like this. I had it on good authority that your vote was the only one against me. I admit it, Strong. I don't think you're fitted to be head of a research foundation. Such a position requires an older man. Wide experience. Like yourself, I suppose? 
So that was the reason for it. You want the position yourself. Now, listen here, Strong. Mind your tongue. Gentlemen, what's the trouble? Brandon, Professor Gans blackballed me. I'd have been elected head of the Lansdowne Foundation if it hadn't been for him and his petty personal ambition. Now, this is a matter between you and me, Strong. Let's keep it that way. I voted in good faith for what I believe to be the good of the Foundation. Your day is coming, Gans. I'll get you for this. Are you gentlemen ready to begin? Everyone is waiting. Well, Jordan, I see you've decided to brazen it out. If you have anything to say to me, Professor Gans, say it in private. I'm afraid that won't be possible. My news will be of interest to the public. But I have decided to let you put your show on first. My news can wait. I'll call everyone in, then. Just a moment, Princess Stella. Will you sit at this end of the table today? Very well, Mr. Brandon. It makes no difference to me. Thank you. Turn out the lights, Jordan. I'll keep my flashlight on you. All right. Now, take your place in the circle, and everyone join hands. Hayden will hold my right wrist so that my hand will be free to turn on this flashlight in an instant. There. Are you ready, Princess? I am ready. I call upon some friendly spirit... Let my voice penetrate these walls and travel on wings of wind. Out there in the vast unknown, I seek a friend, a lonely, unhappy spirit. I would call you back from the dark, lost valley of the beyond. Come, spirit, manifest thyself. The veil is lifted. The boundary between the living and the dead is not a barrier. It is but a frail cloud of mortal man's uncertainty. Come, kind spirit, appear, appear. The spirit approaches. Who calls? Who calls me? There it is, in the corner. A ghost. It's there, all right. Keep your hands joined, everyone. I'll turn on the lights. Hurry, Brandon, it's already disappearing. Oh, it's gone. Jim, look, Professor Gans, he must have fainted. Help me, Brandon. We'll get him out of here. Don't touch him, Strong. Why not? Look closely. There's a small dagger below his heart. What? Professor Gans is dead. <laughs> The police have confirmed my suspicions, Fern. Professor Gans was killed by a poison dagger. Any prints on it? It was too smudged to be of any value. Jim, up until now, I've never believed in ghosts. But you'll have to admit that no living person in that room could have thrown that dagger. No one broke the circle for a second. So you're willing to pin this murder on a ghost? Well, how do you explain it, then? The ghost is the only one that we can rule out. Because, you see, there wasn't any ghost. There wasn't any? But, Jim, we saw it twice. What we saw was nothing more than a clever mixture of muriatic acid and ammonia vapor, released through tiny holes in the dummy radiator. One radiator at each end of the room was a dummy. But how did the ghost disappear so quickly? The gas was operated by an automatic pressure gauge in the basement. It was timed to last for ten seconds. And that spiral whirling effect was due to the intermittent release of air, which circulated about the vapor. At the end of ten seconds... The whole thing was dissolved by a very light spray of ammonia and water, also released from the radiator. Gosh, I almost believed in that ghost, especially after you placed Princess Stella at the opposite end of the table for the second seance. That's why they had two sets of radiators in that room, just in case a skeptic made a request like that. But what of the voice, Jim? It didn't come from anyone in the room, it came from the ghost. Well, that's easy. Princess Stella is an accomplished ventriloquist. Well. There goes my ghost story right up the chimney, or I should say right down the radiator. Fern, I don't want any of this revealed until we know who murdered Gans. All right, Jim. But I don't see how we're ever going to find that out. At the moment, neither do I. But we'll keep trying. Is the inspector still questioning Jordan, Strong, and the princess? Yes, but we'll have to let them go for lack of evidence. I wonder if Jordan had time to put on his socks before he went to headquarters. His socks? Yes. Our fashion plate disillusioned me. He appeared at that last seance without any socks. Well, Fern, get your coat. We're going to the gymnasium. Whatever for, Jim? I'm interested in seeing a little professional boxing. I've often heard those French savate boxes are something to see. (laughs) 
Stella, what are you doing? I'm packing, Jordan. I'm going to pull out. Don't be a fool, Stella. We're under bond. You've got to stay here and stick things out. You suit yourself. I'm leaving. Now listen to me, Stella. We still have a chance to pull through all this and win that $50,000 prize. You've got to go through with that seance today. If we stay here, we'll wind up in jail no matter how the seance turns out. What are you getting at? The police have no evidence against us. Strong was the only one with a motive for killing Gans. We're in the clear. You're wrong, Jordan. Jim Brandon knows we had a motive for killing Gans. Brandon? How could he know anything? I heard the inspector tell Brandon to search Gans' apartment. Since Gans know who, knows who we were and all about the trouble that you got us into in Vienna, he must have had some proof of it. Brandon has that proof now, and he's just waiting for the proper time to use it. That does put us in a spot. We've got to get out of here, Jordan. I'm afraid. What are you afraid of, Stella? Did you kill Gans? How dare you say that? Now, you... take it easy, Stella. Listen, I'll make a deal with you. If you'll stay here and go through with this seance, I promise you have nothing to fear from Brandon. What are you talking about, Jordan? You wouldn't uh, try... Don't worry about what Brandon knows, that's all. Is it a deal? I don't know. How do I know I'm not next on the murderer's list? You're being hysterical. Now, come on now. Get things ready for your performance. If you make it a good one, Stella, we'll be on easy street. Mr. Jordan, may I speak with you a moment? Uh, of course, Miss Collier. What is it? Well, Mr. Brandon is busy at police headquarters and won't be able to get here for the seance. But, but he must. This is the final test for the prize. You are to go on with the seance as usual. It is understood that if you convince Strong and Hayden that Princess Stella has brought about a genuine manifestation, the prize is hers. All right. I'll call the princess. We are ready. Close the door, please, Mr. Jordan, and uh, turn off the lights. Yes, Princess. Jordan, wait a moment. What was that noise? I don't know. It seemed to come from just outside the door. But there's no one there. Well, close the door, then, and let's get started. Join the circle, Jordan. Let me warn you all. Do not break the circle, no matter what happens. Let silence reign a moment. Spirit of another world, come to us. Manifest thyself to those who do not believe. Show thyself within this room. Come, spirit, appear, appear and speak. Who calls? Who disturbs this spirit? I am the spirit of Alvin Gans. Something is wrong. Turn on the lights. Stay where you are, all of you, and hear me out. The ghosts of the murdered have a right to speak. Turn your flashlight on him, Dr. Strong. There's no one there. I'm here, but you can't see me. It cannot be a ghost. It cannot be. You admit before witnesses, Princess Stella, that you have no power to produce a ghost? Yes, yes, I but tell me who you are. I am the Avenger, Stella. I am here to accuse Claude Jordan of the murder of Professor Gans. It's a lie. That's a lie. This is some sort of trick you're playing on me, Stella. It's no trick, Jordan. I'll turn on the lights and produce the evidence. It's a frame-up. Stella! Strong and Hayden. Search Jordan. Oh, no, this Examine his left leg. You'll find something interesting there. Let me go. Why, there's a small bow and arrow attached to his leg. And fastened underneath it is a small dagger like the one used to kill Gans. Yes, go. That's right. This is Strong. Call Inspector White. Tell him Jordan is ready to give him an exhibition of some amazing footwork. <laughs>
Fern, you furnished the clue that solved this murder case. I did? What, Jim? You noticed that Jordan wasn't wearing socks at the seance when Gans was killed. Well, how was that a clue? The thing that had us stumped until then was the certain knowledge that no one at that seance could have used his hands to drive that dagger into Gans' heart. That's right. But what if a person were just as dexterous with his feet as with his hands? You mean he could have thrown the dagger with his feet? Hardly thrown it, but he could have aimed it with his feet. Oh, I see. That little bow and arrow fastened to Jordan's leg could be set, aimed, and released by his other foot. That's right. After I'd figured that out, I realized that the smudge print on the dagger could have been a toe print. Oh, so that's why we went to the gymnasium to see those savat boxes who boxed with their feet. Yes. One of those boxes uh, demonstrated my theory of how the crime was committed without moving the upper part of his body at all. Jim, just what was it that Professor Gans knew about Princess Stella and Jordan? The motive for the murder? Jordan was mixed up in a killing in Vienna about 20 years ago that Gans happened to remember. He intended to expose Jordan after the seance that day, and Jordan knew it. <sighs> there seems to be no limit to the methods of murder. <laughs> they don't give us detectives a chance to grow complacent. No, this one really had you on your toes. Oh, a pun, Miss Collier, that some would call a very murderous weapon. <laughs> Characters, names, places, and plots used in the Avenger program are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is a thought. A thought. A thought. Remember, listen for another adventure of... The Avenger. presents the great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products, presents Harold Perry as the great Gildersleeve. Kraft brings you the great Gildersleeve every week at this time, written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. For between meal lunching, for quick company treats, for all sorts of delightful menu surprises, serve Pabstet, the delicious golden cheese food that's so good in a hundred appetizing ways. Pabstet spreads easily, so you can whip up a marvelous tray of sandwiches in less time than it takes to sit out a hand of bridge. Pabstet slices neatly when chilled, and that's a grand way to serve it with fruit salad or apple pie. And for main dish treats... Pabstead blends ever so smoothly into tempting Welsh rabbits, light fluffy omelets, and cheese-flavored macaroni, egg, and chicken dishes. They're all so wonderfully satisfying when you add Pabstead's mellow cheddar cheese flavor. Remember, Pabstead is a fine energy food, wholesome and nourishing. So look for Pabstead in the familiar round, flat package, and always buy Pabstead when you can. Tomorrow, treat the whole family to Pabstead. Let's join our friend, the great Gildersleeve, who is still suffering the pangs of conscience for his momentary lapse into the arms of Leela Ransom a few days ago. He's also suffering because Eve Goodwin hasn't spoken to him since he confessed his slip. We find him now at home trying to gather courage to telephone her. <laughs> Let's see. I could just pretend there's nothing wrong at all. Pretend the whole thing was a bad dream. Well, Eve, I can say, how have you been? Where have you been keeping yourself? No good. Maybe I could ask her some kind of a question about my campaign. Ask her how to get the women's vote. Oh, no, no that wouldn't do. <laughs> Maybe if don't I... Don't be ridiculous, Leroy. This costume is just right. I don't care if it's right or wrong. I won't wear it. You'll have to wear it. Oh, make me. Leroy, what is all this, Marjorie? Leroy, Leroy has to be in a maid for them. Stop, stop, stop it, stop it, stop it one at a time. What is this? Leroy has to take part in a maypole dance at Mayor Terwilliger's picnic, and he just... Just a minute. Let's get one thing straight around here. It's not Mayor Terwilliger's picnic. It's the annual outing of Summerfield City employees. The city pays for it. The invitation says that the mayor is paying for the ice cream. Well, the city pays the mayor. 
What's this about a maypole dance? The school kids have to do it. Some idea of Miss Goodwin. If it's Miss Goodwin's idea, it's all right. I want you to cooperate 100%, Leroy, at least. A maypole dance. That's kid stuff, Unc. It's not kid stuff at all. By a few hundred years ago, the maypole dance was a universal custom. The peasants used to dance around the maypole every spring. Grown-up peasants, too. Well, I ain't a peasant. <laughs> we needn't go into that. If Miss Goodwin's putting on a maypole dance, you'll take part, Leroy, just like the rest of the children. Oh, I wouldn't mind that so much, but I got a special part. Oh? What is it? I have to present the crown to the Queen of the May. They made me want me to wear this little old Fauntleroy suit and to walk up there with a crown on a pillow. And then I have to kneel down and present it to the Queen of the May. Well, I think that's a very... And who do you suppose is Queen of the May? Who? Ethel Hammerslug. <laughs> oh, Leroy, you make me sick. Ethel Hammerslug is a very nice little girl. Oh, yeah, the new crowner. <laughs> I not only have to crown her, but then I have to sit beside her on her throne. I don't even want to go to Terwilliger's old picnic. It's not Terwilliger's picnic, and you'll go. And by George, you'll wear that costume. But these pants are too tight. This suit is two years old. It's as good as new. You've never worn it. And today you will. Now go upstairs and put it on. Oh, for corn's sake. Go, Leroy. Okay. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Gillsleeve. What about lunch for the mayor's picnic? You want hard-boiled eggs? Ye gods, Bertie. This picnic is not the personal property of Mayor Terwilliger. The city is paying for an outing for its employees. Yes, sir. You want hard-boiled eggs? I'm not going. <laughs> Give the children whatever you have. Oh, Uncle Lord, I think you ought to go. And watch Terwilliger swelling around as if he owned the park? No, thank you. I fixed some fried chicken. Mm-hmm. And some nice cucumber sandwiches. Mm-hmm. Little mayonnaise on them, Bertie? Uh, just a touch. Then I could put in some of them little baby tomatoes. Mm, delicious. <laughs> I thought I might just whip up a quick devil's food cake, Mr. Gilsey, but if you ain't going to the picnic, maybe I shouldn't bother. Well, the children will enjoy it. Besides, it never does any harm to have a cake around the house, Bertie. <laughs> no, sir. Well, I'd better get with it. Well, I should think you'd want to go to the picnic, Uncle Lord. I should think you'd want to see Leroy as King of the May. I'd rather imagine it. I thought you'd be taking Miss Goodwin to the picnic. By George, maybe I should, eh? I might call her up and ask her. Why not? I think I will. Uh. What's the matter? Marjorie, I wonder if you'd mind going out on the porch or something just for a minute. I, uh... <laughs> All right, Unky. I'll leave you alone. Yes, yeah, great. Now... Excuse me, Mr. Gilsey, but have you... Birdie, I'm trying to telephone, if you don't mind. Oh, pardon me. Must be something private. Uh, <laughs> like trying to phone from a cigar store. What if she says no? But if I don't call her, how can she say yes? I don't know how I get into these things. All right, Uncle, I'll leave it to you. Is this a costume? Oh, for heaven's sake, I'm trying to telephone, Leroy. Go ahead. Leave the room, Leroy. Hey, there goes Mrs. Ransom. Are you going to take her to the picnic? Certainly not. Well, she seems to be heading this way. Oh, my goodness. Uncle, what's the matter? Nothing. Is she coming here, Leroy? How do I know? Hey, what are you doing behind the sofa? Where is she? Coming up the front walk. Uh, tell her I'm out, Leroy. But you're right here. You wouldn't want me to tell a lie, would you, Unc? You won't be telling any lie, my boy. Tell her I'm out. You don't know when I'll be back. What a character. Hello, Mr. Gillespie. Well, hello, Phoebe. Be right with you. I'm just measuring out some mothballs here. <laughs> right ahead with whatever you're doing. I just dropped in. Oh, just paying a little visit, eh? That's nice. No, I'm avoiding a little visit. What's that you say? <laughs> a little difficulty at home, Peavy. I came down here to avoid it. Oh, well, I know how it is. There are times when Mrs. Peavy and I have our little fallings out. She says it is, and I say it isn't. She says it is, and I say it isn't. And she says it is. And you and... say it isn't. That's right. <laughs> It goes on like that, and by and by she gets impatient. And she says to me, Richard, you're a stubborn old fool. <laughs> but I fix her. Oh, how? I just say to her, well, now, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> and then I go take a walk. Peavy, you're right. You're a stubborn old fool. Well, now, I 
Oh, you're dancing, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it, it works. It's the only way to handle them. When the wife and I have one of our little tussles, I know just as sure as I walk out that door, if I just hold out long enough, she'll give in. Well, that's a good system. There's uh, only one trouble. What's that? I never can seem to hold out long enough. <laughs> well, you're no different from the rest of us. Well, I... Oh, excuse me, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yes, yes. If you don't mind my asking, who was the party you came down here to avoid? I'm not mentioning the lady's name, Peavy. I'm withholding that information as a gentleman should. Well, I only ask because I'm afraid I see her coming in the shop now. Uh, Miss Goodwin. Miss Goodwin? I'm not avoiding her. Or am I? <laughs> well, anyway, I guess I'm trapped. Oh, hello, Eve. Good morning, Scott Morton. Long time no see. <laughs> Good morning, Miss Peavy. Hmm. Morning, Miss Goodwin. Nice day. Yes, it is. I'd like to... It was a little foggy this morning, though, but about 9.30 the sun broke through, so it turned out nice after all. I'd like a bottle of cologne, Mr. Peavy, if you have it. Cologne? Well, now, there, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disappoint you, Miss Goodwin. Uh, Cologne is very hard to get these days. Cologne is very hard to get, yeah. I put in an order back about Christmas time, but all they were able to send me was a... Grocer razor blades, which I, of course, was glad to get, but it wasn't quite... Like that all over. I heard of a fellow in the hardware business who... who, uh, 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 Excuse me. Have you anything else, Mr. Peavy? Any toilet water? Oh, yes, I have. Just get my glasses on here. I have two here. Now, this one is called Parlement d'Amour. Same as the perfume. It has a very nice smell. Oh, that's very nice. I know that one. I used to buy that for... Oh, it's very nice. <laughs> I think perhaps I'd prefer the other one. What's that? Yes, you'd probably prefer the other one, PV. Let's have a look at that. Well, let's see. This one is called Moment of Passion. <laughs> <laughs> May I smell it? Yeah, let her smell it, PV. Certainly. I can get the stuff around me. Take a little sometime. Here, I'm strong. Let me do it, Phoebe. I got it. There you are, Miss Goodwin. Oh, that is nice. Uh, care to smell it, Mr. Gildersleeve? Oh, no, no. Whatever's all right with Eve is all right with me. <laughs> a lot of the ladies seem to like this one. I think I'll take it. How much is that? That'll be, uh, let's see. It's written on the bottom here. seventy-five and 20% tax, two ten. It's all paid for, Eve. Here you are, Peavy. Oh, no, please. I don't want you to. Here, Mr. Peavy. It's all paid for. But I couldn't think it's of having... It's no use, Eve. Keep Doc your money. Morton, if you don't mind. Well, uh, okay. Gosh. Uh, two ten and five is two fifteen, two twenty-five, two fifty, and fifty. It's three dollars. I thank you. And uh, here's your parcel. Thank you. Goodbye, Mr. Peavy. Goodbye. Oh, Eve, just a minute. Yes? I mean, uh, speaking of the weather, Eve, I mean, uh... Are you going to the picnic today, Eve? I expect to, yes. Some of the children from the school are giving a little performance. Yeah, I know. Leroy, he can hardly wait. Are you going with anybody in particular? I'm going with a group of the teachers. Oh. Well, perhaps I'll see you around. Perhaps. Goodbye, Mr. Peavy. Goodbye. Goodbye, Eve. See you around. (laughs) A little trouble there, Mr. Gildersleeve? What do you think? Well, so it goes. Are you going to the mayor's picnic? I don't know. whole thing is just a political scheme to get votes anyway. And she won't go with me. Well, a lot of things can happen at a picnic. I went to a picnic once. That's when I was a young fellow. I was working for a wholesale drug firm at the time. Dunninger and Holtz, it was. Well, sir, I, I went to this picnic, and who do you suppose I met there? Your future wife. Uh, somebody told you. You did. Oh, did I? <laughs> well, it's a fact. That's the way I met her. Now, who knows? If you go to this picnic today... I've already met my future wife, Peavy. Only she won't speak to me. For all I know, she won't be my wife, either. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. Oh, no? You just saw her, didn't you? Saw the way she treated me. Yes, I did. As if I were a skunk. Well, she wasn't very neighborly. (laughs) What I always say is actions speak louder than words. Oh? What do you mean? Let me ask you something, Mr. Gillespie. Has she given you back your ring? I know. No, she hasn't. Mm-hmm. What are you worrying about, then? She'll come around. Peavy, by George. Maybe I will go to that picnic. I would, if I were you. After all, what's a picnic without a skunk? <laughs> <laughs> The 
Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few seconds. Ready, set, let's go, ladies, for more of those tempting ways to serve Pabstet, the delicious golden cheese food of a hundred uses. First course, cream soup. Just before serving, add a generous amount of Pabstet, cut into small cubes, and watch that cream soup hit a new high in appetizing goodness. Next, the main dish. And our suggestion is eggs golden sauce. Hard-cooked eggs drenched with the mellow cheddar cheese goodness of Pabstet. Now, a grand salad. Press two halves of a pear together with a tasty center filling of Pabstet. And serve with lettuce and mayonnaise. And for dessert, apple pie served with Pabstet wedges. There you have it, menu magic from soup to dessert with Pabstet. And you'll find dozens of other exciting ways to surprise your family with this nourishing, wholesome cheese food. So tomorrow, look for, ask for, and buy Pabstet. Remember the name, Pabstet. Now back to Summerfield and the Great Gildersleeve. The city employees' picnic is well underway with games for the children, tests of strength and skill for the gentlemen, and special events for the ladies, all to the strains of the Sanitation Department Band. Folks, just a minute, please. Uh-oh, Terwilliger's going to talk some more. Uh, when you've finished your lunches, you'll find ice cream is being served at that table under the tree there. All absolutely free with the compliments of your old friend and our next mayor, Cyrus L. Terwilliger. Oh, that's me. <laughs> uh, the big ham. Eat hearty, folks. Yeah, uh, sure, eat hearty, folks, and we'll all come out of your taxes. How about it, Uncle Mort? Should we have lunch? You'd better grab some places. Now, nah, Leroy, you'll not grab anything. I wonder if Miss Goodwin's around. Oh, let's invite her to have lunch with us. Yeah. Oh, I see her. Hey, Miss Goodwin! Hey! <laughs> Leroy, that's no way. Well, here she comes. Oh, you who Eve. Will you sit here with us, Miss Goodwin? I'd love to, Marjorie. Great. I'll tell you what you do, children. Uh, don't you? Why don't you go over and eat at that table over there where all the children are? And leave Miss Goodwin and me. But, well, Uncle, I want to eat with Miss Goodwin. Do as I tell you, Leroy. Take your lunch and go over there. There's a nice place right at the end of the table. Oh, Throckmorton, I don't think you ought to send them off. Run along, Leroy. You too, Marjorie. Uncle Mort, I'm not a child. Then you're old enough to realize that I have things to say to Miss Goodwin. Now, will you run along? <laughs> well, put it that way. <laughs> I don't know that I have anything to say to you, Throckmorton. I came over because Leroy asked me. Eve, please, you don't have to say anything. Just sit here and share my lunch with me. Really, I'm not hungry. Or I'd have brought my own lunch. Oh, come on, Eve. I've got plenty. I've got loads here. You see, fried chicken. Here are two drumsticks. One for you and one for me. Bill. Oh. <laughs> Judge Hooker, how you startle me. Uh, won't you join us, Judge? Yes, yes. Thank you. I'd be delighted. But I seem to have mislaid my lunch. I can't imagine... Oh, Throckmorton has lots of lunch. Oh, we're full of lunch. <laughs> Do sit down. Throckmorton would be only too glad to have you share his lunch, wouldn't you, Throckmorton? Sure, old goat. In that case, I'll be only too glad to accept the invitation. Well, this is cozy, isn't it, Gildy? Three's the crowd, Judge. Oh, now, don't say that. Have a drumstick, Judge? Oh, thank you. I seem to be a little hungry today for some reason. You're always hungry. <sighs> well, I want to tell you, that's the finest fried chicken I've ever put in my mouth. Wipe your chin. Oh. Doc Morton, a drumstick for you? No, thanks. What? I'm not hungry. Oh, come now, that's nonsense. There's all this chicken here. Go ahead and try it, Gilly. It's marvelous. Thank you, Judge. That's very generous of you. <laughs> but I seem to have lost my appetite. Oh, well, all right. Ah, but you're missing something. Finest fried chicken I ever tasted. I'm glad now they couldn't find my lunch. You never had a lunch, and you know it. <laughs> you old goat, why don't you eat the paper plate, too? Oh, here's Mayor Terwilliger. Oh, huh? what does he want? Well, 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 this is a merry little group. Miss Goodwin. How do you do? Judge? Ask the fried chicken? No, no, thank you. Oh, there, Gildersleeve. <clears throat> I'm uh, going to have to ask you gentlemen if I can borrow this lady for a little while. What? We're having a pie-eating contest after lunch. 
I'm going to require some assistance from the fair sex in judging it, and if Miss Goodwin here will do me the honor... I'd be delighted. Splendid. Oh, but uh, finish your lunch first. I've finished, thank you. Oh, let me sit you to your feet, then. But, Eve, you haven't eaten a thing. Eve, you're not going. Sorry, Gildersleeve, but duty calls. <laughs> you said yourself, Throckmorton, three's a crowd. So I'll leave you two together. Excuse me. This way to the arena. Well, Gildy. And I wind up with you. Like to hold hands, Gildy? <laughs> oh, shut up. I've got a good mind to go home, but I'm not going to. I'll show her, and I'll show him, too. I'll show people who's the best man around here. I'm going to enter that pie-eating contest, and I'm going to win it. You do that, Gildy. You just do that. I'm going to. You just show her. You bet I will. You get into that contest and prove to her that there isn't a man in Summerfield who can make a bigger pig of himself than you can. Oh! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen... Ladies and gentlemen, could I have your attention for a moment, please? Yeah, what did I tell you, Judge? He's going to make another speech. Now just keep your shirt on, Gildy. All you can do is be a good sport. Ladies and gentlemen, friends of Summerfield, I only hope you've all had as pleasant a time so far as I've had myself. Thank you, thank you. I know some of you have had a good time. There's a certain politician, for instance, who enjoyed winning the pie-eating contest. Why, you... Stop! <laughs> uh, I won't mention his name because he's my political opponent. Stop! You... <laughs> but I can tell you he's a little on the stout side. I wouldn't say he's exactly fat, but I understand one time he had the mumps for two weeks before he found it out. <laughs> Be a good sport, Gildy. Laugh! <laughs> Uh, now, uh, we're not going to have any speeches today, folks. This is just a social occasion. At the same time, if I may take a moment, I would like to call your attention to one or two facts about the political situation at this time. Now, in the year 1776, what was Summerfield? 1776. In the year 1776, Summerfield was just a tiny village. What? In that tiny village were all the seeds of the summer field that was to grow into the great and prosperous city of today. This could go on for days. The glorious tradition of summer field began to grow and expand. In the year 1812, what do we find? This isn't a speech, it's a filibuster, Judge. The year 1812 saw the establishment of Summerfield's first manufacturing concern. That concern, my friends, was the Summerfield Iron Works whose sleds and washboards have since made the name of our city famous throughout the country. Is he going to tell about every business in town? We come to the year 1813, and what do we find? We want Gildersleeve! The banner year of 1813! We want Gildersleeve! Hey, Gildersleeve, how about a song? Yeah, give us a song! Yeah, a song! Yeah, a song. Uh, uh, well, 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 now, uh, that's an idea, that's, yes, sir. Uh, uh, we've all heard your reputation as a singer, Mr. Gildersleeve. Would you like to croon something for our friends? Well, I'm no professional. So I've heard. Uh, uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I understand that as a singer, Mr. Gildersleeve is a howling success. <laughs> uh, he will now oblige us with a ditty assisted by the street cleaning department band. <laughs> You're trying to put me on the spot, Terwilliger. Well, sing and get off of it. Why, George, I'll... Well, uh, Mr. Leader, uh, do the fellows know Shine on Harvest Moon? Uh, we can try it, Commissioner. Key C only. Oh, fine, fine. Uh, harvest Moon, fellas, and do the best you can. One, two... Shine on... Shine on harvest moon Up in the sky I ain't had no love And since January, February, June or July It's no time Ain't no time to stay Outdoors in school So shine on Shine on harvest moon for me and my girl. Oh, thank you very much. Thank 
Thank you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if I may resume. We want another song. If I may How resume my... How song, ad- Commissioner? Yes, give us another song. Well, I'll do my best, folks. Uh, go ahead and play something, Mr. Leader. If I know it, I'll join in. How about without a song? Without a song. Oh, yeah, that's very good. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Without a song, the day would never end. Without a song, the road would never bend. When things go wrong, a man ain't got a friend. Without a song. Passion girl with heart so true. One who loves nobody else but you. I want a girl just like the girl that married dear old dad. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, Gildersleeve, now get off. Don't you wish I would? <laughs> if I may continue from the point at which I was interrupted, friend. I want another song. Yeah, give us another song. Uh, really, friend. Friends, Mr. Gildersleeve has sung eight songs already. I- I'm afraid his voice is tired. Are you kidding? I'm as fresh as a daisy, folks. <laughs> uh, how about a song uh, uh, just for the ladies? Oh, yeah, yeah, All right, ladies, your wish is my very command. Uh, Mr. Leader. <laughs> oh, sure, we know that one. Uh, number 18, boys. Oh. <laughs> Love is just a game the two are playing. Love is nothing but a game of chance. For the one who chooses very often loses. Love is never sure to be romance. Danger always lurks in Cupid's arrows, but he hasn't aimed at you and me. If you are thinking of some other boy to love, you may always know that you are free. Thank you, ladies. Thank That's you. all, Gildersleeve. So, Williger, I'll sing just as long as there's a demand for this stuff. You can sing all night for my dough, Commissioner. Well, thank you. Well, you can't sing all night for mine. Well, you can't stop. It. Oh, yes, I can. Quiet, quiet. You there, leader. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Take that bunch of straight cleaners home. Or you'll all lose your brooms in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> You were wonderful. Uh, Wasn't he wonderful, Miss Goodwin? He certainly was, Marjorie. Did you hear the way that crowd cheered? Well, I think he could run for president. Yeah, I'll get a regular Sinatra. Yes. <laughs> run along, little boy, run along. I suppose you'd like me to run along, too, huh? Well, the sidewalk isn't wide enough for all of us, my dear. Why don't you and Leroy just walk ahead, huh? Run <laughs> along, Leroy. Give him a break. How much is there in it for me? Leroy. Okay, okay. Uh, that's a boy. Well, shall we start home, Throckmorton? Oh, if you'd like. (laughs) I was very proud of you this afternoon, Throckmorton. Oh, that's so? Yes. I I thought you handled a difficult situation very well. Hmm, nothing much. (laughs) It could have been very embarrassing. You know, when Terwilliger got you up there to sing, he was trying to make you ridiculous. Ah, uh, that was his mistake. I think he found that out. Throck Morton. Yes? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Eve, what's the use of bluffing? I can't be mad at you. Well, I can't stay mad at you. When you sing the way you did just now, I don't know, something happens to me. Oh, well. That's because I was singing to you, Eve. Just you. Were you? You think I could sing that way to anybody else? Oh, darling. 
It's been so long. <laughs> Anna, for Pete's sake, come on! Oh, hey! Oh, well, let's go, Mark. They'll be there all night. <laughs> George, that's pretty nice. Listen to this, Marjorie. Huh? What is it? It's a letter from Maddie Parsons. Uh, she's Frank Parsons' wife. You know, the fellow that reads the meters for us. Oh, yes. What's she writing you about? Well, she just wanted to thank me for keeping him on the payroll those weeks when he was out sick. You remember? Mm-hmm. But listen to this, my dear. She says, By the way, Mr. Gildersleeve, I want to tell you how thankful we both are that Frank went in on the payroll savings plan at the water department. We've always tried to save money, but with one thing and another... It always seemed to slip away somehow. But now we've laid away a war bond every month for 17 months. It'll be a nice little nest egg. Luckily, we didn't have to cash in any of the bonds to pay for Frank's illness. But it was sure nice to know that the money was there in case we did need it. Well, is everybody down at the water department in on the payroll savings plan? Oh, the smart ones are, my dear. Because there isn't a better investment in this whole world or an easier way to save money. Think it over, folks. Good night. on this program was directed by Bob Sweet. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company, makers of Parquet Margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Kraft invites you to listen again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, lots of local news for you tonight. Duluth in the future may become Minnesota's steel manufacturing center serving the entire upper Midwest area. At least that's the opinion advanced here tonight by James W. Clark of St. Paul, commissioner of the State Department of Business, Research, and Development. Clark said his office was very interested in either construction of a new Duluth steel plant or the expansion of the present one operated by the American Steel and Wire Company at Morgan Park. The proposal is one of a number of industrial projects under study by his department, he explained. Vernie Joslin of St. Paul today was elected president of the Northern Great Lakes Area Council during a summer conference being held in Hotel Spaulding here. Joslin, director of the Minnesota Division of Publicity, replaces William Palmer of Lansing, Michigan as head of the group to promote the national resources of the Northern Great Lakes region. Joseph Alexander of Madison, supervisor of recreational publicity, Wisconsin Department of Conservation, was elected vice president, as was Webb McCall of Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Well, another sultry blast is on tap. Not quite as warm, we're glad to hear, as yesterday, or for today, for the Lakehead region tomorrow. Another sultry blast, not quite as warm as today. That's what's in store for us tomorrow, as much of the nation prepares likewise to swelter for the second straight day in the year's hottest temperatures. The Twin Ports region today recorded its all-time high mark for the date with a top reading of 94 degrees. It ties for first place as the warmest day this year with July 5th, according to the Duluth Weather Bureau. The runner-up day was a 91-degree scorcher back in June. Although tomorrow's forecast here also calls for widely scattered thunder showers, U.S. meteorologists in Chicago offer no hope for cooling relief earlier than the weekend. The soonest, Thursday or Friday, the Associated Press said. The low mark at the lakehead today was 65 degrees. Normal is 61. A year ago to date, the high was 80 degrees. It was warm. The torrid wave today blanketed the nation from the Rockies all the way to the Appalachians, roasting the mercury to 100 degrees or over highs in many areas. The nation's contrasts were experienced by Blight, California, where the mercury soared to 108, and by Ely, Nevada, where the mercury dropped to 1 degree above freezing. Chicago recorded its highest temperatures of the year with 98 degrees. Other temperature high todays were 102 at La Crosse, Wisconsin, 101 at Elkader, Iowa, 
a hundred at Blowing Rock, Wisconsin, ninety-eight at St. Louis, at Tumwa and Waterloo, Iowa, and ninety-seven at Des Moines and Mason City, Iowa. One heat casualty in Duluth today was Jack Hackley, sixty of Route Three, Box Seven O Four, who collapsed about eleven this morning while working on a sidewalk construction project at Fifty Seventh Avenue West and Grand Avenue. He was released after treatment at St. Mary's Hospital. So that forecast again, more warm, not quite as warm, scattered thunder showers. The high today, 94, low 65, it's 78 downtown right now. The Duluth Chamber of Commerce Legislation and Taxation Committee has recommended approval of the proposed Duluth Teachers Retirement Fund Association if certain modifications are made, according to R.B. Morris, the Chamber Executive Secretary. Following a subcommittee study of the proposal, the committee suggested this modification, that the annuity payable to any teacher shall not exceed the annuity which the teacher's accumulated contributions, plus the same amount from tax funds, will be at the time of retirement, and in no event shall the annuity from tax funds exceed $900. The proposal is still under study by the Duluth City Council, which must approve the plan before it can go into effect. Well, it won't be long now. An estimated 22,000 Duluth students will return to school this fall, the first of them by September 7th. The bulk of students will enter Duluth public schools where more than 16,000 are expected to study this fall and winter. Public school teachers have been ordered to report for conferences September 7th. All classes open the following day. The University of Minnesota Duluth branch will begin classes September 27th. According to Dr. Raymond C. Gibson, Provo, Registration opens September 13th and will continue through the 24th. Freshman registration at the College of St. Scholastica has been scheduled for the 21st of September. Upper-class students register the following day. School sessions will be resumed September 24th. Duluth parochial schools, including Cathedral High and St. Jean Baptiste, will begin instructions on September 7th. Reverend Father Michael Hogan... School superintendent said the expected enrollment will be between 2,900 and 3,000 students. Stanbrook Hall officials have slated September 3rd and 4th for registration with school opening the 7th of September. District judges of St. Louis County will meet next Tuesday to pass on the qualifications of William Eddy of Virginia, a political figure and new appointee by county commissioners to the County Welfare Board. District Judge Mark Nolan said today... The procedure is required by law in the case of a welfare appointment, with the county board making the nomination county officials said. Under the statute, a majority of the judges must approve the appointment. Judges convened in Duluth today on the appointment but decided to delay action until a full panel could be present. Judge Victor Johnson, you know, is on vacation. Eddie was named in a series of ballots by commissioners to succeed John D. Lynchy, also of Virginia. <laughs> Bertha J. Wellington, 49, of No Penning, escaped serious injury this afternoon when the car she was driving went out of control in 8th Avenue East and finally came to a stop after plunging through a heavy mesh wire fence and an iron gate of the fence. Police said the car brakes apparently failed at 5th Street. Gaining speed as she approached 1st Street, the woman drove the car along the sidewalk, then turned into the fence. The car tore up about 30 to 40 feet of the fence, enclosing a used car lot owned by Economy Supplies. The machine narrowly missed a string of parked trucks. The vehicle then knocked over a heavy iron gate on the fence, coming to a stop in the alley, the rear door at the rear door of Lakeland Motors at 749 East Superior Street. Although the marriage license business began booming in some localities right after the Selective Service Act became law, Douglas County records show no increase in weddings, at least to beat the draft. When the nation's youths between the ages of 18 and 25 begin registrations on Monday, Douglas County males will check to the National Building, 921 Tower Avenue, where draft board number 17 has set up offices. By presidential order... Husbands, fathers, and persons having dependents will be deferred, although no ruling has been made on how long a person must be in that classification to merit exemption. The first day of registration in Superior will find youth born in 1922 after August 30th registering on Monday. Others will register on assigned dates until the 18th of September. By law, the draft cannot start until September 22nd, 90 days after the act became law. Ms. Margaret Hurley has been named clerk of the Douglas County Board, which is headed by Chairman Clarence Erlinson. 
Other members are Norman F. Olson, Harris Jennings, L.R. Duplaise, and Lyle Downey. Nowhere do golf tournaments get more accurate and complete coverage than in the Arrowhead, where the Duluth News Tribune is trained sports writers at every event to bring stories of these competitions to its readers. Every day after qualifying rounds, there are starting times, pairings, and accounts of the day's play that leave no questions unanswered. Follow the fortunes of your favorite golfers in the Duluth News Tribune. Well, most of the superior news tonight is pretty much court news. Two men today were ordered bound over to Superior Court for trial when they waived examination in Superior's Municipal Court. Arraignments on separate charges. Thorwald L. Thurston, 33, of South Range, charged with operating a motor vehicle without the owner's consent, was committed to Douglas County Jail in lieu of bail, set at $300. He was arrested by Undersheriff Elton Eckroth. Gus Fortas, an 18-year-old transient, arrested in Duluth at the request of Superior's police, was lodged in the county jail when he failed to post $500 bail set by Municipal Judge Claude Cooper on a charge of attempted burglary in the nighttime. This youth was charged with being one of a trio which attempted the break-in at a gasoline station at Grand and Dulnap Street early Friday morning. Arrested earlier and awaiting Superior Court trial on the charge are two other youths, James R. Johnson, 19, of Minneapolis, and a 16-year-old from Libertyville, Illinois. Charged with pointing a pistol at another person, Daniel Thibodeau, 32, of Milwaukee. Today was fined $50 in Superior's Municipal Court when he pleaded guilty before Judge Claude Cooper. Police said Thibodeau was arrested on complaint of James Ryan of Duluth. Down at St. Paul, Governor Youngdahl today said he would speak at a Labor Day celebration in Fairbow if those arranging the event give him a written invitation. The governor's request comes after a move by slot machine interests who sought to keep him off the program. An official of the Fairbow celebration said the slot machine men asked that the governor's appearance be canceled. However, according to this official, the men offered to make up any cost involved in re-advertising the event to put it over without Governor Youngdahl. The official is Jesse Allard, general chairman of the festivities. Allard refused to call off Youngdahl's appearance, but a letter was written and mailed out saying the governor would not be on the program. It was signed by two men identified with the Central Labor Union and the Rice County Democratic Farmer Labor Party. After the letter, Allard said he still hoped the governor would appear. It was then Governor Youngdahl requested a written invitation. Other speakers in the program will be Mayor Hubert Humphreys of Minneapolis, Attorney General Ben Crisp, and Secretary of Agriculture Charles Brannan. Down at St. Paul, Northwest Airlines today announced a domestic fare increase of 2% effective the 1st of September. The rate boost was filed today with the Civil Aeronautics Board. One official said the new charges would raise Northwest rates to the new level of the air industry. Here's a bulletin from the Associated Press, London. The Moscow radio says the Soviet government has decided, and we quote here, to close immediately both Soviet consulates in the United States, in New York and San Francisco. It called the action a result of the Kozienkina case. We'll repeat this bulletin. The Moscow radio is quoted out of London tonight as saying, they shall close immediately both Soviet consulates in the United States, in New York and San Francisco. It called the action a result of the Kozienkina case. Over at Detroit, the Bureau of Labor Statistics Cost of Living Index reached a new record high in July. And General Motors employees received a three-cent hourly pay increase today since the pay of GM employees follows the fluctuations of the index. The directors of GM's department of the CIO auto workers say GM workers welcome the increase, but they're not kidding themselves as to its true significance. T.A. Johnston says the workers know that although there, will, although there will be more money in their pay envelopes, it will not buy more at the corner store. Down in the nation's capital, the White House says President Truman will reach Yorktown, Virginia by noon tomorrow. Secretary of Defense Forrestal has commented on the secret meeting of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at Newport, Nor in the Rhode Island, last weekend. Forrestal says that decisions reached reflect neither a victory for the Air Force nor a defeat for the Navy. What was done, he says, was to clarify the position of the Air Force and the Navy in the field of strategic air warfare. The House Un-American Activities Committee announces they expect to have a prize witness Monday. He is one J. Peters, who's been called the leader of a pre-war communist underground in the United States. Peters has been sought for a long time. The committee was informed today that Peters is due Monday at deportation proceedings in New York City. Acting Chairman Carl Munt says the subpoena will be served Peters on Monday if he shows up. 
Frankfurt, Germany. Four Americans died today in the flaming wreckage of two C-47 transports which collided in the air near Frankfurt. The planes were returning from airlift flights to Berlin. Down at Florence, Italy, headquarters of the pro-fascist Italian social movement has been heavily damaged by a bomb explosion. There were no reported casualties. In Berlin, the Russians appear to have given up their series of raids in the western sectors of Berlin. And the tension in the blockaded city is said to have eased up. Birmingham, England, a five-day strike of 16,000 Austin motor car employees has been settled. Austin sells much of its output here in the United States. And down at Fort Wayne, Indiana, in this country, the federal judge says attorneys for the National Labor Relations Board have asked him to the AFL International Topographical Union for contempt of court, asked him to cite the union. The charge is violation of an injunction the judge, Luther Swigert, issued against the union last March. At Los Alamos, New Mexico, workers have agreed to accept a union settlement of a labor dispute at the Los Alamos Atomic Project. Union leaders estimate at least 90% of the 3,500 workers who have been on strike will return to their jobs tomorrow morning. And down in Chicago, the International Harvester Company, strike-bound in six cities, plans to lay off employees in other plants. In Louisville, 1,500 workers will be laid off Friday if the strike by the CIO United Auto Workers is not settled. Lack of parts is given as the reason. And down at St. Paul, a man who simply couldn't handle money was arrested today shortly after the $800 robbery of a ticket seller at the Minnesota State Fair. Arrested at the St. Paul Hotel was 31-year-old Robert Wright, also an employee of the State Fair. Wright was taken into custody after offering $30 for a round-trip ride to Minneapolis. At the same time, he dropped $600 in cash on the hotel floor. Earlier today, James Beach of Tulsa told policemen $800 had been taken from his money belt. Wright said he'd been drinking and could not remember everything, but confessed taking the money from his fellow worker. St. Paul police said that he would face larceny charges tomorrow. Yes, a man who just couldn't handle money. That brings us up to date on the news. It's complete news that will be found in tomorrow morning's issue of your complete newspaper, the Duluth News Tribune. Look to tomorrow morning's issue of the trip. As usual, it's Jim Payton reporting... Thank you once more for listening, and good night.